did treat the man who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th straight night of protest there. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. A peaceful night of protest in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that I've taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. It will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's attorney general is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours, it's pain, it's number pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. The investigation into his shooting is ongoing. And now we have a consumer alert for pet owners this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under the names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased any of these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after taking off, he saw those flames shooting from the right engine and heard loud banging noises as the Boeing 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries. A video, wow. Well, some Trump supporters rocked the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Travis in a boat parade. They got a little too close, though, to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked who would make you feel safe, 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by 1 percent. And when handling his, his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. 
On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration, down in the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. He was alarmed when he found out what he had did. Uh, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books with the Game 2 win over the Rockets. LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former team Ray Allen, teammate Ray Allen, for the second most playoff threes ever. And it was a nail-biter in Darlington for NASCAR Southern 500. But Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late in the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. Harvick snuck in two first after a crash sidelined leader Chase Elliott with 16 laps to go. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position in NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place Denny Hamlin. SpaceX carried out another successful test of its Starship. The company hopes to one day use this ship to send passengers or cargo to other planets. This test is called a hot flight since it only went 150 meters, but everything went smoothly. SpaceX sees this as a very good sign of progress since other designs have not made it that far. All right, you can see some nice sunshine there. Let's bring in NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb tracking some heat. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. We have the Pacific Northwest where we have extreme heat. Windland, Woodland Hills, excuse me, 121 degrees, beating all-time records yesterday in Southern California. Red flag warnings, they continue to remain across the Pacific Northwest with dry conditions and the winds. They're going to continue to stir up throughout the afternoon. Look at the heat across the Southwest into the Pacific Northwest for Las Vegas today, 112. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Across the Rockies, though, we have a dramatic change. Casper today, 64 degrees, and that cold front is going to come across the plains very quickly from Brownsville all the way to New Orleans. We're still in the lower 90s. Ladies, it's time to talk about my favorite snow coming up. <laughs> Something's so wrong with that. Yes. Four-letter S word. Not ready for it. And smiling while you yeah. say it, no less. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Janessa. <laughs> Actress Halle Berry added some extra weight to her at-home workout. The Oscar winner carried her son Maceo as she performed squats in her backyard. She shared this video here on Instagram, writing, quote, with all the chaos that comes with virtual online learning, it can be difficult for little kids to stay energized and engaged. So today, I thought I'd throw my son Maceo into my workout. Nice thing he's cooperating, too, and I know. wiggling out of that. Leading the news, this story proves whiskey really is the gift that keeps on giving. A son who was gifted a bottle of 18-year-old McCallan every year of his birthday is now using the money from the whiskey to buy a house. <laughs> Pete Robson spent over $6,600 on 28 bottles of single malt for his son, Matthew. Matthew was born in 1992, so you do the math. After that, it paid off. He was given instructions not to open them, so now they are worth nearly $53,000, which is great in this case. You earn that much money and there's absolutely no hangover. Oh my God. With, with all of that <laughs> there food. you go. Yeah. Added benefit right, right. there. <laughs> Well, the baseball world is mourning the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 67. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, two teams that Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night.
Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead at today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bonner, live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is certainly no stranger to extradition battles, but this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years in prison on a combined 18 charges. Now, his defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and is essentially an attack on the free press, arguing that Mr. Assange is basically an investigative journalist and is owed First Amendment protections. Uh, but the U.S. government says he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Um, now, we're not ex necessarily expecting a speedy resolution to this. It'll take about four to five weeks to reach a verdict. Uh, and then his defense says that they plan to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. Uh, but there is still some time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that behind the scenes, the Trump administration has offered a pardon if he just simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very infamous 2016 Democratic National Committee email leaks. Now, of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right, Matt, thank you. In today's quick hits, Los Angeles outfielder Mike Trout made Major League history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan impatient for the Cybertruck release came up with his own version of the vehicle. It was created with parts of the Ford Raptor F-150, transformed into a gas-powered Cybertruck lookalike in eight months. This looks just like it. Wow. Brenda Deputy in Georgia found a goat in her patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight for a little bit, but... <laughs> eventually decided, yeah, okay, I'll get out of the car. Goat story ever. Greatest of all time story <laughs> ever. All right, well, Wall Street takes a breather after last week's massive tech sell-off. We've also got a major auto recall call to tell you about. Here with details and some big box office news, CNBC's Karen Cho. Karen, good morning. Corey and Francis, good morning to you. Yes, Korean manufacturers Hyundai and Kia have announced a recall of about 600,000 vehicles in the United States. It follows a fluid leak in the braking system that could cause the engines to catch fire. The vehicles included in the recall are Kia Optima, that's a mid-sized sedan, the Kia Sorento SUVs and the Hyundai Santa Fe, roughly from the years 2013 to 2015. Now, Hyundai has disclosed that there have been about 15 fires that it knows of, but no injuries reported. The recall started in October but users have been warned to park the cars outside until the cars are fixed. Now, to the latest at the box office, and Tenant is the first film to launch since the COVID-19 lockdowns. It's thought to have earned about $146.2 million at the global box office through to Sunday, about $20.2 million of that from the United States debut over the weekend. But it's not enough to break Labor Day records. And what we have seen, too, uncertainty around the future of the Christopher Nolan film and what it earns from here because of the lockdown still, about 65 to 70 70 percent of major multiplexes have reopened in the states but clearly markets in new york san francisco la are still shut so that's an issue mm -hmm. yeah that's a major hit for the numbers karen thank you Austrian athlete Yusef Koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record, spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice wearing nothing but his swim trunks. He stood for two hours, 30 minutes and 57 seconds in that cabinet filled with ice cubes, surpassing the previous record by over 20 minutes. Well, he said that he draws on positive emotions to fight through the freezing pain and have us some ice cream to celebrate after. There you go. All right, Janessa's back now. She's talking about snow. <laughs> Yeah, we have snow that's making its way into Denver three to five inches by tomorrow. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. 
Our first sneak peek for the movie Comeback Trail was released over the weekend. The film starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and other notable names in Hollywood is ske scheduled to hit theaters on November 13th. Well, it took several months longer than usual, but NBC's American Ninja Warrior finally navigated all the hurdles created by COVID-19 and put together a new season. It starts tonight. NBC's Matt Barger has a preview. As the ninja who designs obstacles, crush them tonight. For a show all about overcoming obstacles, American Ninja Warrior faced its toughest one with COVID-19. I assumed the worst that this season wasn't going to happen. But by mid-July, much like the NBA and NHL, Ninja Warrior created its own competition bubble in St. Louis's dome at America Center. Even though it's an 80,000 seat dome, the seats were empty. Competitors, cast and crew all had to adhere to testing and safety protocols. After every run, they had to clean the course. Any contact surface had to be wiped down. And here we go, Flip Rodriguez. That meant only 50 veteran ninjas taking part, but they each chose two rookie ninjas to bring along. Woo! Yeah, her fellow mom's showing support. Jody Avila brought his wife, Pauline, an ICU nurse on the front lines of the pandemic. After the last few months that we've been through, hitting a buzzer this year for my family, especially with my wife watching on the sidelines, would be amazing. The ninjas also got a boost from virtual supporters in taking on a new array of obstacles. Oh, just missed it. We saw them moving faster than we normally do. We saw them doing things that, I mean, heck, we, I think we saw a man fly. The fastest to reach and conquer the bubble's power tower at season's end wins $100,000. It felt as energetic as anything we've ever done because every ninja and every one of us knew how lucky we were to be doing this. A ninja season like no other. Mark Barker, NBC News. I'm glad to see more and more things coming back. Yes. Yeah, one company rolling out a new holiday treat. Archie McPhee is rolling out ketchup flavored candy canes for condiment lovers to get into the holiday spirit. The brand also has some exotically festive candy canes in, in flavors like mac and cheese, mm -hmm. also kale. <laughs> the six pack of ketchup canes will run you a little over five bucks. Um, yeah, a good gag well, gift maybe? Yeah, I guess so, you know, might as well look ahead to the holiday exactly. season. Exactly. Right <laughs>
The weather is expected to cool down later this week. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Well, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part as in, quote, action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerous or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. A peaceful night of protests in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that I've taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tra tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. The city will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's attorney general is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours, it's pain, it's number pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. The investigation into his shooting is ongoing. In Portland, one demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you could see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man, who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th straight night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. More college campuses are cracking down on social distancing rule violations. Northeastern says it has dismissed 11 students who gathered at a hotel that's being used as a dorm. And the $36,000 tuition will not be refunded. NYU revealed that it has suspended more than 20 students and warned the rest to avoid parties and bars. According to NBC News data, 190,000 lives have been lost in the U.S. due to COVID-19, making the race to find an effective vaccine even more urgent. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. Could it be an October surprise? The head of vaccine maker Pfizer says results could be in by the end of next month. But that doesn't mean the vaccine will be ready for the general public. We will not cut corners. Our phase three study will be the only one that will allow us to say if we have an effective and safe vaccine. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he has confidence in the integrity of FDA scientists and timing of results from phase three trials will depend on real world conditions. If you have the trial being taken place in an area that happens to have a lot of infections, you may get an answer sooner than you would have projected because the answer is event driven. In other words, trials in hot spots may yield quicker results. Amendments aren't enough. But with some Americans resisting even decades old vaccines, it's not clear how quickly the public would embrace a brand new drug. 
An NBC News SurveyMonkey poll found just 44 percent of Americans who said they would get the vaccine, with 22 percent saying they would not, and 32 percent weren't sure. Drug manufacturers vowed politics would not influence the vaccine effort. But the CDC has told state governors to prepare to distribute millions of vaccine doses as soon as November 1st. I don't need to have them announce on November 4th, ladies and gentlemen, we've found the vaccine. It's perfect. Watching what happened with hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma, one worries that there would be political influence on the release of this vaccine. The chief scientific advisor to the Trump administration's vaccine effort said he would resign if there's undue interference in this process. But even with fast-tracked approval, experts say it's unlikely more than a small percentage of Americans could be vaccinated before 2021, leaving more months of uncertainty and suffering. And our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. There is cause for concern in Europe this morning as several countries are seeing an uptick in COVID-19 cases. Infection rates are on the rise in France and Britain, with many of the new cases in younger people. The resurgence in the new number of cases comes as many regions seek to reopen their economies. Here's NBC's Matt Bradley. We are seeing a troubling rise in cases, not just here in France, but all throughout Europe. And the reason why is varied. What we are seeing is that after this quite relaxed summer, a lot of young Parisians, a lot of young French people went out and mixed with each other. And we're seeing a lot of younger people getting this disease. Also here in Paris and throughout France, they're allowing for people to get tested for free. So there have been lines outside of testing centers with people who are trying to get tested. This is all increasing the percentage of people who have this disease. What is not following on is the number of people who are dying, and the number of people who are hospitalized. The health system here is still in pretty good shape, even though there has been a surge, and that's because more and more young people are the ones who are infected. They're not dying at the same rate, and they're not having to be put in ICUs. This is a different kind of second wave, and a lot of policymakers here are wondering whether it'd be worth it to actually implement new confinement measures to try to meet this second wave, or whether or not they can just withstand this new wave. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Paris. Climate activists gathered in the Swiss Alps to protest and mourn receding glaciers. A black and white photograph shot in 1891 dramatically illustrates the shrinking of Switzerland's Trient Glacier. Over 200 activists rallied on the foot of the glacier to draw attention to the impact of climate change and urge authorities to take action. Their protest comes a day before the Swiss Parliament begins debating new legislation on reducing CO2 emissions. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with a check of our weather. And it, it seemed like, at least on the East Coast, a nice uh, oh. weekend. Yeah, absolutely beautiful weekend, abundance of sunshine, temperatures pretty comfortable, but on the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story. For the next 24 hours, the fire danger really going to be heightened across Salt Lake City all the way into San Diego, where our temperatures continue to be well above average, hitting 121 in parts of Southern California. Today, we'll continue to be in the triple digits. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Colorado Springs, 92 for today, but you'll be below the freezing mark by tomorrow afternoon across the deep south, watching a few storms. And ladies, I have snow. It's in the forecast. All that's what? coming up. I know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but we're talking about snow. It's now. too soon. Yeah, no, it's 2020. <laughs> yeah. We shouldn't be too surprised. Right. Vanessa, thank you. Austrian athlete Josef Koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record and spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice. Koberl stood for two hours, 30 minutes and 57 seconds in a cabinet filled with 440 pounds of ice cubes wearing nothing but swim trunks. Well, after breaking that teeth chattering record by over 20 minutes, the athletes celebrated with all things an ice cream cone <laughs> right there and hopefully a long, long time in a sauna. Yes, a nice warm bath after that. 
leading the news, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead to today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Corey. Well, Mr. Assange, of course, is no stranger to extradition requests, but uh, this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on combined 18 charges. Now, the defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and that really Mr. Assange is an investigative journalist and so he's due First Amendment protections. Now, of course, the United States government says that he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. We're not necessarily expecting any kind of swift resolution to these hearings that are beginning today. Uh, it'll take about a month, and then the uh, defense says it'll appeal any kind of negative outcome. But there is still time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in this election. Uh, he has alleged that the Trump administration has behind the scenes uh, offered a pardon if he just says that Russia had nothing to do with those very infamous 2016 DNC email leaks. But of course, the White House has denied this. Back to you, Corey. Matt, thank you very much. All I have for you is a word. Tenet. It'll open the right doors. The Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet debuted with $20.2 million in the U.S. and it neared $150 million globally. Astounding numbers considering its release during COVID pandemic. And while many things have been put on hold due to the coronavirus, one family in Tennessee decided it was the right time to open their home and their hearts to a very special young boy. Forrest Sanders from our affiliate at WSMV reports. Please be a quarterback. Marcus Mariota. You know, Andrew and Jock didn't become best friends the first day they met. Or really the second. Andrew, who should our quarterback be? But the third day, they began to realize. We had like a lot of stuff in common. Games, Minecraft. And that's mm -hmm. not all. I don't want to say it. Say what? Pop-Tarts. They love Pop-Tarts. We need more Pop-Tarts. We do. Around the back cave, it's video games. Break for Pop-Tarts. Repeat. Pop tart and they eat tart all day if you let them all day. Pop tart. Keeping up with the appetite of two preteen boys is Jacques' mom and dad, Kevin and Dominique Gill. As the years went on, they, they got pretty close. It's always good to see that bond that they grew. But the truth is, this friendship isn't as simple as just video games and pop tarts. The best. Andrew has lived in foster care about half his life. And more than 8,000 children are in that foster system in Tennessee, waiting for a forever home. They really want that stability in their lives. Molly Parker's with Youth Villages. She tells us the pandemic is slowing the calls coming in for possible homes. And a lot of families were unsure if they wanted to open their homes to a placement just because they didn't really know what the future held. But to that, the Gills want to tell you something. You see, a few years ago, they became Andrew's foster family but he eventually left here. Oh man, I didn't care. That's not true. I'm just playing with you. Uh, I missed him. Um, just really love him. And so comes this. Molly and Andrew on a walk through the park. Andrew realizes. Hello? What's happening? I just turned around the corner and saw everybody. It's a celebration, y'all! Pipe it up! Woo! The Gills ask Andrew if he'll become a forever part of their family. They asked, will you? And I said, yeah. Fighting, please, work. Before I scream, I will scream. When we see them together, we're glad we decided to adopt Andrew. And now, Jock and Andrew share the back cake. Two screens for video games for each. Never too far from never ending Pop-Tarts. This is my brother, Jacques. This is my brother, Andrew. 
And our thanks to Forrest Sanders for that report. Pop-Tarts and video games are just <laughs> the start of it for yes. those two brothers from here on out. Such a great story. So Best sweet. one. Happy Labor Day, everyone. This is not a game for Colorado to Wyoming. You will see your first official snowfall for tomorrow afternoon, where you could see three to five inches. You're watching early today. The last charge by Dylan. He comes up a four. Harvick's still going to win. Harvick wins the Southern 500. Appreciating the fans. It was a nail biter in Darlington at NASCAR's Southern 500, but Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late into the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position as NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place, Denny Hamlin. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books. With the Game 2 win over the Rockets, LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former teammate Ray Allen for second most playoff threes ever. Well, a Michigan boy has found his perfect match. The pair was both born with cleft lips, and that's created an instant bond. Rachel Sweet from NBC affiliate WILX has this heartwarming story of a boy and his dog. Pure happiness at the Jackson County Animal Shelter. Two-year-old Bentley Boyers got to bring his new puppy home. Last week, Bentley's dad, Brandon, came to the animal shelter to look at two chickens he was thinking to adopt when a pooch caught his eye, a puppy with a cleft lip. He FaceTimed, he goes, I think this one has a cleft lip. And I said, get her. We need her. Bentley was born with a cleft lip. His mom said he had a tough start in life where it was a struggle to get him to eat. We had to sit him up and feed him and hold his lip together in order for him to eat. So it was a process. Since day one, he's been a happy baby. Ashley says his cleft lip doesn't make him any different. The family feels finding the puppy will show Bentley he isn't alone. To see him have something in common with the puppy means a lot because he can grow up and understand that him and his puppy have both had something that they can share in common. The animal shelter says they don't normally see puppies with cleft palates. Before her adoption, they had her for a week and don't see that she will have any problems in the future. Her disability is really not holding her back. Um, you know, and as she grows, they'll be able to see more if there's anything changing that has to do with that, but she's really doing well. She might look a little bit different than a normal dog would, but it's not slowing her down at all. At just two months and two years, the imperfect super duo find a perfect match. This is my puppy. Oh, our thanks to Rachel Sweet for that report. And man, they are meant to be together. And I That's cannot right. get over how much he's cuddling his new puppy. <laughs> so sweet. Sweetest thing. Best friends. Oh, just love it. And well, especially these days, you know, for any family, any bright spot. That's I'll take right. It. Let's bring in more furry friends to our family. On this Labor Day, firefighters in California are working overtime as multiple wildfires burn out of control, some 0% contained. One reportedly started by pyrotechnics from a baby gender reveal. It was a weekend of protests in Rochester where the mayor and police chief were called upon to resign in the wake of the death of Daniel Prude. Then to a chaotic scene in Portland where a man was lit on fire after the Molotov cocktail being hurled at police ignited around him. Number one is out, not from losing a match, but tossed for losing his temper and accidentally hitting a line judge. And a scary situation aboard a passenger jet is caught on camera. It's Labor Day, Monday, September 7th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're starting your holiday with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news from California where multiple counties are under a state of emergency. More than 200 people were trapped in the mountains after the Creek Fire exploded to more than 45,000 acres. You can see the flames circling the group there. The fire department said the campers did what they could to get to safety, which resulted in some broken bones and other injuries. The National Guard airlifted the group to safety. The Fresno Bee reports that at least six burn victims were admitted to a medical center.
There are more than 20 active fires burning across California right now. Near San Bernardino, the El Dorado fire has spread to more than 7,000 acres since Saturday morning. Officials now say it was caused by a smoke-generating device that was used during a gender reveal party. As hundreds of firefighters work to try to contain the flames, they're also battling record high temperatures into the triple digits. The state's largest utility is warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday. Some Trump support supporters rocked the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Travis in a boat parade, and they got a little too close to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's <coughs> polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CB CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked, would you make would Donald Trump make you feel safe? 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by one percent. But when it comes to his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time, sharing a powerful message from his hospital bed. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man. Blake also says he is focused not just on his recovery, but his children. He was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times. In Rochester, a peaceful night of protests. 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. During a press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren announced more police reform, including separating the family crisis intervention team from the police department. Our Kathy Park has more. Corey Francis, good morning to you. So after days of unrest here in Rochester, we heard from the police chief, the mayor, as well as a local pastor, and they all have a unified message. They are calling for calm. They have asked church elders in the community to serve as buffers between police and protesters because over the last few nights we have seen the tension just growing. Meanwhile, as far as the investigation goes, all officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay. The attorney general's office is in charge of leading the investigation, but they have asked a grand jury to be a part of this case as well. The police chief was asked about potential agitators in the group, and he said that there have been some arrests from the past several nights, people coming as far away as Alaska, even Massachusetts. So the tension is still very high in Rochester, but once again, city officials are calling for calm. Back to you. All right, Kathy, thank you. 
In Portland, a demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you can see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man. He was later taken to the hospital. This is 100th straight night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers and over 50 people were arrested. The U.S. versus Julian Assange showdown is set to resume today. The 49-year-old WikiLeaks founder is scheduled to appear in a London court for an extradition hearing that was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic. American prosecutors have indicted Assange on 18 espionage and com computer misuse charges. And they are attempting to extradite him for allegedly publishing secret U.S. military documents in relation to Chelsea Manning. For more, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is no stranger to battling extradition attempts. He's faced several over the past few years, uh, but this is really the big one. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on those combined 18 charges. Um, but the defense says that this is all politically motivated and argue that it's really an attack on press freedoms, uh, saying that he's basically an investigative journalist. Uh, but the United States government says that he's really just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Now, we're not really expecting necessarily a speedy resolution to these hearings. They're supposed to take about four to eight weeks. And then the defense says that it's going to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. But there's still some time left for Mr. Assange to become some kind of factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, uh, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that the Trump administration behind the scenes has offered him a pardon if he simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very controversial 2016 leaks of Democratic National Committee emails. But of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right. Matt, thank you. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down in his first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Now he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. A following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. The baseball world mourns the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played for 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and the 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 1967. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, the two teams Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night. Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. All right, we want to turn now to your holiday forecast. Let's uh, bring in NBC's Janessa Webb. And Janessa, you got quite a bit to uh, talk about for the forecast today. Yeah, the East Coast, lovely conditions. It's going to be a wonderful Labor Day. We're seeing fall-like temperatures, but the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story with this heightened fire danger that's across Salt Lake City all the way into Southern California. At least one more day of temperatures just well above average. We're seeing temperatures at least uh, 15 to 30 degrees above average this afternoon. Las Vegas, uh, the feel-like temperature is going to be 112 this afternoon, going to be breaking records all the way into areas of the southwest. It does start to be broken down for the central plains and the high plains by tomorrow. Look at Salt Lake City, a high of 62. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Billings, a high of 48 this afternoon, compared to 106 degrees across Tucson, even Corpus Christi into the deep south. We're still in the lower 90s. And ladies, you know, I get excited talking about snow. We'll have that <laughs> forecast coming up. <laughs> Sounds like a joke, but hey, it's 2020. 
That's anything what it goes. is. Anything goes. We are right. not excited. <laughs> In today's quick hits, Los Angeles uh, outfielder Mike Trout made Major League history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan impatient for the Cybertruck made his own version. It was created with parts of the Ford F-150 and he did it in eight months. A deputy in Georgia found a goat in her patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver <laughs> civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight but eventually got out. We're back with a consumer alert for you this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under brand names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after takeoff, he saw flames shooting from the right engine and he heard loud banging noises. You can see it there in the video. This is a 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries, but that happened 20 minutes after he first saw that video. That had to be the most terrifying 20 Absolutely. minutes for passenger. Kiss the ground the second wow. you get down. Wow. Uh, speeding tickets are up in some states despite state lockdowns due to the pandemic. Iowa State Patrol says they recorded a 101 percent increase from January through August in tickets for speeds exceeding 100 miles an hour. That is compared to over four years. In California, Highway Patrol officers say they issued more than 15,000 tickets from mid-March through August for speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour. That is also a 100 percent increase that same time a year ago. In Ohio, state troopers have also seen a 61 percent increase in speeding tickets in utah it was a 23 percent jump the protests in portland oregon began with the death of george floyd and now more than 100 days later they show no signs of stopping but has the message of racial injustice and police brutality been hijacked by those who want to stir up trouble and cause violence tim gordon from our portland affiliate kgw has the story the protests began in late May and quickly swelled, and with that came the destruction and the violence, including tear gas and other crowd control methods from Portland police and federal officers. We had a quiet visit about it all outside the Justice Center with Seneca Kaysen. Anybody out there frustrated? Kaysen has been a leader of nonviolent protests in Portland. He says the social justice message has been diffused by other opposing interests. Black lives are in the middle of all these agendas. Uh, the rocks are being thrown. Obviously, they got to cross the middle before they can get to the other side. This protest leader says some of the current distraction is coming from people who may be well-meaning but need to take a breath. For 100 days now, white people have gone through 500 years of education and haven't decompressed. That's what, that's what you see, the fireballs and all these different things. I'm not giving them an excuse, but I'm telling you, if you go deep down in the ocean and come back up too fast, you will die. Kaysen continues to speak out. He's got a new bullhorn after his first one was stolen. His message with this one won't change. I love people. I love humans. I know what the issue is. It's not Black Lives Matter. It's right and wrong. You know, and that's the true agenda that's been detached from, the, that we've been severed from. And uh, that's the that's the true narrative that's that's been hijacked. And that's the message he hopes others will hear and share in the next 100 days. It's time for the people with nothing to lose to step aside a little bit and let the people stand. They got things to lose. I have three sons. I'm here fighting for them. We have to stand. We all have to stand. I'm calling everybody that have something to lose and know what the difference between right and wrong is just to stand, not to not to fight, not to stand. And thanks to Tim Gordon for that report. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. 
The official trailer for the movie, The Comeback Trail, was released over the weekend. The film, starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and plenty of other notable names in Hollywood, is scheduled to hit theaters November 13th. Well, they're promising box office debut this holiday weekend despite the pandemic. The Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet opened with $20.2 million in the U.S. and it neared $150 million globally. Right now, Tenet is playing in 2,800 North American locations. That's about three quarters of what most major releases typically launch in. And those theaters are operating at about 50% capacity. Pretty good. Well, after losing his battle to COVID-19, the theater community made an emotional, uh, emotional, uh, yeah, outpouring. For, yes, for that's Cordero. the word, yeah. memorial to yes. Nick Cordero. Take a listen. One of the great ones was the There's song the that they sang there. That was the last song that he performed on Broadway. It was touching. It was emotional. It was a difficult summer for the Broadway community. Yeah, even more so and continuing throughout the rest of the year. And hopefully, fingers crossed that they'll open next. Happy Labor Day, everyone. Who's ready for some snow? If you're across Wyoming to Colorado, you are going to see your first official snowfall by tomorrow morning into your afternoon. Look at a total accumulation. Could see about four to five inches. This does start off kind of that rain and snow mixture, but for the Denver area, I think you could see about two inches by tomorrow morning. You're watching early today. We'll be right back. As this Labor Day weekend continues, there are heightened concerns of a possible surge in coronavirus cases, with the U.S. surpassing 190,000 deaths. In New Jersey, still one of the top 10 states for cases of the virus, crowds gathered this holiday weekend at the Jersey Shore's beaches and boardwalks, an area badly impacted by the economic crisis created by the pandemic. NBC's Amanda Golden reports from Seaside Heights, New Jersey. Hey, Corey and Francis, we're here in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore at a major beach destination for families and folks coming out for the holiday weekend, for Labor Day weekend. We've been seeing a steady stream of people coming here for the beaches and the boardwalks. Not a ton of social distancing, not a lot of mask wearing, but there are some measures in place for the beaches here to keep people spread out when they hit a capacity at a certain beach entrance. They'll close down that entrance and have other people go along to another access point. But for the businesses here, this is a huge beachfront community. The seasonal businesses here have taken such a hit during the COVID summer season. They're hoping to keep that going and actually elongate the summer in part by keeping the beaches open. This town decided they're going to have the beaches stay open through the month of September, potentially longer if the weather cooperates and there's interest. And the businesses here, especially restaurants, are really looking forward to trying to draw in additional revenue, trying to offset some of those losses in profit. And I spoke with the mayor of this town as well as some of those businesses. Take a listen to what they told me. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffered like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. It started off very confusing budgetarily for the community. We need this weekend. We need every other weekend in September. I mean, there's no way that we can possibly do what we need to do by being closed as long as we were and then open up as late as we did. We've been through Hurricane Sandy, we've been through fires, so we're going to get through this and come out even stronger on the other side. So as you heard, they're really trying to make up for the losses that were experienced here over the summer, see if they can bring in some of that revenue and profit to help offset what they experienced. And keep in mind, this is the first major weekend that we've seen where there's at least 25% indoor capacity for restaurants. Whether that'll make a difference for the beachside community here, most businesses tell me it doesn't really affect them. Most of their seating was outdoors to begin with. But with the weather potentially turning, it at least could create additional opportunity to bring in some of that revenue. Corey and Francis? All right, Amanda, thank you. And I know there was concern about people coming back. It sounds like they have. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to be uh, holding our breath for the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks when we find out if those numbers surge. Sorry. All right, celebrating birthdays on this Labor Day. Actor and SNL alum Leslie Jones is 53. Corbin Burns turned 66 today. Rock star and pretenders vocalist Chrissy Hind is 69. And I Will Survive singer-songwriter legend Gloria Gaynor hits double sevens.
record heat wave adds fuel to the deadly California wildfires. Hundreds rescued by helicopter, but is any relief in sight? Number one is out, not from losing a match, but tossed for losing his temper and accidentally hitting a line judge. As the pandemic continues to impact almost everyone, one area that's taken a tough turn is adoption. And what happens to kids who need a forever family? We may be in the last day of the summer season, but are you tough enough to take on the record for being buried in ice? Plus, the Michigan boy and his new puppy share a whole lot more than just friendship. It's Labor Day. Early today starts right now. Good morning on this Monday. I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with the dangerous wildfires that are raging across California. The El Dorado fire has burned more than 7,000 acres in San Bernardino County. Officials say this fire began Saturday morning and was caused by a smoke generating device that we use for a gender reveal party. Temperatures in California climbed to record highs and authorities say a woman died while hiking in the heat wave. And this video shows hikers escaping the fast-moving creek fire. They made it to safety, but there were many campers who had to be rescued. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. In California, fires are burning. Residents are fleeing. Hey, that fire uh, grew so quickly, so fast, it trapped people at uh, Mammoth Pools Reservoir up in the mountains. The creek fire in central California grew so rapidly, it trapped some 200 campers. The National Guard airlifted them to safety. When they became trapped, they were doing what they could to uh, rescue themselves and make themselves safe, um, some of which resulted in injuries, including broken bones, lacerations, scrapes, bruises, those kind of things. State officials say there are more than 20 active fires across the state. More than 900 wildfires have erupted in the state since the middle of August. The flames feeding on the dry landscape and intense heat, temperatures surpassing triple digits in some parts of the state. California's largest utility warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday because the heat and high winds could create even more fire danger. If there is good news, the weather is expected to cool down later this week. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Well, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part as in, quote, action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerous or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. A peaceful night of protests in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that I've taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. The city will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's attorney general is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours, it's pain, it's number pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. 
the investigation into his shooting is ongoing. In Portland, one demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you could see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th Street night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. More college campuses are cracking down on social distancing rule violations. Northeastern says it has dismissed 11 students who gathered at a hotel that's being used as a dorm. And the $36,000 tuition will not be refunded. NYU revealed that it has suspended more than 20 students and warned the rest to avoid parties and bars. According to NBC News data, 190,000 lives have been lost in the U.S. due to COVID-19, making the race to find an effective vaccine even more urgent. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. Could it be an October surprise? The head of vaccine maker Pfizer says results could be in by the end of next month. But that doesn't mean the vaccine will be ready for the general public. We will not cut corners. Our phase three study will be the only one that will allow us to say if we have an effective and safe vaccine. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he has confidence in the integrity of FDA scientists and timing of results from phase three trials will depend on real world conditions. If you have the trial being taken place in an area that happens to have a lot of infections, you may get an answer sooner than you would have projected because the answer is event driven. In other words, trials in hot spots may yield quicker results. Amendments aren't enough. But with some Americans resisting even decades old vaccines, it's not clear how quickly the public would embrace a brand new drug. An NBC News survey monkey poll found just 44 percent of Americans who said they would get the vaccine, with 22 percent saying they would not, and 32 percent weren't sure. Drug manufacturers vowed politics would not influence the vaccine effort, but the CDC has told state governors to prepare to distribute millions of vaccine doses as soon as November 1st. I don't need to have them announce on November 4th, ladies and gentlemen, we've found the vaccine. It's perfect. Watching what happened with hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma, one worries that there would be political influence on the release of this vaccine. The chief scientific advisor to the Trump administration's vaccine effort said he would resign if there's undue interference in this process. But even with fast-tracked approval, experts say it's unlikely more than a small percentage of Americans could be vaccinated before 2021, leaving more months of uncertainty and suffering. And our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. There is cause for concern in Europe this morning as several countries are seeing an uptick in COVID-19 cases. Infection rates are on the rise in France and Britain with many of the new cases in younger people. The resurgence in the new number of cases comes as many regions seek to reopen their economies. Here's NBC's Matt Bradley. We are seeing a troubling rise in cases, not just here in France, but all throughout Europe. And the reason why is varied. What we are seeing is that after this quite relaxed summer, a lot of young Parisians, a lot of young French people went out and mixed with each other. And we're seeing a lot of younger people getting this disease. Also here in Paris and throughout France, they're allowing for people to get tested for free. So there have been lines outside of testing centers with people who are trying to get tested. This is all increasing the percentage of people who have this disease. What is not following on is the number of people who are dying, and the number of people who are hospitalized. The health system here is still in pretty good shape, even though there has been a surge, and that's because more and more young people are the ones who are infected. They're not dying at the same rate, and they're not having to be put in ICUs. This is a different kind of second wave, and a lot of policymakers here are wondering whether it'd be worth it to actually implement new confinement measures to try to meet this second wave, or whether or not they can just withstand this new wave. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Paris. Climate activists gathered in the Swiss Alps to protest and mourn receding glaciers. A black and white photograph shot in 1891 dramatically illustrates the shrinking of Switzerland's Trient Glacier. Over 200 activists rallied on the foot of the glacier to draw attention to the impact of climate change and urge authorities to take action. 
Their protest comes a day before the Swiss Parliament begins debating new legislation on reducing CO2 emissions. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with a check of our weather. And it, it seemed like, at least on the East Coast, a nice uh, oh. weekend. Yeah, absolutely beautiful weekend, abundance of sunshine, temperatures pretty comfortable, but on the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story. For the next 24 hours, the fire danger really going to be heightened across Salt Lake City all the way into San Diego, where our temperatures continue to be well above average, hitting 121 in parts of Southern California. Today, we'll continue to be in the triple digits. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Colorado Springs, 92 for today, but you'll be below the freezing mark by tomorrow afternoon across the deep south, watching a few storms. And ladies, I have snow. It's in the forecast. All that's what? coming up. I know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but we're talking about snow. It's now. too soon. No, no, it's 2020. Yeah. We shouldn't be too surprised. Sure. Right? Janessa, thank you. Austrian athlete Josef Koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record and spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice. Koberl stood for two hours, 30 minutes and 57 seconds in a cabinet filled with 440 pounds of ice cubes wearing nothing but swim trunks. Well, after breaking that teeth chattering record by over 20 minutes, the athlete celebrated with all things an ice cream cone <laughs> right there and hopefully a long, long time in a sauna. Yes, a nice warm bath after that. Leading the news, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead to today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Corey. Well, Mr. Assange, of course, is no stranger to extradition requests, but this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on a combined 18 charges. Now, the defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and that really Mr. Assange is an investigative journalist and so he's due First Amendment protections. Now, of course, the United States government says that he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. We're not necessarily expecting any kind of swift resolution to these hearings that are beginning today. Uh, it'll take about a month, and then the uh, defense says that it'll appeal any kind of negative outcome. But there is still time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in this election. Uh, he has alleged that the Trump administration has behind the scenes uh, offered a pardon if he just says that Russia had nothing to do with those very infamous 2016 DNC email leaks. But of course, the White House has denied this. Back to you, Corey. Matt, thank you very much. All I have for you is a word. Tenet. It'll open the right doors. The Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet debuted with $20.2 million in the U.S. and it neared $150 million globally. Astounding numbers considering its release during COVID pandemic. And while many things have been put on hold due to the coronavirus, one family in Tennessee decided it was the right time to open their home and their hearts to a very special young boy. Forrest Sanders from our affiliate at WSMV reports. Please be a quarterback. Marcus Mariota. You know, Andrew and Jock didn't become best friends the first day they met. Or really the second. Andrew, who should our quarterback be? But the third day, they began to realize. We had like a lot of stuff in common. Games, Minecraft. And that's mm. not all. I don't want to say it. Say what? Pop-Tarts. They love Pop-Tarts. We need more Pop-Tarts. We do. Around the back cave, it's video games. Break for Pop-Tarts. Repeat. Pop tart and they eat tart all day if you let them all day. Pop tart. Keeping up with the appetite of two preteen boys is Jacques' mom and dad, Kevin and Dominique Gill. As the years went on, they, they got pretty close. It's always good to see that bond that they grew. But the truth is, this friendship isn't as simple as just video games and Pop Tarts. Your best. Andrew 
has lived in foster care about half his life. And more than 8,000 children are in that foster system in Tennessee, waiting for a forever home. They really want that stability in their lives. Molly Parker's with Youth Villages. She tells us the pandemic is slowing the calls coming in for possible homes. And a lot of families were unsure if they wanted to open their homes to a placement just because they didn't really know what the future held. But to that, the Gills want to tell you something. You see, a few years ago, they became Andrew's foster family, but he eventually left here. Oh well, man, I didn't care. That's not true. I'm just playing with you. Uh, I missed them. Just really love them. And so comes this. Molly and Andrew on a walk through the park. Andrew realizes. Hello? What's happening? I just turned around the corner and saw everybody. It's a celebration, y'all! Pipe it up! The Gills ask Andrew if he'll become a forever part of their family. They asked, will you? And I said, yeah. Button, please work. Before I scream, I will scream. When we see them together, we're glad we decided to adopt Andrew. And now, Jock and Andrew share the back cave. Two screens for video games for each. Never too far from never ending Pop Tarts. This is my brother, Jacquez. This is my brother, Andrew. And our thanks to Forrest Sanders for that report. Pop Tarts and video games are just <laughs> the start of it for those two brothers from here on out. Such a great story. So Best sweet. one. Happy Labor Day, everyone. This is not a game for Colorado to Wyoming. You will see your first official snowfall for tomorrow afternoon, where you could see three to five inches. You're watching early today. The last charge by Dylan. He comes up a four. Harvick's still going to win. Harvick wins the Southern 500. Appreciating the fans. It was a nail biter in Darlington at NASCAR Southern 500, but Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late into the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position as NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place, Denny Hamlin. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books. With the Game 2 win over the Rockets, LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former teammate Ray Allen for second most playoff threes ever. Well, a Michigan boy has found his perfect match. The pair was both born with cleft lips, and that's created an instant bond. Rachel Sweet from NBC affiliate WILX has this heartwarming story of a boy and his dog. Pure happiness at the Jackson County Animal Shelter. Two-year-old Bentley Boyers got to bring his new puppy home. Last week, Bentley's dad, Brandon, came to the animal shelter to look at two chickens he was thinking to adopt when a pooch caught his eye, a puppy with a cleft lip. He FaceTimed, he goes, I think this one has a cleft lip. And I said, get her. We need her. Bentley was born with a cleft lip. His mom said he had a tough start in life where it was a struggle to get him to eat. We had to sit him up and feed him and hold his lip together in order for him to eat. So it was a process. Since day one, he's been a happy baby. Ashley says his cleft lip doesn't make him any different. The family feels finding the puppy will show Bentley he isn't alone. To see him have something in common with the puppy means a lot because he can grow up and understand that him and his puppy have both had something that they can share in common. The animal shelter says they don't normally see puppies with cleft palates. Before her adoption, they had her for a week and don't see that she will have any problems in the future. Her disability is really not holding her back. Um, you know, and as she grows, they'll be able to see more if there's anything changing that has to do with that, but she's really doing well. She might look a little bit different than a normal dog would, but it's not slowing her down at all. At just two months and two years, the imperfect super duo find a perfect match. This is my puppy. Oh, our thanks to Rachel Sweet for that report. And man, they are meant to be together. And I That's cannot right. get over how much he's cuddling his new puppy. <laughs> so pet. sweet. Sweetest thing.
Best friends. Oh, just love it. And well, especially these days, you know, for any family, any bright spot. That's I'll take right. It. Let's bring in more furry friends to our family. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. On this Labor Day, firefighters in California are working overtime as multiple firefight wildfires burn out of control, some 0% contained. One reportedly started by pyrotechnics from a baby gender reveal. It was a weekend of protests in Rochester where the mayor and police chief were called upon to resign in the wake of the death of Daniel Prude. And then to a chaotic scene in Portland where a man was lit on fire after the Molotov cocktail being hurled at police ignited around him. Number one is out, not from losing a match, but tossed for losing his temper and accidentally hitting a line judge. And a scary situation aboard a passenger jet is caught on camera. It's Labor Day Monday, September 7th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're starting your holiday with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news from California where multiple counties are under a state of emergency. More than 200 people were trapped in the mountains after the Creek Fire exploded to more than 45,000 acres. You can see the flames circling the group there. The fire department said the campers did what they could to get to safety, which resulted in some broken bones and other injuries. The National Guard airlifted the group to safety. The Fresno Bee reports that at least six burn victims were admitted to a medical center. 
There are more than 20 active fires burning across California right now. Near San Bernardino, the El Dorado fire has spread to more than 7,000 acres since Saturday morning. Officials now say it was caused by a smoke generating device that was used during a gender reveal party. As hundreds of firefighters work to try to contain the flames, they're also battling record high temperatures into the triple digits. The state's largest utility is warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday. Some Trump support supporters rocked the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Travis in a boat parade, and they got a little too close to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's <coughs> polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CB CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked, would you make would Donald Trump make you feel safe? 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by one percent. But when it comes to his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time, sharing a powerful message from his hospital bed. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man. Blake also says he is focused not just on his recovery, but his children. He was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times. In Rochester, a peaceful night of protests. 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. During a press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren announced more police reform, including separating the family crisis intervention team from the police department. Our Kathy Park has more. Corey Francis, good morning to you. So after days of unrest here in Rochester, we heard from the police chief, the mayor, as well as a local pastor, and they all have a unified message. They are calling for calm. They have asked church elders in the community to serve as buffers between police and protesters because over the last few nights we have seen the tension just growing. Meanwhile, as far as the investigation goes, all officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay. The attorney general's office is in charge of leading the investigation, but they have asked a grand jury to be a part of this case as well. The police chief was asked about potential agitators in the group, and he said that there have been some arrests from the past several nights, people coming as far away as Alaska, even Massachusetts. So the tension is still very high in Rochester, but once again, city officials are calling for calm. Back to you. All right, Kathy, thank you. 
In Portland, a demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you can see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man. He was later taken to the hospital. This is 100th straight night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers and over 50 people were arrested. The U.S. versus Julian Assange showdown is set to resume today. The 49-year-old WikiLeaks founder is scheduled to appear in a London court for an extradition hearing that was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic. American prosecutors have indicted Assange on 18 espionage and com computer misuse charges. And they are attempting to extradite him for allegedly publishing secret U.S. military documents in relation to Chelsea Manning. For more, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is no stranger to battling extradition attempts. He's faced several over the past few years, uh, but this is really the big one. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on those combined 18 charges. Um, but the defense says that this is all politically motivated and argue that it's really an attack on press freedoms, uh, saying that he's basically an investigative journalist. Uh, but the United States government says that he's really just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Now, we're not really expecting necessarily a speedy resolution to these hearings. They're supposed to take about four to eight weeks. And then the defense says that it's going to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. But there's still some time left for Mr. Assange to become some kind of factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, uh, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that the Trump administration behind the scenes has offered him a pardon if he simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very controversial 2016 leaks of Democratic National Committee emails. But of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right. Matt, thank you. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down in his first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Now he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. A following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerous dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. The baseball world mourns the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played for 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and the 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 1967. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, the two teams Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night. Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. All right, we're going to turn now to your holiday forecast. Let's uh, bring in NBC's Janessa Webb. And Janessa, you got quite a bit to uh, talk about for the forecast today. Yeah, the East Coast, lovely conditions. It's going to be a wonderful Labor Day. We're seeing fall-like temperatures, but the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story with this heightened fire danger that's across Salt Lake City all the way into Southern California. At least one more day of temperatures just well above average. We're seeing temperatures at least uh, 15 to 30 degrees above average this afternoon. Las Vegas, uh, the feel-like temperature is going to be 112 this afternoon, going to be breaking records all the way into areas of the southwest. It does start to be broken down for the central plains and the high plains by tomorrow. Look at Salt Lake City, a high of 62. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Billings, a high of 48 this afternoon, compared to 106 degrees across Tucson, even Corpus Christi into the deep south. We're still in the lower 90s. And ladies, you know, I get excited talking about snow. We'll have that <laughs> forecast coming up. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but hey, it's 2020. 
It's Anything what it goes. is. Anything goes. We are right. not excited. In today's quick hits, Los Angeles uh, outfielder Mike Trout made Major League history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan impatient for the Cybertruck made his own version. It was created with parts of the Ford F-150 and he did it in eight months. A deputy in Georgia found a goat in a patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver <laughs> civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight, but eventually got out. We're back with a consumer alert for you this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under brand names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after takeoff, he saw flames shooting from the right engine and he heard loud banging noises. You can see it there in the video. This is a 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries, but that happened 20 minutes after we first saw that video. That had to be the most terrifying 20 Absolutely. minutes for passenger. Kiss the ground the second wow. you get down. Wow. Uh, speeding tickets are up in some states despite state lockdowns due to the pandemic. Iowa State Patrol says they recorded a 101 percent increase from January through August in tickets for speeds exceeding 100 miles an hour. That is compared to over four years. In California, Highway Patrol officers say they issued more than 15,000 tickets from mid-March through August for speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour. That is also a 100 percent increase that same time a year ago. In Ohio, State troopers have also seen a 61% increase in speeding tickets. In Utah, it was a 23% jump. The protests in Portland, Oregon began with the death of George Floyd. And now, more than 100 days later, they show no signs of stopping. But has the message of racial injustice and police brutality been hijacked by those who want to stir up trouble and cause violence? Tim Gordon from our Portland affiliate KGW has the story. The protests began in late May and quickly swelled. And with that came the destruction and the violence, including tear gas and other crowd control methods from Portland police and federal officers. We had a quiet visit about it all outside the Justice Center with Seneca Kaysen. Anybody out there frustrated? Kaysen has been a leader of nonviolent protests in Portland. He says the social justice message has been diffused by other opposing interests. Black lives are in the middle of all these agendas. Uh, the rocks are being thrown. Obviously, they got to cross the middle before they can get to the other side. This protest leader says some of the current distraction is coming from people who may be well-meaning but need to take a breath. For 100 days now, white people have gone through 500 years of education and haven't decompressed. That's what, that's what you see, the fireballs and all these different things. I'm not giving them an excuse, but I'm telling you, if you go deep down in the ocean and come back up too fast, you will die. Kaysen continues to speak out. He's got a new bullhorn after his first one was stolen. His message with this one won't change. I love people. I love human. I know what the issue is. It's not Black Lives Matter. It's right and wrong. You know, and that's the true agenda that's been detached from, the, that we've been severed from. And uh, that's the that's the true narrative that's that's been hijacked. And that's the message he hopes others will hear and share in the next 100 days. It's time for the people with nothing to lose to step aside a little bit and let the people stand that got things to lose. I have three sons. I'm here fighting for them. We have to stand. We all have to stand. I'm calling everybody that have something to lose and know what the difference between right and wrong is just to stand, not the not the fight, not the stand. And thanks to Tim Gordon for that report. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. 
the official trailer for the movie The Comeback Trail was released over the weekend. The film starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and plenty of other notable names in Hollywood is scheduled to hit theaters November 13th. Why their promising box office debut this holiday weekend despite the pandemic, the Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet opened with $20.2 million in the U.S. and it neared $150 million globally. Right now, Tenet is playing in 2,800 North American locations. That's about three quarters of what most major releases typically launch in. And those theaters are operating at about 50% capacity. Pretty good. Well, after losing his battle to COVID-19, the theater community made an emotional, uh, emotional, uh, yeah, outpouring. For, yes, for that's Gordon. the word, yeah. memorial to yes. Nick Cordero. Take a listen. One of the great ones was the There's song the that they the sang there. That was the last song that he performed on Broadway. It was touching. It was emotional. It was a difficult summer for the Broadway community. Yeah, even more so and continuing throughout the rest of the year. And hopefully, fingers crossed that they'll open next. Happy Labor Day, everyone. Who's ready for some snow? If you're across Wyoming to Colorado, you are going to see your first official snowfall by tomorrow morning into your afternoon. Look at a total accumulation. Could see about four to five inches. This does start off kind of that rain and snow mixture, but for the Denver area, I think you could see about two inches by tomorrow morning. You're watching early today. We'll be right back. As this Labor Day weekend continues, there are heightened concerns of a possible surge in coronavirus cases, with the U.S. surpassing 190,000 deaths. In New Jersey, still one of the top 10 states for cases of the virus, crowds gathered this holiday weekend at the Jersey Shore's beaches and boardwalks, an area badly impacted by the economic crisis created by the pandemic. NBC's Amanda Golden reports from Seaside Heights, New Jersey. Hey, Corey and Francis, we're here in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore at a major beach destination for families and folks coming out for the holiday weekend, for Labor Day weekend. We've been seeing a steady stream of people coming here for the beaches and the boardwalks. Not a ton of social distancing, not a lot of mask wearing. Though there are some measures in place for the beaches here to keep people spread out when they hit a capacity at a certain beach entrance. They'll close down that entrance and have other people go along to another access point. But for the businesses here, this is a huge beachfront community, the seasonal businesses here have taken such a hit during the COVID summer season. They're hoping to keep that going and actually elongate the summer in part by keeping the beaches open. This town decided they're going to have the beaches stay open through the month of September, potentially longer if the weather cooperates and there's interest. And the businesses here, especially restaurants, are really looking forward to trying to draw in additional revenue, how to offset some of those losses in profit. And I spoke with the mayor of this town as well as some of those businesses. Take a listen to what they told me. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffer like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. It started off very confusing, budgetarily for the community. We need this weekend, we need every other weekend in September. I mean, there's no way that we can possibly do what we need to do by being closed as long as we were and then open up as late as we did. We've been through Hurricane Sandy, we've been through fires, so we're gonna get through this and come out even stronger on the other side. So as you heard, they're really trying to make up for the losses that were experienced here over the summer, see if they can bring in some of that revenue and profit to help offset what they experienced. And keep in mind, this is the first major weekend that we've seen where there's at least 25% indoor capacity for restaurants. Whether that'll make a difference for the beachside community here, most businesses tell me it doesn't really affect them. Most of their seating was outdoors to begin with, but with the weather potentially turning, it at least could create additional opportunity to bring in some of that revenue. Corey and Francis. All right, Amanda, thank you. And I know there was concern about people coming back. It sounds like they have. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to be uh, holding our breath for the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks when we find out if those numbers surge. Sorry. All right, celebrating birthdays on this Labor Day. Actor and SNL alum Leslie Jones is 53. Corbin Burns turns 66 today. Rock star and pretenders vocalist Chrissy Hind is 69. And I Will Survive singer-songwriter legend Gloria Gaynor hits double sevens. 
watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want them to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. A record heat wave adds fuel to the deadly California wildfires. Hundreds rescued by helicopter. But is any relief in sight? As the COVID death count in the U.S. surpasses 190,000, will this Labor Day weekend lead to a new spike in cases? A scary situation aboard a military charter, a loud boom and flames seen outside the jet, and it's all caught on camera. Today's Labor Day holiday marks 57 days until the election. I think as things appear to be tightening up in some areas, we've got the latest. An Academy Award winner, Halle Berry, gets in that weekend workout with a little help from her son. Early today starts right now. Good morning on your Monday. I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're with us to start off your holiday. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with a growing fire emergency in California. The El Dorado fire has burned more than 7,000 acres in San Bernardino County. Officials say this fire began Saturday morning and was caused by a smoke generating device that was used for a gender reveal party. Temperatures in California climbed to record highs, and authorities say a woman died while hiking in the heat wave. And this video shows hikers escaping the fast-moving creek fire. They made it to safety, but there were many campers who had to be rescued. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. In California, fires are burning. Residents are fleeing. Hey, that fire uh, grew so quickly, so fast, it trapped people at uh, Mammoth Pools Reservoir up in the mountains. The Creek Fire in Central California grew so rapidly, it trapped some 200 campers. The National Guard airlifted them to safety. 
When they became trapped, they were doing what they could to uh, rescue themselves and make themselves safe, um, some of which resulted in injuries, including broken bones, lacerations, scrapes, bruises, those kind of things. State officials say there are more than 20 active fires across the state. More than 900 wildfires have erupted in the state since the middle of August. The flames feeding on the dry landscape and intense heat, temperatures surpassing triple digits in some parts of the state. California's largest utility warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday because the heat and high winds could create even more fire danger. If there is good news, the weather is expected to cool down later this week. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. In Portland, a demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you can see the man run into the street with his clothing on after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man, who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th straight night of protest there. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. A peaceful night of protests in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people March to the Rochester Public Safety Building, protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that I've taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure trage tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. He will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's attorney general is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours, it's pain, it's nothing but pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. The investigation into his shooting is ongoing. And now we have a consumer alert for pet owners this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under the names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased any of these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after taking off, he saw those flames shooting from the right engine and heard loud banging noises as the Boeing 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries. A video. Wow. Well, some Trump supporters rock the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Travis in a boat parade. They got a little too close, though, to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked who would make you feel safe, 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by 1 percent. And when handling his, his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. 
From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration, down in the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. He was alarmed when he found out what he had did. Uh, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books with the Game 2 win over the Rockets. LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former team Ray Allen, teammate Ray Allen, for the second most playoff threes ever. And it was a nail-biter in Darlington for NASCAR Southern 500. But Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late in the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. Harvick snuck in two first after a crash sidelined leader Chase Elliott with 16 laps to go. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position in NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place Denny Hamlin. SpaceX carried out another successful test of its Starship. The company hopes to one day use this ship to send passengers or cargo to other planets. This test is called a hot flight since it only went 150 meters, but everything went smoothly. SpaceX sees this as a very good sign of progress since other designs have not made it that far. All right, you can see some nice sunshine there. Let's bring in NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb tracking some heat. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. We have the Pacific Northwest where we have extreme heat, Windla Woodland Hills, excuse me, 121 degrees, beating all time records yesterday in Southern California. Red flag warnings, they continue to remain across the Pacific Northwest with dry conditions and the winds. They're going to continue to stir up throughout the afternoon. Look at the heat across the Southwest into the Pacific Northwest for Las Vegas today, 112. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Across the Rockies, though, we have a dramatic change. Casper today, 64 degrees, and that cold front is going to come across the plains very quickly from Brownsville all the way to New Orleans. We're still in the lower 90s. Ladies, it's time to talk about my favorite snow coming up. <laughs> Something's so wrong with that. Yes. Four-letter S word. I'm not ready for it. And smiling while yeah. you say it, no less. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Janessa. <laughs> Actress Halle Berry added some extra weight to her at-home workout. The Oscar winner carried her son to see as she performed squats in her backyard. She shared this video here on Instagram, writing, quote, with all the chaos that comes with virtual online learning, it can be difficult for little kids to stay energized and engaged. So today, I thought I'd throw my son Maceo into my workout. Nice thing he's cooperating, too, and I know. wiggling out of that. Leading the news, this story proves whiskey really is the gift that keeps on giving. A son who was gifted a bottle of 18-year-old McCallan every year of his birthday 
is now using the money from the whiskey to buy a house. <laughs> Pete Robson spent over $6,600 on 28 bottles of single malt for his son, Matthew. Matthew was born in 1992, so you do the math. After that, it paid off. He was given instructions not to open them. So now they are worth nearly $53,000, which is great in this case. You earn that much money and there's absolutely no hangover. Oh my God. With, with all of that <laughs> there food. you go. Yeah. Added benefit right, right. there. <laughs> Well, the baseball world is mourning the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 67. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, two teams that Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night. Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead at today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bonner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is certainly no stranger to extradition battles, but this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years in prison on a combined 18 charges. Now, his defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and is essentially an attack on the free press, arguing that Mr. Assange is basically an investigative journalist and is owed First Amendment protections. Uh, but the U.S. government says he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Um, now, we're not necessarily expecting a speedy resolution to this. It'll take about four to five weeks to reach a verdict. Uh, and then his defense says that they plan to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. Uh, but there is still some time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that behind the scenes, the Trump administration has offered a pardon if he just simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very infamous 2016 Democratic National Committee email leaks. Now, of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right, Matt, thank you. In today's quick hits, Los Angeles outfielder Mike Trout made major league history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan, impatient for the Cybertruck release, came up with his own version of the vehicle. It was created with parts of the Ford Raptor F-150, transformed into a gas-powered Cybertruck look-alike in eight months. This looks just like it. Wow. Part of the deputy in Georgia found a goat in her patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight for a little bit, but... <laughs> eventually decided, yeah, okay, I'll get out of the car. Goat story ever. Greatest of all time story <laughs> ever. All right, well, Wall Street takes a breather after last week's massive tech sell-off. We've also got a major auto recall call to tell you about. Here with details and some big box office news, CNBC's Karen Cho. Karen, good morning. Corinne Francis, good morning to you. Yes, Korean manufacturers Hyundai and Kia have announced a recall of about 600,000 vehicles in the United States. It follows a fluid leak in the braking system that could cause the engines to catch fire. The vehicles included in the recall are Kia Optima, that's a mid-sized sedan, the Kia Sorento SUVs and the Hyundai Santa Fe, roughly from the years 2013 to 2015. Now, Hyundai has disclosed that there have been about 15 fires that it knows of, but no injuries reported. The recall started in October Uber, but users have been warned to park the cars outside until the cars are fixed. Now, to the latest at the box office, and Tenant is the first film to launch since the COVID-19 lockdowns. It's thought to have earned about $146.2 million at the global box office through to Sunday, about $20.2 million of that from the United States debut over the weekend. But it's not enough to break Labor Day records. And what we have seen, too, uncertainty around the future of the Christopher Nolan film and what it earns from here because of the lockdown still about 65 to 70 70 percent of uh, major multiplexes have reopened in the states but clearly markets in new york uh, san francisco la are still shut so that's an issue mm -hmm. yeah that's a major hit for the numbers karen thank you 
Austrian athlete Yusef Koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record, spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice wearing nothing but his swim trunks. He stood for two hours, 30 minutes and 57 seconds in that cabinet filled with ice cubes, surpassing the previous record by over 20 minutes. Well, he said that he draws on positive emotions to fight through the freezing pain and have us some ice cream to celebrate after. There you go. All right, Janessa's is back now. She's talking about <laughs> snow. Yeah, we have snow that's making its way into Denver three to five inches by tomorrow. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. Our first sneak peek for the movie Comeback Trail was released over the weekend. The film starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and other notable names in Hollywood is ske scheduled to hit theaters on November 13th. Well, it took several months longer than usual, but NBC's American Ninja Warrior finally navigated all the hurdles created by COVID-19 and put together a new season. It starts tonight. NBC's Matt Barger has a preview. As the ninja who designs obstacles, crush them tonight. For a show all about overcoming obstacles, American Ninja Warrior faced its toughest one with COVID-19. I assumed the worst that this season wasn't going to happen. But by mid-July, much like the NBA and NHL, Ninja Warrior created its own competition bubble in St. Louis's dome at America Center. Even though it's an 80,000 seat dome, the seats were empty. Competitors, cast and crew all had to adhere to testing and safety protocols. After every run, they had to clean the course. Any contact surface had to be wiped down. And here we go, Flip Rodriguez. That meant only 50 veteran ninjas taking part, but they each chose two rookie ninjas to bring along. Yeah, her fellow mom's showing support. Jody Avila brought his wife, Pauline, an ICU nurse on the front lines of the pandemic. After the last few months that we've been through, hitting a buzzer this year for my family, especially with my wife watching on the sidelines, would be amazing. The ninjas also got a boost from virtual supporters in taking on a new array of obstacles. Oh, just missed it. We saw them moving faster than we normally do. We saw them doing things that, I mean, heck, we, I think we saw a man fly. The fastest to reach and conquer the bubble's power tower at season's end wins $100,000. It felt as energetic as anything we've ever done because every ninja and every one of us knew how lucky we were to be doing this. A ninja season like no other. Mark Barker, NBC News. Glad to see more and more things coming back. Yes. Yeah, one company rolling out a new holiday treat. Archie McPhee is rolling out ketchup flavored candy canes for condiment lovers to get into the holiday spirit. The brand also has some exotically festive candy canes in, in flavors like mac and cheese, mm -hmm. also kale. <laughs> the six pack of ketchup canes will run you a little over five bucks. Um, yeah, a good gag well, gift maybe? Yeah, I guess so, you know, might as well look ahead to the holiday exactly. season. Exactly. Right <laughs> You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. A record heat wave adds fuel to the deadly California wildfires. Hundreds rescued by helicopter, but is any relief in sight? Number one is out, not from losing a match, but tossed for losing his temper and accidentally hitting a line judge. As the pandemic continues to impact almost everyone, one area that's taken a tough turn is adoption. And what happens to kids who need a forever family? We may be in the last day of the summer season, but are you tough enough to take on the record for being buried in ice? Plus, the Michigan boy and his new puppy share a whole lot more than just friendship. It's Labor Day. Early today starts right now. Good morning on this Monday. I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with the dangerous wildfires that are raging across California. The El Dorado fire has burned more than 7,000 acres in San Bernardino County. Officials say this fire began Saturday morning and was caused by a smoke generating device that we use for a gender reveal party. Temperatures in California climbed to record highs and authorities say a woman died while hiking in the heat wave. And this video shows hikers escaping the fast-moving creek fire. They made it to safety, but there were many campers who had to be rescued. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. In California, fires are burning. Residents are fleeing. Hey, that fire uh, grew so quickly, so fast, it trapped people at uh, Mammoth Pools Reservoir up in the mountains. The creek fire in Central California grew so rapidly, it trapped some 200 campers. The National Guard airlifted them to safety. When they became trapped, they were doing what they could to uh, rescue themselves and make themselves safe, um, some of which resulted in injuries, including broken bones, lacerations, scrapes, bruises, those kind of things. State officials say there are more than 20 active fires across the state. More than 900 wildfires have erupted in the state since the middle of August. The flames feeding on the dry landscape and intense heat. Temperatures surpassing triple digits in some parts of the state. California's largest utility warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday because the heat and high winds could create even more fire danger. If there is good news, the weather is expected to cool down later this week. Dan Shenneman, NBC News. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Well, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part as in, quote, action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerous or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. 
A peaceful night of protests in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that I've taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. The city will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's Attorney General is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours, it's pain, it's nothing but pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. The investigation into his shooting is ongoing. In Portland, one demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you could see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man, who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th Street night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. More college campuses are cracking down on social distancing rule violations. Northeastern says it has dismissed 11 students who gathered at a hotel that's being used as a dorm. And the $36,000 tuition will not be refunded. NYU revealed that it has suspended more than 20 students and warned the rest to avoid parties and bars. According to NBC News data, 190,000 lives have been lost in the U.S. due to COVID-19, making the race to find an effective vaccine even more urgent. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. Could it be an October surprise? The head of vaccine maker Pfizer says results could be in by the end of next month. But that doesn't mean the vaccine will be ready for the general public. We will not cut corners. Our phase three study will be the only one that will allow us to say if we have an effective and safe vaccine. Dr. Anthony Fauci says he has confidence in the integrity of FDA scientists and timing of results from phase three trials will depend on real world conditions. If you have the trial being taken place in an area that happens to have a lot of infections, you may get an answer sooner than you would have projected because the answer is event driven. In other words, trials in hot spots may yield quicker results. Amendments aren't enough. But with some Americans resisting even decades old vaccines, it's not clear how quickly the public would embrace a brand new drug. An NBC News survey monkey poll found just 44 percent of Americans who said they would get the vaccine, with 22 percent saying they would not, and 32 percent weren't sure. Drug manufacturers vowed politics would not influence the vaccine effort, but the CDC has told state governors to prepare to distribute millions of vaccine doses as soon as November 1st. I don't need to have them announce on November 4th, ladies and gentlemen, we've found the vaccine. It's perfect. Watching what happened with hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma, one worries that there would be political influence on the release of this vaccine. The chief scientific advisor to the Trump administration's vaccine effort said he would resign if there's undue interference in this process. But even with fast-tracked approval, experts say it's unlikely more than a small percentage of Americans could be vaccinated before 2021, leaving more months of uncertainty and suffering. 
And our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. There is cause for concern in Europe this morning as several countries are seeing an uptick in COVID-19 cases. Infection rates are on the rise in France and Britain with many of the new cases in younger people. The resurgence in the new number of cases comes as many regions seek to reopen their economies. Here's NBC's Matt Bradley. We are seeing a troubling rise in cases, not just here in France, but all throughout Europe. And the reason why is varied. What we are seeing is that after this quite relaxed summer, a lot of young Parisians, a lot of young French people went out and mixed with each other. And we're seeing a lot of younger people getting this disease. Also here in Paris and throughout France, they're allowing for people to get tested for free. So there have been lines outside of testing centers with people who are trying to get tested. This is all increasing the percentage of people who have this disease. What is not following on is the number of people who are dying, and the number of people who are hospitalized. The health system here is still in pretty good shape, even though there has been a surge, and that's because more and more young people are the ones who are infected. They're not dying at the same rate, and they're not having to be put in ICUs. This is a different kind of second wave, and a lot of policymakers here are wondering whether it'd be worth it to actually implement new confinement measures to try to meet this second wave, or whether or not they can just withstand this new wave. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Paris. Climate activists gathered in the Swiss Alps to protest and mourn receding glaciers. A black and white photograph shot in 1891 dramatically illustrates the shrinking of Switzerland's Trient Glacier. Over 200 activists rallied on the foot of the glacier to draw attention to the impact of climate change and urge authorities to take action. Their protest comes a day before the Swiss Parliament begins debating new legislation on reducing CO2 emissions. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now with a check of our weather. And it, it seemed like, at least on the East Coast, a nice uh, yeah. weekend. Yeah, absolutely beautiful weekend, abundance of sunshine, temperatures pretty comfortable, but on the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story. For the next 24 hours, the fire danger really going to be heightened across Salt Lake City all the way into San Diego, where our temperatures continue to be well above average, hitting 121 in parts of Southern California. Today, will continue to be in the triple digits. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Colorado Springs, 92 for today, but you'll be below the freezing mark by tomorrow afternoon across the deep south, watching a few storms. And ladies, I have snow. It's in the forecast. All that's what? coming up. I know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but we're talking about snow. It's now. too soon. Yeah, no, it's 2020. <laughs> yeah. We shouldn't be too surprised. Right. Janessa, thank you. Austrian athlete Josef Koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record and spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice. Koberl stood for two hours, 30 minutes and 57 seconds in a cabinet filled with 440 pounds of ice cubes wearing nothing but swim trunks. Well, after breaking that teeth chattering record by over 20 minutes, the athletes celebrated with all things an ice cream cone <laughs> right there and hopefully a long, long time in a sauna. Yes, a nice warm bath after that. Leading the news, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead to today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Corey. Well, Mr. Assange, of course, is no stranger to extradition requests, but this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on a combined 18 charges. Now, the defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and that really Mr. Assange is an investigative journalist and so he's due First Amendment protections. Now, of course, the United States government says that he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. We're not necessarily expecting any kind of swift resolution to these hearings that are beginning today. Uh, it'll take about a month, and then the uh, defense says it'll appeal any kind of negative outcome. But there is still time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in this election. Uh, he has alleged that the Trump administration has behind the scenes uh, offered a pardon if he just says that Russia had nothing to do 
with those very infamous 2016 DNC email leaks. But of course, the White House has denied this. Back to you, Corey. Matt, thank you very much. All I have for you is a word. Tenet. It'll open the right doors. The Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet debuted with $20.2 million in the U.S. and it neared $150 million globally. Astounding numbers considering its release during COVID pandemic. And while many things have been put on hold due to the coronavirus, one family in Tennessee decided it was the right time to open their home and their hearts to a very special young boy. Forrest Sanders from our affiliate at WSMV reports. Please be a quarterback. Marcus Mariota! You know, Andrew and Jock didn't become best friends the first day they met, or really the second. Andrew, who should our quarterback be? But the third day, they began to realize. We had like a lot of stuff in common. Games, Minecraft. And that's mm -hmm. not all. That I want to see him. Say what? Pop-Tarts. They love Pop-Tarts. We need more Pop-Tarts. We do. Around the Bat Cave, it's video games. Break for Pop-Tarts. Repeat. Pop-Tart. And they eat tart all day if you let them all day. Pop-Tart. Keeping up with the appetite of two preteen boys is Jacques' mom and dad, Kevin and Dominique Gill. As the years went on, they, they got pretty close. It's always good to see that bond that they grew. But the truth is, this friendship isn't as simple as just video games and Pop-Tarts. Yeah, Beth. Andrew has lived in foster care about half his life. And more than 8,000 children are in that foster system in Tennessee, waiting for a forever home. They really want that stability in their lives. Molly Parker's with Youth Villages. She tells us the pandemic is slowing the calls coming in for possible homes. And a lot of families were unsure if they wanted to open their homes to a placement just because they didn't really know what the future held. But to that, the Gills want to tell you something. You see, a few years ago, they became Andrew's foster family, but he eventually left here. Oh man, I didn't care. That's not true. I'm just playing with you. Uh, I missed them. Just really love them. And so comes this. Molly and Andrew on a walk through the park. Andrew realizes. Hello? What's happening? I just turned around the corner and saw everybody. Celebration, y'all! Hype it up! The Gills ask Andrew if he'll become a forever part of their family. They asked, will you? And I said, yeah. Fighting, please work. Before I scream, I will scream. When we see them together, we're glad we decided to adopt Andrew. And now, Jock and Andrew share the back cave. Two screens for video games for each. Never too far from never ending Pop Tarts. This is my brother, Jack Wes. This is my brother, Andrew. And our thanks to Forrest Sanders for that report. Pop Tarts and video games are just <laughs> the start of it for yes. those two brothers from here on out. Such a great story. So Best sweet. one. Happy Labor Day, everyone. This is not a game for Colorado to Wyoming. You will see your first official snowfall for tomorrow afternoon, where you could see three to five inches. You're watching early today. The last charge by Dylan. He comes off a four. Harvick's still going to win. Harvick wins the Southern 500. Appreciating the fans. It was a nail biter in Darlington at NASCAR Southern 500, but Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late into the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position as NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place, Denny Hamlin. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books. With the Game 2 win over the Rockets, LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former teammate Ray Allen for second most playoff threes ever. Well, a Michigan boy has found his perfect match. The pair was both born with cleft lips, and that's created 
an instant bond. Rachel Sweet from NBC affiliate WILX has this heartwarming story of a boy and his dog. Pure happiness at the Jackson County Animal Shelter. Two-year-old Bentley Boyers got to bring his new puppy home. Last week, Bentley's dad, Brandon, came to the animal shelter to look at two chickens he was thinking to adopt when a pooch caught his eye, a puppy with a cleft lip. He FaceTimed, he goes, I think this one has a cleft lip, and I said, get her. We need her. Bentley was born with a cleft lip. His mom said he had a tough start in life where it was a struggle to get him to eat. We had to sit him up and feed him and hold his lip together in order for him to eat, so it was a process. Since day one, he's been a happy baby. Ashley says his cleft lip doesn't make him any different. The family feels finding the puppy will show Bentley he isn't alone. To see him have something in common with the puppy means a lot because he can grow up and understand that him and his puppy have both had something that they can share in common. The animal shelter says they don't normally see puppies with cleft palates. Before her adoption, they had her for a week and don't see that she will have any problems in the future. Her disability is really not holding her back. Um, you know, and as she grows, they'll be able to see more if there's anything changing that has to do with that, but she's really doing well. She might look a little bit different than a normal dog would, but it's not slowing her down at all. At just two months and two years, the imperfect super duo find a perfect match. This is my puppy. Oh, our thanks to Rachel Sweet for that report. And man, they are meant to be together. And I That's cannot right. get over how much he's cuddling his new puppy. <laughs> so sweet. Sweetest thing. Best friends. Oh, just love it. And well, especially these days, you know, for any family, any bright spot. That's I'll right. Take it. Let's bring in more furry friends to our family. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, 
the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. On this Labor Day, firefighters in California are working overtime as multiple wildfires burn out of control, some 0% contained. One reportedly started by pyrotechnics from a baby gender reveal. It was a weekend of protests in Rochester where the mayor and police chief were called upon to resign in the wake of the death of Daniel Prude. Then to a chaotic scene in Portland where a man was lit on fire after the Molotov cocktail being hurled at police ignited around him. Number one is out, not from losing a match, but tossed for losing his temper and accidentally hitting a line judge. And a scary situation aboard a passenger jet is caught on camera. It's Labor Day, Monday, September 7th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're starting your holiday with us. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news from California where multiple counties are under a state of emergency. More than 200 people were trapped in the mountains after the Creek Fire exploded to more than 45,000 acres. You can see the flames circling the group there. The fire department said the campers did what they could to get to safety, which resulted in some broken bones and other injuries. The National Guard airlifted the group to safety. The Fresno Bee reports that at least six burn victims were admitted to a medical center. There are more than 20 active fires burning across California right now. Near San Bernardino, the El Dorado fire has spread to more than 7,000 acres since Saturday morning. Officials now say it was caused by a smoke-generating device that was used during a gender reveal party. As hundreds of firefighters work to try to contain the flames, they're also battling record high temperatures into the triple digits. The state's largest utility is warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday. Some Trump support supporters rocked the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Travis in a boat parade, and they got a little too close to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's <coughs> polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CB CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked, would you make would Donald Trump make you feel safe? 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by one percent. But when it comes to his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time, sharing a powerful message from his hospital bed. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man.
Blake also says he is focused not just on his recovery, but his children. He was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times. In Rochester, a peaceful night of protests. 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building protesting the death of Daniel Prude. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. During a press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren announced more police reform, including separating the family crisis intervention team from the police department. Our Kathy Park has more. Corey Francis, good morning to you. So after days of unrest here in Rochester, we heard from the police chief, the mayor, as well as a local pastor, and they all have a unified message. They are calling for calm. They have asked church elders in the community to serve as buffers between police and protesters because over the last few nights, we have seen the tension just growing. Meanwhile, as far as the investigation goes, all officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay. The attorney general's office is in charge of leading the investigation, but they have asked a grand jury to be a part of this case as well. The police chief was asked about potential agitators in the group, and he said that there have been some arrests from the past several nights, people coming as far away as Alaska, even Massachusetts. So the tension is still very high in Rochester, but once again, city officials are calling for calm. Back to you. All right. Kathy, thank you. In Portland, a demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you can see the man run into the street with his clothing on fire after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man. He was later taken to the hospital. This is 100th straight night of protests. Police say firebombs were hurled at officers and over 50 people were arrested. The U.S. versus Julian Assange showdown is set to resume today. The 49-year-old WikiLeaks founder is scheduled to appear in a London court for an extradition hearing that was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic. American prosecutors have indicted Assange on 18 espionage and com computer misuse charges. And they are attempting to extradite him for allegedly publishing secret U.S. military documents in relation to Chelsea Manning. For more, we turn to NBC's Matt Bodner live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is no stranger to battling extradition attempts. He's faced several over the past few years, uh, but this is really the big one. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years on those combined 18 charges. Um, but the defense says that this is all politically motivated and argue that it's really an attack on press freedoms, uh, saying that he's basically an investigative journalist. Uh, but the United States government says that he's really just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Now, we're not really expecting necessarily a speedy resolution to these hearings. They're supposed to take about four to eight weeks. And then the defense says that it's going to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. But there's still some time left for Mr. Assange to become some kind of factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, uh, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that the Trump administration behind the scenes has offered him a pardon if he simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very controversial 2016 leaks of Democratic National Committee emails. But of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right. Matt, thank you. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration down in his first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. Now he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. A following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerously dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. The baseball world mourns the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played for 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and the 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 1967. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, the two teams Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night. Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. 
All right, we want to turn now to your holiday forecast. Let's uh, bring in NBC's Janessa Webb. And Janessa, you got quite a bit to uh, talk about for the forecast today. Yeah, the East Coast, lovely conditions. It's going to be a wonderful Labor Day. We're seeing fall-like temperatures, but the Pacific Northwest, a completely different story with this heightened fire danger that's across Salt Lake City all the way into Southern California. At least one more day of temperatures just well above average. We're seeing temperatures at least uh, 15 to 30 degrees above average this afternoon. Las Vegas, uh, the feel-like temperature is going to be 112 this afternoon, going to be breaking records all the way into areas of the southwest. It does start to be broken down for the central plains and the high plains by tomorrow. Look at Salt Lake City, a high of 62. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Billings, a high of 48 this afternoon compared to 106 degrees across Tucson, even Corpus Christi into the deep south. We're still in the lower 90s. And ladies, you know, I get excited talking about snow. We'll have that <laughs> forecast coming up. <laughs> sounds like a joke, but hey, it's 2020. That's Anything what it goes. is. Anything goes. We are right. not excited. <laughs> In today's quick hits, Los Angeles uh, outfielder Mike Trout made Major League history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan impatient for the Cybertruck made his own version. It was created with parts of the Ford F-150 and he did it in eight months. A deputy in Georgia found a goat in a patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver <laughs> civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight, but eventually got out. We're back with a consumer alert for you this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under brand names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after takeoff, he saw flames shooting from the right engine and he heard loud banging noises. You can see it there in the video. This is a 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries, but that happened 20 minutes after he first saw that video. That had to be the most terrifying 20 Absolutely. minutes for those passengers. Kiss the ground the second wow. you get down. Wow. Uh, Speeding tickets are up in some states despite state lockdowns due to the pandemic. Iowa State Patrol says they've recorded a 101 percent increase from January through August in tickets for speeds exceeding 100 miles an hour. That is compared to over four years. In California, Highway Patrol officers say they issued more than 15,000 tickets from mid-March through August for speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour. That is also a 100 percent increase that same time a year ago. In Ohio, state troopers have also seen a 61 percent increase in speeding tickets in utah it was a 23 percent jump the protests in portland oregon began with the death of george floyd and now more than 100 days later they show no signs of stopping but has the message of racial injustice and police brutality been hijacked by those who want to stir up trouble and cause violence tim gordon from our portland affiliate kgw has the story The protests began in late May and quickly swelled, and with that came the destruction and the violence, including tear gas and other crowd control methods from Portland police and federal officers. We had a quiet visit about it all outside the Justice Center with Seneca Kaysen. Anybody out there frustrated? Kaysen has been a leader of nonviolent protests in Portland. He says the social justice message has been diffused by other opposing interests. Black lives are in the middle of all these agendas. Uh, The rocks are being thrown. Obviously, they got to cross the middle before they can get to the other side. This protest leader says some of the current distraction is coming from people who may be well-meaning but need to take a breath. For 100 days now, white people have gone through 500 years of education and haven't decompressed. That's what, that's what you see, the fireballs and all these different things. I'm not giving them an excuse, but I'm telling you, if you go deep down in the ocean and come back up too fast, you will die. 
Kaysen continues to speak out. He's got a new bullhorn after his first one was stolen. His message with this one won't change. I love, people. I love people. I love human. I know what the issue is. It's not Black Lives Matter. It's right and wrong. You know, and that's the true agenda that's been detached from, the, that, that we've been severed from. And uh, that's, the, that's the true narrative that's, that's been hijacked. And that's the message he hopes others will hear and share in the next 100 days. It's time for the people with nothing to lose to step aside a little bit and let the people stand that got things to lose. I have three sons. I'm here fighting for them. We have to stand. We all have to stand. I'm calling everybody that have something to lose and know what the difference between right and wrong is just to stand, not to, not to fight, not to stand. And thanks to Tim Gordon for that report. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. The official trailer for the movie, The Comeback Trail, was released over the weekend. The film starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and plenty of other notable names in Hollywood, scheduled to hit theaters November 13th. By their promising box office debut this holiday weekend, despite the pandemic, the Christopher Nolan spy thriller Tenet opened with $20.2 million in the U.S., and it neared $150 million globally. Right now, Tenet is playing in 2,800 North American locations. That's about three quarters of what most major releases typically launch in. And those theaters are operating at about 50% capacity. Pretty good. Well, after losing his battle to COVID-19, the theater community made an emotional, uh, emotional, uh, yeah, outpouring. For, yes, for that's Gordon. the word, yeah. memorial to yes. Nick Cordero. Take a listen. One of the great ones was the There's song the that they sang there. That was the last song that he performed on Broadway. It was touching. It was emotional. It was a difficult summer for the Broadway community. Yeah, even more so and continuing throughout the rest of the year. And hopefully, fingers crossed that they'll open next. Happy Labor Day, everyone. Who's ready for some snow? If you're across Wyoming to Colorado, you are going to see your first official snowfall by tomorrow morning into your afternoon. Look at a total accumulation. Could see about four to five inches. This does start off kind of that rain and snow mixture, but for the Denver area, I think you could see about two inches by tomorrow morning. You're watching early today. We'll be right back. As this Labor Day weekend continues, there are heightened concerns of a possible surge in coronavirus cases, with the U.S. surpassing 190,000 deaths. In New Jersey, still one of the top 10 states for cases of the virus, crowds gathered this holiday weekend at the Jersey Shore's beaches and boardwalks, an area badly impacted by the economic crisis created by the pandemic. NBC's Amanda Golden reports from Seaside Heights, New Jersey. Hey, Corey and Francis, we're here in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore at a major beach destination for families and folks coming out for the holiday weekend, for Labor Day weekend. We've been seeing a steady stream of people coming here for the beaches and the boardwalks. Not a ton of social distancing, not a lot of mask wearing, but there are some measures in place for the beaches here to keep people spread out when they hit a capacity at a certain beach entrance. They'll close down that entrance and have other people go along to another access point. But for the businesses here, this is a huge beachfront community. The season businesses here have taken such a hit during the COVID summer season. They're hoping to keep that going and actually elongate the summer in part by keeping the beaches open. This town decided they're going to have the beaches stay open through the month of September, potentially longer if the weather cooperates and there's interest. And the businesses here, especially restaurants, are really looking forward to trying to draw in additional revenue, how to offset some of those losses in profit. And I spoke with the mayor of this town as well as some of those businesses. Take a listen to what they told me. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffered like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. It started off very confusing, budgetarily for the community. We need this weekend, we need every other weekend in September. I mean, there's no way that we can possibly do what we need to do by being closed as long as we were and then open up 
as late as we did. We've been through Hurricane Sandy. We've been through fires. So we're going to get through this and come out even stronger on the other side. So as you heard, they're really trying to make up for the losses that were experienced here over the summer, see if they can bring in some of that revenue and profit to help offset what they experienced. And keep in mind, this is the first major weekend that we've seen where there's at least 25% indoor capacity for restaurants. Whether that'll make a difference for the beachside community here, most businesses tell me it doesn't really affect them. Most of their seating was outdoors to begin with. But with the weather potentially turning, it at least could create additional opportunity to bring in some of that revenue. Corian Francis? All right, Amanda, thank you. And I know there was concern about people coming back. It sounds like they have. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to be uh, holding our breath for the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks when we find out if those numbers surge. Sorry. All right, celebrating birthdays on this Labor Day. Actor and SNL alum Leslie Jones is 53. Corbin Burnson turns 66 today. Or rock star and pretenders vocalist Christy Hind is 69. And I Will Survive singer-songwriter legend Gloria Gaynor hits double sevens. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. A record heat wave adds fuel to the deadly California wildfires. Hundreds rescued by helicopter. But is any relief in sight? As the COVID death count in the U.S. surpasses 190,000, will this Labor Day weekend lead to a new spike in cases? A scary situation aboard a military charter, a loud boom and flames seen outside the jet, and it's all caught on camera. Today's Labor Day holiday marks 57 days until the election. I think as things appear to be tightening up in some areas, we've got the latest. An Academy Award winner, Halle Berry, gets in that weekend workout with a little help from her son. 
Early Today starts right now. Good morning on your Monday. I'm Corey Coffin. Glad you're with us to start off your holiday. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with a growing fire emergency in California. The El Dorado fire has burned more than 7,000 acres in San Bernardino County. Officials say this fire began Saturday morning and was caused by a smoke generating device that was used for a gender reveal party. Temperatures in California climbed to record highs and authorities say a woman died while hiking in the heat wave. And this video shows hikers escaping the fast-moving creek fire. They made it to safety, but there were many campers who had to be rescued. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report. In California, fires are burning. Residents are fleeing. Hey, that fire uh, grew so quickly, so fast, it trapped people at uh, Mammoth Pools Reservoir up in the mountains. The creek fire in central California grew so rapidly, it trapped some 200 campers. The National Guard airlifted them to safety. When they became trapped, they were doing what they could to uh, rescue themselves and make themselves safe, um, some of which resulted in injuries, including broken bones, lacerations, scrapes, bruises, those kind of things. State officials say there are more than 20 active fires across the state. More than 900 wildfires have erupted in the state since the middle of August. The flames feeding on the dry landscape and intense heat. Temperatures surpassing triple digits in some parts of the state. California's largest utility warning it may have to cut power starting Tuesday because the heat and high winds could create even more fire danger. If there is good news, the weather is expected to cool down later this week. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. In Portland, a demonstrator caught fire during clashes between protesters and police. We do want to warn you, this video is disturbing. In this dramatic video, you can see the man run into the street with his clothing on after a Molotov cocktail was thrown at police. Medics did treat the man, who was later taken to the hospital. This was on the 100th straight night of protest there. Police say fire bombs were hurled at officers. Over 50 people were arrested. A peaceful night of protests in Rochester. Last night, 1,500 people marched to the Rochester Public Safety Building, protesting the death of Daniel Prude. The calls for justice have been deafening. Elders in the community locked arms, forming a barrier between protesters and police. Prude died more than five months ago after being placed in a spit hood by officers who believed he had COVID and pinned Prude to the ground. In her latest press conference, Mayor Lovely Warren vowed to enact police reforms. I know the vast majority of the people that have taken to our streets do so with pure hearts, good intentions to ensure tragedy, tragedies like the death of Mr. Prude never happen again. Their message that we must do better and that we have to address how we police our city has been heard. It will be taking its family crisis intervention team out of the police department and providing more mental health services. New York's attorney general is impaneling a grand jury to determine whether charges should be brought in this case. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake speaks out for the first time from his hospital bed. It's a lot more life to live out here, man. Your life, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward in life can be taken from you like this, man. 24 hours, every 24 hours is pain, it's number pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Blake was paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times, but his attorney says he is focused on recovery and his children. Even if he never walks again, he's not giving up on life. He's going to uh, be the best he can be. The investigation into his shooting is ongoing. And now we have a consumer alert for pet owners this morning. Sunshine Mills has issued a voluntary recall of three dog food products under the names Heartland Farms, Family Pet, and Paws Happy Life. The food may contain high levels of a mold byproduct that can be harmful in large quantities. If you've purchased any of these recalled products, you can contact Sunshine Mills for a refund. A chartered military flight made an emergency landing in Hawaii after passengers noticed flames on the plane's wing. A passenger says minutes after taking off, he saw those flames shooting from the right engine and heard loud banging noises as the Boeing 767 dropped in altitude. He says the pilot announced they were experiencing engine failure and made an emergency landing about 20 minutes later. 
Atlas Air says the flight landed safely following a mechanical issue with one engine. There were no reports of injuries. A video. Wow. Well, some Trump supporters rocked the boat in Texas. Hundreds of vessels swarmed Lake Trout this in a boat parade. They got a little too close, though, to each other. Authorities believe that the close proximity created exceptionally choppy seas, which led to some boats going down. Several sank while others stalled. Authorities had 15 distress calls. Luckily, no one was injured. Also sinking are President Trump's polling numbers. Trump is trailing Joe Biden 42 to 52 percent. That's according to a CBS News YouGov poll. But with 57 days left until the election, when voters were asked who would make you feel safe, 48 percent said Joe Biden compared to Trump's 43 percent. And when it came to the economy, the scales tipping in Trump's favor by 1 percent. And when handling his, his handling of the pandemic, just 38 percent approved. Our Jennifer Johnson is in D.C. with more. From hundreds of thousands expected at the South Dakota State Fair to beachgoers marking the official end of summer, Americans are celebrating this Labor Day holiday weekend. Health officials are fearing another spike in COVID-19 cases, similar to what happened after Memorial Day and the 4th of July holidays, as they see Americans growing weary of the virus. People's willingness to comply with the simple things that we know can reduce spread is going to start to fray as we head into the fall and the winter. America's COVID-19 death toll is approaching 190,000 people. President Trump says a vaccine could be out by the end of the year, if not sooner. But his Democrat opponents aren't buying it. I think that we have learned since this pandemic started, but really before that, that there's very little that we can trust that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. The president facing backlash over the pandemic and reports he denigrated American troops who died in war, calling them suckers and losers. White House officials defended the president. This president supports the military in an unbelievable way. He's created more funding to rebuild the military. On Twitter, the president also fired back, saying the Democrats, together with the corrupt fake news media, have launched a massive disinformation campaign. Other media outlets have confirmed the allegations, including Fox News. The president has called for the firing of the Fox News reporter. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. Novak Djokovic is out of the U.S. Open after hitting a lineswoman with a ball. The men's top seed hit the ball behind him out of frustration, down in the first set to Pablo Carreño Busta. He was alarmed when he found out what he had did. Uh, he went to tend to the woman after she went down and grabbed her throat. Following discussion with officials on the court, Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament. The United States Tennis Association released a statement on the incident detailing the decision to default Djokovic in part, quote, as an action of intentionally hitting a ball dangerously or recklessly. Djokovic penned an apology on Instagram saying he will turn his actions into a lesson of growth. LeBron James continues to shatter the NBA record books with the Game 2 win over the Rockets. LeBron is now the eighth player in NBA history to win 1,000 career games. James went for 28 points and 11 rebounds in the victory, and he may have only hit one three-pointer, but it was enough to pass former team Ray Allen, teammate Ray Allen, for the second most playoff threes ever. And it was a nail-biter in Darlington for NASCAR Southern 500. But Kevin Harvick slipped into the lead late in the race and held off Austin Dillon in the final lap to take home the checkered flag. Harvick snuck in two first after a crash sidelined leader Chase Elliott with 16 laps to go. The win firmly locked Harvick into the top position in NASCAR's playoffs, 10 points ahead of second place Denny Hamlin. SpaceX carried out another successful test of its Starship. The company hopes to one day use this ship to send passengers or cargo to other planets. This test is called a hot flight since it only went 150 meters, but everything went smoothly. SpaceX sees this as a very good sign of progress since other designs have not made it that far. All right, you can see some nice sunshine there. Let's bring in NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb tracking some heat. Good morning, Janessa. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. We have the Pacific Northwest where we have extreme heat. Windland, Woodland Hills, excuse me, 121 degrees, beating all-time records yesterday in Southern California. Red flag warnings, they continue to remain across the Pacific Northwest with dry conditions and the winds. They're going to continue to stir up throughout the afternoon. Look at the heat across the Southwest into the Pacific Northwest for Las Vegas today, 112. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. 
Across the Rockies, though, we have a dramatic change. Casper today, 64 degrees, and that cold front is going to come across the plains very quickly from Brownsville all the way into New Orleans. We're still in the lower 90s. Ladies, it's time to talk about my favorite snow coming up. <laughs> Something's so wrong with that. Yes. Four-letter S word. Not ready for it. And smiling while you yeah. say it, no less. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Janessa. <laughs> Actress Halle Berry added some extra weight to her at-home workout. The Oscar winner carried her son to Seo as she performed squats in her backyard. She shared this video here on Instagram, writing, quote, with all the chaos that comes with virtual online learning, it can be difficult for little kids to stay energized and engaged. So today, I thought I'd throw my son Maceo into my workout. Nice thing he's cooperating, too, and wiggling out of that. Leading the news, this story proves whiskey really is the gift that keeps on giving. A son who was gifted a bottle of 18-year-old McCallan every year of his birthday is now using the money from the whiskey to buy a house. <laughs> Pete Robson spent over $6,600 on 28 bottles of single malt for his son, Matthew. Matthew was born in 1992, so you do the math. After that, it paid off. He was given instructions not to open them, so now they are worth nearly $53,000, which is great in this case. You earn that much money and there's absolutely no hangover. Oh my God. With, with all of that <laughs> there food. you go. Yeah. Added benefit right, right. there. <laughs> Well, the baseball world is mourning the loss of Hall of Famer Lou Brock. Brock played 19 seasons in the big leagues in the 60s and 70s, winning two World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964 and 67. He was baseball's all-time leader in stolen bases when he retired in 1979 and had over 3,000 career hits. Brock was elected into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1985. The Cardinals and Cubs, two teams that Brock played for, held a moment of silence before their game Sunday night. Hall of Famer Lou Brock was 81 years old. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will fight for his freedom today in a British court. Lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government are scheduled to face off in London at an extradition hearing. American prosecutors are fighting to extradite him on spying charges over WikiLeaks' alleged publication of secret U.S. military documents. To look ahead at today's case, we turn to NBC's Matt Bonner, live in Moscow. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Francis. Well, Mr. Assange is certainly no stranger to extradition battles, but this is really the big one for him. If he is sent to the United States, he faces 175 years in prison on a combined 18 charges. Now, his defense says that this is all politically motivated uh, and is essentially an attack on the free press, arguing that Mr. Assange is basically an investigative journalist and is owed First Amendment protections. Uh, but the U.S. government says he's just a cyber criminal who has violated the Espionage Act several times. Um, now, we're not ex necessarily expecting a speedy resolution to this. It'll take about four to five weeks to reach a verdict. Uh, and then his defense says that they plan to actually appeal any unsatisfactory outcome. Uh, but there is still some time for Mr. Assange to become a factor in an already turbulent U.S. presidential election, as he has in the past. Uh, Mr. Assange has alleged that behind the scenes, the Trump administration has offered a pardon if he just simply says Russia had nothing to do with those very infamous 2016 Democratic National Committee email leaks. Now, of course, this is something that the White House has denied. Back to you, Francis. All right, Matt, thank you. In today's quick hits, Los Angeles outfielder Mike Trout made Major League history hitting his 300th career homer. Trout set a new franchise record and became the 16th player in the league to reach 300 home runs before the age of 30. A Bosnian Tesla fan impatient for the Cybertruck release came up with his own version of the vehicle. It was created with parts of the Ford Raptor F-150, transformed into a gas-powered Cybertruck look-alike in eight months. It looks just like it. Wow. A deputy in Georgia found a goat in her patrol car after she left the doors open when she went to deliver civil papers to someone's home. The goat put up a fight for a little bit, but... <laughs> eventually decided, yeah, okay, I'll get out of the car. Goat story ever. Greatest of all time story <laughs> ever. All right, while Wall Street takes a breather after last week's massive tech sell-off, we've also got a major auto recall call to tell you about. Here with details and some big box office news, CNBC's Karen Cho. Karen, good morning. 
Corey and Francis, good morning to you. Yes, Korean manufacturers Hyundai and Kia have announced a recall of about 600,000 vehicles in the United States. It follows a fluid leak in the braking system that could cause the engines to catch fire. The vehicles included in the recall are Kia Optima, that's a mid-sized sedan, the Kia Sorento SUVs and the Hyundai Santa Fe, roughly from the years 2013 to 2015. Now, Hyundai has disclosed that there have been about 15 fires that it knows of, but no injuries reported. The recall started in October but users have been warned to park the cars outside until the cars are fixed. Now, to the latest at the box office, and Tenant is the first film to launch since the COVID-19 lockdowns. It's thought to have earned about $146.2 million at the global box office through to Sunday, about $20.2 million of that from the United States debut over the weekend. But it's not enough to break Labor Day records. And what we have seen, too, uncertainty around the future of the Christopher Nolan film and what it earns from here because of the lockdown still, about 65 to 70 70 percent of uh, major multiplexes have reopened in the states but clearly markets in new york uh, san francisco la are still shut so that's an issue mm-hmm. yeah that's a major hit for the numbers karen thank you austrian athlete yusef koberl chilled out this weekend by breaking a world record spending over two and a half hours submerged in ice wearing nothing but his swim trunks He stood for two hours, 30 minutes, and 57 seconds in that cabinet filled with ice cubes, surpassing the previous record by over 20 minutes. Well, he said that he draws on positive emotions to fight through the freezing pain and have us some ice cream to celebrate after. There you go. All right, Janessa's back now. She's talking about snow. (laughs) Yeah, we have snow that's making its way into Denver three to five inches by tomorrow. You're lying. I, I swear to you, I'm not lying. I'm not, well, I'm, okay, I'm lying a little bit, but I'm a producer. That's what I do. And I will have your money in full, I promise you. You got 72 hours. After that, I choke you to death. Our first sneak peek for the movie Comeback Trail was released over the weekend. The film starring Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, and other notable names in Hollywood is ske- scheduled to hit theaters on November 13th. Well, it took several months longer than usual, but NBC's American Ninja Warrior finally navigated all the hurdles created by COVID-19 and put together a new season. It starts tonight. NBC's Matt Barger has a preview. As the ninja who designs obstacles, crush them tonight. For a show all about overcoming obstacles, American Ninja Warrior faced its toughest one with COVID-19. I assumed the worst that this season wasn't going to happen. But by mid-July, much like the NBA and NHL, Ninja Warrior created its own competition bubble in St. Louis's dome at America Center. Even though it's an 80,000 seat dome, the seats were empty. Competitors, cast and crew all had to adhere to testing and safety protocols. After every run, they had to clean the course. Any contact surface had to be wiped down. And here we go, Flip Rodriguez. That meant only 50 veteran ninjas taking part, but they each chose two rookie ninjas to bring along. Yeah, her fellow moms showing support. Jody Avila brought his wife, Pauline, an ICU nurse on the front lines of the pandemic. After the last few months that we've been through, hitting a buzzer this year for my family, especially with my wife watching on the sidelines, would be amazing. The ninjas also got a boost from virtual supporters in taking on a new array of obstacles. Oh, just missed it. We saw them moving faster than we normally do. We saw them doing things that, I mean, heck, we, I think we saw a man fly. The fastest to reach and conquer the bubble's power tower at season's end wins $100,000. It felt as energetic as anything we've ever done because every ninja and every one of us knew how lucky we were to be doing this. A ninja season like no other. Mark Barker, NBC News. Glad to see more and more things coming back. Yes. One company rolling out a new holiday treat. Archie McPhee is rolling out ketchup flavored candy canes for condiment lovers to get into the holidays there. The brand also has some exotically festive candy canes in in flavors like mac and cheese, Mm -hmm. also kale. (laughs) The six pack of ketchup canes will run you a little over five bucks. Um, Yeah, A good gag gift maybe? Yeah, I guess so, you know, might as well look ahead to the holiday season. (laughs) Exactly. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son 
about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want them to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. There's fire on all sides, all around us. The Labor Day weekend taking a terrifying turn for over 200 people in California's Sierra National Forest as flames, hot embers, and thick smoke from the Creek Fire quickly surrounded and trapped campers at Mammoth Pool Reservoir. You can see smoke, but they said it was like 22 miles away. And uh, it was very fast. And it was literally and like, oh my God, there's fire right there. Just keep going. Just keep going. Juliana Park and her friends, who were hiking in the area, were some of the last to make it out by car. The fire looks like it's going to just grab the car, and we could feel the heat just throughout the vehicle. By Saturday night, the fire had devoured over 36,000 acres, blocking the only way out of the campground. The race to save lives forced to go airborne. I believe there's probably other people that are sheltered in the meadow, unknown at this time of uh, how many may still exist out there. In the middle of the night, first responders rushing trapped campers onto military helicopters to reach safety. As soon as we were in the helicopter, we flew over the fires and you couldn't see anything but pitch black and fire. That's all we could see. We saw firsthand why those evacuations were so critical. The smoke and haze has turned day to night as firefighters face yet another challenge on the front line. Many of the injuries are lacerations, broken bones, and, and those kind of things, and, and the kind of injuries you'd see when somebody's attempting to flee the fire. As ambulances rush to treat the injured, families and their young children grateful they survive. I'm glad to be alive. But across the state, the danger is still very real as flames fueled by triple digit temperatures threaten to destroy anything in its path.
outside of Fresno here. The Creek Fire is still burning totally out of control across California. More than 20 wildfires are burning across the region. And we should mention one outside of Los Angeles was started by a smoke grenade at a gender reveal party. New fallout from the president's latest war over words. I, I say what I say. Disputing allegations, he disparaged fallen soldiers as suckers and losers in some private conversations, as first reported by The Atlantic. There is nobody that feels more strongly about our soldiers, our wounded warriors, our soldiers that died in war than I do. Now attacking Atlantic co-owner Laureen Powell Jobs, widow of Apple's Steve Jobs. Trump tweeting Sunday, Steve Jobs would not be happy that his wife is wasting money he left her on a failing radical left magazine. Call her, write her, let her know how you feel. Cabinet officials coming to the president's defense. Veteran Secretary Robert Wilkie. And I would be offended too if I thought it was true. And Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. The president has always been 100% supportive of the military. The president, whose only public outings this weekend were to his Virginia golf course, dismissed the allegations as a campaign season attack, calling it a hoax. Joe Biden, now leading by 10 points in a new national poll, went out to Catholic Mass in Delaware Sunday as his campaign seized on the Trump military controversy, rushing this months old ad back on the air. Joe Biden understands the awesome power, responsibility, and sacred duty of being commander in chief. Posting new video of veterans reacting to the suckers and losers allegation. It's filled with losers. It's filled with heroes. Today, Biden running mate Kamala Harris will make her first solo campaign trip, visiting union workers in Wisconsin. Sunday, she challenged the president over his claims a COVID vaccine could be ready by November. I would not trust his word. I would trust the word of public health experts and scientists, but not Donald Trump. And Senator Harris would not say whether she would take a COVID vaccine herself. This morning, a reckoning in Rochester. Anger over the death of Daniel Prude, fueling another night of standoffs between police and protesters. The city's leaders mobilizing a group of church elders to serve as a buffer, attempting to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens. The city's mayor and police chief so far rejecting growing calls to resign. Chief Leron Singletary claiming a small group of agitators are disturbing otherwise peaceful gatherings. There are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke. Prude died in March, seven days after he was restrained by officers. But the release of police body camera footage last week showing Prude's arrest sparked outrage in the community. New York's attorney general is now calling a grand jury as part of the investigation. We need to be able to call the police for help and for help to come to us and not to be afraid that a loved one may lose their life. Portland reached a grim milestone this weekend. On the 100th night of protest, police declared a riot, arresting more than 50 people. As tensions flared, one protester is seen on fire. In New York City, protests became violent Friday. Rioters shattering windows and damaging Manhattan businesses, including this Starbucks. Eight were arrested. And on Derby Day, dueling but peaceful protests in Louisville as hundreds demanding justice for Breonna Taylor came face to face with armed self-described militia groups. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake, paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times by police, spoke from his hospital bed. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep. It hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. And not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. And the investigation continues in Kenosha as well as here in Rochester. And demonstrators say they will continue demanding justice for Daniel Prude because the suspension for the officers in his arrest just isn't enough.
The president's former lawyer is speaking out some explosive new allegations against his old boss. What more can you tell us? Well, Michael Cohen, the longtime business associate of Donald Trump, is painting a very unflattering portrait of Donald Trump in a new book. And our own Lester Holt had a chance to speak with Cohen, who described the lengths that he thinks the president would go to stay in office. Do you think he'll win another term as president? So Donald Trump will do anything and everything within which to win. And I believe that includes um, manipulating the ballots, I believe that he would even go so far as to start a war in order to prevent himself from being removed from office. My biggest fear is that there will not be a peaceful transition of power in 2020. We'll all see more of Lester's interview with Michael Cohen on Today and Nightly News. The White House has been pushing back, trying to discredit Cohen by saying that he's a convicted felon and proven liar. Peter? Mm -hmm. Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. Kelly, thank you. This morning, colleges nationwide taking drastic measures to keep COVID-19 under control. Northeastern University suspending 11 freshmen for the semester after they were caught partying in this hotel doubling as a dorm, violating school rules. I hate to say it, but Northeastern gave out a lot of information and like regards as to like what the protocols and so it kind of they had it coming. In a statement, Northeastern officials said in part, Cooperation and compliance with public health guidelines is absolutely essential. Those people who do not follow the guidelines are putting everyone else at risk. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, students at nine fraternity and sorority houses were ordered to quarantine for 14 days after nearly 40 tested positive. I never heard of parties or anything, but you know it's tough when you're living in a house with uh, 50 people. Like One person can uh, ruin it for everybody. The school saying... Our goal is to stop any further spread of the virus among our students and the broader community. Parties like this one near the University of South Carolina, part of the problem. Some schools taking more serious steps. SUNY Oneonta canceling all on-campus classes for the entire semester. 100 cases at SUNY Oneonta became 600 cases at SUNY Oneonta in four days. This spreads quickly. Colleges, not the only potential flashpoint. A wedding in Maine in early August is now being blamed for nearly 150 cases and three deaths in communities as far as 100 miles away. As Labor Day weekend comes to a close, the question and concern for many leaders, could festivities end up being super spreaders? After the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. So let's hope that we can celebrate safely. A cautious message that's not always heard. We just came to have a good time and relax. Uh, really not afraid of COVID. Now, as for those 11 Northeastern students who were punished for partying, they won't be able to take online classes or get refunded that tuition worth up to $36,000. However, they can still appeal that dismissal. In terrain too remote and jagged for any vehicles, this rescue was all about human force. <laughs> I don't think I would have made it out, especially uh, without any other adults. What started out as a camping trip for Peter Monroe and his family soon became a 48-hour trial of survival. It's very steep and rugged up there, so it can be a problem. Peter, his seven-year-old daughter Layla, and yellow lab Buck had gone into the rugged Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood last Tuesday to set up camp for his family at Kinzel Lake. But when his wife Camille arrived later in the day and they were missing, she went searching, discovered his truck at the nearby trailhead with the keys and Layla's stuffed animals still inside, called 911. Rescuers immediately deployed multiple agencies. When there's children involved, uh you know, that's the top priority. The search included more than 50 rescuers, search dogs, Air Force pararescue jumpers, and a construction crew that helped move vehicles across difficult terrain, saving searchers valuable time. Thursday morning, 48 hours after they'd hiked into the woods, rescuers found the trio trapped deep in a canyon ravine near a stream. They had worked their way about 2,000 meters down a 3,000 meter canyon but they were exhausted and not able to move any further without assistance. 
Peter had injured his ankle and knee on the hike down and could not walk. Crews stabilized him in a litter and manually hauled him up the 2,000 meters. Rescuers carried Layla, dehydrated and exhausted. The grateful Monroe thanked the rescuers from the back of the ambulance. You guys, you guys saved myself and my daughter's and my dog's life. As for Buck, who climbed out without any assistance. The dog was done. <laughs> the dog got up to the road and just fell out. He was done. It was good to see them all safe and sound. A harrowing ordeal with a happy ending. Peter is out of the hospital and recovering at home. The family has asked for privacy. As for Buck the dog, it may be a while before he heads out back on any hikes, at least any time soon. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed. But some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begging to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but Yes, now I now that the again the cases have been kind of surging, it is it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India just surpassed Brazil to become the second worst afflicted country in the world. But, you know, both of those countries are still far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the U.S. This morning, Coral Springs, Florida is using a simple 15-minute antigen test on its essential personnel, firefighters, police, and city workers. No blood samples required, just a swab from the back of the throat mixed with a solution and placed into a tray. If it turns blue, then it's positive for coronavirus. There's no better feeling than to be able to tell a family a result right on the spot before they leave, because then you can counsel them you could help them know what to do next. To date, other COVID tests have required long waits, in some cases up to 15 days. While waiting for those results, some Americans do not quarantine, which can spread the virus even more. Dr. Deborah Burks talked about the promise of these rapid tests, just as the pandemic started overwhelming our nation. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly trying to detect the actual live virus. This 15-minute rapid antigen test now in use in Coral Springs was developed in China. Studies on Chinese healthcare workers showed the test was accurate 80.2% of the time. This antigen test comes from China, where they say 80% success. But should we be suspect simply because this is China? I would say that as a scientist, as a researcher, I would be suspect of any test that comes to me for evaluation. If it came from China or England or New Zealand or even within America, I would say that those tests all have to be validated. This 15-minute rapid antigen test is still unproven in the United States. Dr. Peter Antevi, who is the medical director for the Coral Springs Fire Department, follows each antigen test with a more accurate, time-consuming test 
that examines DNA, those comparisons to be shared with the FDA. While an admittedly small test sample in Coral Springs, the 15-minute rapid tests have been 86% accurate. And while 86% accurate isn't perfect, Harvard professor Dr. Ranu Dillon says the way to make up for that failure rate is repeated testing. 80% success rate means 20% aren't caught. Is that good enough? That definitely is good enough if you're testing frequently. So if I, you test one day and you're in that 20% where you're missed, but then you test yourself again the next day or two days later, the likelihood of being missed both of those times is exceedingly low. The FDA says antigen tests will play a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. For cities like Coral Springs, these rapid antigen tests are not only cheaper, but employees are not sidelined for days while waiting for results. And now you got a 15 minute result and? I'll be going home tonight and having dinner with my family. Because you are? Negative. Put a swab to the back of your throat. I took that 15 minute I test. I am a little anxious. Aside from the gag reflex when my throat was swabbed, it was easy. And getting near instant results reduces anxiety. So I'm all clear. You're all clear. Good. <laughs> Thank God. Your colorful mask is working, Carrie. So where might we see these tests widely <laughs> used first? Uh, initially, we'll probably see them in workplaces where people go back to work and also at schools. Now, the test that I took is not the Abbott test. That one we'll begin seeing in about 30 days, and the cost is about $5. So, guys, we're probably yeah. going to see these very soon, just about everywhere. Certainly progress. Late this spring, shocking headlines and viral photos. A wealthy Manhattan neighborhood seemingly overrun with an increase in homeless men and women. Residents sounding the alarm. What we've really noticed is the increase in these sort of incidents. Open and illicit drug use, needles on the ground, things that I actually could not have ever imagined would have occurred just even a few weeks ago. On the Upper West Side, four vacant tourist hotels were converted to temporary homeless shelters. More than 700 residents moving in, all part of a citywide effort to stop devastating coronavirus spread in a vulnerable population. During a virtual community board meeting, shelter leaders explained they had to move fast. Normally it takes about two years or more to create a shelter. We had about two weeks notice for each hotel we opened. That meant in some cases the facilities weren't ready or important details overlooked, like sex offenders with residency restrictions placed at the Belle Claire, around the corner from an elementary school. The shelter says they've since been moved out. Dr. Megan Martin started a group of concerned neighbors pushing to end the program, threatening to file a lawsuit if the city doesn't act. The city was in an emergency situation. These shelters were incredibly dangerous. They had to act quickly. Why was this not an appropriate solution? We replaced one public health crisis with another. They've moved many of these individuals without the resources that they need. But as the firestorm grew, those who support the shelters also took action, some suggesting that their neighbors were insensitive and even intolerant. I have not seen any kind of danger or any kind of deterioration of quality life. And I walk past the Belle Claire every single morning. College professor Melissa Sanchez organized neighborhood families to draw welcoming messages to residents, triggering this angry exchange with a grandmother passing by. Are you surprised personally, someone who lives in this community, to see how angry people have gotten and how fraught this issue has been? I'm really surprised. We know that people here are getting treatment. We also know that the strongest predictor for successful treatment is support of the community. One in particular that said everyone needs a home. When I saw that, that really touched me. But while anger flared on both sides, major crime rates actually fell. According to the NYPD, overall crime rates in the area are down over 5% from the same May through August time period last year. Under pressure, Mayor Bill de Blasio now says people will be moved back into established shelters as the health situation improves. But for some, it may be too late. We do know many families who do not feel safe and who have put their apartments for sale. 
contributing to a wave of people leaving New York City since the start of the pandemic. Opera singer Cheryl Warfield could be one of them. So you're going to stay? I may not. After 9-11, I was here in 9-11, my family expected me to move back home. But you stayed. But I, to, but I stayed. But I may not be able to stay through this. The Department of Homeless Services in this city say this, says that this program has saved lives. And while there were missteps in the beginning, they have increased staff and services available. But Dr. Martin told us there is no level of staff and services that they would find suitable. They want a date for this program to end. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This morning, a reckoning in Rochester. Anger over the death of Daniel Prude, fueling another night of standoffs between police and protesters. The city's leaders mobilizing a group of church elders to serve as a buffer, attempting to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens. The city's mayor and police chief so far rejecting growing calls to resign. Chief Leron Singletary claiming a small group of agitators are disturbing otherwise peaceful gatherings. There are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke. 
Prude died in March, seven days after he was restrained by officers. But the release of police body camera footage last week showing Prude's arrest sparked outrage in the community. New York's attorney general is now calling a grand jury as part of the investigation. We need to be able to call the police for help and for help to come to us and not to be afraid that a loved one may lose their life. Portland reached a grim milestone this weekend. On the 100th night of protest, police declared a riot, arresting more than 50 people. As tensions flared, one protester is seen on fire. In New York City, protests became violent Friday. Rioters shattering windows and damaging Manhattan businesses, including this Starbucks. Eight were arrested. And on Derby Day, dueling but peaceful protests in Louisville as hundreds demanding justice for Breonna Taylor came face to face with armed, self-described militia groups. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake, paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times by police, spoke from his hospital bed. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep. It hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. And not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. And the investigation continues in Kenosha as well as here in Rochester. And demonstrators say they will continue demanding justice for Daniel Prude because the suspension for the officers in his arrest just isn't enough. This morning, colleges nationwide taking drastic measures to keep COVID-19 under control. Northeastern University suspending 11 freshmen for the semester after they were caught partying in this hotel doubling as a dorm, violating school rules. I hate to say it, but Northeastern gave out a lot of information and like regards as to like what the protocols and so it kind of they had it coming. In a statement, Northeastern officials said in part, cooperation and compliance with public health guidelines is absolutely essential. Those people who do not follow the guidelines are putting everyone else at risk. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, students at nine fraternity and sorority houses were ordered to quarantine for 14 days after nearly 40 tested positive. I never heard of parties or anything, but you know it's tough when you're living in a house with uh, 50 people. Like One person can uh, ruin it for everybody. The school saying, our goal is to stop any further spread of the virus among our students and the broader community. Parties like this one near the University of South Carolina, part of the problem. Some schools taking more serious steps. SUNY Oneonta canceling all on-campus classes for the entire semester. 100 cases at SUNY Oneonta became 600 cases at SUNY Oneonta in four days. This spreads quickly. Colleges, not the only potential flashpoint. A wedding in Maine in early August is now being blamed for nearly 150 cases and three deaths in communities as far as 100 miles away. As Labor Day weekend comes to a close, the question and concern for many leaders, could festivities end up being super spreaders? After the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. So let's hope that we can celebrate safely. A cautious message that's not always heard. We just came to have a good time and relax. Uh, really not afraid of COVID. Now, as for those 11 Northeastern students who were punished for partying, they won't be able to take online classes or get refunded that tuition worth up to $36,000. However, they can still appeal that dismissal. In terrain too remote and jagged for any vehicles, this rescue was all about human force. <laughs> I don't think I would have made it out, especially uh, without any other adults. What started out as a camping trip for Peter Monroe and his family soon became a 48-hour trial of survival. It's very steep and rugged up there, so it can be a problem. Peter, his seven-year-old daughter Layla, and yellow lab Buck had gone into the rugged Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood last Tuesday to set up camp for his family at Kinzel Lake. But when his wife Camille arrived later in the day and they were missing, she went searching, discovered his truck at the nearby trailhead with the keys and Layla's stuffed animals still inside, called 911. Rescuers immediately deployed multiple agencies. When there's children involved, uh... You know, that's the top priority. 
The search included more than 50 rescuers, search dogs, Air Force para-rescue jumpers, and a construction crew that helped move vehicles across difficult terrain, saving searchers valuable time. Thursday morning, 48 hours after they'd hiked into the woods, rescuers found the trio trapped deep in a canyon ravine near a stream. They had worked their way about 2,000 meters down a 3,000 meter canyon, but they were exhausted and not able to move any further without assistance. Peter had injured his ankle and knee on the hike down and could not walk. Crews stabilized him in a litter and manually hauled him up the 2,000 meters. Rescuers carried Layla, dehydrated and exhausted. The grateful Monroe thanked the rescuers from the back of the ambulance. You guys, you guys saved myself and my daughters and my dog's life. As for Buck, who climbed out without any assistance. The dog was done. <laughs> the dog got up to the road and just fell out. He was done. It was good to see them all safe and sound. A harrowing ordeal with a happy ending. Peter is out of the hospital and recovering at home. The family has asked for privacy. As for Buck the dog, it may be a while before he heads out back on any hikes, at least mm. anytime soon. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed but some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begging to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but Yes, now I now that the again the cases have been kind of surging, it is it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India just surpassed Brazil to become the second worst afflicted country in the world. But, you know, both of those countries are still far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the U.S. This morning, Coral Springs, Florida is using a simple 15-minute antigen test on its essential personnel, firefighters, police, and city workers. No blood samples required, just a swab from the back of the throat mixed with a solution and placed into a tray. If it turns blue, then it's positive for coronavirus. There's no better feeling than to be able to tell a family a result right on the spot before they leave, because then you can counsel them you could help them know what to do next. To date, other COVID tests have required long waits, in some cases up to 15 days. While waiting for those results, some Americans do not quarantine, which can spread the virus even more. Dr. Deborah Burks talked about the promise of these rapid tests, just as the pandemic started overwhelming our nation. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly trying to detect the actual live virus. This 15-minute rapid antigen test now in use in Coral Springs was developed in China. Studies on Chinese healthcare workers showed the test was accurate 80.2% of the time. This antigen test comes from China, where they say 80% success. But should we be suspect simply because this is China? I would say that as a scientist, as a researcher, I would be suspect of any test that comes to me for evaluation. If it came from China or England 
or New Zealand or even within America, I would say that those tests all have to be validated. This 15-minute rapid antigen test is still unproven in the United States. Dr. Peter Antevi, who is the medical director for the Coral Springs Fire Department, follows each antigen test with a more accurate, time-consuming test that examines DNA, those comparisons to be shared with the FDA. While an admittedly small test sample in Coral Springs, the 15-minute rapid tests have been 86% accurate. And while 86% accurate isn't perfect, Harvard professor Dr. Ranu Dillon says the way to make up for that failure rate is repeated testing. 80% success rate means 20% aren't caught. Is that good enough? That definitely is good enough if you're testing frequently. So if you test one day and you're in that 20% where you're missed, but then you test yourself again the next day or two days later, the likelihood of being missed both of those times is exceedingly low. The FDA says antigen tests will play a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. For cities like Coral Springs, these rapid antigen tests are not only cheaper, but employees are not sidelined for days while waiting for results. And now you got a 15-minute result and... I'll be going home tonight and having dinner with my family. Because you are... Negative. Put a swab to the back of your throat. I took that 15-minute test. I am a little anxious. Aside from the gag reflex when my throat was swabbed, it was easy. And getting near instant results reduces anxiety. So I'm all clear. You're all clear. Good. Thank God. Your colorful mask is working, Carrie. So where might we see these tests widely <laughs> used first? Uh, initially, we'll probably see them in workplaces where people go back to work and also at schools. Now, the test that I took is not the Abbott test. That one we'll begin seeing in about 30 days, and the cost is about $5. So, guys, we're probably yeah. going to see these very soon, just about everywhere. Certainly progress. Late this spring, shocking headlines and viral photos. A wealthy Manhattan neighborhood seemingly overrun with an increase in homeless men and women. Residents sounding the alarm. What we've really noticed is the increase in these sort of incidents. Open and illicit drug use, needles on the ground, things that I actually could not have ever imagined would have occurred just even a few weeks ago. On the Upper West Side, four vacant tourist hotels were converted to temporary homeless shelters. More than 700 residents moving in all part of a citywide effort to stop devastating coronavirus spread in a vulnerable population. During a virtual community board meeting, shelter leaders explained they had to move fast. Normally it takes about two years or more to create a shelter. We had about two weeks notice for each hotel we opened. That meant in some cases the facilities weren't ready or important details overlooked, like sex offenders with residency restrictions placed at the Belle Claire, around the corner from an elementary school. The shelter says they've since been moved out. Dr. Megan Martin started a group of concerned neighbors pushing to end the program, threatening to file a lawsuit if the city doesn't act. The city was in an emergency situation. These shelters were incredibly dangerous. They had to act quickly. Why was this not an appropriate solution? We replaced one public health crisis with another. They've moved many of these individuals without the resources that they need. But as the firestorm grew, those who support the shelters also took action, some suggesting that their neighbors were insensitive and even intolerant. I have not seen any kind of danger or any kind of deterioration of quality life. And I walk past the Belle Claire every single morning. College professor Melissa Sanchez organized neighborhood families to draw welcoming messages to residents, triggering this angry exchange with a grandmother passing by. This is absurd, especially, especially with their children. Are you surprised personally, someone who lives in this community, to see how angry people have gotten and how fraught this issue has been? I'm really surprised. We know that people here are getting treatment. We also know that the strongest predictor for successful treatment is support of the community. One in particular that said, everyone needs a home. When I saw that, that really touched me. But while anger flared on both sides, major crime rates actually fell. 
According to the NYPD, overall crime rates in the area are down over 5% from the same May through August time period last year. Under pressure, Mayor Bill de Blasio now says people will be moved back into established shelters as the health situation improves. But for some, it may be too late. We do know many families who do not feel safe and who have put their apartments for sale. Contributing to a wave of people leaving New York City since the start of the pandemic. Opera singer Cheryl Warfield could be one of them. So you're going to stay? I may not. After 9-11, I was here at 9-11. My family expected me to move back home. But you stayed. But I stayed. But I may not be able to stay through this. The Department of Homeless Services in this city say this, says that this program has saved lives. And while there were missteps in the beginning, they have increased staff and services available. But Dr. Martin told us there is no level of staff and services that they would find suitable. They want a date for this program to end. There's fire on all sides, all around us. The Labor Day weekend taking a terrifying turn for over 200 people in California's Sierra National Forest as flames, hot embers, and thick smoke from the Creek Fire quickly surrounded and trapped campers at Mammoth Pool Reservoir. You can see smoke, but they said it was like 22 miles away. And, uh, it was very fast. And it was literally and like, oh my God, there's fire right there. Just keep going. Oh go, 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 go. Just keep Juliana Park and her friends who were hiking in the area were some of the last to make it out by car. The fire looks like it's going to just grab the car. And we could feel the heat just throughout the vehicle. By Saturday night, the fire had devoured over 36,000 acres, blocking the only way out of the campground. The race to save lives forced to go airborne. I believe there's probably other people that are sheltered in the meadow, unknown at this time of uh, how many may still exist out there. In the middle of the night, first responders rushing trapped campers onto military helicopters to reach safety. As soon as we were in the helicopter, we flew over the fires and you couldn't see anything but pitch black and fire. That's all we could see. We saw firsthand why those evacuations were so critical. The smoke and haze has turned day to night as firefighters face yet another challenge on the front line. Many of the injuries are lacerations, broken bones, and, and those kind of things, and, and the kind of injuries you'd see when somebody's attempting to flee the fire. As ambulances rush to treat the injured, families and their young children grateful they survived. I'm glad to be alive. But across the state, the danger is still very real as flames fueled by triple digit temperatures threaten to destroy anything in its path. Outside of Fresno here, the Creek Fire is still burning totally out of control across California. More than 20 wildfires are burning across the region. And we should mention one outside of Los Angeles was started by a smoke grenade at a gender reveal party. This morning, headline making new claims from the former senior FBI agent at the center of the Bureau's Russia investigation. In a new memoir, Peter Strzok takes sharp aim at the man he once investigated, President Trump. And NBC's chief White House correspondent, Hallie Jackson, sat down with him. Hallie, good morning. Peter, Chanel, good morning to you. You know, to the president, Peter Strzok is a symbol of what he believes is the deep state trying to take him down. And he's targeted the former FBI agent with a number of insults, including calling him a fraud. But Strzok calls his new book compromised because he believes the president has been, with foreign countries holding leverage over him. It's a warning he's now delivering in the starkest of terms. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. I was born in a and he's one of the agents former national security advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S. Charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. 
I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure, improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. Yeah. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like, F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero, and about a possible Trump victory, we'll stop it. Giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, a relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some, whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. The Republican-led Senate Judiciary Committee, which is investigating the Russia investigation, has authorized subpoenas for officials, including Strzok. He tells me if he is subpoenaed, he will testify. New fallout from the president's latest war over words. Look, I, I say what I say. Disputing allegations, he disparaged fallen soldiers as suckers and losers in some private conversations, as first reported by The Atlantic. There is nobody that feels more strongly about our soldiers, our wounded warriors, our soldiers that died in war than I do. Now attacking Atlantic co-owner Laureen Powell Jobs, widow of Apple's Steve Jobs. Trump tweeting Sunday, Steve Jobs would not be happy that his wife is wasting money he left her on a failing radical left magazine. Call her, write her, let her know how you feel. Cabinet officials coming to the president's defense. Veteran Secretary Robert Wilkie. And I would be offended, too, if I thought it was true. And Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. The president has always been 100 percent supportive of the military. The president, whose only public outings this weekend were to his Virginia golf course, dismissed the allegations as a campaign season attack, calling it a hoax. Joe Biden, now leading by 10 points in a new national poll, went out to Catholic Mass in Delaware Sunday as his campaign seized on the Trump military controversy, rushing this months-old ad back on the air. Joe Biden understands the awesome power, responsibility, and sacred duty of being commander-in-chief. Posting new video of veterans reacting to the suckers and losers allegation. It's filled with losers. It's filled with heroes. Today, Biden running mate Kamala Harris will make her first solo campaign trip, visiting union workers in Wisconsin. Sunday, she challenged the president over his claims a COVID vaccine could be ready by November. I would not trust his word. I would trust the word of public health experts and scientists, but not Donald Trump. And Senator Harris would not say whether she would take a COVID vaccine herself. Late this spring, shocking headlines and viral photos. A wealthy Manhattan neighborhood seemingly overrun with an increase in homeless men and women. 
residents sounding the alarm. What we've really noticed is the increase in these sort of incidents. Open and illicit drug use, needles on the ground, things that I actually could not have ever imagined would have occurred just even a few weeks ago. On the Upper West Side, four vacant tourist hotels were converted to temporary homeless shelters. More than 700 residents moving in, all part of a citywide effort to stop devastating coronavirus spread in a vulnerable population. During a virtual community board meeting, shelter leaders explained they had to move fast. Normally it takes about two years or more to create a shelter. We had about two weeks notice for each hotel we opened. That meant in some cases the facilities weren't ready or important details overlooked, like sex offenders with residency restrictions placed at the Belle Claire around the corner from an elementary school. The shelter says they've since been moved out. Dr. Megan Martin started a group of concerned neighbors pushing to end the program, threatening to file a lawsuit if the city doesn't act. The city was in an emergency situation. These shelters were incredibly dangerous. They had to act quickly. Why was this not an appropriate solution? We replaced one public health crisis with another. They've moved many of these individuals without the resources that they need. But as the firestorm grew, those who support the shelters also took action, some suggesting that their neighbors were insensitive and even intolerant. I have not seen any kind of danger or any kind of deterioration of quality life. And I walk past the Belle Claire every single morning. College professor Melissa Sanchez organized neighborhood families to draw welcoming messages to residents, triggering this angry exchange with a grandmother passing by. Are you surprised personally, someone who lives in this community, to see how angry people have gotten and how fraught this issue has been? I'm really surprised. We know that people here are getting treatment. We also know that the strongest predictor for successful treatment is support of the community. One in particular that said everyone needs a home. When I saw that, that really touched me. But while anger flared on both sides, major crime rates actually fell. According to the NYPD, overall crime rates in the area are down over 5% from the same May through August time period last year. Under pressure, Mayor Bill de Blasio now says people will be moved back into established shelters as the health situation improves. But for some, it may be too late. We do know many families who do not feel safe and who have put their apartments for sale contributing to a wave of people leaving New York City since the start of the pandemic. Opera singer Cheryl Warfield could be one of them. So you're going to stay? I may not. After 9-11, I was here in 9-11, my family expected me to move back home. But you stayed. But I stayed. But I may not be able to stay through this. The Department of Homeless Services in this city say this, says that this program has saved lives. And while there were missteps in the beginning, they have increased staff and services available. But Dr. Martin told us there is no level of staff and services that they would find suitable. They want a date for this program to end. This morning, a reckoning in Rochester. Anger over the death of Daniel Prude, fueling another night of standoffs between police and protesters. The city's leaders mobilizing a group of church elders to serve as a buffer, attempting to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens. The city's mayor and police chief so far rejecting growing calls to resign. Chief Laron Singletary claiming a small group of agitators are disturbing otherwise peaceful gatherings. There are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke. Prude died in March, seven days after he was restrained by officers. But the release of police body camera footage last week showing Prude's arrest sparked outrage in the community. New York's attorney general is now calling a grand jury as part of the investigation. We need to be able to call the police for help and for help to come to us and not to be afraid that a loved one may lose their life. Portland reached a grim milestone this weekend. On the 100th night of protest, police declared a riot, arresting more than 50 people. 
As tensions flared, one protester is seen on fire. In New York City, protests became violent Friday. Rioters shattering windows and damaging Manhattan businesses, including this Starbucks. Eight were arrested. It's my blood in the and on Derby Day, dueling but peaceful protests in Louisville as hundreds demanding justice for Breonna Taylor came face to face with armed, self-described militia groups. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake, paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times by police, spoke from his hospital bed. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. And not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and life can be taken from you like this, man. And the investigation continues in Kenosha as well as here in Rochester. And demonstrators say they will continue demanding justice for Daniel Prude because the suspension for the officers in his arrest just isn't enough. This morning, colleges nationwide taking drastic measures to keep COVID-19 under control. Northeastern University suspending 11 freshmen for the semester after they were caught partying in this hotel doubling as a dorm, violating school rules. I hate to say it, but Northeastern gave out a lot of information and like regards as to like what the protocols and so it kind of, they had it coming. In a statement, Northeastern officials said in part, cooperation and compliance with public health guidelines is absolutely essential. Those people who do not follow the guidelines are putting everyone else at risk. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, students at nine fraternity and sorority houses were ordered to quarantine for 14 days after nearly 40 tested positive. I never heard of parties or anything, but you know it's tough when you're living in a house with uh, 50 people. Like One person can uh, ruin it for everybody. The school saying, our goal is to stop any further spread of the virus among our students and the broader community. Parties like this one near the University of South Carolina, part of the problem. Some schools taking more serious steps. SUNY Oneonta canceling all on-campus classes for the entire semester. 100 cases at SUNY Oneonta became 600 cases at SUNY Oneonta in four days. This spreads quickly. Colleges, not the only potential flashpoint. A wedding in Maine in early August is now being blamed for nearly 150 cases and three deaths in communities as far as 100 miles away. As Labor Day weekend comes to a close, the question and concern for many leaders, could festivities end up being super spreaders? After the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. So let's hope that we can celebrate safely. A cautious message that's not always heard. We just came to have a good time and relax. Uh, really not afraid of COVID. Now, as for those 11 Northeastern students who were punished for partying, they won't be able to take online classes or get refunded that tuition worth up to $36,000. However, they can still appeal that dismissal. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed. But some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begin to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but yes, now, I, now that 
the, again, the cases have been kind of surging. It is, it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India just surpassed Brazil to become the second worst afflicted country in the world. But, you know, both of those countries are still far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the U.S. This morning, Coral Springs, Florida is using a simple 15-minute antigen test on its essential personnel firefighters, police, and city workers. No blood samples required, just a swab from the back of the throat mixed with a solution and placed into a tray. If it turns blue, then it's positive for coronavirus. There's no better feeling than to be able to tell a family a result right on the spot before they leave, because then you can counsel them, you could help them know what to do next. To date, other COVID tests have required long waits, in some cases up to 15 days. While waiting for those results, some Americans do not quarantine, which can spread the virus even more. Dr. Deborah Burks talked about the promise of these rapid tests, just as the pandemic started overwhelming our nation. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly exp trying to detect the actual live virus. This 15-minute rapid antigen test now in use in Coral Springs was developed in China. Studies on Chinese healthcare workers showed the test was accurate 80.2% of the time. This antigen test comes from China, where they say 80% success. But should we be suspect simply because this is China? I would say that as a scientist, as a researcher, I would be suspect of any test that comes to me for evaluation. If it came from China or England or New Zealand or even within America, I would say that those tests all have to be validated. This 15-minute rapid antigen test is still unproven in the United States. Dr. Peter Antevi, who is the medical director for the Coral Springs Fire Department, follows each antigen test with a more accurate, time-consuming test that examines DNA, those comparisons to be shared with the FDA. While an admittedly small test sample in Coral Springs, the 15-minute rapid tests have been 86% accurate. And while 86% accurate isn't perfect, Harvard professor Dr. Ranu Dillon says the way to make up for that failure rate is repeated testing. 80% success rate means 20% aren't caught. Is that good enough? That definitely is good enough if you're testing frequently. So if I, you test one day and you're in that 20% where you're missed, but then you test yourself again the next day or two days later, the likelihood of being missed both of those times is exceedingly low. The FDA says antigen tests will play a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. For cities like Coral Springs, these rapid antigen tests are not only cheaper, but employees are not sidelined for days while waiting for results. And now you got a 15 minute result and? I'll be going home tonight and having dinner with my family. Because you are? Negative. Put a swab to the back of your throat. I took that 15 minute test. I am a little anxious. Aside from the gag reflex when my throat was swabbed, it was easy. And getting near instant results reduces anxiety. So I'm all clear. You're all clear. Good. <laughs> Thank God. Your colorful mask is working, Carrie. So where might we see these tests widely <laughs> used first? Uh, initially, we'll probably see them in workplaces where people go back to work and also at schools. Now, the test that I took is not the Abbott test. That one we'll begin seeing in about 30 days, and the cost is about $5. So, guys, we're probably yeah. going to see these very soon, just about everywhere. Certainly progress. Flying can be more unpredictable than ever. NBC News correspondents reporting from airports across the country share what's happening. I was going to get a bite to eat, but a lot of places are still closed right now. Some airlines are making sure that everyone is socially distanced, while others are pretty much packing a full flight. People wearing masks for the most part and keeping distance, as you can see over my shoulder. So we are officially on our flight. And the way we get our snacks have also changed. AAA estimates 15 million people will fly this summer, down 74% from last year. As travelers slowly return to airports, how can you reduce risk? 
I asked Dr. Henry Wu, director of Emory University's Travel Well Center. What's your advice when it comes specifically to flying and air travel? We're still in a phase where uh, travelers need to look carefully at their reasons for travel and not travel unless it's very urgent. Dr. Wu has treated patients who he believes contracted coronavirus while flying and others who may have unknowingly spread the virus during air travel. If you are going to fly, consider this risk checklist. Your destination, is it a hot spot? And do people there wear masks as recommended by the CDC? Where will you stay? Who will you interact with? And what's your plan if you or someone in your group contracts coronavirus? Ask, will you be required to quarantine at your destination or when you come home? If you decide to fly, make sure to plan ahead, especially if you're traveling with kids. Wear clothes with a lot of pockets. You want room to stash those snacks. And of course, keep a pocket open for your ID and your phone for quick access. And don't forget to bring extra masks. Remember, TSA is now allowing up to 12 ounces of hand sanitizer per person. So even a big bottle like this is allowed. And you wanna keep your disinfectant wipes in an outside pocket so they're easy to get to. I also like these little bottles of hand sanitizer that you can clip onto a belt loop or attach to your bag for easy access. And consider putting your kids in clothes that have pockets too. Remind them to put their hands in their pockets and not to touch anything when they get to the airport or on the plane. Got it, Emmy? Got it. At the airport, maintain social distancing of at least six feet from others. One of our producers shot this video at the Denver airport, showing passengers crowded together at check-in. But at New York's LaGuardia Airport, I had plenty of space in the security line. You may also notice that a lot of restaurants are closed. That's why it's really important to pack your own food. And keep in mind, the restaurants that are open will probably be limited, and you may have to wait in super long lines. Another tip, use the bathroom before your flight, especially if you're traveling with kids, so no one has to leave their seats during the flight. Once on board, wipe down all the surfaces you might touch, including the tray, the screen, and the seatbelt buckle. As for your seat, is there one that's considered safest? Dr. Wu says choose a window seat because you're less likely to come in contact with passengers and crew walking the aisle. What about breathing the air in an airplane cabin? The uh, good news is that our modern aircraft have very efficient and effective air filtration systems. That, however, does not eliminate the risk of somebody immediately around you. Wash your hands with soap and water once you land and keep that mask on until you're out of the airport, part of the new normal to reduce your risk of getting sick. And if you are wondering whether you should wear goggles or a face shield in addition to your mask, there's no definitive answer, but Dr. Anthony Fauci believes it could help protect you. So not a bad idea to play it safe and wear some eye protection on that flight. Is there anything else consumers can do to reduce their risk? I, I'm sitting here listening to your every word. I miss my grandparents. I miss my family. I want to go home. I think my fear is I do all of those things. But when I get home and see my older family members, I don't know if I did it the right way and I don't have two weeks to stay at home. You know what I mean? Right. right. You don't have that time and space. Yeah. One thing you can do if you are going somewhere, you have to go somewhere, book a nonstop flight. Sometimes it's uh. more expensive, but if you think about it, two flights means you're exposing yourself to an entire second group of people, essentially doubling your exposure, not to mention the layover in the other airport. So if you can at least take a flight that goes to and from A to B. That's good advice. Yeah. All right. It feels like an eternity ago since I, I got know. on a plane. And there's some Assistant estimates memory. are saying, yeah, and some estimates are saying we will not get back to normal travel till 2024 because of business travel having to mm -hmm. increase again. So wow. it is a tough, challenging time. Everybody's yeah. realizing you can work from home. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. good. All right, Vicki, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's turn now to Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, to drill down on what to expect with the fall approaching. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. So let's dig in here. Today is Labor Day, and it's more likely, you know, that there will be large gatherings that are happening. Um, tell me this. Should we be concerned that we're going to see this big spike, or do you think that people will heed the warning? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, both after Memorial Day and July 4th, we saw pretty big spikes. Uh, I'm hopeful people will be a bit more careful this time. Again, there's nothing wrong with getting outside and going to a beach or going to a park. It's those large gatherings indoors that are really, really deadly. And that's what we have to avoid. And, you know, the temperatures are starting to get colder in some parts of the country. So that limits people being able to hang out outside. So is that a big concern for the fall that more people are going to be inside? Yes, I think a lot of us in the public health community are worried about what's going to happen this fall. Um, as you said, the weather is going to start getting colder. People are going to start spending more time indoors. 
That's where the virus likes to spread. Uh, and so that's part of the reason we wanted to get the caseloads as low as possible as we entered into the fall. Unfortunately, we still have 40 to 50,000 people getting infected every day. So mm. I think we have some work to do before it gets much colder. Well, speaking of which, a hot topic today, we've also seen colleges having issues, you know, keeping kids healthy and they're cracking down. But are administrators, in your opinion, doing enough to protect the students or what should they be doing additionally? Yeah, so look, I, I'm I'm all in for get, making students be more responsible, but administrators have to be responsible too, and 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 they're the adults. Mm -hmm. And what colleges need to be doing is having a plan for quarantining, a plan for surveillance testing. A lot of colleges and universities have put in surveillance testing. I think that's pretty essential. Uh, when colleges don't do their part and then just blame the students, I find that very frustrating and and personally irresponsible. Colleges have a have a responsibility here as well. Mm -hmm. Doctor, we. Uh wanted to get to some viewer questions. We put the call out for questions. And Donna Naples in Florida, uh, she asked on Twitter, my child has gone back to school. What's the best way to make sure backpacks and lunch boxes traveling back and forth each day are sanitized to prevent the spread of germs in their house? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I don't think you need to do anything particularly uh, different. Uh, obviously, wash the lunch boxes after every day. Uh, uh, maybe a little extra hand hygiene. So what I do when I, for instance, pick up groceries from the store is after I put everything away, I wash my hands uh, a bit more assiduously. And, and that's I would do the same thing with lunch boxes for my kids when they get back to, from school. We have a good question from Instagram. When is the best time to get the flu shot this year? Well, most important is to get the flu shot uh, now, later, uh, when it becomes available. Um, so in general, I've been advising people that as soon as the flu vaccine becomes available, uh, people should go out and get it. Here's another question. Do you think it's important for high school student athletes to be tested regularly? That's a very good question. In general, I've been pushing high schools in general when they open up to have some amount of surveillance testing if possible. In terms of student athletes, I don't know if they're at that much higher risk. It depends a little bit on what sport. So I have a I have a high schooler who runs track. Okay. I don't know that she's at particularly increased risk, but football, soccer, where you're going to be spending time indoors in locker rooms, maybe that's a bit of a higher risk situation and, and more testing would be useful. We have another viewer question finally, something I hadn't thought of. It says, should our children shower or bathe? as soon as they get home from school? You know, schools are not some super high-risk place they're going into. I mean, we saw this with doctors and nurses who were working in COVID units who would come home and immediately shower. That's fine. Schools are not that. They're not okay. super dangerous places. I don't think you need to do anything different. Maybe extra careful, like washing hands and making sure that uh, stuff is put away. But other than that, I wouldn't do anything differently. All right. Well, Dr. Jha, thanks for your advice and thanks for joining us this morning. Calming presence this morning, yes. doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Facility. Moral of the story, keep washing your hands. Yeah, really. Always. In terrain too remote and jagged for any vehicles, this rescue was all about human force. <laughs> I don't think I would have made it out, especially uh, without any other adults. What started out as a camping trip for Peter Monroe and his family soon became a 48-hour trial of survival. It's very steep and rugged up there, so it can be a problem. Peter, his seven-year-old daughter Layla and yellow lab Buck had gone into the rugged Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood last Tuesday to set up camp for his family at Kinzel Lake. But when his wife Camille arrived later in the day and they were missing, she went searching, discovered his truck at the nearby trailhead with the keys and Layla's stuffed animals still inside, called 911. Rescuers immediately deployed multiple agencies. When there's children involved, uh you know, that's the top priority. The search included more than 50 rescuers, search dogs, Air Force pararescue jumpers, and a construction crew that helped move vehicles across difficult terrain, saving searchers valuable time. Thursday morning, 48 hours after they'd hiked into the woods, rescuers found the trio trapped deep in a canyon ravine near a stream. They had worked their way about 2,000 meters down a 3,000 meter canyon but they were exhausted and not able to move any further without assistance. Peter had injured his ankle and knee on the hike down and could not walk. Crews stabilized him in a litter and manually hauled him up the 2,000 meters. Rescuers carried Layla, dehydrated and exhausted. The grateful Monroe thanked the rescuers from the back of the ambulance. You guys, you guys saved myself and my daughter's and my dog's life. As for Buck, who climbed out without any assistance, the dog was done. <laughs> the dog got up to the road and just 
fell out. He was done. It was good to see them all safe and sound. A harrowing ordeal with a happy ending. Peter is out of the hospital and recovering at home. The family has asked for privacy, asked for Buck the dog. Maybe a while before he heads out back on any hikes, at least anytime soon. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. For most, city life means a trade-off, space for location. So when coronavirus hit and everyone was stuck in their small homes, walls closed in fast. What was life like in your house at the height of the pandemic with homeschooling and remote work? It was a chaos in the house. With three children growing more restless day by day. I think they started having anxiety at the end when they couldn't come out. So it was more like, we want to go out, we want to play. I don't understand why we're being locked down inside the house. Podiatrist Rehana and Saudi Alam decided it was time to move their family out of New York City to the Long Island suburbs, eventually finding this house, adding a half hour to the commute, but lots more space. Is it fair to say that you guys weren't the only ones with this idea? Yes, oh, no. <laughs> for sure. No. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, right? it's, uh, it was definitely not the buyer's market. It, I, I mean, it's everybody was uh, fighting for, for the houses here. The suburbs near New York are booming. In July, home sales were up 44 percent compared to last year, while the number of properties sold in Manhattan dropped by more than half. People are leaving San Francisco, too. There are more than double the properties on the market in the city now compared to last year. So there's no question people are definitely either moving to other areas outside the city or they're at least buying second homes. Parts of the East Bay, very, very competitive. Napa Valley, very, very competitive. Tahoe is probably having one of the hottest markets they've had in a decade. But for now, the trend appears limited to a handful of big, expensive cities. 
we looked at a slew of housing data comparing urban and suburban markets and concluded that you know, the story of a mass exodus from cities is largely overblown. Moving is costly, reserved for those who have the means. For many, upgrading to more space in the suburbs isn't an option, especially renters who are only just scraping by. The alums say they feel blessed they were able to get their family out. We don't feel like this is New York. Um, I feel like we're in another state and it's, it's beautiful. Nothing quite like a backyard and a sigh of relief. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Long Island, New York. Back at airport checkpoints today. Go ahead and pull out your ID and pull down your mask, please. The biggest flow of passengers since the pandemic began, 900,000 travelers nationwide, but still more than a million fewer travelers than a year ago. Airport terminals, concourses, and ticket counters remain eerily quiet. And that one right here? Passengers that do travel will notice big changes at TSA checkpoints. Social distancing markers on the floor, plexiglass to separate officers and passengers, and new self-service kiosks for touchless check-in. That automatically compare photo IDs with the airline's trip information. Here's how it works. You slide your driver's license into the reader. It automatically then takes a look at your photograph and scans your face to make sure the photograph matches. It then matches your photograph with your flight reservation on file, and you're good to go. Admiral David Pekoski is the TSA chief. As soon as I removed that driver's license from the machine, all the image data was removed. You're not holding on to it. You're not saving anybody's information. No. Despite a 75% drop in passenger traffic, the TSA reports the ratio of gun confiscations per traveler has tripled, and 80% of the guns are loaded. Most passengers claim they simply forgot their gun was in a bag. But the first offense comes with a federal fine of up to $4,100, plus the possibility of local criminal charges. The TSA expects passenger volume will pick up next year, though the CEO of United says getting back to normal will depend on widespread vaccinations. We're modeling it as if we're not back to normal. Uh, We're not back to 2019 levels until 2024. But that's just a guess. In the meantime, the TSA is upgrading its CT scanners to get a better view inside carry-on bags without requiring hand checks. And new software in the full body scanners to reduce the need for pat-downs, trying to make the checkpoint experience touchless. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. What does it mean to be American? What precisely defines Americanism? Almost everything you know about America, I mean everything, is wrong. Americans are seen as one of, if not the most individualistic cultures on Earth. Just read the coverage on our aversion to wearing masks. But were we always this individualistic? And if not, what happened? The frontier is our fantasy. And it was full of people who were renegades or individuals, but what, it was short-lived. It always was followed by corporatism or communalism. It was more a, a church group moved to a certain place so that they could form a community separate from outside influence. So that's not individualism, but it is sort of a, a, a rugged independence. This is Think Again with me, Andrew Stern where I take you every step of the way as I dig into compelling, complex, or controversial topics that make us wonder, do we need to think again? The debate over what makes Americans Americans isn't a new one. It didn't begin with Alexis de Tocqueville in 1835 when he published Democracy in America, but he did turbocharge the conversation. He wrote that the Anglo-American relies upon personal interests to accomplish his ends and gives free scope to the unguided strength and common sense of the people. In trying to describe the ethos of our country, he kickstarted a debate about what defines our national culture, a debate that continues to this day. Ralph Waldo Emerson made the case for primacy of individualism in his seminal 1841 work, Self-Reliance. In it, he wrote that no law can be sacred to me, but that of my nature. The only right is what is after my constitution, the only wrong, what is against it? Eighty years later, in his 1922 book American Individualism, President Herbert Hoover wrote, Individualism has been the primary force of American civilization for three centuries. It is our sort of individualism that has supplied the motivation of America's political, economic, and spiritual institution in all these years. These theories have guided a lot of contemporary conservative thought. In 2010, Ramesh Panuru and Rich Lowry of the National Review wrote, What do we as American conservatives want to conserve? The answer is simple. The pillars of American exceptionalism. It is freer, more individualistic, more democratic, and more open and dynamic than any other nation on Earth. But are we actually more individualistic than any other nation on Earth? Whatever the story is, if you say anything that's universal, it's wrong. Um, if you think it's simple, it's not. And if you're trying to serve contemporary ends by shaping the past, you're not doing anything that's unique. Historian Barry Shane has written extensively about American individualism. His central message to me was that our national story isn't that straightforward. It's not one specific clean narrative, and it certainly isn't consistent over time. Almost no one likes uh, America's real history because it's not convenient. The rise of individualism, I think, is partly a story we tell ourselves. A lot of the qualitative data backs up his assertion. The International Social Survey Program has asked 50 plus nations the same questions every few years since 1984. It tracks national attitudes toward a host of issues. One question asked, does a good citizen follow the law no matter what, even if it's against their conscience? U.S. respondents were less likely to follow their conscience than people in France, Switzerland, and nine other nations. Another question asked, should people support their country even if the country is wrong? 
Americans were more likely to support their country over their individual conscience than 20 other nations, including Russia, South Korea, Israel, South Africa, and Belgium. Now, we do score way higher on individualism when the questions are about, say, the government's role in providing health care or decreasing income inequality. So we aren't a community-focused society like Japan. But we also aren't uniquely, fiercely individualistic, unlike any other country on Earth, either. To whatever degree America's individualistic, I think we probably exaggerate and we do disservice to the 18th centuries. It really hadn't become a, a conscious aspiration until people looked back in the 19th century and said, oh yeah, they were individualistic. Everything having to do with the founding is about finding uh, narratives that are supportive of contemporary political aspirations. Whatever America is or was, it's complicated. There's always multiple streams of meaning. And when you emphasize one at the expense of, of others, you're distorting it. In America's history, community and individualism are not necessarily at odds. They go hand in hand. I think a lot of what makes America unique is that you do get to, to some extent, choose what you belong to. Tim Carney wrote Alienated America. In it, he chronicles the historical rise and more recent decline of community in America. In his telling, America has always been about a balance between community and individualism. That's one way I, I always think of America, and I think it's passed through our kind of cultural DNA over the centuries, that when we are defining ourselves, it's often as part of a group that we're joining and that we want that group to be able to operate freely. My main argument is the American dream is dead, can't be understood as just an economic argument, but a social argument, a lack of belonging and attachment. In Carney's telling, America's history is one defined by rugged independence, but an independence in service of our chosen communities, not really individualism per se. Americans settled new land, sure, but society and religious community invariably followed, usually organized around their specific religious affiliation or church. They wanted the ability to live their lives free of interference, but as a community. It wasn't until the mid 20th century that the hyper individualism that we see today started to take hold. First on the left, but then later on the right. You know, the 1960s, the me generation um, was largely about nobody else gets to define you. You get to define yourself. In recent years, in the recent decade or two, there's been an over individualist shift on the American right. Political thinkers like Ayn Rand began influencing more and more of the conservative conversation through the late 20th century. The reason I got involved in public service, um, by and large, if I had to credit one thinker, one person, it would be Ayn Rand. Rand, through influential books like The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, invented an entire school of philosophy called objectivism, which holds that the proper moral purpose of one's life is the pursuit of one's own happiness. True, laissez-faire, unbridled capitalism was the only way forward. It was these principles that helped shape modern conservatism. But according to Carney, that isn't the real American way. At least, not the America of our actual history. And today, we still seek out community. It's just a different, more hollow version of community than it used to be. Everybody ends up signing up for one tribe or another. No matter how individualistic you are, you're going to join something. And if more of what we're joining are these sort of national political causes with red jerseys and blue jerseys, or worse, extremist movements, then the worse off will certainly be. You can't replace actual physical community with something virtual or something national. So in that way, I do think that we have a, a damaging hyper-individualism that also manifests itself as an over-centralization. The ISSP data backs him up here. When asked how close they feel to their country, Americans rank 20th. But when asked how close they feel to their city or town, we were dead last, 33rd out of 33. There always needs to be a proper balance between a community-mindedness and, and individualism. That over-centralization can be too much of a threat or that the loss of individuality can be too much of a threat and that we actually have both happening at the same time right now. On the American right, I think they are both happening at the same time. I think that people are less likely to be, to belong to something, to attend church regularly, and more likely to the one thing they are gonna join is wearing a red hat with Make America Great Again. 
So they're giving up a human level community and belonging to something else, which can't be as meaningful because it's much more distant. For us, it was critically important to ensure that folks that live in the community could see entrepreneurs of color doing well and, and winning so that we can reimagine what we once understood to be vibrant African-American community. It's an area that doesn't get much attention, doesn't get much love. It's my duty and obligation as a black man, as a business owner, to always pour back into the community. So much has happened in the community and to be able to see the growth of where everything happened with the civil unrest to where we are now is huge growth. The recent unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin over the shooting of Jacob Blake by police sparks memories of what happened four years ago, just 40 miles away. In 2016, the fatal police shooting of Silville Smith led to a weekend of unrest in Milwaukee's Sherman Park neighborhood, a predominantly black community in the city's northwest. Property was destroyed, including a BMO Harris Bank. But the rebuild led to the creation of the Sherman Phoenix, a hub for local businesses that is now the heartbeat of the community. There is this dynamic tension here when I think about Milwaukee between hope and possibility, struggle and the need for change. The space is home to more than two dozen businesses of color, from apparel to beauty to wellness and food. We wanted to make sure that the Sherman Phoenix was a reflection of a well-thriving community offering. So we had to think about um, kind of a clever mix that would attract a diverse group of folks, kind of what can't you get on Amazon? We wanted this resurgence um, of opportunity and we wanted the entrepreneurs to be a reflection of the community in which they would serve. This is a community that I grew up in, so I have a connection just with seeing people that look like me and that came from the same area as me to be able to prosper. Truman McGee owns Funky Fresh Spring Rolls, a company which prides itself on using local ingredients and never being fried. My part in this is giving healthier food options to people that has never had access to it. You know, that means a lot to me. A lot of people from the area, they don't know what quinoa is. Like, we got quinoa bowls on our menu. People are like, what? Quinoa? Hey, just, just give me that rice stuff, right? They don't know. A lot of people haven't heard of kale. A lot of people haven't heard of avocado or never tried avocado. So just being able to educate people and, and show people like, like, we mix these great, natural, fresh things together, you could create some great things. Unfortunately, in our community, there's not a lot of really healthy places to eat. There's not a lot of healthy places to go. And there's not a whole lot of talk about health and wellness. And so Sherman Phoenix allowed to have that space to be able to have that dialogue, that conversation about what does it look like to live well, to be well, and also to think well. Lakia Jones runs Amri Counseling Services a mental health and substance abuse clinic with a location in the complex. As an African-American woman and really in African-American community, we were taught not to take problems outside of the home. And um, if you did that, you got into trouble, some serious trouble. That mindset has created huge problems and has created trauma that continue to exist year after year after year after year as it relates to our community. And so it's really important that we, as a community, start to really have open and honest dialogue around how different issues in our life are affecting our mental health. Having a, a mental health um, service provider normalizes the need and opportunity. You know, even giving tours, just people on the tour will take a card. I've never been to an you know, African-American therapist before. I'll take a card. So it's anecdotally, we've been affirmed that um, it was very much needed service. Like businesses across the country, COVID-19 brought on some unforeseen challenges for the Phoenix. It was devastating at first. It was absolutely devastating. You know, our numbers were down, some by 50 to 70%. And so they needed a moment to breathe, to be able to strategize. So we provided um, so far three months of rent relief to allow our businesses to focus um, 
on not paying rent, um, but really staying um, solvent amidst all of the um, kind of upheaval caused by COVID. I know that um, a lot of other entrepreneurs in other buildings weren't afforded that same opportunity. So it was really a gift for us to be able to rally and utilize our fundraising skills in our network. Truman was able to launch a delivery service while also starting to sell his product Frozen. Lakia managed to pivot to telehealth, offering virtual sessions to her clients. With the country facing a reckoning around racial disparity, communities hard as hit by the pandemic, police brutality, opportunities in the workplace, Joanne thinks the Sherman Phoenix can be a model for other cities. It's a visual, it's a real lived experience around how do we create pathways into the economy, but how do we also nurture our well-being? How do we nurture people of color? How do we nurture folks from all walks of life? So I think it's a critical important, not just to Milwaukee, but to the nation around what's possible when we invest in redeveloping our corridors in our central cities. All around us. The Labor Day weekend taking a terrifying turn for over 200 people in California's Sierra National Forest as flames, hot embers, and thick smoke from the Creek Fire quickly surrounded and trapped campers at Mammoth Pool Reservoir. You can see smoke, but they said it was like 22 miles away. And uh, it was very fast. And it was literally clean. like, oh my God, there's fire right there. Just keep going. Oh go, 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 go. Just keep Juliana Park and her friends, who were hiking in the area, were some of the last to make it out by car. The fire looks like it's going to just grab the car, and we could feel the heat just throughout the vehicle. By Saturday night, the fire had devoured over 36,000 acres, blocking the only way out of the campground. The race to save lives forced to go airborne. I believe there's probably other people that are sheltered in the meadow, unknown at this time of uh, how many may still exist out there. In the middle of the night, first responders rushing trapped campers onto military helicopters to reach safety. As soon as we were in the helicopter, we flew over the fires and you couldn't see anything but pitch black and fire. That's all we could see. We saw firsthand why those evacuations were so critical. The smoke and haze has turned day to night as firefighters face yet another challenge on the front line. Many of the injuries are lacerations, broken bones and, and those kind of things and, and the kind of injuries you'd see when somebody's attempting to flee the fire. As ambulances rush to treat the injured, families and their young children grateful they survive. I'm glad to be alive. But across the state, the danger is still very real as flames fueled by triple digit temperatures threaten to destroy anything in its path. Outside of Fresno here, the Creek Fire is still burning totally out of control across California. More than 20 wildfires are burning across the region. And we should mention one outside of Los Angeles was started by a smoke grenade at a gender reveal party. This morning, headline making new claims from the former senior FBI agent at the center of the Bureau's Russia investigation. In a new memoir, Peter Strzok takes sharp aim at the man he once investigated, President Trump. And NBC's chief White House correspondent, Hallie Jackson, sat down with him. Hallie, good morning. Peter Chanel, good morning to you. You know, to the president, Peter Strzok is a symbol of what he believes is the deep state trying to take him down. And he's targeted the former FBI agent with a number of insults, including calling him a fraud. But Strzok calls his new book compromised because he believes the president has been with foreign countries holding leverage over him. It's a warning he's now delivering in the starkest of terms. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. 
Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. I was born in a and he's one of the agents former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S., charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure, improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like, F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero, and about a possible Trump victory, we'll stop it giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, a relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some, whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. The Republican-led Senate Judiciary Committee, which is investigating the Russia investigation, has authorized subpoenas for officials, including Strzok. He tells me if he is subpoenaed, he will testify. New fallout from the president's latest war over words. I, I say what I say. Disputing allegations, he disparaged fallen soldiers as suckers and losers in some private conversations, as first reported by The Atlantic. There is nobody that feels more strongly about our soldiers, our wounded warriors, our soldiers that died in war than I do. Now attacking Atlantic co-owner Laureen Powell Jobs, widow of Apple's Steve Jobs. Trump tweeting Sunday, Steve Jobs would not be happy that his wife is wasting money he left her on a failing radical left magazine. Call her, write her, let her know how you feel. Cabinet officials coming to the president's defense. Veteran Secretary Robert Wilkie. And I would be offended too if I thought it was true. And Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. The president has always been 100% supportive of the military. The president, whose only public outings this weekend were to his Virginia golf course, dismissed the allegations as a campaign season attack, calling it a hoax. Joe Biden, now leading by 10 points in a new national poll, went out to Catholic Mass in Delaware Sunday as his campaign seized on the Trump military controversy, rushing this months old ad back on the air. Joe Biden understands the awesome power, responsibility, and sacred duty of being commander in chief. Posting new video of veterans reacting to the suckers and losers allegation. It's filled with losers. It's filled with heroes. Today, Biden running mate Kamala Harris will make her first solo campaign trip, visiting union workers in Wisconsin. 
Sunday, she challenged the president over his claims a COVID vaccine could be ready by November. I would not trust his word. I would trust the word of public health experts and scientists, but not Donald Trump. And Senator Harris would not say whether she would take a COVID vaccine herself. Late this spring, shocking headlines and viral photos. A wealthy Manhattan neighborhood seemingly overrun with an increase in homeless men and women. Residents sounding the alarm. What we've really noticed is the increase in these sort of incidents. Open and illicit drug use, needles on the ground, things that I actually could not have ever imagined would have occurred just even a few weeks ago. On the Upper West Side, four vacant tourist hotels were converted to temporary homeless shelters, more than 700 residents moving in, all part of a citywide effort to stop devastating coronavirus spread in a vulnerable population. During a virtual community board meeting, shelter leaders explained they had to move fast. Normally it takes about two years or more to create a shelter. We had about two weeks notice for each hotel we opened. That meant in some cases the facilities weren't ready or important details overlooked, like sex offenders with residency restrictions placed at the Belle Claire, around the corner from an elementary school. The shelter says they've since been moved out. Dr. Megan Martin started a group of concerned neighbors pushing to end the program, threatening to file a lawsuit if the city doesn't act. The city was in an emergency situation. These shelters were incredibly dangerous. They had to act quickly. Why was this not an appropriate solution? We replaced one public health crisis with another. They've moved many of these individuals without the resources that they need. But as the firestorm grew, those who support the shelters also took action, some suggesting that their neighbors were insensitive and even intolerant. I have not seen any kind of danger or any kind of deterioration of quality life. And I walk past the Belle Claire every single morning. College professor Melissa Sanchez organized neighborhood families to draw welcoming messages to residents, triggering this angry exchange with a grandmother passing by. Are you surprised personally, someone who lives in this community, to see how angry people have gotten and how fraught this issue has been? I'm really surprised. We know that people here are getting treatment. We also know that the strongest predictor for successful treatment is support of the community. One in particular that said everyone needs a home. When I saw that, that really touched me. But while anger flared on both sides, major crime rates actually fell. According to the NYPD, overall crime rates in the area are down over 5% from the same May through August time period last year. Under pressure, Mayor Bill de Blasio now says people will be moved back into established shelters as the health situation improves. But for some, it may be too late. We do know many families who do not feel safe and who have put their apartments for sale. Contributing to a wave of people leaving New York City since the start of the pandemic. Opera singer Cheryl Warfield could be one of them. So you're going to stay? I may not. After 9-11, I was here in 9-11, my family expected me to move back home. But you stayed. But I stayed. But I may not be able to stay through this. The Department of Homeless Services in this city say this, says that this program has saved lives. And while there were missteps in the beginning, they have increased staff and services available. But Dr. Martin told us there is no level of staff and services that they would find suitable. They want a date for this program to end. This morning, a reckoning in Rochester. Anger over the death of Daniel Prude, fueling another night of standoffs between police and protesters. The city's leaders mobilizing a group of church elders to serve as a buffer, attempting to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens. The city's mayor and police chief so far rejecting growing calls to resign. Chief Leron Singletary claiming a small group of agitators are disturbing otherwise peaceful gatherings. There are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke. 
Prude died in March, seven days after he was restrained by officers. But the release of police body camera footage last week showing Prude's arrest sparked outrage in the community. New York's attorney general is now calling a grand jury as part of the investigation. We need to be able to call the police for help and for help to come to us and not to be afraid that a loved one may lose their life. Portland reached a grim milestone this weekend. On the 100th night of protest, police declared a riot, arresting more than 50 people. As tensions flared, one protester is seen on fire. In New York City, protests became violent Friday. Rioters shattering windows and damaging Manhattan businesses, including this Starbucks. Eight were arrested. And on Derby Day, dueling but peaceful protests in Louisville as hundreds demanding justice for Breonna Taylor came face to face with armed, self-described militia groups. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake, paralyzed from the waist down after being shot seven times by police, spoke from his hospital bed. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat, and not only just your life, your legs, something that you need to move around and move forward and like could be taken from you like this, man. And the investigation continues in Kenosha as well as here in Rochester. And demonstrators say they will continue demanding justice for Daniel Prude because the suspension for the officers in his arrest just isn't enough. This morning, colleges nationwide taking drastic measures to keep COVID-19 under control. Northeastern University suspending 11 freshmen for the semester after they were caught partying in this hotel doubling as a dorm, violating school rules. I hate to say, but Northeastern gave out a lot of information and like regards as to like what the protocols and so it kind of they had it coming. In a statement, Northeastern officials said in part, cooperation and compliance with public health guidelines is absolutely essential. Those people who do not follow the guidelines are putting everyone else at risk. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, students at nine fraternity and sorority houses were ordered to quarantine for 14 days after nearly 40 tested positive. I never heard of parties or anything, but you know it's tough when you're living in a house with uh, 50 people. Like One person can uh, ruin it for everybody. The school saying, our goal is to stop any further spread of the virus among our students and the broader community. Parties like this one near the University of South Carolina, part of the problem. Some schools taking more serious steps. SUNY Oneonta canceling all on-campus classes for the entire semester. 100 cases at SUNY Oneonta became 600 cases at SUNY Oneonta in four days. This spreads quickly. Colleges, not the only potential flashpoint. A wedding in Maine in early August is now being blamed for nearly 150 cases and three deaths in communities as far as 100 miles away. As Labor Day weekend comes to a close, the question and concern for many leaders, could festivities end up being super spreaders? After the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. So let's hope that we can celebrate safely. A cautious message that's not always heard. We just came to have a good time and relax. Uh, really not afraid of COVID. Now, as for those 11 Northeastern students who were punished for partying, they won't be able to take online classes or get refunded that tuition worth up to $36,000. However, they can still appeal that dismissal. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed. But some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. 
The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begin to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but yes, now I now that the again the cases have been kind of surging, it is it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India just surpassed Brazil uh, to become the second worst afflicted country in the world. But, you know, both of those countries are still far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the U.S. This morning, Coral Springs, Florida is using a simple 15-minute antigen test on its essential personnel. Firefighters, police, and city workers. No blood samples required. Just a swab from the back of the throat mixed with a solution and placed into a tray. If it turns blue, then it's positive for coronavirus. There's no better feeling than to be able to tell a family a result right on the spot before they leave because then you can counsel them, you could help them know what to do next. To date, other COVID tests have required long waits, in some cases up to 15 days. While waiting for those results, some Americans do not quarantine, which can spread the virus even more. Dr. Deborah Burks talked about the promise of these rapid tests, just as the pandemic started overwhelming our nation. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly exp trying to detect the actual live virus. This 15-minute rapid antigen test now in use in Coral Springs was developed in China. Studies on Chinese healthcare workers showed the test was accurate 80.2% of the time. This antigen test comes from China, where they say 80% success. But should we be suspect simply because this is China? I would say that as a scientist, as a researcher, I would be suspect of any test that comes to me for evaluation. If it came from China or England or New Zealand or even within America, I would say that those tests all have to be validated. This 15-minute rapid antigen test is still unproven in the United States. Dr. Peter Antevi, who is the medical director for the Coral Springs Fire Department, follows each antigen test with a more accurate, time-consuming test that examines DNA, those comparisons to be shared with the FDA. While an admittedly small test sample in Coral Springs, the 15-minute rapid tests have been 86% accurate. And while 86% accurate isn't perfect, Harvard professor Dr. Ranu Dillon says the way to make up for that failure rate is repeated testing. 80% success rate means 20% aren't caught. Is that good enough? That definitely is good enough if you're testing frequently. So if I, you test one day and you're in that 20% where you're missed, but then you test yourself again the next day or two days later, the likelihood of being missed both of those times is exceedingly low. The FDA says antigen tests will play a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. For cities like Coral Springs, these rapid antigen tests are not only cheaper, but employees are not sidelined for days while waiting for results. And now you got a 15 minute result and? I'll be going home tonight and having dinner with my family. Because you are? Negative. Put a swab to the back of your throat. I took that 15 minute test. I am a little anxious. Aside from the gag reflex when my throat was swabbed, it was easy. And getting near instant results reduces anxiety. So I'm all clear. You're all clear. Good. <laughs> Thank God. Your colorful mask is working, Carrie. So where might we see these tests widely <laughs> used first? Uh, initially, we'll probably see them in workplaces where people go back to work and also at schools. Now, the test that I took is not the Abbott test. That one we'll begin seeing in about 30 days, and the cost is about $5. So, guys, we're probably yeah. going to see these very soon, just about everywhere. Certainly progress.
flying can be more unpredictable than ever. NBC News correspondents reporting from airports across the country share what's happening. I was going to get a bite to eat, but a lot of places are still closed right now. Some airlines are making sure that everyone is socially distanced, while others are pretty much packing a full flight. People wearing masks for the most part and keeping distance, as you can see over my shoulder. So we are officially on our flight, and the way we get our snacks have also changed. AAA estimates 15 million people will fly this summer, down 74% from last year. As travelers slowly return to airports, how can you reduce risk? I asked Dr. Henry Wu, director of Emory University's Travel Well Center. What's your advice when it comes specifically to flying and air travel? We're still in a phase where uh, travelers need to look carefully at their reasons for travel and not travel unless it's very urgent. Dr. Wu has treated patients who he believes contracted coronavirus while flying and others who may have unknowingly spread the virus during air travel. If you are going to fly, consider this risk checklist. Your destination, is it a hot spot? And do people there wear masks as recommended by the CDC? Where will you stay? Who will you interact with? And what's your plan if you or someone in your group contracts coronavirus? Ask, will you be required to quarantine at your destination or when you come home? If you decide to fly, make sure to plan ahead, especially if you're traveling with kids. Wear clothes with a lot of pockets. You want room to stash those snacks. And of course, keep a pocket open for your ID and your phone for quick access. And don't forget to bring extra masks. Remember, TSA is now allowing up to 12 ounces of hand sanitizer per person. So even a big bottle like this is allowed. And you wanna keep your disinfectant wipes in an outside pocket so they're easy to get to. I also like these little bottles of hand sanitizer that you can clip onto a belt loop or attach to your bag for easy access. And consider putting your kids in clothes that have pockets too. Remind them to put their hands in their pockets and not to touch anything when they get to the airport or on the plane. Got it, Emmy? Got it. At the airport, maintain social distancing of at least six feet from others. One of our producers shot this video at the Denver airport, showing passengers crowded together at check-in. But at New York's LaGuardia Airport, I had plenty of space in the security line. You may also notice that a lot of restaurants are closed. That's why it's really important to pack your own food. And keep in mind, the restaurants that are open will probably be limited, and you may have to wait in super long lines. Another tip, use the bathroom before your flight, especially if you're traveling with kids, so no one has to leave their seats during the flight. Once on board, wipe down all the surfaces you might touch, including the tray, the screen, and the seatbelt buckle. As for your seat, is there one that's considered safest? Dr. Wu says choose a window seat because you're less likely to come in contact with passengers and crew walking the aisle. What about breathing the air in an airplane cabin? The uh, good news is that our modern aircraft have very efficient and effective air filtration systems. That, however, does not eliminate the risk of somebody immediately around you. Wash your hands with soap and water once you land and keep that mask on until you're out of the airport part of the new normal to reduce your risk of getting sick. And if you are wondering whether you should wear goggles or a face shield in addition to your mask, there's no definitive answer, but Dr. Anthony Fauci believes it could help protect you. So not a bad idea to play it safe and wear some eye protection on that flight. Is there anything else consumers can do to reduce their risk? I, I'm sitting here listening to your every word. I miss my grandparents. I miss my family. I want to go home. I think my fear is I do all of those things, but when I get home and see my older family members, I don't know if I did it the right way and I don't have two weeks to stay at home, you know what I mean? Right, right. you don't have that time and space. Yeah. One thing you can do if you are going somewhere, you have to go somewhere, book a nonstop flight. Sometimes it's uh. more expensive, but if you think about it, two flights means you're exposing yourself to an entire second group of people, essentially doubling your exposure, not to mention the layover in the other airport. So if you can, at least take a flight that goes to and from A to B. That's good mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. All right. It feels like an eternity ago since I, I got on a plane. And there's know. some estimates memory. are saying, yeah, and some estimates are saying we will not get back to normal travel till 2024 because of business travel having to mm -hmm. increase again. So wow. it is a tough, challenging time. Everybody's yeah. realizing you can work from home. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. good. All right, Vicki, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's turn now to Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, to drill down on what to expect with the fall approaching. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. So let's dig in here. Today is Labor Day, and it's more likely, you know, that there will be large gatherings that are happening. Um, tell me this. Should we be concerned that we're going to see this big spike, or do you think that people will heed the warning? 
Yeah, so unfortunately, both after Memorial Day and July 4th, we saw pretty big spikes. Uh, I'm hopeful people will be a bit more careful this time. Again, there's nothing wrong with getting outside and going to a beach or going to a park. It's those large gatherings indoors that are really, really deadly. And that's what we have to avoid. And, you know, the temperatures are starting to get colder in some parts of the country. So that limits people being able to hang out outside. So is that a big concern for the fall that more people are going to be inside? Yes, I think a lot of us in the public health community are worried about what's going to happen this fall. Um, as you said, the weather is going to start getting colder. People are going to start spending more time indoors. That's where the virus likes to spread. Uh, and so that's part of the reason we wanted to get the caseloads as low as possible as we entered into the fall. Unfortunately, we still have 40 to 50,000 people getting infected every day. So mm. I think we have some work to do before it gets much colder. Well, speaking of which, a hot topic today, we've also seen colleges having issues, you know, keeping kids healthy and they're cracking down. But are administrators, in your opinion, doing enough to protect the students or what should they be doing additionally? Yeah, so look, I, I'm, I'm all in for get, making students be more responsible, but administrators have to be responsible too, and, and, and they're the adults. Mm. And what colleges need to be doing is having a plan for quarantining, a plan for surveillance testing. A lot of colleges and universities have put in surveillance testing. I think that's pretty essential. Uh, when colleges don't do their part and then just blame the students, I find that very frustrating and, and personally irresponsible. Colleges have a, have a responsibility here as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. We. Uh wanted to get to some viewer questions. We put the call out for questions. And Donna Naples in Florida, uh, she asked on Twitter, my child has gone back to school. What's the best way to make sure backpacks and lunch boxes traveling back and forth each day are sanitized to prevent the spread of germs in their house? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I don't think you need to do anything particularly uh, different. Uh, obviously, wash the lunch boxes after every day. Uh, uh, maybe a little extra hand hygiene. So what I do when I, for instance, pick up groceries from the store is after I put everything away, I wash my hands uh, a bit more assiduously. And, and that's I would do the same thing with lunch boxes for my kids when they get back to, from school. We have a good question from Instagram. When is the best time to get the flu shot this year? Well, most important is to get the flu shot uh, now, later, uh, when it becomes available. Um, so in general, I've been advising people that as soon as the flu vaccine becomes available, uh, people should go out and get it. Here's another question. Do you think it's important for high school student athletes to be tested regularly? That's a very good question. In general, I've been pushing high schools in general when they open up to have some amount of surveillance testing if possible. In terms of student athletes, I don't know if they're at that much higher risk. It depends a little bit on what sport. So I have a I have a high schooler who runs track. Okay. I don't know that she's at particularly increased risk, but football, soccer, where you're going to be spending time indoors in locker rooms, maybe that's a bit of a higher risk situation and, and more testing would be useful. We have another viewer question finally, something I hadn't thought of. It says, should our children shower or bathe as soon as they get home from school? You know, schools are not some super high-risk place they're going into. I mean, we saw this with doctors and nurses who were working in COVID units who would come home and immediately shower. That's fine. Schools are not that. They're not okay. super dangerous places. I don't think you need to do anything different. Maybe extra careful, like washing hands and making sure that uh, stuff is put away. But other than that, I wouldn't do anything differently. All right. Well, Dr. Jha, thanks for your advice and thanks for joining us this morning. Calming presence this morning, yes. doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Facility. Moral of the story, keep washing your hands. Yeah, really. Always. In terrain too remote and jagged for any vehicles, this rescue was all about human force. <laughs> I don't think I would have made it out, especially uh, without any other adults. What started out as a camping trip for Peter Monroe and his family soon became a 48-hour trial of survival. It's very steep and rugged up there, so it can be a problem. Peter, his seven-year-old daughter Layla and yellow lab Buck had gone into the rugged Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood last Tuesday to set up camp for his family at Kinzel Lake. But when his wife Camille arrived later in the day and they were missing, she went searching, discovered his truck at the nearby trailhead with the keys and Layla's stuffed animals still inside, called 911. Rescuers immediately deployed multiple agencies. When there's children involved, uh you know, that's the top priority. The search included more than 50 rescuers, search dogs, Air Force pararescue jumpers, and a construction crew that helped move vehicles across difficult terrain, saving searchers valuable time. 
Thursday morning, 48 hours after they'd hiked into the woods, rescuers found the trio trapped deep in a canyon ravine near a stream. They had worked their way about 2,000 meters down a 3,000 meter canyon, but they were exhausted and not able to move any further without assistance. Peter had injured his ankle and knee on the hike down and could not walk. Crews stabilized him in a litter and manually hauled him up the 2,000 meters. Rescuers carried Layla, dehydrated and exhausted. The grateful Monroe thanked the rescuers from the back of the ambulance. You guys, you guys saved myself and my daughters and my dog's life. As for Buck, who climbed out without any assistance. The dog was done. <laughs> the dog got up to the road and just fell out. He was done. It was good to see them all safe and sound. A harrowing ordeal with a happy ending. Peter is out of the hospital and recovering at home. The family has asked for privacy. As for Buck the dog, maybe a while before he heads out back on any hikes, at least mm. anytime soon. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. That we uh, remove the guy who's there right now. The fact is that, uh, you know, we're in a position where we can fundamentally grow this country just by no other reason, just investing in infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals, all the things we have to do, airports, that in fact could create thousands and thousands of good paying jobs at prevailing wage. And uh, he keeps saying he wants to a, uh, you know, an infrastructure plan. He said he wanted one in, you know, in 2016, 17, 18, 19. Now, he hadn't introduced a thing. What are we waiting for? Well, I, I, I don't think that, you know, he, I don't think he has any interest in it whatsoever at this point. At least he hasn't shown any. One of the things that uh, um, 
uh, Frank, is that uh, have uh, how, how, how have unions helped people get through this pandemic? Um, you know, you, you know, what would be a big investment in infrastructure uh, that, I mean, how, how much would it mean to your members if we were able to create what's estimated to be tens of thousands or actually several million jobs uh, that are needed now? I mean, we need to improve our bridges, our roads. We rank so we're so low in, our, in the safety. We're in a position where, you know, there's no reason why. As President of the United States, you have control of a significant budget of taxpayers' money, taxpayers' dollars, where you're spending federal money hiring contractors to do things. Under my administration, it will be all made in America, not a joke. If it's going to be used, taxpayers' dollars are going to be used to hire corporations to do things from, you know, building roads to building bridges to whatever it is. It's going to have to have been made in America. Any product, steel, aluminum, anything used has to be made in America. And also the supply chain. You know, we, we now have under this president the, uh, you know, the, the largest trade deficit we've had uh, uh, in a long time. The trade deficit with Mexico is higher than it's ever been in, in history. And the uh, product trade deficit with the rest of the world is the highest it's ever been in American history. And that's because he's provided all these loopholes in the law to allow companies to get a tax break going abroad and hiring people doing things abroad. That'll, that'll end, and it will not be a violation of international trade agreements. That'll end in my administration. I mean, for real, it all will have to be made in America if it's a taxpayer dollar is being spent. But uh, tell me about the... Uh, uh, the attempt on the part of corporations to prov provide their, quote, own apprentice programs. There was an effort to shut down you all, and uh, they're deciding they can provide the apprentice programs. Well, as it stands right now, there's, there's guidelines to make sure the people that enter an apprenticeship program actually get the training and end up graduating to a decent-paying job uh, at the completion of their apprenticeship program. And the plan was to eliminate that, take, take all the rules, and let the corporation decide all the, all the angles on how they were going to run their apprenticeship program. As it is now, there are requirements under federal law and state laws to make sure that people do actually get the training. And it's not just a venue for low wages. Uh, we see a lot in corporate America where they want to have an apprenticeship program, and especially in the construction industry, to have people at 50% of the, the wage rate so they can have an advantage on bid day or cut their cost to, uh, in production. And this is problematic. And one, one of the big ones is uh, warehousing. Uh, you know, it's only a $15, $15 an hour job to start with, and then they want to have an apprenticeship program where they bring people in for seven fifty an hour, and then they just churn those people. They keep them until they get to be too expensive, and then they get rid of them. And, you know, it, it ends up that we have people just going through a cycle, and uh, the unemployment system gets drained as it is now, which has never been drained as far as it has in Pennsylvania due to uh, the lack of response of the president on the COVID issue. Uh, we have more, more debt than we're ever going to have uh, in my lifetime. And uh, that, that apprenticeship scheme that was being portrayed by uh, Department of Labor out of D.C. was terrible. I think we had the most calls uh, and comments to uh, L&I on the regulations on that, that have, in the history of <laughs> calls on regulations. So you're absolutely right. Well, the on that. reason why you guys get hired, you have the best training programs in the world. You're the best at what you do. I mean, in fact, you're the best at what you do. And uh, everything they've done uh, has been designed. Uh, you know, uh, the fact is that, uh, um, you know, Wall Street investors didn't build this country. Ordinary folks, middle class built it, and, the, and unions built the middle class. That's how we got to where we are and continue to try to hollow out the union movement, hollow out the middle class is, uh, is, is, is what's going on, been going on for uh, some time now. And I promise you, if I'm elected, it stops. 
it stops. You're going to have the best friend Labor's ever had in the White House because you know, my dad used to have an expression and uh, when he had to leave Scranton because there was no work and moved away to Delaware to find work was that uh, he'd say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. Well, the fact is that uh, there's an awful lot of people who don't think their kids are ever going to be able to reach the standard of living they had because of what's going on. And the House has passed legislation that the so-called HEROES Act that provides for significant help to allow people, first responders, whether they are docs or whether they're firefighters, police officers, whether they are whoever they are, the, the folks keeping the sewers functioning, uh, the, the, the people who make the system work and, uh, and provided the money to, for states to be able to pay them. You all know that states have to have a balanced budget. There's a reason why the federal government was designed not to have to have one, to be able to be a ballast for when things got really bad. We inherited one of the worst economies that existed when uh, the so-called financial collapse, it was, the worst uh, recession, short of a depression in American history when Brock and I got elected. And he put me in charge of a program called the Recovery Act, and it provided for over eight hundred billion dollars in stimulus. But what it did, I was able to spend a hundred and forty four billion dollars making up for states deficits so teachers didn't get fired, so that firefighters didn't get fired, so police officers didn't get fired, so essential workers didn't get fired. All those folks out there that are busting their neck keeping the groceries stacked on a shelf so everybody else can be okay. All those nurses and doctors taking their shots and and, uh, I mean, risking their lives to keep us going. Those firefighters that show up and don't ask, by the way, do you have COVID? They just take care of the problem. And uh, and so, and he has uh, been spending too much time in his golf courses and his sand traps instead of uh, going out. I mean, for real, think about this. I've been around a while. I can't think of any president in the middle of a crisis like this, and there's been other crises, both foreign and domestic, that has not called in the leadership of the Republican and Democratic parties to the White House, to the White House, to the Oval Office, to sit and work out an agreement. But there's no desire to work out an agreement here. It's just the ability to make sure that you he's able to do the minimum things that are necessary to make it look like he's trying. But he's not even had a meeting with them. And so a lot of people are hurting. A whole lot of people are hurting right now because and things we could be avoiding right now. And uh, and I, I just, uh, I was going to say I don't get it, but I'm beginning to get it because I don't think he, it's not what he's about. He talks about this K-shaped recovery, meaning the on the letter K, one part goes up, okay? You know, when you're doing the K, you know, boom, okay, the K is up. That's the stock market. As long as the stock market's doing great, Everything's okay as far as him, but everybody else is getting clobbered. Everybody else is hurting. And uh, and so I, I just think that, uh, you know, and another expression my dad used to talk about, he said, you know, the only way to deal with power, the abuse of power, is with power. And the only power out there to counter the abuse or the extreme abuse of corporate power is unions, labor, the only ones who have the wherewithal to take it on. And that's why I think everyone, including public employees, should have the right to organize and make their case for what they are entitled to have, and what they're able to work, what they should be being paid, how they should be treated. And it's all about just, you know, basic fundamental decency. But I think we've got an enormous opportunity because the public has changed. You know, I'll say one last thing here, and, then, and you don't ask me any questions. You know... Uh, um, all of a sudden, the last, uh, not all of a sudden, the last eight, ten years, things have changed in the following way. People, hourly workers who thought unions were the problem, remember how unions were the issue? That's why we weren't. Well, you know, all of a sudden they found out you had, you had thousands of employees making an hourly wage having to sign 
non-compete agreements. So if you worked at Burger King, you have to sign a non-compete agreement. You would not go across town to McDonald's to try to get five more cents in your hourly wage. All designed to do nothing, just to keep wages down. You could not go. It's not like you had a secret uh, that was uh, consequential and you couldn't give away that secret because it's a high-tech industry to another industry you go to work for. These are people making an hourly wage, just doing just their, just their job. And they were told they couldn't even bargain for themselves, let alone have a union do it. And uh, I remember going up to when, uh, well, I won't go into it, but the point is all of a sudden they figured that out. And then all of a sudden they figured out, too, the reason they got overtime pay is because of unions. Because look at all the overtime was being cut from people who weren't union members. They reclassify you as management. That if you worked in a grocery store and you control the man or woman who brought out the cart that had all the all, all the spaghetti sauce on it, you were management. You you control that cart. I mean, literally. And that's what people realize that this abuse has caught up with them. And uh, and this economic crisis caused by his failure to deal rationally. With COVID, not even acknowledging it, I mean, look, it's going to, you know, warm weather is going to make it go away. It's going to be like a miracle. It's going to be passed. I'm going to have a vaccine for you quickly that everyone's going to be fine. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's all about refusing to deal with the problems that affect ordinary, hardworking people. And uh, I think one of the ways back is to considerably strengthen the union movement. But you guys have any questions for me about anything at all? I would just like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for all you've done for unions in general through your career. And Pennsylvania, um, I mean, if you – and you know Pennsylvania. If you go to Erie now, there's no new jobs in Erie. There's no new jobs in Scranton. There's no new jobs anywhere except for maybe some warehousing jobs or a few uh, delivery jobs now because people can't go to restaurants. But if you take all the people – that are on unemployment and then out all the people that ran out of unemployment and then take all the people that can't get either or just, you know, going day to day, that number is a lot greater than what they're showing on, on TV. Especially those who've had to move to part time and have their wages cut. They're not considered unemployed. They're just considered they're employed. But guess what? When you get your wage cut in half, it's awful hard to pay for the new tires when you have four ball tires on your wife's car or your husband's car. When you, in fact, uh, have your wage cut in half, it's always awful hard to figure out how you put all the meals on the table. It's going to be all right. Or, I mean, how many people have discussions in suburban neighborhoods that are sitting down saying, who's going to tell her she can't go back to the junior college? We can't afford it. Who's going to tell him that he can't do the following? We can't do such and such. I mean, these are the discussions that took place in my living room, my kitchen growing up. And now they have to be there. And there's an answer to it. The money's been appropriated. The money's been appropriated. But the, but the Senate, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell, that Republican leader, said, let the states go bankrupt. Well, that's really cool, right? Let the states go bankrupt. But the point is, I think that the American public is beyond it. I think the American public knows the dereliction has taken place and knows that, uh, you know, we, uh, um, we have a president who doesn't seem to understand the notion of service. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I just, I don't know, the idea that you guys have served and my son who spent a year in Iraq and before that six months in Kosovo and, You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
Excuse me, do you folks know how many people lived at this address on April 1st? By this month, TJ was hoping to be making good money knocking on doors for the census. I was expecting to work 40 hours a week for at least a month, ideally two months. Instead, he only worked 20 hours a week for two weeks. This is entirely disorganized and just lacks any feeling of any preparation or order at all. We spoke with five workers who are frustrated with everything from a lack of communication from management to glitches in the census interview app. It couldn't have come at a worse time for people who needed the income. Some census takers fear retribution for speaking out since employees are not permitted to give interviews. TJ is not his real name. He asked us to make clear he's giving us his personal views. Another census employee would only let us use her voice. I was collecting a pandemic unemployment as a self-employed contractor. So I was looking forward to making, they told me it would be $25 an hour for uh, enumerators in California. And I thought that sounded like a pretty decent thing. She was counting on making around $8,000 over three months of work, but then... I didn't hear from them from March, April, May, June, maybe three months. Three months I did not hear from the census. I definitely wanted to work for them. The Census Bureau has hired far fewer census takers than in previous years. In 2010, it hired more than 700,000 census takers. But they'd only hired around 300,000 census takers by mid-August 2020, according to the Government Accountability Office. Due to the pandemic, the Bureau stopped its field operations in March, just one week after starting the count for most of the U.S. In April, the official census count deadline was extended to October 31st. The agency did not resume full field operations until June. But in early August, the Trump administration announced it was ending the count four weeks early on September 30th. That means fewer paid hours for some workers banking on a paycheck in a tough job market. If I could have worked for $15 an hour starting in June, I would have made a lot more money. And it, it is money that I was kind of relying on. The census offered pay incentives to boost productivity. Workers we spoke with say the requirements were unachievable, like interviewing nine households in one hour. The Government Accountability Office says not enough workers and shortening the deadline pose a risk to a complete and accurate count, especially in communities of color. But we are concerned about the other kind. We've been concerned about that really since we kicked off um, our campaign. No, no, census, no! There's kind of a, a collective feeling of, yeah, this is messed up. This is not working right, and we just don't know what to Let's do. Let's get counted! Let's get counted! A spokesperson for the census says they hired for, quote, what they need this decade because of the transition from paper to more digital counting. They needed fewer census takers this year. Responding to the specific claims of a disorganized working environment this year, the census also told NBC News, quote, whenever you have that large of a workforce, there can be some chaos, absolutely, and that's part of the dynamic of working in the census environment. More companies are extending their work from home policies, saving money in the process. But that savings comes at a cost to other businesses in the neighborhood. NBC News technology correspondent Jacob Ward spoke with one CEO who's giving up their office altogether. Packing up is emotional. And you start looking in drawers and taking things out and putting things in boxes. It becomes very nostalgic. You know, we've been here for 25 years. This has been our life. And to go from having a 4,500 square foot office with all these employees running around and the, you know, the excitement and all of that that's created to going remote is very, very scary. John Gumas's 15 person staff had to work from home during the pandemic. So even he was surprised when he and his whole staff turned out to like going remote. Now he's putting the office up for rent. What will you save by not having to run this place? It's probably about 30 to 35 percent of our operating budget every month is because of a physical building. And you'll just cut that we'll out? We'll just cut that out. This was one of the few areas. But the savings for Gumas come at a cost to other businesses in the neighborhood. So this is what, your lunch spot? This is our lunch spot. This is where we come every single day and have lunch, have coffee, you know, have them deliver uh, sandwiches to the office. So it's going to be kind of sad. 
The Flying Pig Bistro has been reduced to doing only takeout lunch orders since mid-March. A lot of the locals were really people who worked close by rather than live close by, so those people are, are all gone. What does it mean, do you think, when companies like that decide, okay, we're just going to give up on a neighborhood and just work from home from now on? I mean, they got to you know, decide what's right for them, but of course, you know, we're gonna miss them. Now imagine how many dominoes will fall if an entire downtown office building empties out. That's happening across San Francisco. Twitter was the first to say some employees can work remotely forever. Google and Facebook will let most employees work from home through at least June of 2021. And now Slack, the messaging platform, says its people will work from home from now on. Do you feel sort of guilty at all about sort of punching a little bit of a hole in the urban fabric here? Oh, yeah. Not only do I feel guilty, I'm scared. All right, once we leave, it's hard to come back. Jake joins me now from San Francisco. Jake, that's a great story. I, personally, my dad's company also just did the same thing. It's happening in a lot of places. You touched on the ripples that could move through the economy as offices empty out and stay that way. Are we seeing any of those effects already? Well, hi, Savannah. You know, absolutely. In fact, this morning, we got word that the first dominoes had fallen for a service workers union, food service workers that employs about 3,500 people serving Silicon Valley. So I'm actually standing right now at a place we just arrived in Sunnyvale, where behind me, the Yahoo headquarters, now owned by Verizon, has in fact laid off about 91 food service workers. They're the first of their union to be laid off. Now, I should mention that Verizon does not directly employ them. They're employed by a company, a subcontractor. But these people have been laid off pretty much without warning and are now showing up in a symbolic protest to fill out their unemployment paperwork here in front of the building. We spoke to one of them, Augustina Sanchez, who says she's worked in that building for 12 years and just learned that she'd been laid off by mail. I asked her what her financial situation is going to look like on unemployment. We are going to play for unemployment, but um, it's not enough, the unemployment for my pay rent and bills. I think it's, we are going to need another job. But at this time and this situation, we are living, uh, everybody, we don't, it's not enough for us, for me and my co-workers. Savannah, you can just hear the anguish in her voice, and we can see behind mm -hmm. us children, families here trying to sort out what their next steps will be. Now, Google and Facebook, who also employ people from that workers' union, have said in the past that they're going to continue to support them, continue to employ them. But these are really the first dominoes that we've seen falling as buildings like this, and all around me, these buildings are empty, have remained empty for so long and may continue to do so, Savannah. Oh, it's just heartbreaking to hear some of those personal stories and how it's affecting these families. What do we know about how long companies think they'll keep their employees at home? I mean, are people ever coming back? Are any companies planning for that? And then ultimately, what would the financial effects of that be? Well, a new study that just came out from the conference board, which is a think tank of executives, polled the top level executives across the country. And they said about 35 percent of them had no idea, Savannah, when they were going to come back to an office. And new research out commissioned by Slack, the messaging company, has found that only about 12 percent of knowledge workers specifically, the kind of people who work in buildings like these, would ever come back to a full-time in-office situation. So wow. we're talking here about, you know, not just a, a short-term effect. This could be a long-term effect. And as you can see in the people behind us, it's going to have this tremendous upheaval in their financial security. So we're seeing the ripple effects, the dominoes beginning to fall across the American economy, Savannah. Mm, we are, Jacob, and it is tough to see. Thanks so much. We only have 100 days to make so much to get us through to the next year. And if we don't make that money in 100 days, I don't even know what's going to happen when September gets here. I'd love to say it was just like every other summer, but it wasn't. It, was, it, it had that added stress level that we haven't had in the past. Weekends have been very good during the week. has been off, but it, it's, it's not had the, nearly the number of people 
that you're used to seeing on the boardwalk? It's been challenging and it's very stressful. My family's been in business on the boardwalk 70 years, so it's been very predictable with the cycle of business. But now in 2020, it's been very unpredictable and had to go take it on a daily basis because you didn't know what was going to unfold. We've had to adjust to a new way of doing things and it hasn't been easy. Rest assured, we are doing everything in our power to let all of us enjoy the summer fun. Sanitizing and making sure that railings were clean and tables were clean and, you know, um, every other car was used on the rides. This year we had to adjust on the fly many days in a row. I'm happy with the year because it could have been a lot worse. A lot of people are getting a lot more grab and go, take out. A lot of stuff is being packaged into go containers or small pizza boxes to uh, package slices of pie. The third party delivery, Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, the like, etc. basically replaced the late night dollars that we were missing after midnight because of the, the boardwalk did close after midnight. We're only allowed 50% of the occupancies, but even on beautiful, sunny, hot days, the water park had less people at it. Days that were normally boardwalk days for the ride pier, we had less people. But our games department did very well. Being on the boardwalk and being able to be open for a while, they've, done, they've had a good year. Reluctantly, I did have to raise my prices because the expenses just kept going up. and. Uh, to keep pace with that, things like hand sanitizers, masks, other other things that you need now in this corona environment, even going forward if we have to have the gloves, the masks, what have you. It was challenging this summer, but very uh, rewarding uh, in the respect that we're making it through. We've had no outbreaks, nobody gets sick, no reason to shut down or quarantine, so I'm very pleased and a little bit surprised that we didn't have anybody get sick, and that's a nice testament going to be a little hard trying to figure out what we're going to do going into the winter. I know there's going to be some uh, some lean months coming up for sure. It's not been as good as 2019. It's almost like right after Sandy when that happened and it, things were slow and people weren't around. It, it's eerily similar. Superstorm Sandy was devastating for the whole area. We were just starting to recover from that and then this Seaside Heights fire hit and uh, wiped us out. When the roller coaster and all the rides fell in the water and we had to rebuild, we at least knew what we had to do. But for this, it's been challenging. It certainly has. I mean, it starts wearing on you. I literally grew up on the boardwalk. That's a big part of my life. It's, it's how, I, how I grew up, and um, it's what I've embraced uh, professionally. And uh, I really wasn't too surprised to see that Seaside continues. It is a very resilient town, a very resilient uh, business community. Seaside's a great place to come. It could have been a totally disastrous season, but we all did the best we could given what was in front of us. Pfizer says they will have results in October, and the president has said that there could be a vaccine uh, approved before the election. Uh, what's the most realistic time frame for approval? Well, I have said now multiple times over the last several months that the projection would be that by the end of November, December of this calendar year, that we would have an answer whether or not we have a safe and effective vaccine that's approvable. Is it possible? that it could be before then? And the answer is yes. I think it's unlikely, but I think it's possible. And the possibility will be dictated by, for example, if you have the trial being taken place in an area that happens to have a lot of infections, you may get an answer sooner than you would have projected. Because the answer is event-driven. It's not driven by the time of the trial or by the number of people in the trial. It's driven by the number of events or infections, as it were, that you have in the placebo group versus mm -hmm. the experimental group. So again, my prediction is going to be November, December, but I would not be overly surprised if it happened before then. That's approval. What about actual rollout of a vaccine? Good point. People getting it. Good point. Right now, there are mechanisms in place to make doses of vaccines even before we know whether it works or not. 
and there are pre-orders and pre-purchases of vaccines on the part of the federal government. The way it looks like it'll play out, by the time we get to the end of the year, we will have a few to 10 millions of doses. We won't have hundreds of millions of doses. As we get into 2021, the beginning first quarter and half of the year, then you're talking about several tens, if not hundreds of millions of doses. There's a surge of cases in the Midwest, colleges. This is something obviously everybody's concerned about. Uh, what should colleges be doing? Should they be sending students home, no. more testing? What, what should colleges be doing? Well, colleges are doing different models. Some colleges are doing everything virtual and online, uh, but that's not what many of the colleges are doing. Many of them are testing everybody before they even get on into the dorms, into the campus, and then doing surveillance intermittently. Sometimes that's a couple of times a week, sometimes that's a little bit more. But the important thing is to have the capability when a student gets infected, rather than close everything down or sending them home, to have either a dorm or a floor of a dorm where they could safely and comfortably segregate them from the rest of the students. But we are not recommending that they send an infected college student home. Because what you're then doing is you're getting an infected person and putting them back in the community to spread infection. So the best thing you can do is to keep them on campus, segregated from the rest of the students, but not essentially telling them to go home. The number of African-American medical students now is about the same as it was decades ago, especially men. How do you solve this problem, and how, how big a problem do you see that as? Oh, it is a big problem. We've got to get more minority students into medical school and nursing schools, but certainly mostly medical schools. You want the medical staff throughout the country to reflect as much as possible what the demography of the country is. And we absolutely need more minority, particularly African-American medical students and ultimately physicians. He was the former Russian spy someone wanted to silence. Alexander Litvinenko poisoned in 2006 after defecting. Anybody who can provide any true information, they try to stop them because they want to control this information. Even Kremlin critics say if that means reaching beyond Russia's borders. Alexander Litvinenko had been granted asylum here in the UK, but it was at this London hotel where he met with two former Russian agents, believing he was amongst friends and drank a cup of tea laced with a fatal dose of polonium. And he's not the only Russian dissident to be poisoned on British soil. In 2018, a similar fate awaited former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia, poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok in their adopted home, Salisbury. They survived, but the toxin spread, killing a British woman, terrorising a city. The same kind of nerve agent German authorities now say was used on Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny just a matter of weeks ago. Poisons are generally administered like a, like a tailored suit. If you have too much poison, uh, then it will still be detectable in the system afterwards in any uh, autopsy or perhaps on any remaining materials. If, if there isn't enough uh, quantity, for example, if a target only has half a cup of poison or something, then they will get ill, but they may not die. Right. And while the method may seem like a Cold War relic, Carl Dewey's recorded 27 incidents of poisoning or suspected poisoning since Putin's first premiership in 1999. The Russian government denies involvement in the case of Navalny, but calls for retribution are intensifying. For US-born investor Bill Browder, it's personal. I think at this point, Vladimir Putin's assets should be frozen. Browder's Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, died in prison after exposing government corruption, inspiring Browder to create the Magnitsky Act, sanctioning offenders of human rights. Uh, I'm almost sure that, that nobody will have the guts to sanction Vladimir Putin himself. If Trump minimizes or diminishes his, Putin's responsibility for, for grave crimes, that emboldens Putin to do more things. Without major international intervention, those touched by the toxic legacy of these attacks have dedicated their lives to prevention. You fight for your 
husband, for your memory, for your life. I always said it was not enough uh, international reaction for what happened since my husband was poisoned because uh, people still believe you can do business as usual with Russia, but you can't. Tonight, Alexei Navalny continues to fight for his life, another ruthless attempt to silence a Kremlin critic, successful at least for now. Helena Humphrey, NBC News, London. There's fire on all sides, all around us. The Labor Day weekend taking a terrifying turn for over 200 people in California's Sierra National Forest as flames, hot embers and thick smoke from the creek fire quickly surrounded and trapped campers at Mammoth Pool Reservoir. You can see smoke, but they said it was like 22 miles away. And, uh, it was very fast. And it was literally movie. like, oh my God, there's fire right there. Just keep going. Oh Just keep going. Juliana Park and her friends who were hiking in the area were some of the last to make it out by car. The fire looks like it's going to just grab the car and we could feel the heat just throughout the vehicle. By Saturday night, the fire had devoured over 36,000 acres, blocking the only way out of the campground. The race to save lives forced to go airborne. I believe there's probably other people that are sheltered in the meadow, unknown at this time of uh, how many may still exist out there. In the middle of the night, first responders rushing trapped campers onto military helicopters to reach safety. As soon as we were in the helicopter, we flew over the fires and you couldn't see anything but pitch black and fire. That's all we could see. We saw firsthand why those evacuations were so critical. The smoke and haze has turned day to night as firefighters face yet another challenge on the front line. Many of the injuries are lacerations, broken bones and, and those kind of things and, and the kind of injuries you'd see when somebody's attempting to flee the fire. As ambulances rush to treat the injured, families and their young children grateful they survive. I'm glad to be alive. But across the state, the danger is still very real as flames fueled by triple digit temperatures threaten to destroy anything in its path. Outside of Fresno here, the Creek Fire is still burning totally out of control across California. More than 20 wildfires are burning across the region. And we should mention one outside of Los Angeles was started by a smoke grenade at a gender reveal party. This morning, headline making new claims from the former senior FBI agent at the center of the Bureau's Russia investigation. In a new memoir, Peter Strzok takes sharp aim at the man he once investigated, President Trump. And NBC's chief White House correspondent, Hallie Jackson, sat down with him. Hallie, good morning. Peter, Chanel, good morning to you. You know, to the president, Peter Strzok is a symbol of what he believes is the deep state trying to take him down. And he's targeted the former FBI agent with a number of insults, including calling him a fraud. But Strzok calls his new book compromised because he believes the president has been, with foreign countries holding leverage over him. It's a warning he's now delivering in the starkest of terms. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. I was born in a and he's one of the agents former national security advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S., charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure. Improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at 
President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. Yeah. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero and about a possible Trump victory we will stop it. Giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, a relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. The Republican-led Senate Judiciary Committee, which is investigating the Russia investigation, has authorized subpoenas for officials, including Strzok. He tells me if he is subpoenaed, he will testify. New fallout from the president's latest war over words. Thank you. I, I say what I say. Disputing allegations, he disparaged fallen soldiers as suckers and losers in some private conversations, as first reported by The Atlantic. There is nobody that feels more strongly about our soldiers, our wounded warriors, our soldiers that died in war than I do. Now attacking Atlantic co-owner Laureen Powell Jobs, widow of Apple's Steve Jobs. Trump tweeting Sunday, Steve Jobs would not be happy that his wife is wasting money he left her on a failing radical left magazine. Call her, write her, let her know how you feel. Cabinet officials coming to the president's defense. Veteran Secretary Robert Wilkie. And I would be offended too if I thought it was true. And Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. The president has always been 100% supportive of the military. The president, whose only public outings this weekend were to his Virginia golf course, dismissed the allegations as a campaign season attack, calling it a hoax. Joe Biden, now leading by 10 points in a new national poll, went out to Catholic Mass in Delaware Sunday as his campaign seized on the Trump military controversy, rushing this months old ad back on the air. Joe Biden understands the awesome power, responsibility, and sacred duty of being commander in chief. Posting new video of veterans reacting to the suckers and losers allegation. It's filled with losers. It's filled with heroes. Today, Biden running mate Kamala Harris will make her first solo campaign trip, visiting union workers in Wisconsin. Sunday, she challenged the president over his claims a COVID vaccine could be ready by November. I would not trust his word. I would trust the word of public health experts and scientists, but not Donald Trump. And Senator Harris would not say whether she would take a COVID vaccine herself. Late this spring, shocking headlines and viral photos. A wealthy Manhattan neighborhood seemingly overrun with an increase in homeless men and women. Residents sounding the alarm. What we've really noticed is the increase in these sort of incidents. Open and illicit drug use, needles on the ground, things that I actually could not have ever imagined would have occurred. Just 
even a few weeks ago. On the Upper West Side, four vacant tourist hotels were converted to temporary homeless shelters. More than 700 residents moving in, all part of a citywide effort to stop devastating coronavirus spread in a vulnerable population. During a virtual community board meeting, shelter leaders explained they had to move fast. Normally, it takes about two years or more to create a shelter. We had about two weeks notice for each hotel we opened. That meant in some cases the facilities weren't ready or important details overlooked, like sex offenders with residency restrictions placed at the Belle Claire around the corner from an elementary school. The shelter says they've since been moved out. Dr. Megan Martin started a group of concerned neighbors pushing to end the program, threatening to file a lawsuit if the city doesn't act. The city was in an emergency situation. These shelters were incredibly dangerous. They had to act quickly. Why was this not an appropriate solution? We replaced one public health crisis with another. They've moved many of these individuals without the resources that they need. But as the firestorm grew, those who support the shelters also took action, some suggesting that their neighbors were insensitive and even intolerant. I have not seen any kind of danger or any kind of deterioration of quality life. And I walk past the Belle Claire every single morning. College professor Melissa Sanchez organized neighborhood families to draw welcoming messages to residents, triggering this angry exchange with a grandmother passing by. Are you surprised personally, someone who lives in this community, to see how angry people have gotten and how fraught this issue has been? I'm really surprised. We know that people here are getting treatment. We also know that the strongest predictor for successful treatment is support of the community. One in particular that said everyone needs a home. When I saw that, that really touched me. But while anger flared on both sides, major crime rates actually fell. According to the NYPD, overall crime rates in the area are down over 5% from the same May through August time period last year. Under pressure, Mayor Bill de Blasio now says people will be moved back into established shelters as the health situation improves. But for some, it may be too late. We do know many families who do not feel safe and who have put their apartments for sale. Contributing to a wave of people leaving New York City since the start of the pandemic. Opera singer Cheryl Warfield could be one of them. So you're gonna stay? I may not. After 9-11, I was here in 9-11, my family expected me to move back home. But you stayed. But I, to, but I stayed, but I may not be able to stay through this. The Department of Homeless Services in this city say this, says that this program has saved lives. And while there were missteps in the beginning, they have increased staff and services available. But Dr. Martin told us there is no level of staff and services that they would find suitable. They want a date for this program to end. This morning, a reckoning in Rochester. Anger over the death of Daniel Prude, fueling another night of standoffs between police and protesters. The city's leaders mobilizing a group of church elders to serve as a buffer, attempting to de-escalate the situation on the ground. We elders have volunteered to put our bodies on the line to make sure that that happens. The city's mayor and police chief so far rejecting growing calls to resign. Chief Laron Singletary claiming a small group of agitators are disturbing otherwise peaceful gatherings. There are agitators within the crowd, whether they're from here or elsewhere, who do want to uh, provoke. Prude died in March, seven days after he was restrained by officers. But the release of police body camera footage last week showing Prude's arrest sparked outrage in the community. New York's attorney general is now calling a grand jury as part of the investigation. We need to be able to call the police for help and for help to come to us and not to be afraid that a loved one may lose their life. Portland reached a grim milestone this weekend. On the 100th night of protest, police declared a riot, arresting more than 50 people. As tensions flared, one protester is seen on fire. Things are going, as you probably see, the numbers are terrific. 
So we uh, called some people, wished them a very happy Labor Day, and they told us how they're doing. And we really celebrate the American worker. We are in the midst of the fastest economic recovery in U.S. history. So we have a lot to be thankful for, including this really beautiful day. So I thought we'd do this outside as opposed to in your more normal place. The United States experienced the smallest contraction of any major Western nation. You probably know that. Uh, you look around and see how we're doing compared to every other nation. And uh, our rise is spectacular. And we're rebounding much more quickly from the pandemic. The U.S. economy added 1.4 million jobs last month. We've added a record-setting 10.6 million jobs since May. 10.6 million jobs since May. That's a record that is not even close. Is, uh, second place is a long ways away. In July, the Congressional Budget Office was projecting unemployment over 10.5 percent through the end of 2020. So they thought 2020 and maybe it would be a lot longer than that. Some projections where you'd go through the entire year, and uh, that includes uh, a lot of months in the following year, 2021. And instead, the unemployment rate plunged, really to the surprise of many, all the way down to 8.4 percent in August. And that's the second largest single month decline on record. And we have the first. We have both of them. So we have the uh, two number one declines. Decline meaning positive, not negative. We're currently witnessing the fastest labor market recovery from an economic crisis in history, world history. By contrast, Biden presided over the worst, the weakest, and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was a, it was a long, slow slog, and it was a very small very small on growth and very small on every other factor that you need. It was the weakest recovery. Under my leadership, next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country, I project. And uh, some people are starting to agree. We have a V shape. It's probably a super V. And you see what's going on with the stock market, where it's, uh, in certain cases, already setting records. The NASDAQ has set 17 records already. And this is, as we're hopefully rounding the final turn, and the pandemic. Uh, first, we'll end the pandemic under Operation Warp Speed. We've pioneered groundbreaking therapies, reducing the fatality rate 85 percent since April. Uh, you don't hear that from the press very often. Uh, they don't like to talk about that. So the fatality rate, 85 percent. Think of that since April. The United States has experienced among the lowest case fatality rates of any major country in the world. And uh, we are uh, an absolute leader in every way. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy should immediately apologize for the reckless anti-vaccine rhetoric that they are talking right now, talking about endangering lives. And it undermines science. And what's happening is uh, all of a sudden you'll have this incredible vaccine. And because of that fake rhetoric, it's a political rhetoric. That's all it is, just for politics, because now they see we've done an incredible job. And in speed, like nobody's ever seen before, this could have taken two or three years and instead, it's going to be uh, going to be done in a very short period of time. Could even have it during the month of October. So, contrary to all of the lies, the vaccine that they're they're politicalized. They're, they're, they'll say anything, and it's so dangerous for a country what they say. But the vaccine will be very safe and very effective, and it'll be delivered very soon. Now, you could you could have a very big surprise coming up. I'm sure you'll be very happy, but the the people will be happy. The people of the world will be happy. Next, we'll return to unprecedented prosperity through our pro-American policies. We'll pass new tax cuts to boost take-home pay. We're going to be cutting taxes very substantially. We get it back through growth. We had tremendous growth until we got hit with the China virus. 
We'll continue our historic regulatory reduction campaign. We've, as you know, in three and a half years, we've cut more regulations than any other administration, no matter how long, no matter what period of time you're talking about. We'll enact fair trade deals, and we're working on seven major fair trade deals right now. And when I say fair, fair to our country, because our country is ripped off by every nation. Friend, foe, didn't matter. Every nation was ripping us off at a level that it's just unbelievable, to be honest. We're going to be expanding opportunity zones, and uh, we will uh, keep that going. It's been a tremendous, a tremendous program. I want to thank Senator Scott, South Carolina, for coming up with that whole concept, because he came up and I liked it right away. And it was — it's really turned out to be a tremendous thing, especially for African Americans, Hispanic Americans. We'll continue to unleash American energy. We're number one in the world, and we're totally energy independent right now. And in 2021, we'll create 10 million jobs at least in the first 10 months. Joe Biden, the radical socialist Democrats, would immediately collapse the economy. If they got in, they would collapse it. You'll have a crash, the likes of which you've never seen before. Your stocks, your 401ks. Remember, it's the people that own these massive listed companies. A lot of people, rich people and not-so-rich people and middle-income people, and those stocks will crash like you've never seen before. The Biden plan begins with a $4 trillion tax hike, and that will end everything, including growth. There won't be growth. There'll be total contraction. Biden's also pledged to demolish the U.S. energy industry and implement the same policies causing blackouts in California. He wants to have things lit up with wind. Now, he'll have to talk to China, Russia, uh, India, and lots of other countries, because they're not doing that. And if they're not doing it, uh, it puts us at a tremendous economic disadvantage, and it doesn't work. You take a look at the blackouts in California. It's really rather amazing what's going on there. They've tried to go, and that's just with a small portion going that route. That doesn't work, and it can't fire up our big plants. If we're going to have this great industry that we've created, can't fire up our big plants. Biden's plan for the China virus is to shut down the entire U.S. economy. He's going to totally rely on somebody to walk up. Yes, sir, it's time to shut it down. He'd be laying off tens of millions of workers and causing countless deaths from suicide, substance abuse, depression, heart disease, and other very serious illnesses. Because when you do a shutdown, there's a problem on the other side. It's not just from the virus. You have a big problem with suicides, with losing your jobs, with all sorts of things. That, uh, you just take a look. Depression is a massive problem. And uh, what happens is you — they turn to substance abuse alcohol, drugs. So we can't do that. And then we'd have to give up all the gains that I've been talking about over the last three months. We've — what we have done is incredible. We're setting records all over the world, no matter where you go. Nobody has done what we've been able to do. So we're setting records in jobs. We're setting records in numbers. And you're going to see some very big numbers. Third quarter numbers are coming out right before a very special day, November 3rd. So you have the numbers coming out. And they're, uh, I think, going to be fantastic. You know, I think they're going to be fantastic. The best numbers of all, if somebody doesn't come along and raise taxes, double, triple, quadruple your taxes, will be the numbers from next year. But you're going to have a good third quarter number coming out. And uh, I think it's going to be hard for even the media to disparage that number. Biden wants to surrender our country to the virus. He wants to surrender our families to the violent left-wing mob. And he wants to surrender our jobs to China, our jobs and our economic well-being. I've taken in billions and billions of dollars from China. No other president's done what I've done. I've given much of it to the farmers. I've given it to farmers and manufacturers, but I've given most of it to the U.S. Treasury. Nobody's done that. We haven't taken in 10 cents from China ever. They targeted our farmers, and I targeted them. And I gave $28 billion to our farmers. Our farmers wouldn't be existent right now. Right now, they're very happy. In fact, they're setting records on purchases. China is purchasing more corn than they've ever done. Record purchase of corn and soybeans, beef, because they know I'm not happy with them. They know I'm not happy at all. And frankly, uh, I don't want to set the world necessarily to thinking too much about it right now, but there's been 
No country anywhere at any time that's ripped us off like China has. We lose billions and billions of dollars for years and years, decades. We've lost billions and billions and billions of dollars by dealing with China. We get nothing from China. They get nothing other than loss, other than giving our money. And they take that money and they build their military. And you see they're building up a powerful military. And it's very lucky that I've been building ours up, because otherwise we'd be dwarfed right now by China. We would be a terrible thing, a terrible thing. We're way ahead on the nuclear front. We've upgraded our nuclear hope to God. We never have to use it. But we would be in a position that we are not in right now. But China is spending the money we give them to build up their military. So when you mention the word decouple, it's, uh, it's an interesting word. So we lose billions of dollars, and if we didn't do business with them, we wouldn't lose billions of dollars. It's called decoupling, so you'll start thinking about it. You'll start thinking. They take our money and they spend it on building airplanes and building ships and building rockets and missiles. And Biden has been just a pawn for them. He's been so easy, they dream about Biden. There was a report today that they hope that uh, Joe Biden becomes president. If Joe Biden becomes president, China will own the United States, and every other country will be smiling also. They'll be smiling. When reports come out that certain countries don't really like me too much, that's not because of my personality, although it could be that also, frankly. It's because of the fact that I've been very tough on countries that have been ripping us off for so many years. If you look at NATO, with the exception of eight countries, we're one of them. Every country is way behind their delinquent, especially Germany, in paying their NATO bills. That means we end up paying it, and we're not doing it. I told them, we're not doing it. And they've increased their spending now, $130 billion, going up to $400 billion a year. It's all because of me. Then you hear the country doesn't like me. I mean, I can understand that, because President Obama and other presidents, in all fairness, would go in there and They'd make a speech and they'd leave. I went in there, I looked, and I said, this is unfair. We're paying for NATO. We're paying for NATO, almost all of it. So they rip us off on the military, and then they rip us off with the European Union on trade. And Biden doesn't have a clue. He, you know he doesn't have a clue. Everybody knows he doesn't have a clue. In prime time, he wasn't good. And now, it's not prime time. He spent 47 years sending American jobs to China, to Mexico, and to other countries while collecting millions of dollars in campaign and super PAC contributions from global corporations that got rich by making American workers poor. His son, where's Hunter? Where's Hunter? I call him where's Hunter. Uh, walked away with one and a half billion dollars to manage, even though he never did that before. He walked away with a fortune from Ukraine, from China, and from other countries between his son and his brother. You ought to read the statements. And the press doesn't pick that up. If I ever did that, it would be, uh, it would be hell even worse than it's been, okay? Even worse than it's been. What he's done is so incredible. I won't give them the billion dollars, he says. I won't give them unless they get rid of that prosecutor. And then, voila, they got rid of the prosecutor. And the press doesn't even want to talk about it. You talk about quid pro quo. With me, there was none. With him, he's right on tape, and you don't want to cover it. You should be ashamed of yourselves. The press should be ashamed of themselves. But Biden shipped away our jobs, threw open our borders, and sent our youth to fight in these crazy, endless wars. And it's one of the reasons the military — I'm not saying the military is in love with me. The soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't, because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. But uh, we're getting out of the endless wars. You know how we're doing. We defeated 100 percent of the ISIS caliphate, 100 percent. When I was in, when I came in, it was a mess. It was all over. They have it in a certain color, all ISIS. A year later, I said, where is it? It's all gone, sir. Because of you, it's all gone. Because of my philosophy, but be all gone. I said, that's good. Let's bring our soldiers back home. Some people don't like to come home. Some people like to continue to spend money. 
one cold-hearted globalist betrayal after another, and that's what it was. Biden supported NAFTA. He supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Two disasters, the most disastrous trade deals in history, both of them. I can't tell you which was worse. They were both terrible. And as you know, I ended it, and uh, I ended NAFTA. And we're looking at the World Trade Organization. They've become much better, I will say that. Uh, we, uh, World Health, I got out of because we're spending $500 million. China was spending $38 million, and China controlled it. But World Trade, we're looking at it. They've been very nice to us lately, I will say that. Amazingly. We never used to win anything at the World Trade. We'd lose every case. Now, all of a sudden, we're winning a lot of cases. We just won $7 billion as a case. And uh, they're talking to us much differently than they used to. Because if they don't shape up, we're going to ship out. That's all. We're not treated fairly. China is treated as a developing nation. Developing nation. We're treated as a nation that's fully developed. We're not fully developed, as far as I'm concerned. When you look around at Portland and you see what these Democrats are doing to our cities, Take a look at what's happening in New York and Chicago, where you have Democrat-run cities and mayors that are running and governors that are running states so badly and mayors running cities so badly. It's very sad to look at it. It's Democrat-run. Every one of them that I see. I guess we could probably find one or two that aren't, but I don't — so far, I haven't been able to. Uh, if you look at uh, Biden, he supported TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been a disaster, would have destroyed our automobile business. By the way, many plants are being built right now, auto plants in Michigan, just like I said. They're being built in Ohio. They're being built in South Carolina, North Carolina. They're being built all over and expanded at a level that we've never seen before. Because I said to Japan and Germany and others, sorry, you got to come here and build plants, otherwise, we're going to have to make it very tough on you with tariffs. And we got out of the horrible Paris Climate Accord that he'll go back into because, you know, it sounds wonderful. It's a disaster for this country. They've basically taken away your wealth, the Paris Climate Accord. And the other countries don't have to adhere to it. China doesn't kick in until 2030. They don't have to do anything till 2030. We had very high standards. We would have had to close under some scenarios. 25 percent of our businesses in order to qualify under this ridiculous Paris Climate Accord. It sounds good. It was very bad and very expensive. The New York Times has just published an entire story on Biden's China sellouts, which is amazing for The New York Times. I appreciate that. In 2001, Biden said the United States welcomes the emergence of a prosperous, integrated China on the global stage because we expect this is going to be a China that plays by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. They didn't play by the rules. The World Trade Organization, one of the reasons it's so bad is that China didn't play by the rules. We did. We did. But their rules were easier because they're considered a developing nation. So they had a much lower standard. But even that, they didn't play by the rules. That's when they became a rocket ship. They were flatlined for years and years and years. Then they joined the World Trade Organization. And frankly, they cheated. Okay, they cheated. I'll say it. What difference does it make? I feel much differently. I feel I made a great trade deal with China. Great. They're, and they're buying. You know why they're buying? Because they know I'm not happy. That's why they're buying. And I talk about it because today is Labor Day. And it's a good time to talk about when we're being ripped off by countries, but nobody's even close to China. Biden cheered China's rise as a great power because great powers adhere to international norms in the areas of nonproliferation, human rights, and trade. Well, they didn't. They took advantage of stupid people. Stupid people. And Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it. But you know that. The cost of Biden's economic treachery was 60,000 shuttered American factories. And I hear this morning the real number is probably 70,000. 70,000 shuttered American factories. And he's talking about how wonderful it is with China. No, China's been very bad, on top of which we had the China plague sent to us and other viruses. Nothing near this serious, but the swine. We had other viruses sent in over the years that came from China. I wonder why. If Biden wins, China wins, because China will own this country. If Biden wins, 
China will own this country, and hopefully you're not going to be able to find that out. It's the most important election in our history right now. Most important election in our history. Under my administration, we will make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world, and we'll end our reliance on China once and for all. Whether it's decoupling or putting in massive tariffs like I've been doing already, we're going to end our reliance on China because we can't rely on China. And I don't want them building a military like they're building right now, and they're using our money to build it. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States, and we'll impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China, and we'll hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. Now you can understand why China would much rather see Sleepy Joe than Donald Trump. But as long as I'm president, we will never waver in our undying loyalty to the American worker and to our country as a whole. So, happy Labor Day, everybody. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the issue of what happened when you were in France continues to be a story. You're going to have to take that off, please. Just, you can take I'll, it off. You're, you're, how, how many feet are you away? I'll speak a lot louder. Well, if you don't take it off, you're very muffled. So if you would take it off, it would be a lot easier. I'll, I'll just speak a lot louder. Is that better? It's better, yeah. Mr. It's Mr. better. Mr. President, some people are having a hard time believing your denials of the Atlantic story because of what you said about John McCain in the past. Do you understand that? And have you asked John no, I don't understand and have that. you asked John Kelly to refute that story? No, I don't understand it at all, no, because I've always been on the opposite side of John McCain. John McCain liked wars. I will be a better warrior than anybody, but when we fight a war, we're going to win them. And frankly, I was never a fan of John McCain. You know that. It's been very obvious. I was, but I had to approve his entire funeral. I wanted him to get. He deserved a first class. You know, it all was approved by me. We sent Air Force One to pick up the casket. A lot of things. But no, I was not a fan of John McCain because he wanted the endless wars, and I didn't. I thought that the way the vets were taken care of, our great vets, was not good, not appropriate. And, of course, he took the fake, dirty dossier and gave it over to the FBI. So this is not somebody I'm not supposed to say, what a wonderful guy. So, you know what? I lived with him. He lived with me, but we had different philosophies. I think my philosophy is right. I think it's turned out to be right. But I wasn't a fan. But I respect people, and I respect a lot of people. That doesn't mean I necessarily uh, have to agree with them. And I didn't agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, the story is a hoax written by a guy who's got a tremendously bad history. The magazine itself, which I don't read, but I hear it's just totally anti-Trump. He's a big Obama person. He's a big Clinton person. And he made up the story. It's a totally made-up story. In fact, I was very happy to see Zach Fuentes came out and said, now he's that's, — I think that's number 15. And these are people that were there. That's the 15th person, General Kellogg. Uh, everybody that was there uh, knew what happened. And so I was happy to see that Zach came out and said it's not true. He just came out. And uh, it's a disgrace. Who would say a thing like that? Only an animal would say a thing like that. There is nobody that has more respect for not only our military, but for people that gave their lives in the military. There is nobody — and I think John Kelly knows that. I think he would know that. I think he knows that from me. But Zach Fuentes, as you know, worked for John. And I think they both know that. But Zach came out, as you know, today or yesterday, last night, and said very strongly that uh, he didn't hear anything like that. Even John Bolton came out and said that was untrue. Now, what was true is that we had the worst weather. I think it was as bad a rain as I've just about ever seen. And it was a fog. You, you literally couldn't see. I walked out. I didn't have to, I didn't need somebody to tell me. I walked out. I said, there's no way we can take helicopters in this. I understand helicopters very well. And they said, no, sir, that's been canceled. They would have had to go Secret Service. I have the whole list. They would have had to go through a very, very busy section during the day of Paris. 
They would have had to go through the city. The Paris police were asking us, please don't do it, because they're not ready. When you do that, you need a lot of time. They, they take days and days and days to prepare for that. I wanted to do it very badly. I was willing to sit in a car for two hours, three hours, four hours. I didn't care. It didn't matter. And I had nothing else to do. I went there for that. I had nothing else to do. It was ended because of the terrible weather, and nobody was prepared to go through in terms of Paris, the police, the military, and the Secret Service. And they came out very strongly and said, sir, we can't allow you to make this trip. If I wanted to, sir, we can't allow you from a safety standpoint. It was a phony story, just like the dirty dossier, the fake dirty dossier, just like the Russia collusion, just like all of the other phony stories. And there'll be more phony stories. But I do appreciate Zach coming out. But Zach now is the 15th person that's denied it. Zach now, I think, also talked about the weather aspect of it. And he's probably the 14th or 15th person that blamed it on weather. So that's enough of that. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Christina Bob, One American News, thank you for holding the briefing. Thank you. We're seeing judges, most recently in Detroit, limit police ability to use non-lethal force. Uh, my first question would be, should the police be allowed to use non-lethal force to call the violence in their city? We're talking about where non-lethal force? Right, so in the riots, most recently. The riots. Yes. Well, I think what's happened is the, uh, the toughness. These are Democrat-run cities all. And there's no, um, there's no retribution. There's no, you, they stand there, they throw things at the people that are supposed to be protecting something and nothing happens. They throw rocks, they throw cans of soup, they throw lots of hard objects and rarely does anything happen. But I've told when we have the federal in there, as you know, I told the US Marshals to go get the man who killed a, another man, and they know who it was, and you have to arrest him. You have to arrest him. After two and a half days, they didn't arrest him. The U.S. Marshals went in, and it ended up being a gunfight, and the man was killed. But this is a man that had a bad record, and there's a man that killed a man in the street. I mean, I witnessed it. Most people witnessed it. And the U.S. Marshals went in. They weren't playing games. They can't play games. If somebody is breaking the law, there's got to be a form of retribution. I watch so often when I watch some of the, uh, the areas that we're talking about. Now we have Rochester. That's, again, Democrat governor, Democrat mayor, all Democrats, every one of them. And it always will be. I was with the governor in Texas. He looked at me and said, I can't imagine how they allow this to happen. And, you know, it's different. It's different. I could talk about other governors saying the same thing. Yeah, please, go ahead. I could follow up on that. Uh, we're also hearing reports of groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter traveling around the country, leaving their home cities to go um, riot and protest in other cities where they're yeah. causing damage. Do we expect to see um, prosecutions or charges yeah. in the Department of Justice for those traveling for that purpose? So we have now over a thousand people, federal, uh, in jail. We're prosecuting many people. A big thing was when I signed the law putting people in jail if you knock down monuments. That was three months ago. There hasn't been a federal monument knocked down in three months or even thought about it. I don't think they've even thought about it. So that's had a very big impact, very big impact. But yeah, we're uh, going around. And the nice part is you people take, see those people up there, they take nice pictures of everybody. So we don't even have to bother. We can use the news photos. We had a photo right over there of Andrew Jackson, uh, the monument. He was getting ready. and. This guy was a big, brave guy, and he was up like this, and he was showing off to all his friends, and he got arrested. So did a lot of other people get arrested. And I would say we have the ultimate proof. Now, in that case, we got there before they ripped down the statue of Andrew Jackson, which is so beautiful, which is right over there. But they never got it. But right after that, I signed a, an order saying you go to prison for 10 years. And as soon as I signed that order, that was the end of the statues coming down. But they have other ideas. They've, they've got plenty of ideas. They're not at want for ideas. Please, go ahead. Mr. Spunt, David Spunt from Fox News. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, thank you for taking my question. Um, sir, you talked a lot about the economy and touted the economy. Three weeks ago in Bedminster, I asked you specifically why you have not called Democratic leadership to the White House to meet with them. If they don't want to meet, it's on them. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing you. I cover you on the weekends and stuff. You're I don't think they are. No, I don't think Why have you not met with them in yeah. person? I mean, we're in September. There's no deal. There's no hope of a deal. 
Uh, we're two months out from the election. What Don't say, say there's no me? hope. Why do you say there's but no what hope? Can you say to what do you know? Well, what can you say? It what do you know? It doesn't seem like And, and let me just tell you, I know my customers. That's what I do. Uh, I know Pelosi. I know Schumer very well. They don't want to make a deal because they think it's good for politics if they don't make a deal. This has nothing to do with anything other than you have to know who you're dealing with. I do. Uh, these are people that uh, I don't have a lot of respect. Uh, I don't think they have a lot of respect for the American people. And I know who I'm dealing with. And I don't need to meet with them to be turned down. They don't want to make a deal because they know that's good for the economy. And if they make a deal that's good for the economy and, therefore, it's good for me for the election in November or November 3rd, and, therefore, they're not going to make a deal. Now, uh, if we gave the store away, if we bailed out all of their Democrat-run cities where we give them a trillion dollars, which is the kind of money they want, they want a trillion dollars to bail out badly-run Democrat cities and states, uh, whether it's New York or Illinois or others, uh, they want to bail them out. And we're saying, well, we're not going to pay that kind of a price in order to bail the city. We'll do something to help cities, but that's going to have to rest on its own. And why didn't you do this at the beginning? Because they could have done it at the beginning. So I know who I'm dealing with. And I'm on the phone with uh, Mnuchin and with Meadows and with all of these people constantly, you know, while they're there. But I also know when it's time to meet with people. I've done very well with deals, okay? That's what I do. And I know when it's time to meet. But I don't have to meet them in order to be turned down and in order for them to walk out to the sticks, which is the microphones, and give you people a false report of what just took place in the Oval Office. So um, they don't want to make a deal because they think that if the country does as badly as possible, even though a lot of people are being hurt, that's good for the Democrats. But, David, that's a bad thing. Yeah, please, but go as ahead. President, shouldn't you take the high road, sir? I, I am taking the high road. I'm taking the high road by not seeing them. That's the high road. Yeah. And you think it's President David And if Jackson. I thought it made a difference or would make a difference, I'd do it in a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. David Jackson, USA Today. My question is about the Durham report, which you have talked about recently. You said, let's see what happens. Now, you've accused people of committing crimes against you during the Russia investigation. Yeah, President sure, Obama, sure. They spied on my campaign. That's right. My question they spied on my campaign. And if they were Democrats, they would have been in jail two years ago. They would have been in jail. Literally, if this side were the Democrat side, they would have been in jail two years ago for 50-year terms for treason and other things. Me, my question is, do you want the Justice Department to indict people over this? I'm not going to say that. I have to see the report. I haven't seen it. I purposely, I don't know if that was a good thing, smart thing. I don't know. But nobody can complain about it. I have every right to have been very much involved. And maybe someday I'll get involved in it. They spied on my campaign, and that includes Biden and Obama. They spied on my campaign trying to defeat me. They wrote up a fake dossier that has proven to be totally fake, written by Christopher Steele, paid for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. And they used that illegally in the FISA courts. If we did what they did, you would have many people in jail all right, all right now. And you have, other than the one agent that admitted his guilt, that he forged documents, we don't have that yet, but the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens. Sounds but like let, me just, let me just say something. President Obama and Biden, Sleepy Joe, he knew everything that was happening. They were spying on my campaign and they got caught. Now let's see what happens. But if this were the opposite way, people would have been jailed. They would have been in jail already for a period of at least, it would have started two years ago and it would have been for 50 years for treason. Because you can't do that. That's never, and nothing like that's ever happened before. Then they created, at tremendous expense, the money they paid is tremendous. I'm sure you know the money that was paid, millions of dollars. They created a fake dossier, a fake dossier, proven to be now fake. Everyone, and they used it in the FISA courts. That's a crime. So far, I haven't seen anybody have a problem, but the report hasn't been issued yet. Let's see what happens with the Durham report. But this started at Obama. And some people would say, and some people would well, but he was the president. Like, let's leave him alone. If it were me, they wouldn't be leaving me alone. I can tell you, it's a totally double standard, and it's a, it's a disgrace. And if I were a Republican senator, and if I were a Republican congressman, and we have some great ones, but we have a lot of them that don't fight the way that the other side fights. We have much better policy. We have much better things going for us, like borders, and walls and immigration and no sanctuary cities and a lot they have a lot of bad stuff going.
but they're dirty fighters. And the dirtiest fight of all is the issuance of 80 million ballots, unrequested. They're not requested. They're just sending 80 million ballots all over the country, 80 million ballots, non-requested. I call them unsolicited ballots. That's going to be the dirtiest fight of all. People are going to get ballots. They're going to say, what am I doing? And then they're going to harvest. They're going to do all the things. And if you look at the last period of six months, take a look at the races where they've sent ballots out. Take a look at Carolyn Maloney, whose race should be redone because she won that race totally unfairly to her opponent. Her opponent did very well against her. That race should be rerun. But they declared her the winner because they heard I found out about it. But take a look at what's happened in New Jersey and in Virginia and different places. It's a disgrace. That'll be a beauty. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. If proven true, are you okay with Postmaster General DeJoy and the fact that he asked former employees at his private company to make donations to the GOP and then reimburse them? Are you okay yeah, with that? I don't know too much about it. I read something this morning, but I don't. Other than that, I'd have to see it. Uh, he's a very respected man. He was approved. Uh, very much uh, by both parties, I guess. It was sort of a, an approval that took place by both parties. I don't know exactly what the story is. I'll certainly know within a short period of time. I just read it for the first time. I read it this morning, just like you did. Would you support an investigation, sir? Sure, sure. And in I think the let the investigations go, but, but uh, he's a very respected man. Again, it was a uh, bipartisan commission. Postmaster General is appointed by a bipartisan commission, and we'll see how that goes. But no, I, I think he's a very honest guy, but we'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Go ahead, please. Follow up, please, if you don't mind. If it's proven to be a campaign finance scheme, do you think he should lose his job? Yeah, if something could be proven that he did something wrong, always. You know? Thank you. Always. They've been looking at me for four years. They found nothing. Four years, think of it. For four years, from the day I came down the escalator, I've been under investigation by Sleaze, and they found nothing. They found nothing. A friend of mine said, you have to be the most innocent, honorable man ever to hold the office of president. Think of it. They spent just Mueller alone. He spent, I guess the real number turned out to be $48 million, but whatever it was, many, many millions of dollars. They had 18 angry Democrats looking. They had FBI agents all over the place. They had every — and they have no collusion. Friends of mine have said, sophisticated friends have said, you've got to be the most innocent guy ever to hold this office. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, after Navalny poisoning, Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany is under pressure to cancel Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia to Germany. Would you support such a move? Do you sure. think the, the project should be canceled? Sure. Well, I've been, I've been supportive of that. I was the first one that brought it up. You never heard of Nord Stream 2 until Trump came along. When I came along, I said, wait a minute. We're protecting Germany from Russia, right? NATO. We're protecting Germany from Russia. Germany's paying Russia billions and billions of dollars to get their energy. And the real number is probably 60 to 70 percent, ultimately, of their energy is going to come from Russia. And I said this for years, that nobody talks about it. One of the many things between sanctions and all of the what we've done for Ukraine relative to what the past had. They used to send pillows, and we sent tank busters. But I brought that up a long time ago. Russia's unhappy that I brought it up. But you never heard of Nord Stream 2. Nobody did until I got elected. And I said, why is Germany making a deal to give billions of dollars to Russia, and then we're protecting Germany from Russia? How does that work? And then on top of it, Germany is delinquent because they're only paying a little more than 1 percent, and they're supposed to be paying 2 percent, and even the 2 percent is low. But just remember, Trump, me, I got the countries of NATO to spend 1.130 billion, going to $400 billion a year. Think of it, $400 billion a year more for NATO. And the purpose of NATO primarily is Europe protection against Russia. Now they can use it for other, I guess, and they have a little bit in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm the one that did that. So, but nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about Nord Stream 2. The answer is, absolutely, if they feel that something happens. 
But I don't know that Germany is in a position right now because Germany is in a very weakened position energy-wise. They're closing all their plants. They're closing their nuclear. They're closing their coal. They're closing a lot of plants. And they are — they have put themselves in a very bad position, frankly. Very, very bad position. Yeah, please. Uh, can I follow up on Jeff Mason's question? Uh, have you asked John Kelly to publicly no, I have nothing against John. I have no nothing against anybody. No, I was very heartened to see that a friend of his, because I know Zach is a friend of his and worked for him. I was very heartened to see that Zach Fuentes came out with the statement that he did, I guess, late last night, that uh, it was not true. Can I ask another question? Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President, what exactly is un-American about federal government training programs that are aimed at improving inclusivity? Well, we're going to do a report. Yeah, I, I fired those people. They're all gone. And uh, it was a disgrace, frankly. And we're going to give you a big report that's going to make you very happy. All right. Yeah, please. Thank you. Darlene Superville, AP. You said a moment ago, they'll say anything. You were talking about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and their comments about the vaccine. You have a No, they say worse. They say negative. They say negative. They're going to make the vaccine into a negative so that when we have it, and I spoke to the head of Pfizer, I spoke to the head of Johnson & Johnson, I spoke to the head of the greatest uh, medical companies in the world. We're doing great. We're going to have it soon. Wait a minute. So now what they're saying is, oh, wow, this is bad news. President Trump is getting this vaccine in record time. By the way, if this were the Obama administration, you wouldn't have that vaccine for three years, and you probably wouldn't have it at all. So we're going to have a, a vaccine very soon, maybe even before a very special date. You know what date I'm talking about. But let me just tell you, wait. And what they're doing because they think it is going fast. And if you talk to a lot of your sources, if you have sources, if you talk to your sources in the FDA, you'll see it's going very, very well. The, the numbers are looking unbelievably strong, unbelievably good. So now they're saying, wow, Trump's pulled this off. OK, let's disparage the vaccine. That's so bad for this country. That's so bad for the world to even say that. And that's what they're saying it. But I watched Kamala's poll numbers drop from 15 to almost zero, and then drop out even before she ran in Iowa, because people didn't like her. And I understand why. She will never be president, although I have to be careful, because Obama used to say that about me, so I have to be a little bit careful. Right, but, but you have to look at her a little bit more closely, because obviously Joe's not doing too well. So you're going to have to look at her a little bit too closely. But she's talking about disparaging a vaccine so that people don't think the achievement was a great achievement. I don't want the achievement for myself. I want something that's going to make people better, that people aren't going to get sick with. That includes therapeutics, where we're doing equally as well. Therapeutics. Go your ahead. Your, your point is that what they're saying is that they're saying it for political purposes. Yes. You have asserted repeatedly that a vaccine will be on the market by before the election. No, I didn't by say, the I didn't say they will. I said by the end of the year. The same thing that no, you but you're not quoting you're me saying. accurately. I said that vaccines will be on the market before the end of the year. But they may even be on the market. They may even be developed and fully developed, tested, everything else. You know, we have 30,000 people in just one vaccine right now under test in very, very highly infected areas. So we're going to be able to get a good result one way or the other very soon. So I didn't say what you said. What I said is by the end of the year. But I think it could even be sooner than that. It could be during the month of October, actually could be before November. Are you also saying that for political reasons? No, I'm saying that because we want to save a lot of lives. The fast With me, it's the faster the better. With somebody else, maybe they would say it politically. But I'm saying it in, in terms of this is what we need. We have to have, if we get the vaccine early, that's a great thing, whether it's politics or not. Now, do benefits inure if you're able to get something years ahead of schedule? I, I guess maybe they do. But the most important thing to me is saving lives. It's the most important thing. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Hi. Um, just based on some of your recent tweets, sir, do you... Um, you do sound so clear, <laughs> as opposed to everybody else, where they refuse. Your, your tweets about the 1619 project. Yeah. Uh, why do you object to that being taught in schools? And, and do you object to slavery itself being taught uh, in schools? Yeah, so, no, I want everybody to know everything they can about our history. I'm not a believer in cancel culture, the good or the bad. If you don't study the bad, it could happen again. So I do want that 
subjects studied very, very carefully and very accurately. Um, but uh, we grew up with a certain history, and now they're trying to change our history, revisionist history. That's why they want to take down our monuments. That's why they want to take down our statues. I saw something the other day which was absolutely horrendous, a Washington Monument. They want to rename it the D.C. Committee, but the D.C. Committee is all Democrats. Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, we're talking about this is the big stuff now. This is the big stuff. And they want to rename it. They want to redesignate it. They want to take some down. No, we don't do that. Never going to happen with me, I guarantee you that. Well, I want to thank you all, and I just want to wish you a very happy Labor Day. And we're having tremendous success, whether it's on the vaccines, whether it's on the pandemic, the, the plague that came in from China that China should have never let happen, because I will never feel the same about China. And I just want to, again, wish you a happy Labor Day. Thank you very much, everybody. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This morning, colleges nationwide taking drastic measures to keep COVID-19 under control. Northeastern University suspending 11 freshmen for the semester after they were caught partying in this hotel doubling as a dorm, violating school rules. I hate to say it, but Northeastern gave out a lot of information and like regards as to like what the protocols and so it kind of they had it coming. In a statement, Northeastern officials said in part, cooperation and compliance with public health guidelines is absolutely essential. 
Those people who do not follow the guidelines are putting everyone else at risk. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, students at nine fraternity and sorority houses were ordered to quarantine for 14 days after nearly 40 tested positive. I never heard of parties or anything, but you know it's tough when you're living in a house with uh, 50 people, like one person can uh, ruin it for everybody. The school saying, our goal is to stop any further spread of the virus among our students and the broader community. Parties like this one near the University of South Carolina, part of the problem. Some schools taking more serious steps. SUNY Oneonta canceling all on-campus classes for the entire semester. 100 cases at SUNY Oneonta became 600 cases at SUNY Oneonta in four days. This spreads quickly. Colleges, not the only potential flashpoint. A wedding in Maine in early August is now being blamed for nearly 150 cases and three deaths in communities as far as 100 miles away. As Labor Day weekend comes to a close, the question and concern for many leaders, could festivities end up being super spreaders? After the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. So let's hope that we can celebrate safely. A cautious message that's not always heard. We just came to have a good time and relax. Uh, really not afraid of COVID. Now, as for those 11 Northeastern students who were punished for partying, they won't be able to take online classes or get refunded that tuition worth up to $36,000. However, they can still appeal that dismissal. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed. But some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begging to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but yes, now I now that the again the cases have been kind of surging, it is it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India just surpassed Brazil uh, to become the second worst afflicted country in the world. But, you know, both of those countries are still far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the U.S. This morning, Coral Springs, Florida is using a simple 15-minute antigen test on its essential personnel. Firefighters, police, and city workers. No blood samples required. Just a swab from the back of the throat mixed with a solution and placed into a tray. If it turns blue, then it's positive for coronavirus. There's no better feeling than to be able to tell a family a result right on the spot before they leave because then you can counsel them, you can help them know what to do next. To date, other COVID tests have required long waits, in some cases up to 15 days. While waiting for those results, some Americans do not quarantine, which can spread the virus even more. Dr. Deborah Burks talked about the promise of these rapid tests, just as the pandemic started overwhelming our nation. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly trying to detect the actual live virus. 
This 15-minute rapid antigen test now in use in Coral Springs was developed in China. Studies on Chinese healthcare workers showed the test was accurate 80.2 percent of the time. This antigen test comes from China, where they say 80 percent success. But should we be suspect simply because this is China? I would say that as a scientist, as a researcher, I would be suspect of any test that comes to me for evaluation. If it came from China or England or New Zealand or even within America, I would say that those tests all have to be validated. This 15-minute rapid antigen test is still unproven in the United States. Dr. Peter Antevi, who is the medical director for the Coral Springs Fire Department, follows each antigen test with a more accurate, time-consuming test that examines DNA, those comparisons to be shared with the FDA. While an admittedly small test sample in Coral Springs, the 15-minute rapid tests have been 86% accurate. And while 86% accurate isn't perfect, Harvard professor Dr. Ranu Dillon says the way to make up for that failure rate is repeated testing. 80% success rate means 20% aren't caught. Is that good enough? That definitely is good enough if you're testing frequently. So if I, you test one day and you're in that 20% where you're missed, but then you test yourself again the next day or two days later, the likelihood of being missed both of those times is exceedingly low. The FDA says antigen tests will play a critical role in the fight against COVID-19. For cities like Coral Springs, these rapid antigen tests are not only cheaper, but employees are not sidelined for days while waiting for results. And now you got a 15 minute result and? I'll be going home tonight and having dinner with my family. Because you are? Negative. Put a swab to the back of your throat. I took that 15 minute test. I am a little anxious. Aside from the gag reflex when my throat was swabbed, it was easy. And getting near instant results reduces anxiety. So I'm all clear. You're all clear. Good. Thank God. Your colorful mask is working, Carrie. So where might we see these tests widely <laughs> used first? Uh, initially, we'll probably see them in workplaces where people go back to work and also at schools. Now, the test that I took is not the Abbott test. That one we'll begin seeing in about 30 days, and the cost is about $5. So, guys, we're probably yeah. going to see these very soon, just about everywhere. Certainly progress. Flying can be more unpredictable than ever. NBC News correspondents reporting from airports across the country share what's happening. I was going to get a bite to eat, but a lot of places are still closed right now. Some airlines are making sure that everyone is socially distanced, while others are pretty much packing a full flight. People wearing masks for the most part and keeping distance, as you can see over my shoulder. So we are officially on our flight. And the way we get our snacks have also changed. AAA estimates 15 million people will fly this summer, down 74% from last year. As travelers slowly return to airports, how can you reduce risk? I asked Dr. Henry Wu, director of Emory University's Travel Well Center. What's your advice when it comes specifically to flying and air travel? We're still in a phase where uh, travelers need to look carefully at their reasons for travel and not travel unless it's very urgent. Dr. Wu has treated patients who he believes contracted coronavirus while flying and others who may have unknowingly spread the virus during air travel. If you are going to fly, consider this risk checklist. Your destination, is it a hot spot? And do people there wear masks as recommended by the CDC? Where will you stay? Who will you interact with? And what's your plan if you or someone in your group contracts coronavirus? Ask, will you be required to quarantine at your destination or when you come home? If you decide to fly, make sure to plan ahead, especially if you're traveling with kids. Wear clothes with a lot of pockets. You want room to stash those snacks. And of course, keep a pocket open for your ID and your phone for quick access. And don't forget to bring extra masks. Remember, TSA is now allowing up to 12 ounces of hand sanitizer per person. So even a big bottle like this is allowed. And you wanna keep your disinfectant wipes in an outside pocket so they're easy to get to. I also like these little bottles of hand sanitizer that you can clip onto a belt loop or attach to your bag for easy access. And consider putting your kids in clothes that have pockets too. Remind them to put their hands in their pockets and not to touch anything when they get to the airport or on the plane. Got it, Emmy? Got it. At 
the airport maintain social distancing of at least six feet from others. One of our producers shot this video at the Denver airport, showing passengers crowded together at check-in. But at New York's LaGuardia Airport, I had plenty of space in the security line. You may also notice that a lot of restaurants are closed. That's why it's really important to pack your own food. And keep in mind, the restaurants that are open will probably be limited, and you may have to wait in super long lines. Another tip, use the bathroom before your flight, especially if you're traveling with kids, so no one has to leave their seats during the flight. Once on board, wipe down all the surfaces you might touch, including the tray, the screen, and the seatbelt buckle. As for your seat, is there one that's considered safest? Dr. Wu says choose a window seat because you're less likely to come in contact with passengers and crew walking the aisle. What about breathing the air in an airplane cabin? The uh, good news is that our modern aircraft have very efficient and effective air filtration systems. That, however, does not eliminate the risk of somebody immediately around you. Wash your hands with soap and water once you land and keep that mask on until you're out of the airport, part of the new normal to reduce your risk of getting sick. And if you are wondering whether you should wear goggles or a face shield in addition to your mask, there's no definitive answer, but Dr. Anthony Fauci believes it could help protect you. So not a bad idea to play it safe and wear some eye protection on that flight. Is there anything else consumers can do to reduce their risk? I, I'm sitting here listening to your every word. I miss my grandparents. I miss my family. I want to go home. I think my fear is I do all of those things. But when I get home and see my older family members, I don't know if I did it the right way and I don't have two weeks to stay at home, you know what I mean? Right. right. You don't have that time and space. Yeah. One thing you can do if you are going somewhere, you have to go somewhere, book a nonstop flight. Sometimes it's uh. more expensive, but if you think about it, two flights means you're exposing yourself to an entire second group of people, essentially doubling your exposure, not to mention the layover in the other airport. So if you can at least take a flight that goes to and from A to B. That's good advice. Yeah. All right. It feels like an eternity ago since I, I got on a plane. I and there's know. some Assistant estimates memory. are saying, yeah, and some estimates are saying we will not get back to normal travel till 2024 because of business travel having to mm -hmm. increase again. So wow. it is a tough, challenging time. Everybody's good. realizing you can work from home. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. good. All right, Vicki, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's turn now to Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, to drill down on what to expect with the fall approaching. Dr. Jha, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. So let's dig in here. Today is Labor Day and it's more likely, you know, that there will be large gatherings that are happening. Um, tell me this. Should we be concerned that we're going to see this big spike or do you think that people will heed the warning? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, both after Memorial Day and July 4th, we saw pretty big spikes. Uh, I'm hopeful people will be a bit more careful this time. Again, there's nothing wrong with getting outside and going to a beach or going to a park. It's those large gatherings indoors that are really, really deadly. And that's what we have to avoid. And, you know, the temperatures are starting to get colder in some parts of the country. So that limits people being able to hang out outside. So is that a big concern for the fall that more people are going to be inside? Yes, I think a lot of us in the public health community are worried about what's going to happen this fall. Um, as you said, the weather is going to start getting colder. People are going to start spending more time indoors. That's where the virus likes to spread. Uh, and so that's part of the reason we wanted to get the caseloads as low as possible as we entered into the fall. Unfortunately, we still have 40 to 50,000 people getting infected every day. So mm. I think we have some work to do before it gets much colder. Well, speaking of which, a hot topic today, we've also seen colleges having issues, you know, keeping kids healthy and they're cracking down. But are administrators, in your opinion, doing enough to protect the students or what should they be doing additionally? Yeah, so look, I, I'm, I'm all in for get, making students be more responsible, but administrators have to be responsible too, and, and, and they're the adults. Mm -hmm. And what colleges need to be doing is having a plan for quarantining, a plan for surveillance testing. A lot of colleges and universities have put in surveillance testing. I think that's pretty essential. Uh, when colleges don't do their part and then just blame the students, I find that very frustrating and, and personally irresponsible. Colleges have a, have a responsibility here as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. We. Uh wanted to get to some viewer questions. We put the call out for questions. And Donna Naples in Florida, uh, she asked on Twitter, my child has gone back to school. What's the best way to make sure backpacks and lunch boxes traveling back and forth each day are sanitized to prevent the spread of germs in their house? Mm. 
It's a good question. Um, I don't think you need to do anything particularly uh, different. Uh, obviously, wash the lunch boxes after every day. Uh, uh, maybe a little extra hand hygiene. So what I do when I, for instance, pick up groceries from the store is after I put everything away, I wash my hands uh, a bit more assiduously. And, and that's I would do the same thing with lunch boxes for my kids when they get back to, from school. We have a good question from Instagram. When is the best time to get the flu shot this year? Well, most important is to get the flu shot uh, now, later, uh, when it becomes available. Um, so in general, I've been advising people that as soon as the flu vaccine becomes available, uh, people should go out and get it. Here's another question. Do you think it's important for high school student athletes to be tested regularly? That's a very good question. In general, I've been pushing high schools in general when they open up to have some amount of surveillance testing if possible. In terms of the student athletes, I don't know if they're at that much higher risk. It depends a little bit on what sport. So I have a I have a high schooler who runs track. Okay. I don't know that she's at particularly increased risk, but football, soccer, where you're going to be spending time indoors in locker rooms, maybe that's a bit of a higher risk situation and, and more testing would be useful. We have another viewer question finally, something I hadn't thought of. It says, should our children shower or bathe as soon as they get home from school? You know, schools are not some super high-risk place they're going into. I mean, we saw this with doctors and nurses who were working in COVID units who would come home and immediately shower. That's fine. Schools are not that. They're not okay. super dangerous places. I don't think you need to do anything different. Maybe extra careful, like washing hands and making sure that uh, stuff is put away. But other than that, I wouldn't do anything differently. All right. Well, Dr. Jha, thanks for your advice and thanks for joining us this morning. Calming presence this morning, yes. doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Moral of Pacidity. the story, keep washing your hands. Yeah, really. Always. In terrain too remote and jagged for any vehicles, this rescue was all about human force. <laughs> I don't think I would have made it out, especially uh, without any other adults. What started out as a camping trip for Peter Monroe and his family soon became a 48-hour trial of survival. It's very steep and rugged up there, so it can be a problem. Peter, his seven-year-old daughter Layla, and yellow lab Buck had gone into the rugged Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood last Tuesday to set up camp for his family at Kinzel Lake. But when his wife Camille arrived later in the day and they were missing, she went searching, discovered his truck at the nearby trailhead with the keys and Layla's stuffed animals still inside, called 911. Rescuers immediately deployed multiple agencies. When there's children involved, uh you know, that's the top priority. The search included more than 50 rescuers, search dogs, Air Force pararescue jumpers, and a construction crew that helped move vehicles across difficult terrain, saving searchers valuable time. Thursday morning, 48 hours after they'd hiked into the woods, rescuers found the trio trapped deep in a canyon ravine near a stream. They had worked their way about 2,000 meters down a 3,000 meter canyon but they were exhausted and not able to move any further without assistance. Peter had injured his ankle and knee on the hike down and could not walk. Crews stabilized him in a litter and manually hauled him up the 2,000 meters. Rescuers carried Layla, dehydrated and exhausted. The grateful Monroe thanked the rescuers from the back of the ambulance. You guys, you guys saved myself and my daughter's and my dog's life. As for Buck, who climbed out without any assistance, the dog was done. <laughs> the dog got up to the road and just fell out. He was done. It was good to see them all safe and sound. A harrowing ordeal with a happy ending. Peter is out of the hospital and recovering at home. The family has asked for privacy. As for Buck the dog, it may be a while before he heads out back on any hikes, at least mm. anytime soon. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. 
The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. For most, city life means a trade-off, space for location. So when coronavirus hit and everyone was stuck in their small homes, walls closed in fast. What was life like in your house at the height of the pandemic with homeschooling and remote work? It was a chaos in the house. With three children growing more restless day by day. I think they started having anxiety at the end when they couldn't come out. So it was more like, we want to go out, we want to play. I don't understand why we're being locked down inside the house. Podiatrist Rehana and Saudi Alam decided it was time to move their family out of New York City to the Long Island suburbs, eventually finding this house, adding a half hour to the commute, but lots more space. Is it fair to say that you guys weren't the only ones with this idea? Yes, oh, no. <laughs> for sure. No. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, right? it's, uh, it was definitely not the buyer's market. It, I, I mean, it's everybody was uh, fighting for, for the houses here. The suburbs near New York are booming. In July, home sales were up 44 percent compared to last year, while the number of properties sold in Manhattan dropped by more than half. People are leaving San Francisco, too. There are more than double the properties on the market in the city now compared to last year. So there's no question people are definitely either moving to other areas outside the city or they're at least buying second homes. Parts of the East Bay, very, very competitive. Napa Valley, very, very competitive. Tahoe is probably having one of the hottest markets they've had in a decade. But for now, the trend appears limited to a handful of big, expensive cities. We looked at a slew of housing data comparing urban and suburban markets and concluded that you know, the story of a mass exodus from cities is largely overblown. Moving is costly, reserved for those who have the means. For many, upgrading to more space in the suburbs isn't an option, especially renters who are only just scraping by. The alums say they feel blessed they were able to get their family out. We don't feel like this is New York. Um, I feel like we're in another state and it's, it's beautiful. Nothing quite like a backyard and a sigh of relief. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Long Island, New York. Back at airport checkpoints today. Go ahead and pull out your ID and pull down your mask, please. The biggest flow of passengers since the pandemic began, 900,000 travelers nationwide, but still more than a million fewer travelers than a year ago. Airport terminals, concourses, and ticket counters remain eerily quiet. And that one right here? 
Passengers that do travel will notice big changes at TSA checkpoints. Social distancing markers on the floor, plexiglass to separate officers and passengers, and new self-service kiosks for touchless check-in. That automatically compare photo IDs with the airline's trip information. Here's how it works. You slide your driver's license into the reader. It automatically then takes a look at your photograph and scans your face to make sure the photograph matches. It then matches your photograph with your flight reservation on file, and you're good to go. Admiral David Pekoski is the TSA chief. As soon as I removed that driver's license from the machine, all the image data was removed. You're not holding on to it. Not you're not saving anybody's no. information. No. Despite a 75% drop in passenger traffic, the TSA reports the ratio of gun confiscations per traveler has tripled, and 80% of the guns are loaded. Most passengers claim they simply forgot their gun was in a bag. But the first offense comes with a federal fine of up to $4,100, plus the possibility of local criminal charges. The TSA expects passenger volume will pick up next year, though the CEO of United says getting back to normal will depend on widespread vaccinations. We're modeling it as if we're not back to normal, uh, we're not back to 2019 levels until 2024. But that's just a guess. In the meantime, the TSA is upgrading its CT scanners to get a better view inside carry-on bags without requiring hand checks. And new software in the full body scanners to reduce the need for pat-downs, trying to make the checkpoint experience touchless. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. 
live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Excuse me, do you folks know how many people lived at this address on April 1st? By this month, TJ was hoping to be making good money knocking on doors for the census. I was expecting to work 40 hours a week for at least a month, ideally two months. Instead, he only worked 20 hours a week for two weeks. This is entirely disorganized and just lacks any feeling of any preparation or order at all. We spoke with five workers who are frustrated with everything from a lack of communication from management to glitches in the census interview app. It couldn't have come at a worse time for people who needed the income. Some census takers fear retribution for speaking out since employees are not permitted to give interviews. TJ is not his real name. He asked us to make clear he's giving us his personal views. Another census employee would only let us use her voice. I was collecting a pandemic unemployment as a self-employed contractor. So I was looking forward to making, they told me it would be $25 an hour for uh, enumerators in California. And I thought that sounded like a pretty decent thing. She was counting on making around $8,000 over three months of work, but then... I didn't hear from them from March, April, May, June, maybe three months. Three months I did not hear from the census. I definitely wanted to work for them. The Census Bureau has hired far fewer census takers than in previous years. In 2010, it hired more than 700,000 census takers. But they'd only hired around 300,000 census takers by mid-August 2020, according to the Government Accountability Office. Due to the pandemic, the Bureau stopped its field operations in March, just one week after starting the count for most of the U.S. In April, the official census count deadline was extended to October 31st. The agency did not resume full field operations until June. But in early August, the Trump administration announced it was ending the count four weeks early on September 30th. That means fewer paid hours for some workers banking on a paycheck in a tough job market. If I could have worked for $15 an hour starting in June, I would have made a lot more money. And it, it is money that I was kind of relying on. The census offered pay incentives to boost productivity. Workers we spoke with say the requirements were unachievable, like interviewing nine households in one hour. The Government Accountability Office says not enough workers and shortening the deadline pose a risk to a complete and accurate count, especially in communities of color. But we are concerned about the economy. We've been concerned about that really since we kicked off um, our campaign. No, no, census, no! There's kind of a, a collective feeling of, yeah, this is messed up. This is not working right, and we just don't know what to Let's do. Let's get counted! Let's get counted! A spokesperson for the census says they hired for, quote, what they need this decade because of the transition from paper to more digital counting. They needed fewer census takers this year. Responding to the specific claims of a disorganized working environment this year, the census also told NBC News, quote, whenever you have that large of a workforce, there can be some chaos, absolutely, and that's part of the dynamic of working in the census environment. Pfizer says they will have results in October, and the president has said that there could be a vaccine uh, approved before the election. Um, what's the most realistic time frame for approval? Well, I have said now multiple times over the last several months that the projection would be that by the end of November, December of this calendar year, that we would have an answer whether or not we have a safe and effective vaccine that's approvable. Is it possible? that it could be before then? And the answer is yes. I think it's unlikely, but I think it's possible. And the possibility will be dictated by, for example, if you have the trial being taken place in an area that happens to have a lot of infections, you may get an answer sooner than you would have projected because the answer is event driven. It's not driven by the time of the trial or by the number of people in the trial. It's driven by the number of events or infections, as it were, that you have in the placebo group versus the experimental group. So again, my prediction is going to be November, December, but I would not be overly surprised if it happened before then. That's approval. What about actual rollout of a vaccine? Good point. People getting it. Good point. Right now, there are mechanisms in place to make doses of vaccines even before we know whether it works or not. 
and there are pre-orders and pre-purchases of vaccines on the part of the federal government. The way it looks like it'll play out, by the time we get to the end of the year, we will have a few to 10 millions of doses. We won't have hundreds of millions of doses. As we get into 2021, the beginning first quarter and half of the year, then you're talking about several tens, if not hundreds of millions of doses. There's a surge of cases in the Midwest, colleges. This is something obviously everybody's concerned about. Uh, what should colleges be doing? Should they be sending students home, no. more testing? What, what should colleges be doing? Well, colleges are doing different models. Some colleges are doing everything virtual and online, uh, but that's not what many of the colleges are doing. Many of them are testing everybody before they even get on into the dorms, into the campus, and then doing surveillance intermittently. Sometimes that's a couple of times a week, sometimes that's a little bit more. But the important thing is to have the capability when a student gets infected, rather than close everything down or sending them home, to have either a dorm or a floor of a dorm where they could safely and comfortably segregate them from the rest of the students. But we are not recommending that they send an infected college student home. Because what you're then doing is you're getting an infected person and putting them back in the community to spread infection. So the best thing you can do is to keep them on campus, segregated from the rest of the students, but not essentially telling them to go home. The number of African-American medical students now is about the same as it was decades ago, especially men. How do you solve this problem, and how, how big a problem do you see that as? Oh, it is a big problem. We've got to get more minority students into medical school and nursing schools, but certainly mostly medical schools. You want the medical staff throughout the country to reflect as much as possible what the demography of the country is. And we absolutely need more minority, particularly African-American medical students and ultimately physicians. More companies are extending their work from home policies, saving money in the process. But that savings comes at a cost to other businesses in the neighborhood. NBC News technology correspondent Jacob Ward spoke with one CEO who's giving up their office altogether. Packing up is emotional. And you start looking in drawers and taking things out and putting things in boxes. It becomes very nostalgic. You know, we've been here for 25 years. This has been our life. And to go from having a 4,500 square foot office with all these employees running around and the, you know, the excitement and all of that that's created to going remote is very, very scary. John Dumas's 15 person staff had to work from home during the pandemic. So even he was surprised when he and his whole staff turned out to like going remote. Now he's putting the office up for rent. What will you save by not having to run this place? It's probably about 30 to 35 percent of our operating budget every month is because of a physical building. And you'll just cut that out? We'll just cut that out. This was one of the few areas. But the savings for Gumas come at a cost to other businesses in the neighborhood. So this is what, your lunch spot? This is our lunch spot. This is where we come every single day and have lunch, have coffee, you know, have them deliver uh, sandwiches to the office. So it's going to be kind of sad. The Flying Pig Bistro has been reduced to doing only takeout lunch orders since mid-March. A lot of the locals were really people who worked close by rather than live close by, so those people are, are all gone. What does it mean, do you think, when companies like that decide, okay, we're just going to give up on a neighborhood and just work from home from now on? I mean, they got to you know, decide what's right for them, but of course, you know, we're gonna miss them. Now imagine how many dominoes will fall if an entire downtown office building empties out. That's happening across San Francisco. Twitter was the first to say some employees can work remotely forever. Google and Facebook will let most employees work from home through at least June of 2021. And now Slack, the messaging platform, says its people will work from home from now on. Do you feel sort of guilty at all about sort of punching a little bit of a hole in the urban fabric here? Oh, yeah. Not only do I feel guilty, I'm scared. All right, once we leave, it's hard to come back. 
Jake joins me now from San Francisco. Jake, that's a great story. I, personally, my dad's company also just did the same thing. It's happening in a lot of places. You touched on the ripples that could move through the economy as offices empty out and stay that way. Are we seeing any of those effects already? Well, hi, Savannah. You know, absolutely. In fact, this morning we got word that the first dominoes had fallen for a service workers union, food service workers that employs about 3,500 people serving Silicon Valley. So I'm actually standing right now at a place we just arrived in Sunnyvale, where behind me, the Yahoo headquarters, now owned by Verizon, has in fact laid off about 91 food service workers. They're the first of their union to be laid off. Now, I should mention that Verizon does not directly employ them. They're employed by a company, a subcontractor. But these people have been laid off pretty much without warning and are now showing up in a symbolic protest to fill out their unemployment paperwork here in front of the building. We spoke to one of them, Augustina Sanchez, who says she's worked in that building for 12 years and just learned that she'd been laid off by mail. I asked her what her financial situation is going to look like on unemployment. We are going to play for unemployment, but um, it's not enough, the unemployment for my pay rent and bills, I think is, we are going to need another year. But at this time and this situation, we are living, uh, everybody, we don't, it's not enough for us, for me and my co-workers. Savannah, you can just hear the anguish in her voice, and we can see behind mm -hmm. us children, families here trying to sort out what their next steps will be. Now, Google and Facebook, who also employ people from that workers' union, have said in the past that they're going to continue to support them, continue to employ them. But these are really the first dominoes that we've seen falling as buildings like this, and all around me, these buildings are empty, have remained empty for so long and may continue to do so, Savannah. Oh, it's just heartbreaking to hear some of those personal stories and how it's affecting these families. What do we know about how long companies think they'll keep their employees at home? I mean, are people ever coming back? Are any companies planning for that? And then ultimately, what would the financial effects of that be? Well, a new study that just came out from the Conference Board, which is a think tank of executives, polled top-level executives across the country, and they said about 35 percent of them had no idea, Savannah, when they were going to come back to an office. And new research out commissioned by Slack, the messaging company, has found that only about 12 percent of knowledge workers specifically, the kind of people who work in buildings like these, would ever come back to a full-time in-office situation. So wow. we're talking here about, you know, not just a, a short-term effect. This could be a long-term effect. And as you can see in the people behind us, it's going to have this tremendous upheaval in their financial security. So we're seeing the ripple effects, the dominoes, beginning to fall across the American economy, Savannah. Mm, we are, Jacob, and it is tough to see. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, I'm Joe Fryer. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz. He's following the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Gotti. Hey, Joe, good to be with you. We start with the presidential campaigns kicking into high gear now less than 60 days away from Election Day. President Trump will be in Oregon today after touting job numbers and slamming China. Here's what he had to say today about what his administration would do to bring American jobs back from abroad. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States. And we'll impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China. And we'll hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. The 
perspective. Meanwhile, the Biden-Harris ticket has been courting working-class voters and unions in key swing states after earning three big union endorsements today. Biden in Pennsylvania at the AFL-CIO headquarters and vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris in Milwaukee holding a roundtable with black business leaders and meeting with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And here out in the West, firefighters in California are battling massive wildfires as the state sees record-breaking heat. Millions of people are now being warned that they could see power outages with temperatures topping 100 degrees. California authorities are urging residents to conserve power as much as possible. And cases of the coronavirus are spiking in France, Spain, and the UK, and they are raising concerns and fears of a second coronavirus wave in Europe. France and the UK each have over 300,000 cases of coronavirus, and Spain has over 400,000. Last week, each country saw thousands of new cases breaking records since the beginning of this pandemic. And meanwhile, India overtook Brazil as the country with the second most coronavirus cases in the world, with over 4 million total COVID-19 cases, after the United States with over 6 million. And German doctors say Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny is no longer in a medically induced coma and his condition is improving. Two weeks after the German government says he was poisoned with a nerve agent developed by the Soviet military during the Cold War, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has condemned the alleged attack, calling it an attempted murder and an attempt at silencing Navalny. Russian officials have denied any involvement. And lastly, a Saudi Arabia court has issued a final eight convictions in the murder of U.S. journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Five people are accused of being involved in his killing, and they were given a 20-year prison sentence. Another given 10 years in prison, and the remaining two were ordered to serve seven years. Their identities have not been released. Now, originally, five of the defendants were sentenced to death for his killing, but a judge has reduced those sentences. And Khashoggi was killed in Istanbul's embassy in 2018. He had been living in exile and openly critical of the Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The CIA found that the Crown Prince ordered the killing, but bin Salman says he was not involved with the murder. And that's it for today, Joe. We're going to follow some more and we'll bring it back to you. Sounds good, Gotti. We'll see you in a little bit. Massive wildfires are raging out of control across California today. The largest fire is burning in the central part of the state near Fresno. It's called the Creek Fire. So far, it has scorched almost 79,000 acres. Campers were trapped by flames over the weekend and had to be rescued by California National Guard helicopters. Governor Gavin Newsom is now declaring a state of emergency for several counties. Mandatory evacuations are also in effect. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is in Yucaipa, California. California joins us with more. Now, Steve, you're near the front lines of another fire, the El Dorado fire in Southern California. What can you tell us about the situation there? Joe, the fire here, one of more than two dozen major fires burning across the state, more than 14,000 firefighters on the front lines in the entirety of California. Here in Southern California, this fire is now charred 7,000 acres. You can see the destruction behind me, but that's almost good news in and of itself, because a few hours ago, you wouldn't be able to see anything covering the hillside behind me except smoke. The, there's really been a real, true, dramatic break in the weather, at least from the brutal temperatures that we saw over the weekend. Uh, you know, it's, it's calmed down a lot from the 110, 115, 120 degrees in some places, not to say that it's not going to be hot today. It will still reach triple digit temperatures. But this morning, the winds died down, the heat laid down, and firefighters finally able to get a foothold on the fire here, now 7% contained. We need to talk about this fire because it is rare that we get the cause of the fire while it is still burning. And this cause has been extraordinary. Fire investigators now confirm that the fire was sparked by a gender reveal gone wrong. They say it was a smoke generating incendiary device at a gender reveal photo op in a park that is very nearby to where I'm standing now. That explosive went off, sparked the fire, which is now spread to 7,000 acres. Officials say the people who were involved are cooperating, yet they're still going to face at least a life-altering fine, but maybe even criminal charges based on the fire behavior at this point as it continues to spread, maybe destroys more structures or even maybe kills people that are in the area. Although that there is some containment on it, that is good news to see that it is kind of spreading back and trapped in the canyons. 
that are behind me. So some good news here, a break in the weather, but we still expect more high temperatures this afternoon, which will add more fuel to the fire. Plus this area and several others across the state still in a red flag warning. Joe. Steve, it's just amazing when you hear about that gender reveal gone wrong. And those of us who live here in California sort of know when that, especially when the temps are so bad, you have to be especially careful when it comes with fire. Now, talk yeah. about the fire that's burning to the north of you in central California for a moment. There was that daring rescue over the weekend. Campers were trapped by the flames. Tell us a little more about what happened there. The Creek Fire, as you mentioned, Joe, now close to 80,000 acres burning out of control this weekend one of the most dramatic air rescues in modern history here in California. It was essentially about 200, 200 plus people trapped near Mammoth Pool Reservoir, a little area inside the forest in there. They were surrounded by flames. Military helicopters were called in. There was a Black Hawk and a Chinook. They were able to scoop everybody up between those two helicopters. The scenes and the reporting out of there is incredible. We're hearing, you know, the people that were rescued were hugging their first responders as they were airlifted to safety. We heard about some minor cuts, some bruises, some minor burns. There were a few incidents of serious uh, injuries taken from that fire as this incredible scene was unfolding. But for the most part, many of those people are just happy to have their lives from the swift action of the people that came in there and scooped them up. So an incredible scene there. But again, that fire still raging. And with these red flag winds that are still in place, firefighters have their hands full there too. Joe. All right. Thank you, Steve Patterson, reporting from the scene of the El Dorado fire here in California. Thank you, Joe. Labor Day is the unofficial kickoff for the home stretch of the presidential campaign. A Democratic nominee, Joe Biden's maintaining a steady grip on the race. Biden holds a 10 point lead over President Trump nationally, according to a new CBS YouGov poll. Biden is spending the holiday meeting with workers in Pennsylvania. The campaign announced earlier today that three labor unions endorse the former vice president. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli is in Harrisburg for us. Mike, thanks for joining us. We know President Trump Trump won Pennsylvania in 2016. We know it is vital to both candidates this year. What does Biden need to do today and what else is the former vice president up to right now? Well, Joe, as you say, Labor Day is that traditional kickoff to the fall campaign. It's the day when the rest of the country tunes into a race that we've all been obsessing about for almost two years now. And you hit it on, on the head. Pennsylvania, there's no state probably more important to the Biden strategy than this battleground state. And what demographic, what group is probably uh, just as important as the state itself? It is union workers, those working class voters that Joe Biden has always felt he has a unique appeal to in the Democratic Party. Now, Hillary Clinton won union households in 2016 nationally, according to the exit polls, but she only won them by eight points. Now, that, that might sound like a healthy advantage, but when you consider that President Obama, with Joe Biden on the ticket for uh, two terms, uh, won it by more than 20 points. So she nearly uh, saw half of that, uh, that advantage cut in half. It was actually the weakest performance by a Democratic nominee since 1984, when President Reagan won a landslide re-election. So that's why you see Joe Biden uh, spending part of his day in a backyard conversation with union workers as well as veterans. And now he's in the headquarters of the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO behind me. He's going to be having a conversation both in person and virtual with union workers across the country. And we got a little taste of what that conversation might include in a new op-ed that Biden penned with uh, Richard Trumka. He's the president of the AFL-CIO union nationally. And I'll read you just a little bit of part of it. He says, as workers struggle against a deadly pandemic, a painful recession and deep racial disparities, the labor movement also faces an additional burden, a union busting president. Now we saw President Trump in his news conference just a little while ago, talking about how great the economy is, talking about the record stock market. Biden also used that backyard conversation to say, listen, it's not Wall Street that built America. It's, it's hardworking uh, middle class workers uh, like those that he's been appealing to throughout this campaign. So Biden really willing to take on the economic argument against President Trump, Joe. Yeah, and you mentioned it there that even though Biden maintains a steady lead in the polls, he is still trailing President Trump in polls on the economy. So what are the things the Biden campaign is trying to do to sort of flip that in the final stretch? Because it's hard to win an election without winning the economy. Now, two things to that, Joe. Now, first of all, the Biden campaign says the number one issue for voters, they're confident, continues to be 
the pandemic, the president's mishandling of the pandemic, which in part is an economic issue. As Biden often says, you can't get you know, the country on, back on a strong economic footing until you deal with the pandemic. So that's always going to be where Joe Biden begins and ends his conversations. But the Biden campaign also says it doesn't want to concede that they can't maybe take back the advantage on the issue of the economy. And Biden previewed that a little bit over the weekend when he had a, a news conference with reporters uh, the day of the jobs numbers coming out. He, he pointed out the fact that he re released his own economic plan during the month of July, four different prongs that called the Build Back Better agenda. And what he says he now wants to do over the next few weeks is take that message on the road. He is going to start traveling more in person to these battleground states and compare the very detailed plans he says he's put forward on things like manufacturing, on infrastructure, on clean energy, and compare that to what he says is a lack of plans from President Trump. President Trump's argument, as Biden says, is simply, I built the economy once before and I'll do it again, but without offering anything in the way of specifics. As Biden also likes to point out, he inherited a strong economy from the Obama-Biden administration and then saw that squandered away. So the Biden campaign clearly ready to take this economic argument on the road. That latest CBS News YouGov poll also shows that Biden holds a six-point lead over President Trump in battleground Wisconsin, which the president just barely won four years ago. That's where Senator Kamala Harris is making her sort of solo campaign debut today. What is she doing there and why this focus on Wisconsin? Yeah, Senator Harris, this is her real first road trip as the Democratic nominee for vice president. There have been some questions about why we haven't seen Senator Harris on the road just yet, including one that was asked to Biden at that news conference on Friday. He said, listen, one of the he knows full well as somebody who was the running mate in 2008 and 2012, you don't necessarily want to be in the same place as your, your running mate. You want to divide and conquer. And so what are we seeing today? Kamala Harris hitting some of the same notes that Biden is talking to union voters. She was at an IBEW training facility. She's going to be talking about the Biden-Harris economic plan as well. And we also know that she spent some time meeting with the family of Jacob Blake, even spoke with him by phone. So this is really a sort of a, an example of how this ticket can sort of divide and conquer, hit the road as Biden did last week in Kenosha, where he uh, spoke to that community that's still grappling with uh, the fallout of the shooting of Jacob Blake there and, and the rioting that we saw that followed. And now Senator Harris in Milwaukee hitting that same important battleground state with the same message, but splitting that up over time. It's really how you typically see these campaigns run. Obviously, it's been a very different campaign without the candidates traveling quite as much. But Senator Harris really getting her own chance uh, in the spotlight in a key battleground state. And we'll see how she does today, Joe. Yeah, nothing typical this year. Thanks so much, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. There are more than 6 million coronavirus cases in the United States and now over 190,000 deaths. It's more than any other country in the world. President Trump says he is the one who can deliver an economic rebound and a vaccine in record time. Biden presided over the worst, the weakest and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was the it was a long, slow slog. Under my leadership, next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country, I project. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy. Could even have it during the month of October. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins me now. Shannon, this news conference, it was a late announcement today. First of all, what are your big takeaways from what the president had to say? Well, one, I think this was an attempt by the president to steal a bit of the spotlight away from Biden and Harris, who you talked about are out on the road on Labor Day. There was nothing on the president's schedule this morning, and this was a relatively quickly, hastily put together press conference by the president. Um, another thing I think to note from that, and you can kind of hear it in those clips you played, is we're seeing the vaccine increasingly becoming a political pawn in this campaign. The president came out pretty quickly and attacked Senator Harris for comments that she had made uh, a day or so before, uh, suggesting that she wouldn't trust a vaccine that was developed under President Trump. Uh, Trump accused her of being an anti-vaxxer uh, and, you know, harming public health, uh, while at the same time, as 
President Trump was speaking, uh, the former Vice President Biden was asked about a vaccine, and he accused Trump of saying that, that Trump is the one who is discouraging the public trust in the vaccine because Trump says so many things uh, that aren't true, and Biden himself saying that he would be willing to take a vaccine if it was available. So a lot of back and forth on the vaccine, and I think we're going to continue to see that. You know, the president said that, um, as you could hear from that clip, there could possibly be a vaccine in October. He appears to be the only one at this point who is saying that. Um, Dr. Fauci was asked about this just last week and continues to say the end of the year. He you know, did not have anything to say about a vaccine before the election. But when the president was asked about this today and whether it could help him politically, he demurred and said it wasn't for political reasons, but then acknowledged that he supposed it was something that could help him politically. As we just mentioned, Kamala Harris is in Wisconsin today. We know Vice President Mike Pence is making a trip there. So dueling trips, but they're in different parts of the state and they're speaking to very different groups. What can you tell us about the vice president's trip? Right. You know, with Senator Harris in the largest city in the state, the vice president is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a smaller blue-collar, uh, blue working-class city along the Mississippi River. And you know, I think the difference in locations is sort of emblematic of the different approaches these campaigns are taking. We have seen the president increasingly going to smaller cities, more rural, working-class parts of states where his support is heaviest in an effort to drive out his base, rather than focusing on the more population-dense suburbs around major cities or going to these large cities trying to win over or convert voters. So I think you can see a convergence in strategy in the location, but of course, as well as, as the message. Uh, Senator Harris meeting with the Blake family. Uh, you know, Vice President Pence, when he talked about the issues in Kenosha, really focused on the destruction that has followed those protests uh, and also accusing Biden of not standing up for law enforcement and not condemning Antifa enough and trying to, again, create a contrast uh, between their campaigns by saying that the Trump administration will never defund the police. So I think this tale of two Wisconsin visits is very emblematic of where we're seeing both of their campaigns go from a messaging and a strategic standpoint. Shannon, I'm from Minnesota. I can tell you also when you hit western Wisconsin, sometimes you pick up media in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Minnesota is also a key state this year. So sometimes it's a two for one when you hit western Wisconsin. I also want to mention the president picking up the pace. He's traveling to several battleground states. What is ahead for the president? Well, he is going back to North Carolina this week. He was just there last week. Of course, North Carolina, an important battleground state, and I would say even more important at the moment because as of Friday, the state started sending out absentee ballots to people who had requested them. So while there's a lot of focus on Labor Day being sort of the, the real start of the home stretch, in places like North Carolina, uh, the home stretch is over. It is election day for people who will be sending in their absentee ballots that they receive in the coming days. Uh, another state that's going to be starting voting well ahead of the election day is Michigan, and the president's going to travel there later this week. Uh, and again, this strategy that the Trump campaign is taking to focus on these early voting states now, because they really believe the majority of ballots are going to be cast before election day considering how much vote by mail there is expected to be, despite all the, the criticism the president has made of that and really trying to scare tactics of people, you can see from their strategy that they're still expecting this to be a heavily, heavily mail voted, early voting uh, election coming up. Shannon, while we have you, we're hearing about a potential shakeup at the Pentagon, some reports. What's the latest from there? Yeah, uh, my colleagues Courtney Kuby and Carol Lee uh, were reporting today that uh, the president has obviously for a while not been very happy with Defense Secretary uh, Mark Esper, and he had asked the head of the VA if he would step in and take over at the Defense Department. Now, that would be such a big shakeup so close to the election. We are about 56 days out. It's hard to imagine that the president would replace his defense secretary so close to the election, um, especially as there has been so much criticism right now of the president's uh, comments or reported comments uh, that he has made about the military. But certainly, according to reporting by NBC News, 
that is a serious discussion that has been going on with inside the West Wing. Shannon, thanks so much. Thank you. Protesters rallied outside police headquarters in Rochester, New York today, demanding justice following the death of Daniel Prude. It comes after a weekend of demonstrations in Rochester. Last night, more than a thousand people took to the streets. Prude died after an incident with police back in March when he was restrained and a spit hood was placed over his head because he said he had coronavirus. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park reports. Hey, Joe, good afternoon to you. So after several days of tense and sometimes violent protests here in Rochester, things actually took a different turn yesterday. It was actually pretty calm. And the police chief is thanking city elders, church elders, who served as buffers between police and protesters. And in fact, it may have worked because there were no arrests. But, Joe, there is certainly still tension here on the ground. A lot of that frustration is directed toward the police chief as well as the mayor for their handling of the Daniel Prude case. But we heard from them in a press conference yesterday, and they are standing firm on their approach. They're saying that they followed all the protocols, but they're still growing calls for them to step down. They responded by saying that they will continue to stay in their position because this is their community and they will work to do better. Meantime, as far as the investigation goes, all seven officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay and the attorney general's office is now taking the lead on the investigation, but they have also asked a grand jury to take a closer look at this case as well. But demonstrators say that they will continue to be out here in Rochester until all the officers are prosecuted. Joe? Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel 
And my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. There are nearly 21 million registered voters in California. That's up more than 10 percent from this time in 2016. The big question right now, can the current election infrastructure handle a surge of mail-in ballots? NBC News business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent got a behind-the-scenes look at one of California's largest ballot processing centers. It's part of NBC's Vote Watch Week. In Orange County, California, the final sprint to Election Day begins on October 5th. In a month, all of these envelopes will be stuffed with ballots and sent out to voters. Once they're returned here to the registrar, that's when the process kicks into high gear. So this Orange County's nonpartisan chief elections official, Neil Kelly, oversees the fifth largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. He says he's running a military-style operation to handle what's likely to be the biggest mail-in vote ever. I think we're probably going to see upwards of 90 percent, honestly, for the November election. That could add up to 1.2 million in Orange County. Kelly has been anticipating the onslaught since the pandemic hit in March, investing more than a million dollars in new machinery and doing dry runs to prepare. You know, I lose sleep a lot at night. I think every election official does. And one of the things that I lose sleep over is making sure the voters understand their options. The options, mail in your ballot early, drop it off in one of these secure drop boxes, or deliver it in person to a vote center starting four days before Election Day. You can, of course, always vote in person. So when your ballot arrives, the first thing it does is go into this piece of equipment. And what this piece of equipment does at a very high speed, it's capturing an image of that signature in a split second. What happens if your signature is not legitimate? It goes to another tier for additional review. A human is comparing the signature here? Correct. Ah. Correct. A human being is comparing every single signature. So if it's good ballots, then these ballots come into this device right here, and this piece of equipment actually splits the envelope open, and this operator would pull out each individual ballot. Is he able to see the way I cast my ballot? No. The secrecy of the ballot remains because it stays folded here until it goes to another team for opening and flattening. This is the moment of truth because now it comes in and we scan it and we're capturing all the data where the voter actually voted. Although Orange County captures mail-in ballots as soon as they arrive, no actual votes are tallied until Election Day. California allows ballots to arrive up to 17 days after Election Day, as long as they're postmarked by November 3rd. Kelly has 30 days by state law to count all the votes, but believes they could finish in two weeks. As for the criticism from the White House... Mail-in ballots will lead to the greatest fraud. Universal mail-in is a very dangerous thing. It's fraud with fraud and every other thing that can happen. I try and stay out of the political fray as the election official, right? But just in general, when you talk about the security of mail-in voting in general, I think it has more secure aspects than in-person voting. What we saw is a situation where the county has the time, money, and resources to handle the expected surge in mail-in voting, but that's just not the case nationwide. Not all counties are this fortunate or prepared. And Joe joins us now. Such a fascinating look behind the scenes. Joe, what stood out to you most in this whole process? Was there anything about the system that surprised you at all? Yeah, I think when you take a look at the volume of what they're going to be handling, in Orange County, they're a very well-oiled machine. I was there on Super Tuesday, and you saw them bringing in not just the mail-in votes, but the votes that were tallied across vote centers across the county, and they're ready for this. And they've attempted a bunch of different scenarios. They're running dry runs of possible crises, possible issues they could run into. So they feel very prepared. What's fascinating is that, you know, all of the registrars across the country, they all talk to each other. And Neil Kelly says that he's spoken to several other counties in other states where they are concerned about how they're going to handle the volume, how they're going to deal with accusations of voter fraud, even if those have no basis to them. And they do feel the pressure from the White House directly, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe, and great to see you, my friend. Great to see you, too. Joe's report was part of our Vote Watch week. We're investigating what could affect your vote and explaining what you need to pay attention to this election. That's all this week right here on NBC News. 
Former FBI agent Peter Strzok is attacking President Trump in a new book, calling him a national security threat. Strzok was fired from his job after text messages surfaced of him criticizing the president. NBC News chief White House correspondent Hallie Jackson spoke with Strzok about what he wrote. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. And he's one of the agents former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S., charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure, improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. Yeah. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like, F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero, and about a possible Trump victory, we'll stop it giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, a relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some, whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Just two weeks into the semester and more than 650 students at Iowa State University have tested positive for coronavirus. The outbreak is now spreading into the surrounding county. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hillier joins us now from Ames, Iowa. Vaughn, good to see you. The infection rate on campus has more than doubled in just the past week. What exactly is happening there? Exactly. If you just look at the percent positive rate, you know, let's just go to the data here. The percent positive rate on the Iowa State campus here in Ames, Iowa, the very first week, it was 13 percent, Joe. The second week, it jumped all the way up to 28 percent positive rate, which is strikingly high. And that is where there, there are those real serious question marks about what way can the school year go forward? I just want to introduce you, Blake McGill. He's a sophomore here uh, at the university. Okay. And I think you'll see exactly where he's at. He's in a quarantine dorm uh, where he will have to be spending 10 days because he was in close proximity to somebody who had COVID here on campus. Take a listen. I'd say classes are going really well. Iowa State's uh, done a good job of making things very accessible for students that uh, are either forced to or prefer to go full online. Um, moving forward, I think they, they have a lot of uh, help opportunities and resources for us, uh, for those that are doing an, all the uh, online uh, activity. And so uh, I would really hope to see that continue for the rest of the semester so that we can all stay here and still get uh, a taste of what normal college is usually like rather than send us all home again. Blake was obviously a good sport with us there on day number five in quarantine. and the work of our great camera and audio team of Mike and Tim there, having the chance to talk to him. Uh, but what you're seeing right now is there's a, about 100 students like Blake that are currently in isolation or in quarantine, uh, which is making this difficult for the university. There's already been more than 650 cases here on campus, and there is concern about to the extent to which it begins to percolate and goes outside of this campus. Ames is a college town, but if you look across Story County, Iowa here, where Ames is at, it is now a hot spot here in the country. Iowa has the highest per capita uh, rate of cases right now, just behind South Dakota in North Dakota, Joe. Yeah, and Vaughn, you mentioned that. We know universities are not in a bubble. Students work in the community, people in the community work at the college. So what is the worry in the community about this spreading beyond the college? You know, if anybody's gone around a college campus before, uh, usually socializing is at the forefront, along with, of course, the educational side of things. And that's what makes it strikingly uh, difficult, especially if you take into account freshmen that are coming onto campus. And I want to introduce you live to one of those right now, if we could. Uh, Gwen Costello, you're an animal science major, 
And tell me, you're a freshman, you moved down here from Wisconsin. Yes. What happened on your very first day? I um, moved in on the 4th and I got tested over the Thielen Health Center and I got um, notified that I had tested positive for COVID-19 without having any contact with anyone who had been possibly even exposed to Very it. first day, then what happened? Um, I got moved from Friley across campus to Linden, which is right behind us. Which is right behind us over there. Yes. You were in isolation. Yes. How many days? Uh, from the 4th to the 15th, so for 10 days. You had a lot to think about in your first uh, week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> After that, you were released mm -hmm. from isolation. Uh, then what did you see on campus here? Um, lots of partying um, and people not like uh, conforming to the social distancing rules that have been like put in place by not only the campus, but also obviously the CDC. And so when all of the cases like began to spike, it tended to be because of the parties that those people were going to. It had to have made you almost want to scream. It was frustrating. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of us are socially deprived teenagers after not having a senior year for us who are freshmen this year. And then to put us in a socially enriched zone and tell us to not socialize is pretty difficult, to what say is, the least. What is your, my sympathies are with you. What is, what is your message now to students? And is it possible to have the rest of the school year go on in the way that it's attempted to go in this first month? Um, my message is wear a mask because it's easy to put a mask on. It's one of the first things I do in the morning when I leave class because I have very early classes. And so if you put a mask on, you're saving yourself and anyone else. That have you seen a difference? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, I've seen that when people are wearing masks outside, it makes me personally feel safer, even though I can't get it for at least the 90 day period because I tested positive. So I have the antibodies. It makes me feel safer to be wearing a mask because in case I come into close contact with somebody who has it again, or I might possibly still have any symptoms, which I don't. Um, but if anything were to happen in the future, it makes me feel safer and it makes the people that I'm with also feel safer, I believe. Gwen, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank Hopefully you. the next couple of years are a little bit better than the start of this one here. Uh, animal science major, freshman. Not only is it the educational side of things for these students, but these universities, uh, Joe, the, the universities and government officials will tell you as well that the, the, the long-term concern here is also the financing of these educational institutions here. You know, that's why initially the Iowa State is having their first football game this Saturday, and they announced that 25,000 fans were going to be allowed in. But after much pushback, as Story County is now a hotspot, they have uh, they have gone against that initial decision. And it's the athletic department that is saying that the university is now finds itself in a $30 million deficit because of it. These are the tough conversations that not only students, uh, as well as faculty, as well as, as these university officials are now grappling with. Yeah, this pandemic is hitting college communities very hard. Vaughn, while we have you, I do want to ask you, is Iowa's governor or any state officials doing or saying anything about this outbreak that you're seeing around the university? Governor Kim Reynolds, a Republican here, has been insistent that she is not going to implement a statewide mask mandate but also she is not going to allow localities to enforce mask mandates, which has led to a lot of uh, local officials uh, that have been uh, frustrated by that decision. Just this morning, I was talking with uh, Dr. John Pash Passion, who is the chair of the Story County Board of Health, and he said that localities, especially when a place like Story County now finds itself to be a hotspot, should have that ability to make their own uh, decisions within their jurisdiction uh, and one of those is a mask mandate, which the governor right now has been resistant to allowing these localities to do. All right, Von Hilliard, thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. Labor Day, of course, is the unofficial end of summer. There is a lot of worry, though, that what happens this weekend and what happens today could impact the entire fall, at least when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. So we want to bring in our doctor to ask a few questions about this weekend and what's going to happen moving forward. Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter joins us now. She's an internal medicine physician at California Pacific Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for having us. We know Dr. Fauci has expressed concerns about what people might do this weekend. We know we saw with Memorial Day weekend and even the 4th of July, people had gatherings then. And then in the weeks that followed, we saw the virus spread. What are your worries about Labor Day weekend? Well, Joe, we're all concerned that we'll see these same spikes after this holiday weekend. And, and really that impacts everyone's ability to allow our children to go back to school safely, to return to work. You know, I want to point out that at Memorial Day, we had 20,000 cases per day. 
Now we're at about 40,000 cases per day. So our individual behavior uh, this weekend and, and beyond really matters. You know, that, that said, the value of social interaction, as we know, is significant and really impacts our well-being. So, you know, if, if you do feel strongly that you want to gather this weekend, it should really depend on your individual situation and that of your family and, and your tolerance for risk. Uh, don't forget, it, it takes just one person to spread COVID to many people. And it can actually be someone in your own family. So doing things like staying outdoors, wearing masks, maintaining social distance um, when you're not eating and drinking around other people is, is really the right thing to do. And, and the bottom line is that there's no 100% risk-free way to get together with folks. And, and remember that you know if you're spending time around anyone that's high risk, meaning that they have underlying health conditions or they're over 60, their risk is much greater for, for illness and and death from COVID. We know how important it is to try to get the pandemic under control heading into the fall after seeing so many spikes, especially in the South and West this summer. Based on what you're seeing right now, looking around the country, where are we at and how much is or is not the coronavirus under control? Well, Joe, we're now in the seventh month of, of the COVID pandemic, and, and there continues to be no uh, national strategy out, uh, out of the White House. We still have COVID cases rising in 22 states. We heard what just, just now what's going on in Iowa. You know, as we head into flu season, this is extremely concerning. I mean, listen, if, if we had easily accessible, fast testing, if nearly everyone was wearing a mask and there were policies in place and messaging to support this, we really could get much of our lives back while we wait for a COVID vaccine. You know, the White House should not be advocating for schools to be opening no matter what, or for bars and restaurants and other businesses to just resume regular services. This is driving many more COVID cases and preventable deaths. Um, I really think we can do so much better than this as a nation, and, and we really should be. For months now, we have been talking about testing. In some places, it can be hard to get a test. Others who get a test are waiting 10, 14 days to get the results, which essentially makes contact tracing useless. As far as you can tell, where do things stand now as far as being able to get a test and get those results back quickly? Joe, it's, it's dependent on where you live. So we're still not in a great place nationwide in terms of testing, unfortunately. You know, there, there are not enough tests being done and delays in results. You know, we, we have seen these rapid tests emerge, and this is a step in the right direction. Uh, they're fast. They're relatively good tests. They're cheap. Uh, we need now to see the political will to take this very seriously. Uh, we need to have the capacity to, to trace and to isolate people if they test positive. And we need to test everyone, not just people who are symptomatic, since we know somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of people are asymptomatic with COVID. So if we can do these things and, and have the capacity to do, honestly, billions of tests in this country, we can make a big difference. Dr. Ungerleiter, thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now, this wasn't a normal summer for any of us. And for businesses at the Jersey Shore, well, it has been a season full of challenges and restrictions. In Seaside Heights, New Jersey, the mayor is now planning to keep the beaches open to make up for the economic losses. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffer like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. If the weather stays like this in the 80s and the 70s, we'll do it every day. If we find that people aren't coming, which I believe they will, then we would adjust. We may not open up every day during the week. It's going to be a, a trial. We spoke to a few businesses in Seaside Heights about their plans at the beginning of the summer. So how did they fare in the pandemic economy? We checked in for the holiday weekend. We only have 100 days to make so much to get us through to the next year. And if we don't make that money in 100 days, I don't even know what's going to happen when September gets here. I'd love to say it was just like every other summer, but it wasn't. It was. It, it had that added stress level that we haven't had in the past. Weekends have been very good during the week. Has been off, but it, it's it's not had the nearly the number of people 
that you're used to seeing on the boardwalk? It's been challenging and it's very stressful. My family's been in business on the boardwalk 70 years, so it's been very predictable with the cycle of business. But now in 2020, it's been very unpredictable and had to go take it on a daily basis because you didn't know what was going to unfold. We've had to adjust to a new way of doing things and it hasn't been easy. Rest assured, we are doing everything in our power to let all of us enjoy the summer fun. Sanitizing and making sure that railings were clean and tables were clean and, you know, um, every other car was used on the rides. This year we had to adjust on the fly many days in a row. I'm happy with the year because it could have been a lot worse. A lot of people are getting a lot more grab and go, take out. A lot of stuff is being packaged into go containers or small pizza boxes to uh, package slices of pie. The third party delivery, Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, the like, et cetera, basically replaced the late night dollars that we were missing after midnight because the boardwalk did close after midnight. We're only allowed 50% of the occupancies, but even on beautiful, sunny, hot days, the water park had less people at it. Days that were normally boardwalk days for the ride here, we had less people. But our games department did very well. Being on the boardwalk and being able to be open for a while, they've, done, they've had a good year. Reluctantly, I did have to raise my prices because the expenses just kept going up. And uh, to keep pace with that, things like hand sanitizers, masks, other, other things that you need now in this corona environment, even going forward if we have to have the gloves, the masks, what have you. It was challenging this summer, but very uh, rewarding uh, in the respect that we're making it through. We've had no outbreaks, nobody gets sick, no reason to shut down or quarantine. So I'm very pleased and a little bit surprised that we didn't have anybody get sick. And that's a nice testament. It's going to be a little hard trying to figure out what we're going to do going into the winter. I know there's going to be some, uh, some lean months coming up for sure. It's not been as good as 2019. It's almost like right after Sandy when that happened and it was, things were slow and people weren't around. It, it's eerily similar. Superstorm Sandy was devastating for the whole area. We were just starting to recover from that and then this Seaside Heights fire hit and uh, wiped us out. When the roller coaster and all the rides fell in the water and we had to rebuild, we at least knew what we had to do. But for this, it's been challenging. It certainly has. I mean, it starts wearing on you. I literally grew up on the boardwalk. That's a big part of my life. It's, it's how, I, how I grew up, and um, it's what I've embraced uh, professionally. And uh, I really wasn't too surprised to see that Seaside continues. It is a very resilient town, a very resilient uh, business community. Seaside's a great place to come. It could have been a totally disastrous season, but we all did the best we could given what was in front of us. A key opposition figure in Belarus has vanished following another weekend of mass protests. Maria Kolesnikova was last seen being shoved into a vehicle by a group of men. That's according to a local media outlet in Belarus. Kolesnikova was a central figure in protests against the rule of embattled president Alexander Lukashenko. The apparent abduction seems to be yet another example of a pattern of world leaders consolidating power. It's a trend called authoritarian drift. Here's NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. Governments around the world seem to have taken advantage of the ongoing pandemic to make major power grabs, some even explicitly using the coronavirus as a reason to consolidate authority. In Belarus, the longtime president, Alexander Lukashenko, often called Europe's last dictator, won his sixth consecutive term, claiming he got 80% of the vote. His opponent has been forced to flee the country after she called for a recount, citing widespread voter fraud. Mass protests have erupted and authorities have responded with violence, resulting in at least two deaths and thousands of arrests. The EU has stated that it does not recognize the election, but Belarus maintains close ties to Russia and Vladimir Putin has offered assistance to Lukashenko in the wake of the unrest. But clearly what's happening in Belarus is um, related to, I think, authoritarian drift in many places of the world. 
Lukashenko didn't use COVID-19 to grab power. In fact, he was notoriously dismissive of the coronavirus pandemic. And that's part of the anger directed towards him now. He behaves in the same way as Turkmenistan president, as Kim Jong-un. Uh, who also denied the, the danger and the threat of the virus. But it highlights an important trend. In times of crisis comes opportunity for both democracy and despots. Authoritarian drift happens when a country's democratic foundations, such as free speech, fair elections, independent judiciary, and strong civil rights are eroded. Here are a few examples from around the world to keep an eye on. In Hungary over the past decade, Prime Minister Viktor Orban's political party has quietly bought up most of the country's media companies and in March took over the country's most widely read online newspaper. It was previously an independent check on the government, but a close ally of Orban recently purchased a controlling share in the company and in July fired its editor-in-chief, prompting dozens of reporters to quit in protest. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, one of the country's most prominent entrepreneurs and newsmen, Jimmy Lau, was arrested along with his two sons and several of his company's executives. The charge? Suspicion of colluding with foreign forces, an offence which did not exist until a new national security law was forced upon Hong Kong by China in July. The outbreak of coronavirus in the Philippines has been one of the worst in Asia, and its president, Rodrigo Duterte, has used the lockdowns as an opportunity to pass a sweeping anti-terror law, greatly expanding the definition of terrorism, which rights groups worry could be applied to actions such as protests or criticism of the government. And in Brazil, as total deaths from COVID pass 100,000, the country's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has repeatedly clashed with the nation's Supreme Court, which has investigated him and his family. In May, Bolsonaro joined a rally against the Supreme Court, and he has claimed that he has the backing of the military to resist the court's absurd orders. Authoritarian drift has been a factor worldwide for years, but the pandemic seems to be accelerating it. Political scientists are questioning whether the handling of coronavirus could expose the weakness of democracy in comparison to the unchecked power of an authoritarian state. I mean, on the one hand, one has to worry about the information you're getting from an authoritarian state. At the same time, um, there's also reason to believe that an authoritarian state might have more means at its disposal to put policies in place that are highly unpopular, but, but much needed. Social distancing and wearing a mask will be effective. And that's not that popular in democracies. This wouldn't be the first time a disease had a drastic impact on politics. You could go back through history and you can look at great political shifts um, and see how pandemics or diseases affected the political outcomes. Doug North won a Nobel Prize in economics. One of his arguments is that because there was a labor shortage following the, the Black Death, and he sees that changing balance and the shortage of labor as one of the reasons why feudalism ultimately ends up disappearing. More recently, the Spanish flu of 1918 swept through the ranks of both sides of World War I, but its devastating impact on the already weakened German army accelerated the end of the war and Germany's humiliating defeat, setting the stage for a 20th century filled with conflict. Those who support democracy aren't taking this lying down. Young people in Hong Kong have been protesting for well over a year now and show no signs of stopping despite the pandemic. People from all over Belarusian society have risen up to demand an electoral recount, even in the face of violence from the police. In Brazil and the Philippines, the strong Supreme Courts have so far held up as checks on their country's leaders. For now, it seems that many democracies, both old and young, will have to prove that they can withstand a public health crisis while maintaining their democratic values, a challenge that may prove even more difficult if a dreaded second wave hits the world this fall or winter. Hey everyone, I'm Joe Fryer. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz. He's following the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Gotti. 
Hey, Joe, good to see you. We're gonna start with the presidential campaigns kicking into high gear now, less than 60 days from the election day. President Trump will be in Oregon today after touting job numbers and slamming China. Here's what he had to say today about what his administration would do to bring American jobs back from abroad. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States and will impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China and will hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. And Vice President Pence in southwest Wisconsin talking at the electric utility Dairyland Power Cooperative. Meanwhile, the Biden-Harris ticket has been courting working class voters and unions in key swing states after earning three big union endorsements today. Biden in Pennsylvania at the AFL-CIO headquarters and vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris in Milwaukee holding a roundtable with black business leaders and meeting with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And out here in the West, firefighters in California are battling massive wildfires as the state sees record-breaking heat. Millions of people are now being warned they could be uh, in power outages with temperatures topping 100 degrees. California authorities are urging residents to conserve power as much as possible. And cases of the coronavirus are spiking in France, Spain, and the UK, and they are raising fears of a second coronavirus wave in Europe. France and the UK each have over 300,000 cases of coronavirus, and Spain has over 400,000. Last week, each country saw thousands of new cases breaking records since the start of the pandemic. And meanwhile, in India, they overtook Brazil as the country with the second most coronavirus cases in the world, with over 4 million total COVID-19 cases all after the United States with over 6 million. And in Germany, German doctors say Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny is no longer in a medically induced coma and his in uh, condition is improving. Two weeks after the German government says he was poisoned with a nerve agent developed by the Soviet military during the Cold War, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has condemned the alleged attack, calling it attempted murder and an attempt to sil silence Navalny. Russian officials have denied any involvement. And lastly, a Saudi Arabian court issued a final eight convictions in the murder of U.S. journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Five people accused of being involved in his killing were given a 20-year prison sentence. Another was given 10 years in prison, and the remaining two were ordered to serve seven years. Their identities have not been released. Originally, five of the defendants were sentenced to death for his killing, but a judge has reduced those sentences. Khashoggi was killed in Istanbul's embassy in 2018. He has been living in exile, or he had been living in exile, and openly critical of Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The CIA found that the Crown Prince ordered the killing, but bin Salman says he was not involved with the murder. And that's what we're following so far, Joe. We're going to have much more coming up soon. Sounds good, Gotti. We'll see you in an hour. See you then. Massive wildfires are raging out of control across California today. The largest fire is burning in the central part of the state near Fresno. It's called the Creek Fire. So far, it has scorched almost 79,000 acres. Campers were trapped by flames over the weekend and had to be rescued by California National Guard helicopters. Governor Gavin Newsom is now declaring a state of emergency for several counties. Mandatory evacuations are also in effect. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is in Yucaipa. California joins us with more. Now, Steve, you're near the front lines of another fire, the El Dorado fire in Southern California. What can you tell us about the situation there? Joe, the fire here, one of more than two dozen major fires burning across the state, more than 14,000 firefighters on the front lines in the entirety of California. Here in Southern California, this fire is now charred 7,000 acres. You can see the destruction behind me, but that's almost good news in and of itself, because a few hours ago, you wouldn't be able to see anything covering the hillside behind me except smoke. 
the, there has really been a real, true, dramatic break in the weather, at least from the brutal temperatures that we saw over the weekend. Uh, you know, it's, it's calmed down a lot from the 110, 115, 120 degrees in some places, not to say that it's not going to be hot today. It will still reach triple digit temperatures. But this morning, the winds died down, the heat laid down and firefighters finally able to get a foothold on the fire here. Now, 7 percent contained. We need to talk about this fire because it is rare that we get the cause of the fire while it is still burning. And this cause has been extraordinary. Fire investigators now confirm that the fire was sparked by a gender reveal gone wrong. They say it was a smoke generating incendiary device at a gender reveal photo op in a park that is very nearby to where I'm standing now. That explosive went off, sparked the fire, which is now spread to 7,000 acres. Officials say the people who were involved are cooperating, yet they're still going to face at least a life-altering fine, but maybe even criminal charges based on the fire behavior at this point as it continues to spread, maybe destroys more structures or even maybe kills people that are in the area. Although that there is some containment on it, that is good news to see that it is kind of spreading back and trapped in the canyons that are behind me. So some good news here, a break in the weather, but we still expect more high temperatures this afternoon, which will add more fuel to the fire, plus this area and several others across the state still in a red flag warning. Joe? Steve, it's just amazing when you hear about that gender reveal gone wrong. And those of us who live here in California sort of know when that, especially when the temps are so bad, you have to be especially careful when it comes with fire. Now, talk yeah. about the fire that's burning to the north of you in central California for a moment. There was that daring rescue over the weekend. Campers were trapped by the flames. Tell us a little more about what happened there. The Creek Fire, as you mentioned, Joe, now close to 80,000 acres burning out of control this weekend one of the most dramatic air rescues in modern history here in California. It was essentially about 200, 200 plus people trapped near Mammoth Pool Reservoir, a little area inside the forest in there. They were surrounded by flames. Military helicopters were called in. There was a Black Hawk and a Chinook. They were able to scoop everybody up between those two helicopters. The scenes and the reporting out of there is incredible. We're hearing, you know, the people that were rescued were hugging their first responders as they were airlifted to safety. We heard about some minor cuts, some bruises, some minor burns. There were a few incidents of serious uh, injuries taken from that fire as this incredible scene was unfolding. But for the most part, many of those people are just happy to have their lives from the swift action of the people that came in there and scooped them up. So an incredible scene there. But again, that fire still raging. And with these red flag winds that are still in place, firefighters have their hands full there, too. Joe. All right. Thank you, Steve Patterson, reporting from the scene of the El Dorado fire here in California. Thank you, Joe. Labor Day is the unofficial kickoff for the home stretch of the presidential campaign. A Democratic nominee, Joe Biden's maintaining a steady grip on the race. Biden holds a 10 point lead over President Trump nationally, according to a new CBS YouGov poll. Biden is spending the holiday meeting with workers in Pennsylvania. The campaign announced earlier today that three labor unions endorse the former vice president. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli is in Harrisburg for us. Mike, thanks for joining us. We know President Trump Trump won Pennsylvania in 2016. We know it is vital to both candidates this year. What does Biden need to do today and what else is the former vice president up to right now? Well, Joe, as you say, Labor Day is that traditional kickoff to the fall campaign. It's the day when the rest of the country tunes into a race that we've all been obsessing about for almost two years now. And you hit it on, on the head. Pennsylvania, there's no state probably more important to the Biden strategy than this battleground state. And what demographic, what group is probably uh, just as important as the state itself? It is union workers, those working class voters that Joe Biden has always felt he has a unique appeal to in the Democratic Party. Now, Hillary Clinton won union households in 2016 nationally, according to the exit polls. But she only won them by eight points. Now, that, that might sound like a healthy advantage, but when you consider that President Obama, with Joe Biden on the ticket for uh, two terms, uh, won it by more than 20 points. So she nearly uh, saw half of that, uh, that advantage cut in half. It was actually the weakest performance by a Democratic nominee since 1984, when President Reagan won a landslide reelection. So that's why you see Joe Biden 
uh, spending part of his day in a backyard conversation with union workers as well as veterans. And now he's in the headquarters of the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO behind me. He's going to be having a conversation both in person and virtual with union workers across the country. And we got a little taste of what that conversation might include in a new op-ed that Biden penned with uh, Richard Trumpka. He's the president of the AFL-CIO union nationally. And I'll read you just a little bit of part of it. He says, as workers struggle against a deadly pandemic, a painful recession and deep racial disparities, the labor movement also faces an additional burden, a union-busting president. Now, we saw President Trump in his news conference just a little while ago talking about how great the economy is, talking about the record stock market. Biden also used that backyard conversation to say, listen, it's not Wall Street that built America. It's, it's hardworking, uh, middle-class workers uh, like those that he's been appealing to throughout this campaign. So Biden really willing to take on the economic argument against President Trump, Joe. Yeah, and you mentioned it there that even though Biden maintains a steady lead in the polls, he is still trailing President Trump in polls on the economy. So what are the things the Biden campaign is trying to do to sort of flip that in the final stretch? Because it's hard to win an election without winning the economy. Now, two things to that, Joe. Now, first of all, the Biden campaign says the number one issue for voters, they're confident, continues to be the pandemic, the president's mishandling of the pandemic, which in part is an economic issue. As Biden often says, you can't get you know, the country on, back on a strong economic footing until you deal with the pandemic. So that's always going to be where Joe Biden begins and ends his conversations. But the Biden campaign also says it doesn't want to concede that they can't maybe take back the advantage on the issue of the economy. And Biden previewed that a little bit over the weekend when he had a, a news conference with reporters uh, the day of the jobs numbers coming out. He, he pointed out the fact that he re released his own economic plan during the month of July, four different prongs that called the Build Back Better Agenda and what he says he now wants to do over the next few weeks is take that message on the road. He is going to start traveling more in person to these battleground states and compare the very detailed plans he says he's put forward on things like manufacturing, on infrastructure, on clean energy, and compare that to what he says is a lack of plans from President Trump. President Trump's argument, as Biden says, is simply, I built the economy once before and I'll do it again, but without offering anything in the way of specifics, as Biden also likes to point out, he inherited a strong economy from the Obama-Biden administration and then saw that squandered away. So the Biden campaign clearly ready to take this economic argument on the road. That latest CBS News YouGov poll also shows that Biden holds a six-point lead over President Trump in battleground Wisconsin, which the president just barely won four years ago. That's where Senator Kamala Harris is making her sort of solo campaign debut today. What is she doing there and why this focus on Wisconsin? Yeah, Senator Harris, this is her real first road trip as the Democratic nominee for vice president. There have been some questions about why we haven't seen Senator Harris on the road just yet, including one that was asked to Biden at that news conference on Friday. He said, listen, one of the he knows full well as somebody who was the running mate in 2008 and 2012. You don't necessarily want to be in the same place as your, your running mate. You want to divide and conquer. And so what are we seeing today? Kamala Harris hitting some of the same notes that Biden is talking to union voters. She was at an IBEW training facility. She's going to be talking about the Biden-Harris economic plan as well. And we also know that she spent some time meeting with the family of Jacob Blake, even spoke with him by phone. So this is really a sort of a, an example of how this ticket can sort of divide and conquer, hit the road as Biden did last week in Kenosha, where he uh, spoke to that community that's still grappling with uh, the fallout of the shooting of Jacob Blake there and, and the rioting that we saw that followed. And now Senator Harris in Milwaukee hitting that same important battleground state with the same message, but splitting that up over time. It's really how you typically see these campaigns run. Obviously, it's been a very different campaign without the candidates traveling quite as much. But Senator Harris really getting her own chance uh, in the spotlight in a key battleground state. And we'll see how she does today, Joe. Yeah, nothing typical this year. Thanks so much, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. There are more than 6 million coronavirus cases in the United States and now over 190,000 deaths. It's more than any other country in the world. President Trump says he is the one who can deliver an economic rebound and a vaccine in record time. Biden presided over the worst, the weakest and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was the it was a long, slow slog under my leadership. Next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country, I project. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and 
his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy. Could even have it during the month of October. NBCnews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins me now. Shannon, this news conference, it was a late announcement today. First of all, what are your big takeaways from what the president had to say? Well, one, I think this was an attempt by the president to steal a bit of the spotlight away from Biden and Harris, who you talked about are out on the road on Labor Day. There was nothing on the president's schedule this morning, and this was a relatively quickly, hastily put together press conference by the president. Um, another thing I think to note from that, and you can kind of hear it in those clips you played, is we're seeing the vaccine increasingly becoming a political pawn in this campaign. The president came out pretty quickly and attacked Senator Harris for comments that she had made uh, a day or so before, uh, suggesting that she wouldn't trust a vaccine that was developed under President Trump. Uh, Trump accused her of being an anti-vaxxer uh, and, you know, harming public health, uh, while at the same time as President Trump was speaking, uh, you know, former Vice President Biden was asked about a vaccine, and he accused Trump of saying that, that Trump is the one who is discouraging the public trust in the vaccine because Trump says so many things uh, that aren't true. And Biden himself saying that he would be willing to take a vaccine if it was available. So a lot of back and forth on the vaccine. And I think we're going to continue to see that. You know, the president said that, um, as you could hear from that clip, there could possibly be a vaccine in October. He appears to be the only one at this point who is saying that. Um, Dr. Fauci was asked about this just last week and continues to say the end of the year. He you know, did not have anything to say about a vaccine before the election. But when the president was asked about this today and whether it could help him politically, he demurred and said it wasn't for political reasons, but then acknowledged that he supposed it was something that could help him politically. As we just mentioned, Kamala Harris is in Wisconsin today. We know Vice President Mike Pence is making a trip there. So dueling trips, but they're in different parts of the state and they're speaking to very different groups. What can you tell us about the vice president's trip? Right. You know, with Senator Harris in the largest city in the state, the vice president is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a smaller blue-collar, uh, blue working-class city along the Mississippi River. And you know, I think the difference in locations is sort of emblematic of the different approaches these campaigns are taking. We have seen the president increasingly going to smaller cities, more rural, working-class parts of states where his support is heaviest in an effort to drive out his base rather than focusing on the more population-dense suburbs around major cities or going to these large cities trying to win over or convert voters. So I think you can see a convergence in strategy in the location, but of course, as well as, as the message. Uh, Senator Harris meeting with the Blake family. Uh, you know, Vice President Pence, when he talked about the issues in Kenosha, really focused on the destruction that has followed those protests uh, and also accusing Biden of not standing up for law enforcement and not condemning Antifa enough and trying to, again, create a contrast uh, between their campaigns by saying that the Trump administration will never defund the police. So I think this tale of two Wisconsin visits is very emblematic of where we're seeing both of their campaigns go from a messaging and a strategic standpoint. Shannon, I'm from Minnesota. I can tell you also when you hit western Wisconsin, sometimes you pick up media in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Minnesota is also a key state this year. So sometimes it's a two for one when you hit western Wisconsin. I also want to mention the president picking up the pace. He's traveling to several battleground states. What is ahead for the president? Well, he is going back to North Carolina this week. He was just there last week. Of course, North Carolina, an important battleground state, and I would say even more important at the moment because as of Friday, the state started sending out absentee ballots to people who had requested them. So while there's a lot of focus on Labor Day being sort of the, the real start of the home stretch, in places like North Carolina, uh, the home stretch is over. It is election day for people who will be sending in their absentee ballots that they receive in the coming days. Uh, another state that's going to be starting voting well ahead of 
the election day is Michigan, and the president's going to travel there later this week. Uh, and again, this strategy that the Trump campaign is taking to focus on these early voting states now, because they really believe the majority of ballots are going to be cast before election day, considering how much vote by mail there is expected to be, despite all the, the criticism the president has made of that and really trying to scare tactics of people. You can see from their strategy that they're still expecting this to be a heavily, heavily mail voted, early voting uh, election coming up. Shannon, while we have you, we're hearing about a potential shakeup at the Pentagon, some reports. What's the latest from there? Yeah, uh, my colleagues Courtney Cuby and Carol Lee uh, were reporting today that uh, the president has obviously for a while not been very happy with Defense Secretary uh, Mark Esper, and he had asked the head of the VA if he would step in and take over at the Defense Department. Now, that would be such a big shakeup so close to the election. We are about 56 days out. It's hard to imagine that the president would replace his defense secretary so close to the election, um, especially as there has been so much criticism right now of the president's uh, comments or reported comments uh, that he has made about the military. But certainly, according to reporting by NBC News, that is a serious discussion that has been going on with inside the West Wing. Shannon, thanks so much. Thank you. Protesters rallied outside police headquarters in Rochester, New York today, demanding justice following the death of Daniel Prude. It comes after a weekend of demonstrations in Rochester. Last night, more than a thousand people took to the streets. Prude died after an incident with police back in March when he was restrained and a spit hood was placed over his head because he said he had coronavirus. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park reports. Hey, Joe, good afternoon to you. So after several days of tense and sometimes violent protests here in Rochester, things actually took a different turn yesterday. It was actually pretty calm. And the police chief is thanking city elders, church elders, who served as buffers between police and protesters. And in fact, it may have worked because there were no arrests. But, Joe, there is certainly still tension here on the ground. A lot of that frustration is directed toward the police chief as well as the mayor for their handling of the Daniel Prude case. But we heard from them in a press conference yesterday, and they are standing firm on their approach. They're saying that they followed all the protocols, but they're still growing calls for them to step down. They responded by saying that they will continue to stay in their position because this is their community and they will work to do better. Meantime, as far as the investigation goes, all seven officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay and the attorney general's office is now taking the lead on the investigation. But they have also asked a grand jury to take a closer look at this case as well. But demonstrators say that they will continue to be out here in Rochester until all the officers are prosecuted. Joe? You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. There are nearly 21 million registered voters in California. That's up more than 10 percent from this time in 2016. The big question right now, can the current election infrastructure handle a surge of mail-in ballots? NBC News business and technology correspondent Joe Lane Kent got a behind-the-scenes look at one of California's largest ballot processing centers. It's part of NBC's Vote Watch Week. In Orange County, California, the final sprint to Election Day begins on October 5th. In a month, all of these envelopes will be stuffed with ballots and sent out to voters. Once they're returned here to the registrar, that's when the process kicks into high gear. Orange County's nonpartisan chief elections official, Neil Kelly, oversees the fifth largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. He says he's running a military-style operation to handle what's likely to be the biggest mail-in vote ever. I think we're probably going to see upwards of 90 percent, honestly, for the November election. That could add up to 1.2 million in Orange County. Kelly has been anticipating the onslaught since the pandemic hit in March, investing more than a million dollars in new machinery and doing dry runs to prepare. You know, I lose sleep a lot at night. I think every election official does. And one of the things that I lose sleep over is making sure the voters understand their options. The options, mail in your ballot early, drop it off in one of these secure drop boxes, or deliver it in person to a vote center starting four days before Election Day. You can, of course, always vote in person. So when your ballot arrives, the first thing it does is go into this piece of equipment. And what this piece of equipment does at a very high speed, it's capturing an image of that signature in a split second. What happens if your signature is not legitimate? It goes to another tier for additional review. A human is comparing the signature here? Correct. Ah. Correct. A human being is comparing every single signature. So if it's good ballots, then these ballots come into this device right here, and this piece of equipment actually splits the envelope open, and this operator would pull out each individual ballot. Is he able to see the way I cast my ballot? No. The secrecy of the ballot remains because it stays folded here until it goes to another team for opening and flattening. This is the moment of truth because now it comes in and we scan it and we're capturing all the data where the voter actually voted. Although Orange County captures mail-in ballots as soon as they arrive, no actual votes are tallied until Election Day. California allows ballots to arrive up to 17 days after Election Day, as long as they're postmarked by November 3rd. Kelly has 30 days by state law to count all the votes, but believes they could finish in two weeks. As for the criticism from the White House... Mail-in ballots will lead to the greatest fraud. Universal mail-in is a very dangerous thing. It's fraud with fraud and every other thing that can happen. I try and stay out of the political fray as the election official, right? But just in general, when you talk about the security of mail-in voting in general, I think it has more secure aspects than in-person voting. 
what we saw is a situation where the county has the time, money, and resources to handle the expected surge in mail-in voting, but that's just not the case nationwide. Not all counties are this fortunate or prepared. And Joe joins us now. Such a fascinating look behind the scenes. Joe, what stood out to you most in this whole process? Was there anything about the system that surprised you at all? when you take a look at the volume of what they're going to be handling. In Orange County, they're a very well-oiled machine. I was there on Super Tuesday, and you saw them bringing in not just the mail-in votes, but the votes that were tallied across vote centers across the county. And they're ready for this. And they've attempted a bunch of different scenarios. They're running dry runs of possible crises, possible issues they could run into. So they feel very prepared. What's fascinating is that, you know, all of the registrars across the country, they all talk to each other. And Neil Kelly says that he's spoken to several other counties in other states where they are concerned about how they're going to handle the volume, how they're going to deal with accusations of voter fraud, even if those have no basis to them. And they do feel the pressure from the White House directly, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe, and great to see you, my friend. Great to see you, too. Joe's report was part of our Vote Watch week. We're investigating what could affect your vote and explaining what you need to pay attention to this election. That's all this week right here on NBC News. Just two weeks into the semester and more than 650 students at Iowa State University have tested positive for coronavirus. The outbreak is now spreading into the surrounding county. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hillier joins us now from Ames, Iowa. Vaughn, good to see you. The infection rate on campus has more than doubled in just the past week. What exactly is happening there? Exactly. If you just look at the percent positive rate, you know, let's just go to the data here. The percent positive rate on the Iowa State campus here in Ames, Iowa, the very first week, it was 13 percent, Joe. The second week, it jumped all the way up to 28 percent positive rate, which is strikingly high. And that is where there, there are those real serious question marks about what way can the school year go forward? I just want to introduce you, Blake McGill. He's a sophomore here uh, at the university. Okay. And I think you'll see exactly where he's at. He's in a quarantine dorm uh, where he will have to be spending 10 days because he was in close proximity to somebody who had COVID here on campus. Take a listen. I'd say classes are going really well. Iowa State's uh, done a good job of making things very accessible for students that uh, are either forced to or prefer to go full online. Um, moving forward, I think they, they have a lot of uh, help opportunities and resources for us, uh, for those that are doing an, all the uh, online uh, activity. And so uh, I would really hope to see that continue for the rest of the semester so that we can all stay here and still get uh, a taste of what normal college is usually like rather than send us all home again. Blake was obviously a good sport with us there on day number five in quarantine. and the work of our great camera and audio team of Mike and Tim there, having the chance to talk to him. Uh, but what you're seeing right now is there's a, about 100 students like Blake that are currently in isolation or in quarantine, uh, which is making this difficult for the university. There's already been more than 650 cases here on campus, and there is concern about to the extent to which it begins to percolate and goes outside of this campus. Ames is a college town, but if you look across Story County, Iowa here, where Ames is at, it is now a hot spot here in the country. Iowa has the highest per capita uh, rate of cases right now, just behind South Dakota in North Dakota, Joe. Yeah, and Vaughn, you mentioned that. We know universities are not in a bubble. Students work in the community, people in the community work at the college. So what is the worry in the community about this spreading beyond the college? You know, if anybody's gone around a college campus before, uh, usually socializing is at the forefront, along with, of course, the educational side of things. And that's what makes it strikingly uh, difficult, especially if you take into account freshmen that are coming onto campus. And I want to introduce you live to one of those right now, if we could. Uh, Gwen Costello, you're an animal science major. And tell me, you're a freshman. You moved down here from Wisconsin. Yes. What happened on your very first day? I um, moved in on the 4th, and I got tested over at the Thielen Health Center. 
and I got um, notified that I had tested positive for COVID-19 without having any contact with anyone who had been possibly even exposed to Very it. first day, then what happened? Um, I got moved from Friley across campus to Linden, which is right behind us. Which is right behind us over there. Yes. You were in isolation. Yes. How many days? Uh, from the 4th to the 15th, so for 10 days. You had a lot to think about in your first uh, week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> After that, you were released from mm -hmm. isolation. Uh, then what did you see on campus here? Um, lots of partying um, and people not like uh, conforming to the social distancing rules that have been like put in place by not only the campus, but also obviously the CDC. And so when all of the cases like began to spike, it tended to be because of the parties that those people were going to. That had to have made you almost want to scream. It was frustrating. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of us are socially deprived teenagers after not having a senior year for us who were freshmen this year. And then to put us in a socially enriched zone and tell us to not socialize is pretty difficult, to what say is, the least. What is your, my sympathies are with you. What is, what is your message now to students? And is it possible to have the rest of the school year go on in the way that it's attempted to go in this first month? Um, my message is wear a mask because it's easy to put a mask on. It's one of the first things I do in the morning when I leave class because I have very early classes. And so if you put a mask on, you're saving yourself and anyone else. That have you seen a difference? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, I've seen that when people are wearing masks outside, it makes me personally feel safer, even though I can't get it for at least the 90 day period because I tested positive. So I have the antibodies. It makes me feel safer to be wearing a mask because in case I come into close contact with somebody who has it again, or I might possibly still have any symptoms, which I don't. Um, but if anything were to happen in the future, it makes me feel safer and it makes the people that I'm with also feel safer, I believe. Gwen, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank Hopefully you. the next couple of years are a little bit better than the start of this one here. Uh, animal science major, freshman, not only is it the educational side of things for these students, but these universities, uh, Joe, the, the universities and government officials will tell you as well that the, the, the long-term concern here is also the financing of these educational institutions here. You know, that's why initially the Iowa State is having their first football game this Saturday, and they announced that 25,000 fans were gonna be allowed in. But after much pushback, as Story County is now a hotspot, they have, uh, they have gone against that initial decision, and it's the athletic department that is saying that the university is, now finds itself in a $30 million deficit because of it. These are the tough conversations that not only students, uh, as well as faculty, as well as, as these university officials are now grappling with. Yeah, this pandemic is hitting college communities very hard. Vaughn, while we have you, I do want to ask you, is Iowa's governor or any state officials doing or saying anything about this outbreak that you're seeing around the university? Governor Kim Reynolds, a Republican here, has been insistent that she is not going to implement a statewide mask mandate but also she is not going to allow localities to enforce mask mandates, which has led to a lot of uh, local officials uh, that have been uh, frustrated by that decision. Just this morning, I was talking with uh, Dr. John Pas Passion, who is the chair of the Story County Board of Health, and he said that localities, especially when a place like Story County now finds itself to be a hotspot, should have that ability to make their own uh, decisions within their jurisdiction uh, and one of those is a mask mandate, which the governor right now has been resistant to allowing these localities to do. All right, Von Hilliard, thank you so much. Former FBI agent Peter Strzok is attacking President Trump in a new book, calling him a national security threat. Strzok was fired from his job after text messages surfaced of him criticizing the president. NBC News chief White House correspondent Hallie Jackson spoke with Strzok about what he wrote. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. And 
he's one of the agents former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S., charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure, improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. Yeah. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like, F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero, and about a possible Trump victory, we'll stop it giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some, whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. 
A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Labor Day, of course, is the unofficial end of summer. There is a lot of worry, though, that what happens this weekend and what happens today could impact the entire fall, at least when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. So we want to bring in our doctor to ask a few questions about this weekend and what's going to happen moving forward. Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter joins us now. She's an internal medicine physician at California Pacific Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for having us. We know Dr. Fauci has expressed concerns about what people might do this weekend. We know we saw with Memorial Day weekend and even the 4th of July, people had gatherings then. And then in the weeks that followed, we saw the virus spread. What are your worries about Labor Day weekend? Well, Joe, we're all concerned that we'll see these same spikes after this holiday weekend. And, and really that impacts everyone's ability to allow our children to go back to school safely, to return to work. You know, I want to point out that at Memorial Day, we had 20,000 cases per day. Now we're at about 40,000 cases per day. So our individual behavior uh, this weekend and, and beyond really matters. You know, that, that said, the value of social interaction, as we know, is significant and really impacts our well-being. So, you know, if, if you do feel strongly that you want to gather this weekend, it should really depend on your individual situation and that of your family and, and your tolerance for risk. Uh, don't forget, it, it takes just one person to spread COVID to many people, and it can actually be someone in your own family. So doing things like staying outdoors, wearing masks, maintaining social distance um, when you're not eating and drinking around other people is, is really the right thing to do. And, and the bottom line is that there's no 100% risk-free way to get together with folks. And, and remember that, you know, if you're spending time around anyone that's high risk, meaning that they have underlying health conditions or they're over 60, their risk is much greater for, for illness and death from COVID. We know how important it is to try to get the pandemic under control heading into the fall after seeing so many spikes, especially in the South and West this summer. Based on what you're seeing right now, looking around the country, where are we at and how much is or is not the coronavirus under control? Well, Joe, we're now in the seventh month of, of the COVID pandemic, and, and there continues to be no uh, national strategy out, uh, out of the White House. We still have COVID cases rising in 22 states. We heard what just, just now what's going on in Iowa. You know, as we head into flu season, this is extremely concerning. I mean, listen, if, if we had easily accessible, fast testing, if nearly everyone was wearing a mask and there were policies in place and messaging to support this, we really could get much of our lives back while we wait for a COVID vaccine. You know, the White House should not be advocating for schools to be opening no matter what, or for bars and restaurants and other businesses to just resume regular services. This is driving many more COVID cases and preventable deaths. Um, I really think we can do so much better than this as a nation, and, and we really should be. For months now, we have been talking about testing. In some places, it can be hard to get a test. Others who get a test are waiting 10, 14 days to get the results, which essentially makes contact tracing useless. As far as you can tell, where do things stand now as far as being able to get a test and get those results back quickly? Joe, so it's, it's dependent on where you live. So we're still not in a great place nationwide in terms of testing, unfortunately. You know, there, there are not enough tests being done and delays in results. You know, we, we have seen these rapid tests emerge, and this is a step in the right direction. Uh, they're fast, 
They're relatively good tests. They're cheap. Uh, we need now to see the political will to take this very seriously. Uh, we need to have the capacity to, to trace and to isolate people if they test positive. And we need to test everyone not just people who are symptomatic, since we know somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of people are asymptomatic with COVID. So if we can do these things and, and have the capacity to do, honestly, billions of tests in this country, we can make a big difference. Dr. Ungerleiter, thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now, this wasn't a normal summer for any of us. And for businesses at the Jersey Shore, well, it has been a season full of challenges and restrictions. In Seaside Heights, New Jersey, the mayor is now planning to keep the beaches open to make up for the economic losses. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffer like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. If the weather stays like this in the 80s and the 70s, we'll do it every day. If we find that people aren't coming, which I believe they will, then we would adjust. We may not open up every day during the week. It's going to be a, a trial. We spoke to a few businesses in Seaside Heights about their plans at the beginning of the summer. So how did they fare in the pandemic economy? We checked in for the holiday weekend. We only have 100 days to make so much to get us through to the next year. And if we don't make that money in 100 days, I don't even know what's going to happen when September gets here. I'd love to say it was just like every other summer, but it wasn't. It was. It, it had that added stress level that we haven't had in the past. Weekends have been very good during the week. It's been off, but it, it's it's not had the, nearly the number of people that you're used to seeing on the boardwalk. It's been challenging and it's very stressful. My family's been in business on the boardwalk 70 years, so it's been very predictable with the cycle of business. But now in 2020, it's been very unpredictable and you had to go take it on a daily basis because you didn't know what was going to unfold. We've had to adjust to a new way of doing things, and. It hasn't been easy. Rest assured, we are doing everything in our power to let all of us enjoy the summer fun. Sanitizing and making sure that railings were clean and tables were clean and, you know, um, every other car was used on the rides. This year we had to adjust on the fly many days in a row. I'm happy with the year because it could have been a lot worse. A lot of people are getting a lot more grab and go, take out. A lot of stuff is being packaged into go containers or small pizza boxes to uh, package slices of pie. The third party delivery, Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, the like, et cetera, basically replaced the late night dollars that we were missing after midnight because the boardwalk did close after midnight. We're only allowed 50% of the occupancy, but even on beautiful, sunny, hot days, the water park had less people at it. Days that were normally boardwalk days for the ride here, we had less people. But our games department did very well. Being on the boardwalk and being able to be open for a while, they've, done, they've had a good year. Reluctantly, I did have to raise my prices because the expenses just kept going up. And uh, to keep pace with that, things like hand sanitizers, masks, other, other things that you need now in this corona environment, even going forward, if we have to have the gloves, the masks, what have you. It was challenging this summer, but very uh, rewarding uh, in the respect that we're making it through. We've had no outbreaks, nobody gets sick, no reason to shut down or quarantine. So I'm very pleased and a little bit surprised that we didn't have anybody get sick. And that's a nice testament. It's going to be a little hard trying to figure out what we're going to do going into the winter. I know there's going to be some, uh, some lean months coming up for sure. It's not been as good as 2019. It's almost like right after Sandy when that happened and it was, things were slow and people weren't around. It, it's eerily similar. Superstorm Sandy was devastating for the whole area. We were just starting to recover from that and then this Seaside Heights fire hit and uh, wiped us out. When the roller coaster and all the rides fell in the water and we had to rebuild, we at least knew what we had to do. But for this, it's been challenging. It certainly has. I mean, it starts wearing on you. I literally grew up on the boardwalk. 
that's a big part of my life. It's, it's how, I, how I grew up, and um, it's what I've embraced uh, professionally. And uh, I really wasn't too surprised to see that Seaside continues. It is a very resilient town and a very resilient uh, business community. Seaside's a great place to come. It could have been a totally disastrous season, but we all did the best we could given what was in front of us. A key opposition figure in Belarus has vanished following another weekend of mass protests. Maria Kolesnikova was last seen being shoved into a vehicle by a group of men. That's according to a local media outlet in Belarus. Kolesnikova was a central figure in protests against the rule of embattled president Alexander Lukashenko. The apparent abduction seems to be yet another example of a pattern of world leaders consolidating power. It's a trend called authoritarian drift. Here's NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. Governments around the world seem to have taken advantage of the ongoing pandemic to make major power grabs, some even explicitly using the coronavirus as a reason to consolidate authority. In Belarus, the longtime president, Alexander Lukashenko, often called Europe's last dictator, won his sixth consecutive term, claiming he got 80% of the vote. His opponent has been forced to flee the country after she called for a recount, citing widespread voter fraud. Mass protests have erupted and authorities have responded with violence, resulting in at least two deaths and thousands of arrests. The EU has stated that it does not recognize the election, but Belarus maintains close ties to Russia and Vladimir Putin has offered assistance to Lukashenko in the wake of the unrest. Well, clearly what's happening in Belarus is um, related to, I think, authoritarian drift in many places of the world. Lukashenko didn't use COVID-19 to grab power. In fact, he was notoriously dismissive of the coronavirus pandemic. And that's part of the anger directed towards him now. He behaves in the same way as Turkmenistan president, as Kim Jong-un. Uh, who also denied the, the danger and the threat of the virus. But it highlights an important trend. In times of crisis comes opportunity for both democracy and despots. Authoritarian drift happens when a country's democratic foundations, such as free speech, fair elections, independent judiciary, and strong civil rights are eroded. Here are a few examples from around the world to keep an eye on. In Hungary over the past decade, Prime Minister Viktor Orban's political party has quietly bought up most of the country's media companies and in March took over the country's most widely read online newspaper. It was previously an independent check on the government, but a close ally of Orban recently purchased a controlling share in the company and in July fired its editor-in-chief, prompting dozens of reporters to quit in protest. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, one of the country's most prominent entrepreneurs and newsmen, Jimmy Lau, was arrested along with his two sons and several of his company's executives. The charge? Suspicion of colluding with foreign forces, an offence which did not exist until a new national security law was forced upon Hong Kong by China in July. The outbreak of coronavirus in the Philippines has been one of the worst in Asia, and its president, Rodrigo Duterte, has used the lockdowns as an opportunity to pass a sweeping anti-terror law, greatly expanding the definition of terrorism, which rights groups worry could be applied to actions such as protests or criticism of the government. And in Brazil, as total deaths from COVID pass 100,000, the country's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has repeatedly claimed with the nation's Supreme Court, which has investigated him and his family. In May, Bolsonaro joined a rally against the Supreme Court, and he has claimed that he has the backing of the military to resist the court's absurd orders. Authoritarian drift has been a factor worldwide for years, but the pandemic seems to be accelerating it. Political scientists are questioning whether the handling of coronavirus could expose the weakness of democracy in comparison to the unchecked power of an authoritarian state. I mean, on the one hand, one has to worry about the information you're getting from an authoritarian state. At the same time, um, there's 
also reason to believe that an authoritarian state might have more means at its disposal to put policies in place that are highly unpopular but, but much needed. Social distancing and wearing a mask will be effective, and that's not that popular in democracies. This wouldn't be the first time a disease had a drastic impact on politics. You could go back through history and you can look at great political shifts um, and see how pandemics or diseases affected the political outcomes. Doug North, the one on Nobel Prize in economics, one of his arguments is that because there was a labor shortage following the, the Black Death, and he sees that changing balance and the shortage of labor as one of the reasons why feudalism ultimately ends up disappearing. More recently, the Spanish flu of 1918 swept through the ranks of both sides of World War I, but its devastating impact on the already weakened German army accelerated the end of the war and Germany's humiliating defeat, setting the stage for a 20th century filled with conflict. Those who support democracy aren't taking this lying down. Young people in Hong Kong have been protesting for well over a year now and show no signs of stopping despite the pandemic. People from all over Belarusian society have risen up to demand an electoral recount, even in the face of violence from the police. In Brazil and the Philippines, the strong Supreme Courts have so far held up as checks on their country's leaders. For now, it seems that many democracies, both old and young, will have to prove that they can withstand a public health crisis while maintaining their democratic values. A challenge that may prove even more difficult if a dreaded second wave hits the world this fall or winter. Hey everyone, I'm Joe Fryer. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz. He's following the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey there, Gotti. Hey, Joe. Happy Monday. We're going to start with the presidential campaign as it heats up with both Trump and Biden making their case on how they can get the country through the coronavirus pandemic. Scientists are racing to find an effective coronavirus vaccine as cases here top 6 million and deaths rise over 190,000. Trump saying today that Biden and vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris are politicizing the search for a vaccine. Biden accused Trump of doing the same thing and spreading misinformation. Here's Biden earlier today. I want full transparency on the vaccine. One of the problems is the way he's playing with policy is he said so many things that aren't true. I'm worried if we do have a really good vaccine, people are going to be reluctant to take it. And so he's, he's undermining public confidence. But pray God we have it. If I could get a vaccine tomorrow, I'd do it. If it would cost me the election, I'd do it. Today, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was in court in a UK court fighting extradition to the US, but the judge denied his attempt to delay that extradition hearing. Assange is facing 18 charges, including conspiring to hack a government computer and violating espionage law. He could serve up to 175 years in prison. Prosecutors say he conspired with Chelsea Manning, a US Army intelligence analyst, to hack a Pentagon computer and release hundreds of thousands of files on the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. His defenders say he was acting as a journalist and exposing US military wrongdoing. The hearing began in February, but had been postponed in April because of the pandemic. And Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan Markle have repaid over two million pounds or three million dollars of public money that they used while living on royal grounds. They had done some refurbishing to their home at Windsor Castle, drawing some criticism when they decided to step down as frontline royals this year. Harry and Meghan have been living here in L.A. since March and recently signed a major deal with Netflix to produce films, shows and some documentaries. And some sad news in the sports world. St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Famer Lou Brock died at 81 years old. Uh, the outfielder helped the Cardinals win three pennants and two World Series titles in the 1960s. And after nearly two decades of a career in the MLB, he worked as a commentator and part-time instructor. And Joe, he will be greatly missed. Those are some of the headlines we're following right now. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Gotti, and great to see you. Have a good one. You too. 
Democratic VP nominee Kamala Harris is making her solo campaign debut in Battleground, Wisconsin today. She's been in Kenosha and Milwaukee, while her opponent, Vice President Mike Pence, makes his pitch to voters on the opposite end of the state. NBC News political reporter Ali Vitale joins us now from Milwaukee. Ali, good to see you. So if last week was any indication the Trump and Biden campaigns are drawing stark mm -hmm. contrast when it comes to their messaging in Wisconsin, okay. how did Senator Harris seek to contrast herself with her opponent today. Joe, today perhaps more of a contrast of location and scheduling. The president, of course, spending the day at the White House, the Democratic ticket out on various parts of the battleground state campaign trail, Joe Biden in Pennsylvania, and Kamala Harris making, as you mentioned, her first stop on the actual campaign trail, taking it away from being virtual and back into what we used to consider normal out here on the, on the campaign trail coming to Wisconsin. And she made a few stops here, first meeting with the family and legal team of Jacob Blake, the black man who was shot recently by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, setting off another wave of unrest there in that part of the country. She then came to the IBEW Electrical Workers Union Hall behind me, meeting and talking with people there. But of course, attendance is sparse on purpose, totally not a hallmark of the usual campaign trail where People used to boast about the crowds that they had. Now, the Democratic ticket trying to get out a little bit more because we're getting into the home stretch, but doing it safely. So that's the contrast out here today, trying to talk about the economy on Labor Day. Democrats really leaning into union voters, someone that they hope to really win over come November. The president held a news conference earlier today, really went after Senator Harris for not trusting him on a vaccine. What did he say? And has there been any response yet from Harris? No response from Harris yet. She does have one more event today where we may hear her say something about this. But I think it's important to note what the president was responding to. Over the weekend, Kamala Harris, in an interview with CNN, was asked about the potential for a vaccine and if she would take it. She said that she wouldn't just take Trump's word for it. Instead, she would want to hear from science experts and other people in the medical field who say that it's reliable, sound, and efficient. Here's how Trump interpreted that comment and responded to it today at the White House. Should immediately apologize for the reckless anti-vaccine rhetoric that they are talking right now, talking about endangering lives, and it undermines science. And what's happening is uh, all of a sudden you'll have this incredible vaccine. And because of that fake rhetoric, it's a political rhetoric. That's all it is, just for politics. Now, it's also important, Joe, to explain why Harris said that she wasn't just going to take Trump's word for it, because over the course of the last few months of the pandemic, we have heard the president say to do things that aren't necessarily medically sound in combating or preventing the coronavirus, including pressing hydroxychloroquine as an option for Americans. So that's part of why Senator Harris was saying she wanted to hear from outside medical professionals about a potential vaccine. Trump, of course, today saying that he hopes to have one very soon before that special day. You can only imagine that he was talking about in November. But it does kind of bring us to this larger point about the politicization that we've seen, unfortunately, of the pandemic. Donald Trump, of course, trying to turn the page on it while the Democratic ticket is focusing on Trump's mishandling of it and attaching that inextricably with the economic recession that's going on. So it's going to be interesting to see if Harris or Biden does continue to extend this news cycle about a vaccine, making it just the latest political ping pong ball. Ali, we know Wisconsin was a surprising blow to Democrats in the 2016 race. President won by less than one percentage point there. Tell us about the stakes and what is the Biden campaign doing that's different from what Hillary Clinton did four years ago? Since the 2016 election, Democrats have been trying to lay the groundwork so that what they saw happen in 2016 here in Wisconsin does not happen again. That means, as I've been talking to state officials here in the Democratic Party and national Democrats, they have been investing early and often in volunteers, in grassroots operations, and in trying to make sure that they have the energy on the ground going from as early as possible when they started that operation 
all the way through the November election. And it's important to note why. In 2016, we saw voter turnout go down by 3% statewide from where it was in 2012. And here in Milwaukee County, where Harris was campaigning today, it's an area that Democrats have won the last three election cycles, but it also saw a pretty substantial margin of decline in turnout, 10% down from 2012. So for Democrats, it's going to be important for them to turn out all of those voters. And it's part of what's interesting about Senator Harris being here today. The Biden campaign has really used her to continue outreach to minority groups of voters. When she's campaigning virtually, she does a lot of talking to black voter groups, Hispanic voter groups, AAPI groups, and it's part of building the Biden coalition. Here in Milwaukee County, look at the demographic breakdown. It's a majority white community, but only by a little bit, 51% white here. The other 40% black and Hispanic voters, Harris trying to appeal to them while also speaking to union voters broadly here, trying to bridge the demographic, the demographic depth of this, this electorate, and then also trying to reach out to all voters. Again, all in the name of turnout. That's what Democrats believe it's gonna come down to here in Wisconsin. Lots of information there. Thank you so much, Allie. Thanks. President Trump held a last-minute Labor Day news conference at the White House earlier today, creating an opportunity to issue a full-throated campaign-style attack against his rival. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. Shannon, the president was hitting Biden on a range of issues today. First, let's take a listen. Biden wants to surrender our country to the virus. He wants to surrender our families to the violent left-wing mob. And he wants to surrender our jobs to China. And Biden's a stupid person. You know that. You're not going to write it. But you know that. And as you just heard, there are times simply insulting Biden's intelligence. What do you make of that strategy? Well, that's something the president's been doing for a while now, is attacking Biden's mental acumen, you know, everything from Sleepy Joe to, at one point, the president saying that Joe Biden would have to be put in a nursing home if he were elected president. Um, but as long as well as attacking Biden and his personality in general, I mean, the president spends so much time attacking so many other things other than Biden that, in, in some instances, the attacks on Biden get lost. And even in those clips, you could hear uh, he is attacking the left-wing mob. He is attacking China. He will attack people who aren't on the ballot at all, like Bernie Sanders and AOC. Uh, he'll attack Kamala Harris, you know, who is on the ballot, but, you know, is obviously not top of the ticket. So, so much of the president's time is spent trying to run against people and things that aren't Joe Biden in so many instances that a lot of times these attacks on Biden really get drowned out. Um, today, you could hear him, you know, not pulling any punches and, and you know, really using some... Um, you know, sort of basic language against Biden, calling him stupid. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting to see as we go forward in this campaign, how much are the attacks going to be directed at Biden and how much are attacks going to be put toward a broader cultural uh, issue of the moment that the president is trying to fight. President today was also asked about the allegations against Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, this over campaign finance violations, different from the Postal Service cutbacks that have been in the news. What is this about and how did the president respond to it? Well, the allegation is that DeJoy, who was a Republican mega donor, a very large donor to the Republican Party, uh, the allegation and the report is that he encouraged or forced employees of his old company to donate to Republican campaigns and then reimburse them in the form of bonuses. That's what's being alleged. The president was asked about that and have a listen to what he had to say. I don't know too much about it. I read something this morning, but I don't. Other than that, I'd have to see it. Uh, he's a very respected man. He was approved uh, very much uh, by both parties. Follow up, please, if you don't mind. If it's proven to be a campaign finance scheme, do you think he should lose his job? Yeah, if something could be proven that he did something wrong, always. And the key there, if it is to be proven, the president 
uh, initially appeared not to know that much about it, and, and certainly not saying that this is something that is a priority for him to investigate or directing uh, the Justice Department or whoever in his administration to find out more and investigate it. That is not something we heard from the president, uh, and I think that speaks to where his head is at on this issue. Yeah. Oh, now, tomorrow, the president will campaign in some of the first states that are casting mail-in ballots. What can we expect from the president? Well, I think you, you know, made a good point there that he'll be in North Carolina, which absentee ballots have already gone out in that state. And there's a real focus on the Trump campaign to hit these early voting states. Of course, so many states with people expected to be voting by absentee are going, you're going to have people voting before Election Day by mail. But North Carolina is predominantly one of those. Um, Michigan, another state he is going to hit uh, later in the week. Ballots there for people who have requested an absentee ballot go out in about three weeks. Um, he uh, was in North Carolina last week as well. Uh, so the president really hitting these early voting states. The campaign is trying to get the focus more on the economy. The president's press conference today was supposed to be focused on the economy. Um, you know, they haven't really been able to pick up much ground in this issue of crime that they've spent tens of millions of dollars on. Obviously, Americans are still widely disapproving of his handling of the coronavirus. So the economy remains the last place where the president has some edge, though not much, if any, uh, against Biden. So I think another theme to look for in the coming weeks from all of these campaign stops. And Shannon, the Trump campaign is expected to increase TV ad spending next week. But this comes as the campaign is reportedly facing a cash crunch. What do we know about this? What's going on? Well, the campaign has spent more than a billion dollars already. And if you look at the president's poll numbers, there are some signs that the race is tightening. But he is obviously trailing Biden not only nationally, but in almost every battleground state consistently in the vast majority of polls that we've seen. So that is despite all of the money that is being spent. The Trump campaign over the past months has pulled back on campaign ads, and they have said that an effort to uh, restructure their strategy to go after some of these early voting states, as, as we were just discussing a moment ago, um, but also a question about what is going to be the best messaging and digesting these poll numbers that have come out over the past week to get a sense of what is effective and what is not effective and how they change the momentum of the race. We do know that the campaign has already invested in spending very heavily after Labor Day. They said that spending during the uh, Republican convention wasn't something they felt they needed to do because they were already getting the sort of free airtime from the convention. So after Labor Day, they're telling us to watch for some big investments and pushes there. Uh, but, you know, of course, this was a race we didn't think would come down to money. The Trump campaign had been so confident that their fundraising was so strong, they had endless money coming in, and money wasn't going to be a question. But obviously, as we enter these final months, money is very much on this campaign's mind as they try and conserve resources here. All right. Shannon, thank you so much. Thank you. There's another candidate, Kanye West. He has spent nearly $7 million on his presidential campaign, according to a filing with the Federal Election Commission. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hillier joins me now. So, Vaughn, now this may surprise a lot of people, but where does the Kanye 2020 campaign stand as of today? You know, for, for all the flurry that is around the Kanye West candidacy and for all the number of states where his presence on the ballot has been rejected, Joe, the reality is, is that he is on the ballot in 12 states, including places like here in, here in Iowa, Minnesota, Colorado. Those are three potential states that could have close outcomes. Look, Minnesota, the Trump, pre, uh, Trump, can, uh, the Trump campaign looks at that as a place where they could pull off a win where they didn't in 2016. And if Kanye West is able to, you know, pull even a few thousand votes in an extremely close race, I'll remind you, Michigan was just 11,000 vote difference in 2016. The Kanye West name on the ballot could make a difference. And when you look at their uh, a list, you've got those 12 states, but there's also five states that are currently as well going through a legal limbo, you know, places like Arizona, where uh, the, a lower court has ruled that he was not eligible because he is a registered Republican in the state of Wyoming, or the state of Wyoming, his home state. 
uh, but he was attempting to get on the ballot as an independent. The Supreme Court is expected to hear that case uh, beginning tomorrow. So there's question marks as to, obviously, a candidate who has only been on the campaign trail just one day at the same time, getting that name on the ballot could be potentially a big deal in a lot of these states. Yvonne, speaking of Arizona, there was recently a campaign stop there. What can you tell us about that? Well, th this because this was a last minute play, it's been an effort to get ultimately his name on these ballots. In order to do that in these states, you've got to get enough verified signatures. And on Friday, you saw a group of about 75 paid signature gatherers congregate out inside the Arizona State Capitol to drop off more ballots. That campaign says that they turned in over 90,000 ballots to the Arizona Secretary of State's office. Of course, they would have to go through the process uh, of getting those verified to meet what is a threshold of 39,000 votes in order to get placed onto the ballot. Again, if the Supreme Court rules that Kanye West's name could appear on the ballot, then that is part of uh, that second process. But this also comes down to the fact here that Kanye West doesn't actually have a campaign team. There's an individual named Greg Keller who is a GOP operative based out of Missouri. There's a, a, a woman named Megan Cox, who is a GOP operative in the state of Arizona. There's some of these other conservative operatives in other states that have been trying to get his name on the ballot. Uh, and the question is, to what extent is Kanye West even involved in this? And that is why I asked the very questions of the folks who were these paid signature gatherers, uh, whether they actually wanted Kanye West to be president. And take a listen. From Arizona. 2020. Who wants Kanye West to be president? <laughs> Joe, I play you that soundbite because these were paid uh, signature gatherers from around the country. In fact, on my way from Arizona over here to Iowa this weekend, one of them was on the plane with me here. And then the second question who actually wants Kanye West to be president? You heard uh, a deafening silence there. All right, Vaughn. Interesting times we're in. Thank you so much. Misinformation about the coronavirus pandemic seems to be spread as easily as the virus itself in the United States. That could threaten the security of an unprecedented election in just 57 days. NBC News tech correspondent Ben Collins takes a closer look as part of NBC's Vote Watch Week. You know, before COVID, there was misinformation in every country, for sure. But in one country, it might be about the prime minister. And in another country, it might be about, you know, the response to some natural disaster. In a third country, it might be about some celebrity. And what's happened with COVID, there is misinformation on the same topic in every country around the world. And we're all talking about the same kinds of emergency responses, whether that's like lockdowns or masking or restaurants closing, et cetera. As scientists get closer to developing a vaccine, false information about the coronavirus continues to spread to all corners of the world. That presents a unique opportunity for Jake Shapiro. He's a professor at Princeton, leading a team of researchers studying COVID misinformation on a global scale. Today, we have about 2,400 narratives uh, in the database, uh, 33 different languages. We have an ability now to really say, here's what the trends have been in a whole bunch of countries around the world. There's a consistent drumbeat of narratives around the nature of the emergency response and around the status of particular individuals. Misinformation about the nature of the virus, the origin of the virus, um, things like that, that has really dropped off dramatically. It's not really as credible as it once was to say, hey, this thing is just like a seasonal flu. Like, generally, people understand that's not true. Some misinformation is simply bizarre, like a tweet from a fake BBC account claiming actor Daniel Radcliffe had the virus, but some could carry long-term implications. About a quarter of the misinformation narratives which we track had very clear political motives. So they were trying to promote the policy response of a particular actor or denigrate the policy response of a political actor or undermine a particular institution in a society. What, what that suggests to me is that the people who are using misinformation for political purposes are going to hop on whatever the issue of the day is. And for the last six months, in many places around the world, the issue of the day has been COVID. One of the biggest drivers of misinformation? Fear. 
Stories which seem like designed to like make people scared is the largest category for sure, so about a third. As the United States approaches a critical election this November without an effective vaccine, could fear keep people from the polls? The thing which worries me a little bit more about COVID is it could potentially be used for very targeted voter suppression. You kind of micro-target people on social media to scare them away from going to vote in person by you know, sending them lots of content which emphasizes the, the public health risks and the dangers that they face from going to vote. That's the aspect I, I am more concerned with. It's that like highly targeted voter suppression that uses COVID as the story to keep people away from the polls. And Shapiro warns the bigger threat is the same Russian interference we saw in 2016. You know, we just had the director of the National Counterintelligence Center come out and say, Russia is working hard to influence the 2020 election through creating false information and fake behavior on social media. That there's a direct assault by a foreign country on the integrity of our political discussion in our country. This is like a direct effort to impersonate Americans and produce content that is appearing as though it's produced in our country. But are we in a better position now than we were four years ago? Now there are multiple companies that have large staffs working on this, and all the platforms are out there looking for it. The intelligence community is tracking it, and various aspects of the federal government are tracking it. So there's, there's like way more being done now than there was then. That's a much better situation for our democracy than 2016. We're less than two months away from the 2020 presidential election, and casting your ballot might be a little confusing this year, but don't worry, NBC News is here to help. We have a new state-by-state -state guide called Plan Your Vote. It has information on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions by state. You can check it out at NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. Massive wildfires are burning across California. The governor here declaring a state of emergency. The most active is the Creek Fire, burning in central California. So far, more than 70,000 acres have been scorched. California is also in the grip of an oppressive heat wave. Some places seeing triple-digit temperatures, making the firefight even more difficult. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is in Yucaipa, California, at the El Dorado Fire. Steve, what's happening where you are? Are right now. Well, Joe, because of those scorching temperatures, the conditions ripe to continue fueling these fires, including the one where I am now here in Southern California, the El Dorado fire. This is butted up against San Bernardino National Forest. That forest, along with several others in Southern California and Central California, uh, by officials have now been shut down because of the extreme risk. Here in Southern California, I have to say, the winds that tend to pick up during this time at about one, two in the afternoon have started to kick up. The fire has spread even more. It was in the 7,000s as far as acreage. It is now 8,600 acres. So it is spreading with the winds that will help carry the fire to new locations. But I will say it is a cooler wind than the blast furnace that we had over the weekend when temperatures were up to 110, 115, 120 in some places. Here, there is not much more fuel to burn. If you're looking at me live, uh, it looks like I'm on a different planet for a reason. It's because it's already scorched so much in the areas that are near to those residential areas. Still, 21,000 evacuated from their homes. Again, 8,600 acres burn, only 7% contain. Firefighters, again, dealing with these red flag winds that are in the area. They need to get a handle on this and try to get as much containment done as humanly possible before the winds continue to kick up as the day progresses into the night. They hope to get uh, much more containment on this so they can get a good handle on this fire, including all the other fires that are burning across the state. Now, more than two dozen with a grand total of two million acres burned this year. That is a record for California, this fire among those that are so dangerous now in the state of California, Joe. Back to you. Yeah, Steve, just an eerie sight where you're standing there right now. We know that there are all kinds of evacuations taking place, along with people who had to be rescued by a helicopter. What's the latest when it comes to evacuations, and, and how are they dealing with this all in the middle of a pandemic? Well, first thing I should say, Joe, is the cause the trucks roll in. That's what you're going to hear in the background. Uh, is the cause of the fire, because it's been such a source of consternation for so many people hearing the actual source of the fire, which is a gender reveal that has gone wrong. It happened in El Dorado 
they parked very close by to where I am uh, now. Somebody was doing a gender reveal over the weekend. It was clarified as a photo opportunity and not necessarily a gender reveal party, but uh, fire officials and fire investigators say that there was some sort of incendiary device that would have created an explosive smoke-like effect. You would imagine it would either be pink or blue. I'm not sure what the result was, except to say that the result in this area has been largely black. This uh, fire has done so much damage. The people that are responsible could face criminal charges. They will at least face a hefty fine. But again, that has left to thousands evacuated out of their homes. We're in these areas where wide swaths are completely evacuated. Uh, you'll see roadblocks that are miles and miles away from actual civilization as you drive on in to where the actual firefight is. So this is obviously a very difficult thing for firefighters. Firefighters themselves, and having to do so many fires already in the year of 2020, uh, I've spoken to a lot of fire officials about what they do in preparation for COVID. A lot of the actual firefighting itself does not change at all. You can't really social distance when you're on the front line of one of these massive infernos. However, when they come back to base camp, when they're in those camps, uh, and they have to get a line on the food or cycle out shifts, that becomes much more difficult because of COVID. And then all the people going into those shelters have to get temperature checks, have to be spread out. So they may need more shelters if there is a massive evacuation like the one we're seeing here. Very complicated situation when you factor in COVID and you factor in, again, these this weather condition, which is terrible for these fires that are spreading across the state. Joe, back to you. All right, Steve, thank you so much. Stay safe, my friend. Thank you, Joe. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. 
Florida is taking no chances, putting harsh restrictions in place at many beaches in anticipation of massive crowds enjoying the Labor Day holiday. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Miami Beach. Morgan, great to see you. So how have beaches there prepared in their plans to try and keep people safe this holiday? Well, Joe, they've put out some new rules ahead of this big holiday weekend. And on top of that, they've also stationed uh, volunteers, code enforcement officers along really every entrance to the famed South Beach here uh, in Miami. Uh, and they don't really have to say much. There's people standing here by the entrances wearing masks, making it pretty clear you need to have yours on before you set foot onto the beach. And once you get to your spot, you can then take it off, go swimming and have a good time. If you're not wearing one, you're going to be given uh, another mask provided by the city, and then a $50 fine. That's uh, according to the mayor of Miami uh, Beach, who I had a chance to speak to earlier this week, uh, just about how to go about approaching this new kind of holiday in the middle of a pandemic. This virus has a learning curve in every way, and we now know that the masks help, social distancing helps, uh, doing the kinds of things that, that the doctors have been telling us to do. We need to continue to do it, and I hope they do it because after the last few holidays, there were, there were surges right afterwards, which were frankly very deadly. Yeah, one of those surges the mayor mentioned was at the 4th of July. We saw a statewide case jump of about 78 percent across Florida. They're hoping to eliminate that this go around uh, with that widespread compliance of the masks, social distancing. And they also, of course, still have a cap here on uh, bars and restaurants. Bars are not open. Restaurants capped at 50 percent capacity. If they break that, Joe, they face a five hundred dollar fine uh, and the potential of being shut down. Joe. Hey, Morgan, last month, Miami Beach issued more than fourteen thousand dollars in fines to mask violators. How effective have those fines been? Are we seeing more people in masks there now? You know, having been here at the start of the summer, whenever that mask uh, rule went into effect, I can say that we are seeing more masks out here today uh, over the past weekend since we've been here in Miami Beach. Uh, and that also goes if you uh, make your way into the actual uh, city itself, Ocean Drive, uh, just about 100 yards from where I'm, where I'm standing. You're going to see people walking around on sidewalks wearing these. I will be the first to say that there is not 100 percent compliance. Um, tickets are being handed out. We do know that, uh, however, the city, or rather the police force for Miami Beach, said that they've issued 800 mask citations over the past two weeks. They don't have the official numbers in from this holiday weekend, but they did say, Joe, that the majority of those tickets that were handed out came prior to the holiday weekend, which uh, leads them to believe that, for the most part, the word is out. Uh, people need to just make certain uh, essential changes to go about living their life if they want to come out here uh, and take part in a little sunshine and a little sand. Joe? Yeah, I know you've been talking with people throughout the holiday weekend. Based on your conversations, does it seem like people are taking the restrictions seriously? Uh, yes and no. You know, I think we have seen a, a growing number of people realize that this is just how life is going to be in the short term, uh, hopefully not too long. Uh, you do have some people that are you know, adamantly opposed, um, maybe on a personal level, but they'll still throw the mask on. Uh, and then you have folks that, um, you know, if they're not going to partake here because they don't want to put a mask on, they'll simply uh, go somewhere else. Um, uh, but you, it's best to hear from them in your own words. It, we had a chance to have, have a wide array of conversations with uh, just some of the thousands that turned out to Miami Beach this weekend. Take a listen. If we weren't in a pandemic, what would the beach be looking like? Oh, crazy. It would be a lot more full, for sure. Boy, you'll see so much more people outside. It'd be packed? It would be super packed. Everybody would be dancing, music playing. Actually expected more. But being because of this whole coronavirus thing, yeah. I just appreciate whatever we can get at this point. Yeah. To the new rules by now? Sure. I'm a retired teacher, so I am very used to the rules. Living my best life, going to the beach. You know, doing whatever I need to do. Wear my mask when needed, uh, just to, uh, for the sake of others. And that was really the general consensus as far as the attitude goes for the beachgoers we spoke to, Joe. They remember back when these beaches were closed entirely. So if they do have to make some changes in order to come out and enjoy them, those we spoke to say they're happy to do so. Send it back to you. All right. Appreciate it, Morgan. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Health officials are warning of a possible spike in coronavirus cases after the Labor Day weekend. The U.S. now tops 6 million infections. More than 190,000 people have died. Dr. Julie Morita is the vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and former chief medical officer of the Chicago Department of Health. Dr. Morita, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we saw the spike in cases after Memorial Day and then again on the 4th of July. How concerned are you as we wrap up Labor Day weekend? Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. I think, you know, the key thing to keep in mind is that in those communities where there is widespread disease, if people are congregating and not maintaining social distancing and not wearing masks, there will likely be spikes in the number of cases that occur. I think what I've heart been heartened to see as I've walked around Chicago in the community in my neighborhoods, I can see that people are wearing neighborhood are wearing masks. They're actually congregating, uh, but also keeping distances from other families. So it's really important uh, to adhere to the social distancing, to wear the masks, and then you can actually do things outside and be a little more social than you you would have would have been previously when the parks and beaches were closed down. You know, Europe is starting to see a second wave. Parts of the U.S. are still struggling right now. What is your message to people as we head into the fall, especially with flu season on the horizon? So everyone wants for the pandemic to be over, but the pandemic is not over. And so though some jurisdictions are reopening restaurants, reopening bars, allowing people to congregate, there is this risk for increased transmission and more people getting sick, sick if people aren't adherent and aren't wearing their masks and aren't keeping social distancing. So as we head into the fall, we know that influenza will be coming. It always comes every year. It starts coming in the fall. Flu vaccines are available now. I think it's really critical. That's something that people can do is actually to go ahead and get their flu vaccines so they don't get flu, burden the healthcare system, potentially get flu, and then also getting COVID is not a good combination. And so really taking advantage of this opportunity to get a flu vaccine to prevent themselves from getting sick is really, uh, this is the opportunity to do that. Speaking of vaccines, President Trump said again today that a coronavirus vaccine could be ready by November. First, let's listen to this. This could have taken two or three years, and instead it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be done in a very short period of time. Could even have it during the month of October. So contrary to all of the lies, the vaccine, that they're, they're politicalized. They're, they're, they'll say anything. And it's so dangerous for our country what they say. But the vaccine will be very safe and very effective. October, of course, is just next month. What do you make, doctor, of that timeline? So we have a long established successes with vaccines. Many of the diseases that used to cause death and disability like polio and measles, we rarely see. And that's because we, the U.S. has a well-established vaccine system and a program. It takes, there's a lot of steps in the process for developing and approving a vaccine and for actually making the recommendations and getting it out to the community. So I, those steps are really critical and those steps need to be followed so the FDA can license a vaccine that is safe and effective. What is most important about the vaccine is making sure that it works and that it's safe for people who get it and following the usual processes and following the steps with the FDA and the CDC leading, we can actually have a safe and effective vaccine. And the time frame for which it happens, as much as I'd like to have the vaccine tomorrow, I'd much rather have a vaccine that is safe and effective and have it take a little bit longer. We saw states struggle to roll out effective testing and contact tracing strategies. Based on your experience in Chicago, what do you think local governments need to do to get ready for a vaccine rollout? So when I was a, a chief medical officer at the Chicago Department of Public Health during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, the CDC led the effort in terms of vaccine uh, distribution and allocation, and that process went about as smoothly as it could have. There were hiccups in the road, as all emergencies and crises have, but generally because there was a lead agency that was orchestrating and could manage different states' needs and different jurisdictions' needs, and there were clear messages about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine, it went relatively smoothly. What I'd like to see is that same kind of leadership from a CDC perspective to assure that all jurisdictions know 
what to expect from the vaccine, when they might get it, who should get the vaccine. But in addition to that, because we're seeing such a huge impact on people of color in the United States with COVID, we really need to make sure that we're, the local and state jurisdictions and health departments are actually working with communities to understand what their concerns are about the vaccine. Do they have fears about the safety of the vaccine? Do they not trust the vaccine? And if that's the case, then really working with them to understand how we can address their concerns, how we, who we can actually help communicate to the community so that when the vaccine is available, that it actually gets to everyone who needs the vaccine in a fair and just way. Dr. Marita, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. 2020 has been a year for the record books. We're in the midst of a global pandemic, the fallout, an economic crisis pushing millions to the brink of bankruptcy. There's also a national reckoning on race. All this with a presidential election now less than two months away. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry crisscrossed the U.S. during all of it. Here's some of what he saw during his road to recovery RV trip across America. By the summer of 2020, America was struggling to breathe. Uncertainty, fear, and confusion seem to be everywhere. The question is, how did we get from this? What we don't want to do is have to revert back to a, a phase one. To this. Our COVID units are completely full. And from this. United, we stand, divided, we fall. They need to unite with one another. To this. In search of answers, we traveled over 7,000 miles across 15 states on a road trip through the most turbulent summer in a generation to find out if and how we can reunite these divided states of America. Hey man, sometimes we all need to calm down and relax a little. Cal Perry joins us now. So Cal, 15 states in 70 days, all in a caravan of RVs. First of all, how in the world did you do it? Uh, well, we tried to be careful about it. I had a great crew, I should say that. Mark Ringo and Frank Ringo brothers, and I think it would probably take brothers to share an RV like that, very close uh, living quarters. But we did it, obviously, because of the pandemic. We wanted to avoid hotels. We wanted to avoid airports. Uh, in the Midwest, when we started out, a lot of the hotels were closed, so it, it just made sense. It also allowed us uh, to stay in places we wouldn't have otherwise stayed for a long time, Indiana, Illinois, places in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. So we got to take a look at the economy, and what what was surprising, I think, uh, was the division. I think everybody knows that America is divided, but divided even on science, as you've been talking to your guests recently and Morgan down on the beach there, still no mask mandate. That, I think, was a surprise because here in the UK, where I am now, uh, almost everybody is wearing a mask. There's a mask mandate and people uh, sort of follow it. So that was a surprise. Then, of course, we have this national reckoning on race. There's major divisions there. And then you add to that the president and his rallies and what he's trying to do um, in preparation for this election by, by putting a lot of doubt into the process. Um, I think that was very surprising to all of us as well. Your RV trip across America began with the idea that you'd meet people getting back on their feet. How did you end up in Louisville, Kentucky? Who did you meet? And tell me about your time there. Well, part of it was Brianna Taylor was killed uh, by police who went into her apartment on, you know, what they called a no-knock raid. They, they busted down the door in the city, uh, really sparked off after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. So we went down uh, to really pitch in and try to help the coverage. The city um, was in many ways out of control. You'll remember that there was um, clashes taking place all over the country. You were on the West Coast covering it as I was in uh, Louisville. Um, I was surprised. I think we were all were surprised at how the authorities reacted, certainly the National Guard um, in Kentucky. And we really wanted to talk to somebody who had been through this before, America has been through this before. We went through this in the 60s, this conversation. It's, of course, a new generation now. But we wanted to talk to somebody who had marched with Martin Luther King. Um, and we found Reverend Donna Beasley sitting in a chair in this park every day. We were able to talk to her. And, and part of this 30 minutes is extended conversations with people like this. Take a listen. What do you think about what's going on here? I think it's absolutely abhorrent that at this day and time, we're still having to go through this. So. so there you have a little bit of sort of how she was feeling. We actually heard from her yesterday. She's still there. We expect some movement on the Breonna Taylor case, we hope, in the next sort of week or two. And people like that are staying there. They're going to try to show their solidarity with the, the Taylor family until there's some kind of resolution 
um, in that case, Joe. Cal, we haven't seen many campaign rallies this year, but we have seen a few. What was it like for you watching rallies during this pandemic? It was obviously very strange. I mean, I come at this partly, I try to come at this from the perspective of how would a foreign correspondent cover the United States. Um, and it's pretty stark when, when you have the president giving these rallies in the midst of a pandemic, you have the clashes outside. I think one of the, the things that's scary that's now starting to take place more and more in the country are these militias, these militias coming out heavily armed, clashing oftentimes with Black Lives Matter supporters. We've seen violence, of course, but there's this doubt that the president is putting on the democratic process, which I have to tell you, from my experience overseas, is incredibly dangerous. If people don't believe in the process, process, the, the, the country in many ways, the democracy that we know uh, will fall apart. I think it's likely uh, that what we'll see, and we've seen it around the world, um, is a man who doesn't necessarily win the election, but tries not to lose uh, the election. And you hear more of more of this in these rallies. You hear him talking about, for example, in North Carolina, where people should go and check on their mail-in ballots. That could be incredibly dangerous. So I found that sort of stark. The language that he's using is very reminiscent of what you hear from strongmen around the world. Um, and I found that quite scary. All right. Thank you so much, Cal. And a programming note now, you can watch highlights from Cal Perry's trip around the country, Road to Recovery, America at a Crossroads. It airs tonight right here on NBC News Now. France is reporting a record number of infections leading to school closures just days after restarting in-person classes. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the latest on the coronavirus resurgence in Europe. Yeah, well, it looks like all of Paris is out here strutting their stuff on the Champs-Élysées. It looks normal, but you'll notice just about everybody is wearing a mask. It's not for show. This country is about to see a coronavirus rebound. Today in France, it's deja vu all over again, as new COVID cases surge, reaching a new record Friday of nearly 9,000 cases in a single day. Masks are now compulsory in major French cities. Violators could pay a nearly $200 fine. It's not just France. Cases in Spain are way up again after a summer lull. And in the UK, infections just soared to nearly 3,000 in a day, its biggest jump since May. And new travel bans are being imposed. But some Parisians remain remarkably blasé. Yeah, of course, uh, we are a bit worried about, about the situation, but uh, we also have to live like, uh, like normally. New free testing stations here account for some of the rise in numbers, but hospitalization and death rates remain low. There are fewer than 500 COVID cases in intensive care, down from about 8,000 at the height of the crisis. The infected are mostly young, showing mild or no symptoms, a trend reflected across Europe. Young people begin to understand that it's a real thing for everybody, not just for old people. And this time, France won't stop. French President Emmanuel Macron is ruling out a fresh lockdown. People are going back to work and schools have reopened, but 22 shut down almost immediately last week after outbreaks. American Jake Lippert, whose family lives in France, had been eager to get back to class. Originally, I was kind of excited to be able to see my friends again, but yes, now I now that, the, again, the cases have been kind of surging, it is it does feel a little bit less sure. His mother Kim is also worried and confused. We wear masks absolutely everywhere we go, and we're trying to do everything we can to be safe, but it feels like we are walking into the unknown. And it's not just Europe. India surpassed Brazil as the second worst afflicted country in the world, but both of those countries are far behind the global leader in this pandemic, the United States. Matt Bradley, NBC News, Paris. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. 
protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Saudi Arabia has issued its final verdicts against those charged with the killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. His fiance today put out a statement calling the ruling a mockery of justice, adding that the international community will, quote, not accept the farce. NBC News correspondent Sarah Harmon has the story. Hi, Joe. Saudi Arabia today handed out what it says was a final verdict for eight people involved in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. They received sentences of between seven and 20 years. Of course, earlier this year, Khashoggi's sons, who still live in Saudi Arabia, quote, pardoned five of the killers, thereby sparing them the death penalty. However, this verdict has been widely criticized for a number of reasons. It wasn't an open trial. The identities of those accused hasn't been released, but chiefly, none of the people who were sentenced today are thought to have masterminded the brutal killing of Jamal Khashoggi that took place in October of 2018 inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Khashoggi went inside to get a marriage license and he never came out. It's thought that a 15-man hit squad traveled from Saudi Arabia to Istanbul and dismembered him inside. There are still lingering questions about the role of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. At the time of this killing, some Western governments pointed the finger at him and wanted more information about his involvement in this. Perhaps a final thought for the Khashoggi family. To this day, Jamal Khashoggi's remains have never been recovered, leaving his sons and his fiance to grieve him with no body. It has been over a month since the chemical explosion in Lebanon's capital. The blast damaged Beirut's port and nearby neighborhoods, including gay-friendly districts that are safe havens for the country's LGBTQ residents. NBC News producer Elizabeth Kaur reports on the community there and how they plan to rebuild what was lost. 23-year-old Firas Nabulsi found his freedom in Beirut.
explosion in Lebanon's capital shattered his security. To find acceptance, and then in one second everything was destroyed, and I didn't, I didn't have anything to hold on to. It, it literally broke me. Nabolsi is gay. His parents are unaccepting, so he moved to the city's Mar Mikhail and Jamezi districts. These LGBTQ community hubs in Lebanon are now in ruins. The August explosion happened in a warehouse that stored ammonium nitrate. It killed almost 200 people and injured 6,000. And now we lost most of our venues where we can be ourselves in. And we'll put aside that we lost our jobs, our houses are damaged. Lebanon is considered relatively accepting compared to its neighbors. It's one of 70 countries that still criminalizes homosexuality. Recent judicial rulings has made prosecution difficult. From a personal queer perspective, uh, you always you always have to separate Beirut from the rest of it in a, a sense of tolerance. Sandra Mellum owns the Beirut gay club Ego. After the explosion, she fundraised for those impacted. Volunteers helped Mellum give out food and care packages from her apartment. She said residents who were once homophobic now welcome their support. I think it's also like uh, lifting the threshold of, uh, of tolerance because people are realizing, okay, so maybe the LGBT community isn't uh, a separate unit on its own. They're actually involved in, in, in everything on ground. The past two weeks have shown a sense of unity I have not seen in a very long time. And it's, it's very humbling to have people we've never met before open their homes to us and, and be very transparent about their needs. For Nabolsi and Melon's other volunteers, helping out is therapeutic. What's keeping me hopeful really is that sometimes things fall apart so they can be rebuilt with a stronger uh, base. So hopefully this will only push us forward. Working together to rebuild the city, but their supportive community was never broken. Hey everyone, I'm Joe Fryer. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Gadi Schwartz. He's following the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Gadi. Hey, Joe, good to see you. We're going to start with the presidential campaigns kicking into high gear now, less than 60 days from the election day. President Trump will be in Oregon today after touting job numbers and slamming China. Here's what he had to say today about what his administration would do to bring American jobs back from abroad. We'll manufacture our critical medical supplies in the United States. We'll create Made in America tax credits and bring our jobs back from China to the United States and will impose tariffs on companies that desert America to create jobs in China and other countries. If they can't do it here, then let them pay a big tax to build it someplace else and send it into our country. We'll prohibit federal contracts from companies that outsource to China and we'll hold China accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. And Vice President Pence in southwest Wisconsin talking at the electric utility Dairyland Power Cooperative. Meanwhile, the Biden-Harris ticket has been courting working class voters and unions in key swing states after earning three big union endorsements today. Biden in Pennsylvania at the AFL-CIO headquarters and vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris in Milwaukee holding a roundtable with black business leaders and meeting with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And out here in the West, firefighters in California are battling massive wildfires as the state sees record-breaking heat. Millions of people are now being warned they could be uh, in power outages with temperatures topping 100 degrees. California authorities are urging residents to conserve power as much as possible. And cases of the coronavirus are spiking in France, Spain, and the UK, and they are raising fears of a second coronavirus wave in Europe. France and the UK each have over 300,000 cases of coronavirus, and Spain has over 400,000. Last week, each country saw thousands of new cases breaking records since the start of the pandemic. And meanwhile, in India, they overtook Brazil as the country with the second most coronavirus cases in the world, with over 4 million total COVID-19 cases. 
all after the United States with over 6 million. And in Germany, German doctors say Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny is no longer in a medically induced coma and his in uh, condition is improving. Two weeks after the German government says he was poisoned with a nerve agent developed by the Soviet military during the Cold War, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has condemned the alleged attack, calling it attempted murder and an attempt to sil silence Navalny. Russian officials have denied any involvement. And lastly, a Saudi Arabian court issued a final eight convictions in the murder of U.S. journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Five people accused of being involved in his killing were given a 20-year prison sentence. Another was given 10 years in prison, and the remaining two were ordered to serve seven years. Their identities have not been released. Originally, five of the defendants were sentenced to death for his killing, but a judge has reduced those sentences. Khashoggi was killed in Istanbul's embassy in 2018. He has been living in exile, or he had been living in exile, and openly critical of Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The CIA found that the Crown Prince ordered the killing, but bin Salman says he was not involved with the murder. And that's what we're following so far, Joe. We're going to have much more coming up soon. Sounds good, Gotti. We'll see you in an hour. See you then. Massive wildfires are raging out of control across California today. The largest fire is burning in the central part of the state near Fresno. It's called the Creek Fire. So far, it has scorched almost 79,000 acres. Campers were trapped by flames over the weekend and had to be rescued by California National Guard helicopters. Governor Gavin Newsom is now declaring a state of emergency for several counties. Mandatory evacuations are also in effect. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is in Yucaipa. California joins us with more. Now, Steve, you're near the front lines of another fire, the El Dorado fire in Southern California. What can you tell us about the situation there? Joe, the fire here, one of more than two dozen major fires burning across the state, more than 14,000 firefighters on the front lines in the entirety of California. Here in Southern California, this fire is now charred 7,000 acres. You can see the destruction behind me, but that's almost good news in and of itself, because a few hours ago, you wouldn't be able to see anything covering the hillside behind me except smoke. The, there has really been a real, true, dramatic break in the weather, at least from the brutal temperatures that we saw over the weekend. It, you know, it's, it's calmed down a lot from the 110, 115, 120 degrees in some places, not to say that it's not going to be hot today. It will still reach triple digit temperatures. But this morning, the winds died down, the heat laid down, and firefighters finally able to get a foothold on the fire here, now 7% contained. We need to talk about this fire because it is rare that we get the cause of the fire while it is still burning. And this cause has been extraordinary. Fire investigators now confirm that the fire was sparked by a gender reveal gone wrong. They say it was a smoke generating incendiary device at a gender reveal photo op in a park that is very nearby to where I'm standing now. That explosive went off, sparked the fire, which is now spread to 7,000 acres. Officials say the people who were involved are cooperating, yet they're still going to face at least a life-altering fine, but maybe even criminal charges based on the fire behavior at this point as it continues to spread, maybe destroys more structures or even maybe kills people that are in the area. Although that there is some containment on it, that is good news to see that it is kind of spreading back and trapped in the canyons that are behind me. So some good news here, a break in the weather, but we still expect more high temperatures this afternoon, which will add more fuel to the fire, plus this area and several others across the state still in a red flag warning. Joe? Steve, it's just amazing when you hear about that gender reveal gone wrong. And those of us who live here in California sort of know when that, especially when the temps are so bad, you have to be especially careful when it comes with fire. Now, talk yeah. about the fire that's burning to the north of you in central California for a moment. There was that daring rescue over the weekend. Campers were trapped by the flames. Tell us a little more about what happened there. The Creek Fire, as you mentioned, Joe, now close to 80,000 acres burning out of control this weekend one of the most dramatic air rescues in modern history here in California. It was essentially about 200, 200 plus people trapped near Mammoth Pool Reservoir, a little area inside the forest in there. They were surrounded by flames. Military helicopters were called in. There was a Black Hawk and a Chinook. They were able to scoop everybody up between those two helicopters. The scenes and the reporting out of there is incredible. 
We're hearing, you know, the people that were rescued were hugging their first responders as they were airlifted to safety. We heard about some minor cuts, some bruises, some minor burns. There were a few incidents of serious uh, injuries taken from that fire as this incredible scene was unfolding. But for the most part, many of those people are just happy to have their lives from the swift action of the people that came in there and scooped them up. So an incredible scene there. But again, that fire still raging. And with these red flag winds that are still in place, firefighters have their hands full there, too. Joe. All right. Thank you, Steve Patterson, reporting from the scene of the El Dorado fire here in California. Thank you, Joe. Protesters rallied outside police headquarters in Rochester, New York, today demanding justice following the death of Daniel Prude. It comes after a weekend of demonstrations in Rochester. Last night, more than 1,000 people took to the streets. Prude died after an incident with police back in March when he was restrained and a spit hood was placed over his head because he said he had coronavirus. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park reports. Hey, Joe, good afternoon to you. So after several days of tense and sometimes violent protests here in Rochester, things actually took a different turn yesterday. It was actually pretty calm. And the police chief is thanking city elders, church elders, who served as buffers between police and protesters. And in fact, it may have worked because there were no arrests. But, Joe, there is certainly still tension here on the ground. A lot of that frustration is directed toward the police chief as well as the mayor for their handling of the Daniel Prude case. But we heard from them in a press conference yesterday, and they are standing firm on their approach. They're saying that they followed all the protocols, but there's still growing calls for them to step down. They responded by saying that they will continue to stay in their position because this is their community and they will work to do better. Meantime, as far as the investigation goes, all seven officers involved in the arrest have been suspended with pay and the attorney general's office is now taking the lead on the investigation. But they have also asked a grand jury to take a closer look at this case as well. But demonstrators say that they will continue to be out here in Rochester until all the officers are prosecuted. Joe. Labor Day is the unofficial kickoff for the home stretch of the presidential campaign. A Democratic nominee, Joe Biden's maintaining a steady grip on the race. Biden holds a 10 point lead over President Trump nationally, according to a new CBS YouGov poll. Biden is spending the holiday meeting with workers in Pennsylvania. The campaign announced earlier today that three labor unions endorse the former vice president. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli is in Harrisburg for us. Mike, thanks for joining us. We know President Trump Trump won Pennsylvania in 2016. We know it is vital to both candidates this year. What does Biden need to do today and what else is the former vice president up to right now? Well, Joe, as you say, Labor Day is that traditional kickoff to the fall campaign. It's the day when the rest of the country tunes into a race that we've all been obsessing about for almost two years now. And you hit it on, on the head. Pennsylvania, there's no state probably more important to the Biden strategy than this battleground state. And what demographic, what group is probably uh, just as important as the state itself? It is union workers, those working class voters that Joe Biden has always felt he has a unique appeal to in the Democratic Party. Now, Hillary Clinton won union households in 2016 nationally, according to the exit polls, but she only won them by eight points. Now, that, that might sound like a healthy advantage, but when you consider that President Obama, with Joe Biden on the ticket for uh, two terms, uh, won it by more than 20 points. So she nearly uh, saw half of that, uh, that advantage cut in half. It was actually the weakest performance by a Democratic nominee since 1984, when President Reagan won a landslide re-election. So that's why you see Joe Biden uh, spending part of his day in a backyard conversation with union workers as well as veterans. And now he's in the headquarters of the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO behind me. He's going to be having a conversation both in person and virtual with union workers across the country. And we got a little taste of what that conversation might include in a new op-ed that Biden penned with uh, Richard Trumpka. He's the president of the AFL-CIO union nationally. And I'll read you just a little bit of part of it. He says, as workers struggle against a deadly pandemic, a painful recession and deep racial disparities, the labor movement also faces an additional burden, a union busting president. Now we saw President Trump in his news conference just a little while ago, talking about how great the economy is, talking about the record stock market. Biden also used that backyard conversation to say 
listen, it's not Wall Street that built America. It's, it's hardworking uh, middle class workers uh, like those that he's been appealing to throughout this campaign. So Biden really willing to take on the economic argument against President Trump, Joe. Yeah, and you mentioned it there that even though Biden maintains a steady lead in the polls, he is still trailing President Trump in polls on the economy. So what are the things the Biden campaign is trying to do to sort of flip that in the final stretch? Because it's hard to win an election without winning the economy. Now, two things to that, Joe. Now, first of all, the Biden campaign says the number one issue for voters, they're confident, continues to be the pandemic, the president's mishandling of the pandemic, which in part is an economic issue. As Biden often says, you can't get you know, the country on, back on a strong economic footing until you deal with the pandemic. So that's always going to be where Joe Biden begins and ends his conversations. But the Biden campaign also says it doesn't want to concede that they can't maybe take back the advantage on the issue of the economy. And Biden previewed that a little bit over the weekend when he had a, a news conference with reporters uh, the day of the jobs numbers coming out. He, he pointed out the fact that he re released his own economic plan during the month of July, four different prongs it called the Build Back Better Agenda. And what he says he now wants to do over the next few weeks is take that message on the road. He is going to start traveling more in person to these battleground states and compare the very detailed plans he says he's put forward on things like manufacturing, on infrastructure, on clean energy, and compare that to what he says is a lack of plans from President Trump. President Trump's argument, as Biden says, is simply, I built the economy once before and I'll do it again, but without offering anything in the way of specifics, as Biden also likes to point out, he inherited a strong economy from the Obama-Biden administration and then saw that squandered away. So the Biden campaign clearly ready to take this economic argument on the road. That latest CBS News YouGov poll also shows that Biden holds a six-point lead over President Trump in battleground Wisconsin, which the president just barely won four years ago. That's where Senator Kamala Harris is making her sort of solo campaign debut today. What is she doing there and why this focus on Wisconsin? Yeah, Senator Harris, this is her real first road trip as the Democratic nominee for vice president. There have been some questions about why we haven't seen Senator Harris on the road just yet, including one that was asked to Biden at that news conference on Friday. He said, listen, one of the he knows full well as somebody who was the running mate in 2008 and 2012, you don't necessarily want to be in the same place as your, your running mate. You want to divide and conquer. And so what are we seeing today? Kamala Harris hitting some of the same notes that Biden is talking to union voters. She was at an IBEW training facility. She's going to be talking about the Biden-Harris economic plan as well. And we also know that she spent some time meeting with the family of Jacob Blake, even spoke with him by phone. So this is really a sort of a, an example of how this ticket can sort of divide and conquer, hit the road as Biden did last week in Kenosha, where he uh, spoke to that community that's still grappling with uh, the fallout of the shooting of Jacob Blake there and, and the rioting that we saw that followed. And now Senator Harris in Milwaukee hitting that same important battleground state with the same message, but splitting that up over time. It's really how you typically see these campaigns run. Obviously, it's been a very different campaign without the candidates traveling quite as much. But Senator Harris really getting her own chance uh, in the spotlight in a key battleground state. And we'll see how she does today, Joe. Yeah, nothing typical this year. Thanks so much, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. There are more than 6 million coronavirus cases in the United States and now over 190,000 deaths. It's more than any other country in the world. President Trump says he is the one who can deliver an economic rebound and a vaccine in record time. Biden presided over the worst, the weakest and the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It was the, it was a long, slow slog. Under my leadership, next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country, I project. Under my leadership, we'll produce a vaccine in record time. Uh, Biden and his very liberal running mate, the most liberal person in Congress, by the way, is not a competent person, in my opinion, would destroy this country and would destroy this economy. Could even have it during the month of October. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins me now. Shannon, this news conference, it was a late announcement today. First of all, what are your big takeaways from what the president had to say? Well, 
One, I think this was an attempt by the president to steal a bit of the spotlight away from Biden and Harris, who you talked about are out on the road on Labor Day. There was nothing on the president's schedule this morning, and this was a relatively quickly, hastily put together press conference by the president. Um, another thing I think to note from that, and you could kind of hear it in those clips you played, is we're seeing the vaccine increasingly becoming a political pawn in this campaign. The president came out pretty quickly and attacked Senator Harris for comments that she had made uh, a day or so before, uh, suggesting that she wouldn't trust a vaccine that was developed under President Trump. Uh, Trump accused her of being an anti-vaxxer uh, and, you know, harming public health, uh, while at the same time as President Trump was speaking, uh, you know, former Vice President Biden was asked about a vaccine, and he accused Trump of saying that, that Trump is the one who is discouraging the public trust in the vaccine because Trump says so many things uh, that aren't true. And Biden himself saying that he would be willing to take a vaccine if it was available. So a lot of back and forth on the vaccine. And I think we're going to continue to see that. You know, the president said that, um, as you could hear from that clip, there could possibly be a vaccine in October. He appears to be the only one at this point who is saying that. Um, Dr. Fauci was asked about this just last week and continues to say the end of the year. He you know, did not have anything to say about a vaccine before the election. But when the president was asked about this today and whether it could help him politically, he demurred and said it wasn't for political reasons, but then acknowledged that he supposed it was something that could help him politically. As we just mentioned, Kamala Harris is in Wisconsin today. We know Vice President Mike Pence is making a trip there. So dueling trips, but they're in different parts of the state and they're speaking to very different groups. What can you tell us about the vice president's trip? Right. You know, with Senator Harris in the largest city in the state, the vice president is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a smaller blue-collar, uh, blue working-class city along the Mississippi River. And you know, I think the difference in locations is sort of emblematic of the different approaches these campaigns are taking. We have seen the president increasingly going to smaller cities, more rural, working-class parts of states where his support is heaviest in an effort to drive out his base, rather than focusing on the more population-dense suburbs around major cities or going to these large cities trying to win over or convert voters. So I think you can see a convergence in strategy in the location, but of course, as well as, as the message, uh, Senator Harris meeting with the Blake family, uh, you know, Vice President Pence, when he talked about the issues in Kenosha, really focused on the destruction that has followed those protests uh, and also accusing Biden of not standing up for law enforcement and not condemning Antifa enough and trying to, again, create a contrast uh, between their campaigns by saying that the Trump administration will never defund the police. So I think this tale of two Wisconsin visits is very emblematic of where we're seeing both of their campaigns go from a messaging and a strategic standpoint. Shannon, I'm from Minnesota. I can tell you also when you hit western Wisconsin, sometimes you pick up media in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Minnesota is also a key state this year. So sometimes it's a two for one when you hit western Wisconsin. I also want to mention the president picking up the pace. He's traveling to several battleground states. What is ahead for the president? Well, he is going back to North Carolina this week. He was just there last week. Of course, North Carolina, an important battleground state, and I would say even more important at the moment, because as of Friday, the state started sending out absentee ballots to people who had requested them. So while there's a lot of focus on Labor Day being sort of the, the real start of the home stretch, in places like North Carolina, uh, the home stretch is over. It is election day for people who will be sending in their absentee ballots that they receive in the coming days. Uh, another state that's going to be starting voting well ahead of the election day is Michigan, and the president's going to travel there later this week. Uh, and again, this strategy that the Trump campaign is taking to focus on these early voting states now, because they really believe the majority of ballots are going to be cast before election day, considering how much vote by mail there is expected to be, despite all the, the criticism the president has made of that and really trying to scare tactics of people. You can see from their strategy that they're still expecting this to be a heavily, heavily mail voted, early voting uh, election coming up. Shannon, while we have you, we're hearing about a potential shakeup at the Pentagon, some reports. What's the latest from there? 
Yeah, uh, my colleagues Courtney Cuby and Carol Lee uh, were reporting today that uh, the president has obviously for a while not been very happy with Defense Secretary uh, Mark Esper, and he had asked the head of the VA if he would step in and take over at the Defense Department. Now, that would be such a big shakeup so close to the election. We are about 56 days out. It's hard to imagine that the president would replace his defense secretary so close to the election, um, especially as there has been so much criticism right now of the president's uh, comments or reported comments uh, that he has made about the military. But certainly, according to reporting by NBC News, that is a serious discussion that has been going on with inside the West Wing. Shannon, thanks so much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. It's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. There are nearly 21 million registered voters in California. That's up more than 10 percent from this time in 2016. The big question right now, can the current election infrastructure handle a surge of mail-in ballots? NBC News business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent got a behind-the-scenes look at one of California's largest ballot processing centers. It's part of NBC's Vote Watch Week. In Orange County, California, the final sprint to Election Day begins on October 5th. In a month, all of these envelopes will be stuffed with ballots and sent out to voters. Once they're returned here to the registrar, that's when the process kicks into high gear. 
Orange County's nonpartisan chief elections official, Neil Kelly, oversees the fifth largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. He says he's running a military-style operation to handle what's likely to be the biggest mail-in vote ever. I think we're probably going to see upwards of 90 percent, honestly, for the November election. That could add up to 1.2 million in Orange County. Kelly has been anticipating the onslaught since the pandemic hit in March, investing more than a million dollars in new machinery and doing dry runs to prepare. You know, I lose sleep a lot at night. I think every election official does. And one of the things that I lose sleep over is making sure the voters understand their options. The options, mail in your ballot early, drop it off in one of these secure drop boxes, or deliver it in person to a vote center starting four days before Election Day. You can, of course, always vote in person. So when your ballot arrives, the first thing it does is go into this piece of equipment. And what this piece of equipment does at a very high speed, it's capturing an image of that signature in a split second. What happens if your signature is not legitimate? It goes to another tier for additional review. A human is comparing the signature here? Correct. Ah. Correct. A human being is comparing every single signature. So if it's good ballots, then these ballots come into this device right here, and this piece of equipment actually splits the envelope open, and this operator would pull out each individual ballot. Is he able to see the way I cast my ballot? No. The secrecy of the ballot remains because it stays folded here until it goes to another team for opening and flattening. This is the moment of truth because now it comes in and we scan it and we're capturing all the data where the voter actually voted. Although Orange County captures mail-in ballots as soon as they arrive, no actual votes are tallied until Election Day. California allows ballots to arrive up to 17 days after Election Day, as long as they're postmarked by November 3rd. Kelly has 30 days by state law to count all the votes, but believes they could finish in two weeks. As for the criticism from the White House... Mail-in ballots will lead to the greatest fraud. Universal mail-in is a very dangerous thing. It's fraud with fraud and every other thing that could happen. I try and stay out of the political fray as the election official, right? But just in general, when you talk about the security of mail-in voting in general, I think it has more secure aspects than in-person voting. What we saw is a situation where the county has the time, money, and resources to handle the expected surge in mail-in voting, but that's just not the case nationwide. Not all counties are this fortunate or prepared. And Joe joins us now. Such a fascinating look behind the scenes. Joe, what stood out to you most in this whole process? Was there anything about the system that surprised you at all? Yeah, I think when you take a look at the volume of what they're going to be handling, in Orange County, they're a very well-oiled machine. I was there on Super Tuesday, and you saw them bringing in not just the mail-in votes, but the votes that were tallied across vote centers across the county. And they're ready for this. And they've attempted a bunch of different scenarios. They're running dry runs of possible crises, possible issues they could run into. So they feel very prepared. What's fascinating is that, you know, all of the registrars across the country, they all talk to each other. And Neil Kelly says that he's spoken to several other counties and other states where they are concerned about how they're going to handle the volume, how they're going to deal with accusations of voter fraud, even if those have no basis to them. And they do feel the pressure from the White House directly, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe, and great to see you, my friend. Great to see you, too. Joe's report was part of our Vote Watch week. We're investigating what could affect your vote and explaining what you need to pay attention to this election. That's all this week right here on NBC News. Former FBI agent Peter Strzok is attacking President Trump in a new book, calling him a national security threat. Strzok was fired from his job after text messages surfaced of him criticizing the president. NBC News chief White House correspondent Hallie Jackson spoke with Strzok about what he wrote. There is no more urgent election in our lifetime from a counterintelligence perspective. And that's why, less than two months before Election Day, former FBI agent Peter Strzok is pulling no punches. Without exaggeration, President Trump's counterintelligence vulnerabilities are exponentially greater than any president in modern history. So do you think the president is a national security threat? I do. Strzok helped open the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. So involved, he named the operation Crossfire Hurricane 
after a Rolling Stones song stuck in his head. I was born in a and he's one of the agents former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to about his conversations with the then Russian ambassador to the U.S., charges the Justice Department recently moved to dismiss. I think that's a, a miscarriage of justice. What do you attribute it to, then? Political pressure, improper political pressure from the White House and the Department of Justice. Now, Strzok is still worried about unfinished business. Do you believe the Russians still have hidden leverage over the president? I think that's a fair assumption. Why? Uh, I think when you look at President Trump and the efforts he has taken to uh, fighting tooth and nail to prevent, for instance, the release of his tax records, there is something there that he doesn't want out. Strzok, a key part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, also worked briefly with the special counsel in 2017, looking into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia before being removed and later fired. Yeah. His dismissal coming after the discovery of text messages he exchanged with a co-worker with whom he was having an affair. Texts like, F Trump, Hillary should win 100 million to zero, and about a possible Trump victory, we'll stop it. Giving ammunition to the president and his supporters who believed the FBI was working against President Trump. A watchdog report later found no political bias motivating the investigation. These outside independent people who have looked at it have concluded that this was entirely proper. To some people in this country, your credibility is simply and frankly shot. They just don't believe what you're saying because of some of your past actions, the text message, etc. Why should those people believe you now that you're coming out and sounding the alarm bell about President Trump? Listen to what I have to say. I guarantee you, whoever you are in America, you are not going to step away from that without a deep, deep concern about our president's interactions and uh, a relationship with the government of Russia. In a statement, the White House calls Strzok's book utter nonsense, adding, quote, he is now trying to make money selling the same lies for which he was fired. Strzok and Page, the lovers, the great lovers. The president himself has described Strzok as a minion, a sick loser, and accused him of treason. It is angering. It is, it makes you, it promotes fear. It is fearful. The second thing is, it is enormously frustrating because it's not the truth. And it strips away your identity, at least with some, whatever portion of the population is listening and believing the president. You had to have known that writing this book would reignite those attacks. So why do it? Because it's important to get the message out. You are ringing the alarm bell. I am. You think people will listen to it? I hope so. I think so. Even with you as the messenger? Absolutely. Just two weeks into the semester and more than 650 students at Iowa State University have tested positive for coronavirus. The outbreak is now spreading into the surrounding county. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hillier joins us now from Ames, Iowa. Vaughn, good to see you. The infection rate on campus has more than doubled in just the past week. What exactly is happening there? Exactly. If you just look at the percent positive rate, you know, let's just go to the data here. The percent positive rate on the Iowa State campus here in Ames, Iowa, the very first week, it was 13 percent, Joe. The second week, it jumped all the way up to 28 percent positive rate, which is strikingly high. And that is where there, there are those real serious question marks about what way can the school year go forward? I just want to introduce you, Blake McGill. He's a sophomore here uh, at the university. Okay. And I think you'll see exactly where he's at. He's in a quarantine dorm uh, where he will have to be spending 10 days because he was in close proximity to somebody who had COVID here on campus. Take a listen. I'd say classes are going really well. Iowa State's uh, done a good job of making things very accessible for students that uh, are either forced to or prefer to go full online. Um, moving forward, I think they, they have a lot of uh, help opportunities and resources for us, uh, for those that are doing an, all the uh, online uh, activity. And so uh, I would really hope to see that continue for the rest of the semester so that we can all stay here and still get uh, a taste of what normal college is usually like rather than send us all home again. Blake was obviously a good sport with us there on day number five in quarantine. and the work of our great camera and audio team of Mike and Tim there, having the chance to talk to him. Uh, but what you're seeing right now is there's a, about 100 students like Blake that are currently in isolation or in quarantine, uh, which is making this difficult for the university. There's already been more than 650 cases here on campus. 
and there is concern about to the extent to which it begins to percolate and goes outside of this campus. Ames is a college town, but if you look across Story County, Iowa here, where Ames is at, it is now a hot spot here in the country. Iowa has the highest per capita uh, rate of cases right now, just behind South Dakota in North Dakota, Joe. Yeah, and Vaughn, you mentioned that. We know universities are not in a bubble. Students work in the community. People in the community work at the college. So what is the worry in the community about this spreading beyond the college? You know, if anybody's gone around a college campus before, uh, usually socializing is at the forefront, along with, of course, the educational side of things. And that's what makes it strikingly uh, difficult, especially if you take into account freshmen that are coming onto campus. And I want to introduce you live to one of those right now, if we could. Uh, Gwen Costello, you're an animal science major. And tell me, you're a freshman. You moved down here from Wisconsin. Yes. What happened on your very first day? I um, moved in on the 4th, and I got tested over at the Thielen Health Center. And I got um, notified that I had tested positive for COVID-19 without having any contact with anyone who had been possibly even exposed to Very it. first day, then what happened? Um, I got moved from Friley across campus to Linden, which is right behind us. Which is right behind us over there. Yes. You were in isolation. Yes. How many days? Uh, from the 4th to the 15th, so for 10 days. You had a lot to think about in your first uh, week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> After that, you were released from mm -hmm. isolation. Uh, then what did you see on campus here? Um, lots of partying um, and people not like uh, conforming to the social distancing rules that have been like put in place by not only the campus, but also obviously the CDC. And so when all of the cases like began to spike, it tended to be because of the parties that those people were going to. It had to have made you almost want to scream. It was frustrating. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of us are socially deprived teenagers after not having a senior year for us who were freshmen this year. And then to put us in a socially enriched zone and tell us to not socialize is pretty difficult, to what say is, the least. What is your, my sympathies are with you. What is, what is your message now to students? And is it possible to have the rest of the school year go on in the way that it's attempted to go in this first month? Um, my message is wear a mask because it's easy to put a mask on. It's one of the first things I do in the morning when I leave class because I have very early classes. And so if you put a mask on, you're saving yourself and anyone else. That have you seen a difference? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, I've seen that when people are wearing masks outside, it makes me personally feel safer, even though I can't get it for at least a 90 day period because I tested positive. So I have the antibodies. It makes me feel safer to be wearing a mask because in case I come into close contact with somebody who has it again, or I might possibly still have any symptoms, which I don't. Um, but if anything were to happen in the future, it makes me feel safer and it makes the people that I'm with also feel safer, I believe. Gwen, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank Hopefully you. the next couple of years are a little bit better than the start of this one here. Uh, animal science major, freshman, not only is it the educational side of things for these students, but these universities, uh, Joe, the, the universities and government officials will tell you as well that the, the, the long-term concern here is also the financing of these educational institutions here. You know, that's why initially the Iowa State is having their first football game this Saturday, and they announced that 25,000 fans were going to be allowed in. But after much pushback, as Story County is now a hotspot, they have uh, they've gone against that initial decision, and it's the athletic department that is saying that the university is, now finds itself in a $30 million deficit because of it. These are the tough conversations that not only students, uh, as well as faculty, as well as, as these university officials are now grappling with. Yeah, this pandemic is hitting college communities very hard. Vaughn, while we have you, I do want to ask you, is Iowa's governor or any state officials doing or saying anything about this outbreak that you're seeing around the university? Governor Kim Reynolds, a Republican here, has been insistent that she is not going to implement a statewide mask mandate but also she is not going to allow localities to enforce mask mandates, which has led to a lot of uh, local officials uh, that have been uh, frustrated by that decision. Just this morning, I was talking with uh, Dr. John Pas Passion, who is the chair of the Story County Board of Health, and he said that localities, especially when a place like Story County now finds itself to be a hotspot, should have that ability to make their own uh, decisions within their jurisdiction uh, and one of those is a mask mandate, which the governor right now has been resistant to allowing these localities to do. All right, Von Hilliard, thank you so much.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Labor Day, of course, is the unofficial end of summer. There is a lot of worry, though, that what happens this weekend and what happens today could impact the entire fall, at least when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. So we want to bring in our doctor to ask a few questions about this weekend and what's going to happen moving forward. Dr. Shoshana Ungerleider joins us now. She's an internal medicine physician at California Pacific Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for having us. We know Dr. Fauci has expressed concerns about what people might do this weekend. We know we saw with Memorial Day weekend and even the 4th of July, people had gatherings then. And then in the weeks that followed, we saw the virus spread. What are your worries about Labor Day weekend? Well, Joe, we're all concerned that we'll see these same spikes after this holiday weekend. And, and really, that impacts everyone's ability to allow our children to go back to school safely, to return to work. You know, I want to point out that at Memorial Day, we had 20,000 cases per day. Now we're at about 40,000 cases per day. So our individual behavior uh, this weekend and, and beyond really matters. You know, that, that said, the value of social interaction, as we know, is significant and really impacts our well-being. So, you know, if, if you do feel strongly that you want to gather this weekend, it should really depend on your individual situation and that of your family and, and your tolerance for risk. Uh, don't forget, it, it takes just one person to spread COVID to many 
people. And it can actually be someone in your own family. So doing things like staying outdoors, wearing masks, maintaining social distance um, when you're not eating and drinking around other people is, is really the right thing to do. And, and the bottom line is that there's no 100% risk-free way to get together with folks. And, and remember that you know if you're spending time around anyone that's high risk, meaning that they have underlying health conditions or they're over 60, their risk is much greater for, for illness and death from COVID. We know how important it is to try to get the pandemic under control heading into the fall after seeing so many spikes, especially in the South and West this summer. Based on what you're seeing right now, looking around the country, where are we at and how much is or is not the coronavirus under control? Well, Joe, we're now in the seventh month of, of the COVID pandemic, and, and there continues to be no uh, national strategy out, uh, out of the White House. We still have COVID cases rising in 22 states. We heard what just, just now what's going on in Iowa. You know, as we head into flu season, this is extremely concerning. I mean, listen, if, if we had easily accessible, fast testing, if nearly everyone was wearing a mask and there were policies in place and messaging to support this, we really could get much of our lives back while we wait for a COVID vaccine. You know, the White House should not be advocating for schools to be opening no matter what, or for bars and restaurants and other businesses to just resume regular services. This is driving many more COVID cases and preventable deaths. Um, I really think we can do so much better than this as a nation, and, and we really should be. For months now, we have been talking about testing. In some places, it can be hard to get a test. Others who get a test are waiting 10, 14 days to get the results, which essentially makes contact tracing useless. As far as you can tell, where do things stand now as far as being able to get a test and get those results back quickly? Joe, it's, it's dependent on where you live. So we're still not in a great place nationwide in terms of testing, unfortunately. You know, there, there are not enough tests being done and delays in results. You know, we, we have seen these rapid tests emerge, and this is a step in the right direction. Uh, they're fast. They're relatively good tests. They're cheap. Uh, we need now to see the political will to take this very seriously. Uh, we need to have the capacity to, to trace and to isolate people if they test positive. And we need to test everyone, not just people who are symptomatic, since we know somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of people are asymptomatic with COVID. So if we can do these things and, and have the capacity to do, honestly, billions of tests in this country, we can make a big difference. Dr. Ungerleiter, thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now, this wasn't a normal summer for any of us. And for businesses at the Jersey Shore, well, it has been a season full of challenges and restrictions. In Seaside Heights, New Jersey, the mayor is now planning to keep the beaches open to make up for the economic losses. Because of the COVID virus, we naturally suffer like everybody else, but we're a short community. Our economics is depending on a four or five month season. If the weather stays like this in the 80s and the 70s, we'll do it every day. If we find that people aren't coming, which I believe they will, then we would adjust. We may not open up every day during the week. It's going to be a, a trial. We spoke to a few businesses in Seaside Heights about their plans at the beginning of the summer. So how did they fare in the pandemic economy? We checked in for the holiday weekend. We only have 100 days to make so much to get us through to the next year. And if we don't make that money in 100 days, I don't even know what's going to happen when September gets here. I'd love to say it was just like every other summer, but it wasn't. It was. It, it had that added stress level that we haven't had in the past. Weekends have been very good during the week. has been off, but it, it's, it's not had the, nearly the number of people that you're used to seeing on the boardwalk. It's been challenging. It's very stressful. My family's been in business on the boardwalk 70 years, so it's been very predictable with the cycle of business. But now in 2020, it's been very unpredictable, and you had to go take it on a daily basis because you didn't know what was going to unfold. We've had to adjust to a new way of doing things, and... It hasn't been easy. Rest assured, we are doing everything in our power to let all of us enjoy the summer fun. Sanitizing and making sure that railings were clean and tables were clean and 
you know, um, every other car was used on the rides. This year we had a, a just on the fly many days in a row. I'm happy with the year because it could have been a lot worse. A lot of people are getting a lot more grab and go, take out. A lot of stuff is being packaged into go containers or small pizza boxes to uh, package slices of pie. The third party delivery of Uber Eats, DoorDash, the like, etc., basically replaced the late night dollars that we were missing after midnight because of the boardwalk did close after midnight. We're only allowed 50% of the occupancies, but even on beautiful, sunny, hot days, the water park had less people at it. Days that were normally boardwalk days for the ride gear, we had less people. But our games department did very well. Being on the boardwalk and being able to be open for a while, they've, done, they've had a good year. Reluctantly, I did have to raise my prices because the expenses just kept going up. And uh, to keep pace with that, things like hand sanitizers, masks, other, other things that you need now in this corona environment, even going forward, if we have to have the gloves, the masks, what have you. It was challenging this summer, but very uh, rewarding uh, in the respect that we're making it through. We've had no outbreaks, nobody gets sick, no reason to shut down or quarantine. So I'm very, very pleased and a little bit surprised that we didn't have anybody get sick. And that's a nice testament. It's going to be a little hard trying to figure out what we're going to do going into the winter. I know there's going to be some, uh, some lean months coming up for sure. It's not been as good as 2019. It's almost like right after Sandy when that happened and it was, things were slow and people weren't around. It, it's eerily similar. Superstorm Sandy was devastating for the whole area. We were just starting to recover from that and then this Seaside Heights fire hit and uh, wiped us out. When the roller coaster and all the rides fell in the water and we had to rebuild, we at least knew what we had to do. But for this, it's been challenging. It certainly has. I mean, it starts wearing on you. I literally grew up on the boardwalk. That's a big part of my life. It's, it's how, I, how I grew up, and um, it's what I've embraced uh, professionally. And. Uh, I really wasn't too surprised to see that Seaside continues. It is a very resilient town, a very resilient uh, business community. Seaside's a great place to come. It could have been a totally disastrous season, but we all did the best we could given what was in front of us. A key opposition figure in Belarus has vanished following another weekend of mass protests. Maria Kolesnikova was last seen being shoved into a vehicle by a group of men. That's according to a local media outlet in Belarus. Kolesnikova was a central figure in protests against the rule of embattled president Alexander Lukashenko. The apparent abduction seems to be yet another example of a pattern of world leaders consolidating power. It's a trend called authoritarian drift. Here's NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. Governments around the world seem to have taken advantage of the ongoing pandemic to make major power grabs, some even explicitly using the coronavirus as a reason to consolidate authority. In Belarus, the longtime president, Alexander Lukashenko, often called Europe's last